Welcome to the best day of your life or the craziest thing you've ever seen. It's called the New World Spirit and we're aware of how it looks. It's very alarming. But if you're an academic or a grassroots organizer or a Joe Blow or a Jane Doe, uh, you can look up here in the left hand corner and you can find the abstract to read about the real substance behind the public presentation. The goal and a real victory will be if we have anyone leaving this presentation with the same conclusion we've had, which is that yes, it's completely insane, but it's crazy enough that it just might work. We're aware that there's problems and we're starting with them. And there's five listed here that we're gonna try and answer during the presentation. Don't be afraid to ask questions because we're going to ask you a favor. The line between genius and madness can sometimes get a little murky. So we would like to ask the viewers to bear with us through potentially 27 triggers. The current culture we're in is very delicate and fragile because it's, it's, it's missing this logic, this sort of living nature of how to coexist. So if you could hold on for at least 10 across these 27 opposite pairs that are in tension in our current society all over the world, we'd greatly appreciate it. This particularly goes for academics because it's often a temptation to only work in your specialty. Uh, and we're gonna be covering quite a few domains of knowledge in a very short period of time, and it can be very abrasive and volatile at first. We're teaching something completely new that's requiring a higher level of cooperation. And even though this presentation looks like it's simple, we're trying to do two things at once, which is that we're showing an immense kind of complexity in a simple form that we're hoping comes off as elegant. So if you feel like it, you can tap the screen to sort of sign onto this sort of favor uh, in the internal world. And we will begin the journey starting now. So bear with us. 21 more triggers to go. We just burnt six. <laughs> We're going to win or attempt to win with this new world spirit. All six Nobel Prizes simultaneously at the same time. Not only is it difficult to win one Nobel Prize, but it may not have crossed anyone's mind to even think of winning more than one, never mind all six. And the synchronistic, synchronistic, symmetry, all this stuff will come uh, later on as we talk more about how this incredible feat will become accomplishable. It is such an audacious goal to try and win all six Nobel Prizes that the question of why crosses the mind. Is it for the glory and the fame? Well, partly, who wouldn't want to be honored by a Nobel Prize? Even just one across you know, one prize, even though the committees have had problems over the years, it's still quite an honor. But the reality is that the New World Spirit team conjured up this idea out of a desperation to try and accelerate change to address some of these global problems we seem to be having. So this chart here, the Noble Influence Graph, uh, may burn four more triggers. So we're down to 17, as you can see from 21. And what this graph is showing is the population of human beings on the planet, almost 8 billion, versus the influencer, the largest influencers in the world to date. And it's not everyone, but it's a, it's a cross-section of individual influencers like Christian Ronaldo has um, hundreds of millions of followers. Uh, the United Nations has the most technical or theoretical influence because they have 193 plus nations that they could technically influence even though the culture seems to be too fragmented to really use that power in a powerful peacekeeping way sometimes. And then of course we have Elon Musk who just bought Twitter and quite a few other influencers as well as Apple, Walt Disney, Comcast in the States and uh, New World Spirit is in the middle here with Facebook, Warner Brothers. But towards the end here, after we get past Abu Dhabi and uh, the Chinese media agencies, we have the world religions. 
And this circle here explains why we named the New World Spirit, New World Spirit, and not something else. It's because current sur surveys show that roughly 85% of the world subscribes to a spiritual or religious background. So to influence the world to work together and cooperate needs to incorporate the spiritual dimension. And the word spirit helps us fulfill that. But to see why, if we take Christianity, Hinduism, Buddhism, and Islam, which are the largest current religions in the world, and we put them on top of each other, we very quickly see why changing the world without them is impossible or virtually impossible. It's because they're well over half the world's population and are quite influential. So how the world spirit, the new world spirit, is going to function is that by winning one Nobel Prize, it might be possible to get on the map. So if we update the graph after winning one Nobel Prize, you can see down here that if we're lucky, it equals maybe somebody like Christian Ronaldo. If we're lucky and it is a best case scenario, but compared to the other influencers in the world, it's never going to probably make that much of a dent. But if we win two, now the interesting thing about winning two is that it's technically been done before. There's a few Nobel Prize winners out there, like Linus Pauling, who won two. But the novelty here is that they didn't win them at the same time. So that's what the New World Spirit's going to try and do, is by winning two simultaneously, it'll catch the world's attention and perhaps get somewhere between that 500 million and 2 billion influencing uh, threshold. But that, of course, is also not enough to change the world or influence it in a significant way. It's pretty much as, as powerful as maybe Apple might be in the West, um, but maybe not in the East. But if we won three Nobel Prizes, this is where it starts to get powerful because it's a recognition tool um, that lends significant, significant credence of the current age. So winning three would start catching everybody's attention. Something completely new seems to be going on. Um, and it might actually start to create, um, if not real change, some real discussions around the, the, techno, the technical details of this presentation. And the conversations might start, but policies and other things which are uh, greatly needed right now will still be probably leaving behind. But now if we won a fourth uh, prize with a fifth prize, that's where it starts to become world changing in a drastically sped up timeline. And then if we win, of course, an additional Nobel Prize, then it starts to rival what the United Nations can do in terms of its influence if it did have um, a, little bit more, a little bit more cohesion and uh, a little bit more cooperation. So to update the graph, after winning all six Nobel Prizes, would put the New World Spirit in a domain of its own, a new, a new bracket of influence that has never been achieved before, and a much needed one. So if we update the graph, we can see that the influence probably won't reach everybody because not everybody is reachable at this current period in time but it would be something significant. And this is why we thought up the six Nobel Prizes to sort of create a new world spirit that would engage all types of industries, all types of spiritual leaders, all types of national leaders, and get to a level of cooperation that could address some of these global issues in time. Now, if the influencing plan excites you so far and you want to contribute, we want to right off the bat let you know that your talents and your contributions will be recognized. 
because this is a new initiative in cooperation that also has an economic dimension. And we took off one of the triggers here down from 17 to 16 because this new spirit license that we're going to be giving to people who want to participate, whether you want to do it on your own or join the New World Spirit team formally or contribute an in-kind gift of your talents, it looks at first a little bit impractical like the rest of everything so far. But what we're going to do is these five things. One is if we do win all the prizes or even if we win one, two, however many, the fund will be split amongst everybody. Um, so right now it's about 1.4 million United States dollars per prize. So it's over 6 million, but we're going to be sharing that if you can contribute meaningfully. And then the novelty is that the Nobel Prize is, is not where it stops. The, the money will go towards uh, creating these new universal prizes. The second part is where the trigger comes in. So including the founders and organizers of New World Spirit. So there's an, a radical new equality here. Everyone will get 90,000 Canadian maximum because it is the studied number for the most amount of ha happiness per unit dollar according to current studies and trends. And this will be in terms of purchasing parity all around the world because this will be a, a, an actual world uh, initiative. But it will also adjust for inflation, uh, consumer price index, anything that could erase that real purchasing pow uh, parity power. Plus something called flow dividends and the Pareto rotations. These are novel things that are going to be explained later in terms of the Nobel Economics Prize. You can see here it has something to do in the bottom with idea-based economics, which is the new type of economics uh, that we're going to be exploring. But at a minimum, the amount paid will be up to 90000 but really it's, it's the number of, of dollars divided by the number of people who are contributing. So if there's 10,000 people, well, $6 million isn't enough to pay all 90, 000, everybody 90000 But you know, even at 10,000 people, uh, which is unlikely, everybody would still get $600 for whatever they do in their spare time to help out. If you're not motivated by money, um, then if you're in academia, having this on your curriculum vitae would uh, probably help you find a few careers. Uh, it is also maybe noticed that if you study the Nobel Prize criterion, some of the prizes can't nominate a team, but we hope to apply for the, the prizes as the team New World Spirit as an organization. And so far, only the Nobel Peace Prize has been awarded to uh, an organization. The rest of them have been to individuals. But we're going to try and show that the editing we do for the other prizes can be filed as a team because it really was a team effort. Uh, and if not, we're going to try and get the individuals who are following this direction to maybe donate it to the fund so we can still split it. Now, what do you have to do to have this incredible opportunity um, be a part of your life? It's very simple. Contribu contribute five meanings to what we're calling the story of being. It doesn't make sense now, but it's quite simple. Um, and that's how we're going to try and reward uh, whoever partakes in this and gives the real talent time. This might be adjusted, but for now, this is the intention and the kind of spirit behind um, the prizes and to make it a sustainable effort even beyond winning them. This is trying to start up something new long term with this incredible influence that will self-perpetuate in a meaningful way. Now we're going to drop down from 16 to 15 triggers because by this point you might be wondering, okay, well now we know why we're doing this. We know the audacity and there's a little bit of a compensation model. What do we actually have to do? When we showed this idea to a few Oxford scholars and a few people who worked at NASA and very high potential individuals, they were still overwhelmed. And we thought, okay, we're going to make it as simple as possible by not really talking about the theory. We're going to say, what do you actually have to do in practice to contribute to this is very simple. We broke it down to a three-step process that has to do with the Nobel Literature Prize. We're going to be writing that story of being that we were talking about previously in the spirit license. So number one is you're going to select the story that you're going to contribute your talents to. Number two is you're going to schedule a game to play with other people to write a sentence of that story. And then number three is you're actually going to play the game. There are screenshots of each template, but if you click on them, it gives you a link 
um, to start accessing the stories. So there's four examples of stories to contribute to. The first one is called the story of being, and you can click on it, and you can see that people can split their own versions off the main story branch. But we're going to go to the peer branch, story 1.0, and you're going to see there's these polished papers at each of these competency levels, one, two, three, four, five. The competency one level has to do with the easiest level. It's like a lullaby, it's for uh, children. And then number two is the teenager, number three is the undergraduate, number four is the uh, master's of PhD, and then the fifth is a very high level of competency. So this is the, this is the finished story that the collective effort of the teams create. So you can come in here and you can start looking for games or you can say, I want to contribute to this story in a certain way. Here's the sentences. And you can go and start scheduling. So if we close the story, once you decide which one you're going to contribute to, you can go to the scheduling sheet. And if you have the presentation sent to you, uh, all you do is you click on the link and it opens up the scheduling document. So there's a lot going on here. But for this step, you don't have to pay attention to that. All you have to do is go here and look to see if there's a game you want to join at the competency level that you want and see if it's open or if it's full or if it's passed. So you're gonna see for the date, you're gonna look at the date, you're gonna look at the time, and this is worldwide, so make sure you know it's in universal standard time or maybe it'll convert to your time zone. We'll see what, uh, how Google Sheets handles it. You're gonna say what story you wanna to contribute to. Then there's an actual game sheet that you'll be playing on. There's something called a fun literature, which is the form you have to play to uh, to get on the Nobel Prize. There's a criteria you have to meet. What language you're gonna play in, what com competency level, some extra things you don't understand and don't need to understand right now. Um, but when all these last couple of columns are green, that means this game is ready to go. Um, so you can put your name uh, in any of these where they need players. So you can click here and say, okay, if you wanna be player one, then don't put your real name, put a screen name, something like you know Spirit Man or whatever you wanna do. Um, because right now, uh, anonymity is a very important part of this. And there's other specific rules, which you'll learn more about. But at a minimum, you schedule a, great, a game like this. Uh, or you can create a new column down here, and you can just add a game with your own criterion. But in the beginning, um, all you have to do is join games. And so you can either click on joining the game at the appropriate time here on the scheduling sheet. Um, or you can go and create your own template uh, here and then link it to the scheduling sheet so that other people can join you. So this is the most advanced version of the sheet and it's very overwhelming at first but the game is quite simple. You have the rules you have to meet here. There's the cycle of the game, uh, the players of the game here where the, the points are tracked as people each have a turn. There's really only two rules. Rule number one is that at each turn, each player can only do one of three things. They can add a word, modify a word that is already in the sentence, or remove a word. Then rule number two is they have to justify that change um, with, and it's a, a way to create a, a different kind of team dynamic. But with each uh, turn, here's where the sentence is being built for the story. And to be Nobel Prize worthy, uh, this yellow square has to do with these universal categories. Um, you just have to make sure these words are in the sentence, whether they're understood or not, um, to do something truly novel for the Nobel Literature Prize. But you can see each word has its own column because each word is being tracked for what are called meanings. And so the more meanings are behind each word, the more valuable and more meaningful universally the sentence becomes. And in terms of art and literature, the Nobel Prizes are given to people who create the most universally engaging meanings that when readers of all types of experiences have, they can see themselves in it in a meaningful way that contains usually uh, wisdom or a new reflection on reality. Or if it is a particular perspective, um, it is appealing to universal themes. So that's not always true, but for the most part, that's what makes great art. And you can see for every word, um, we have these meanings adding up at the end, where in this sentence we have, I think, roughly 14. And so the higher we get this number of meanings, um, the better and more likely the sentence will be contributing to the story and submitted to the Nobel Literature 
uh, committee. Um, so you can see the number, there's 18 words in this one, and um, you can learn more about this process as you go along. The more meanings you give, they're beside your player name, um, and there's different levels that you can play this at. So that's basically all that you have to do to get on the Nobel, uh, uh, the Nobel Prize Initiative with the New World Spirit. One, two, three, and you have to commit about five of those meanings to the story and have them accepted. If a sentence beats out your sentence, your, sen your meanings might disappear, so you have to play the game again and reestablish. As more and more people play the game, um, the sentences should become a higher quality, um, but basically that's all you have to do. Very simple. It's it looks like it's not a Nobel Prize worthy, but there's a lot more behind the scenes than meets the eye. We've just made it simple so that anybody of any grade, any education level, anywhere in the world, even if they're illiterate, can get help to participate in this process because we're trying to make it uh, as universal as, uh, as possible for this new world spirit. Now, don't worry if you don't understand everything in the templates. The good news is that there's an executor, they're called, somebody who runs these meetings and keeps track of the turns, and they're more trained, and they will make sure that the template gets filled out. You don't necessarily have to fill this out when you're new. As people examine the sentences on their own, they're going to start doing this um, on their own. But in the beginning, there's supposed to be one person who is basically the moderator and leads people to make their contributions, where they might not even look at this screen, but it will be on the, the screen so that they can see the sentence as it's being built so you don't have to keep it in memory. So don't worry about that part. It really is as simple as we could possibly make it, and it's really just as simple as playing a game. The theory we'll get into in a few more slides. Now, why are we dropping another trigger? We went from 15 down to 14, and it's because it's very triggering to some individuals who see this, where we're trying to say that there is a single thread uniting all the sciences and not only the sciences but literature and art as well and so the liberal arts are also included in this science and at first it seems bombastic but a true theory of everything a true universal science which is simultaneously an art and that art becomes a science is a notion that has followed humanity since the beginning of recorded history where human beings want to know what is really out there what is the truth and this feat of uniting all the sciences together in one systematic whole would not have been possible without a breakthrough in the greatest philosopher to have potentially ever lived or at least has written one of the most difficult works to ever have been written by a human being that has endeavored to unite all the disciplines of knowledge uh, into one whole. And that philosopher is Georg Wilhelm Friedrich Hegel. So for the past 200 years, this uh, philosopher has not been truly understood. It's very polarizing, but this breakthrough discovery has shown that there is a universality running through all the domains of knowledge and that universal domain is a special kind of logic that we now are beginning to understand and is Nobel Prize worthy. So to begin with you can see that each of the Nobel Prizes um, covers an aspect of the science and they all have their own unique graphic which we'll be explaining uh, in more depth. But to go quickly, all we're providing here is not the full answers. We actually have to win these prizes together in order to win um, the Economics and Peace Prize. So even though we could take more time and maybe in smaller teams or even in individuals figure these out alone, uh, the direction is so powerful that it would be better to do it together. So these are directions and ideas that are not fully flushed out, but those who are specialized in these fields will start to recognize that there is real novelty here uh, and that what Hegel was doing was actually the same as what 130 three philosophers in history were doing and that modern science is still trying to do 200 years after he had written his master works. But this slide is just to introduce the concept of universality. So the thing that is running through all of them is really 
universal logic in different forms. So in physics, it's a universal physics, which will explain the origins of the universe and the Hawking hurdle no boundary problem and mathematics that show the timelessness, spacelessness problem. Um, I'm getting into Julian Barber's shape dynamics, which we'll talk about more. But then there's universal evolution in chemistry, universal healthcare, universal flow, universal beauty and meaning, and then universal peace. So those that want to believe in a in a more fragmented version that these kind of theories of everything aren't really possible, there are human artifices, um, this might be a little bit jarring. So we're losing a trigger on that. But for anyone else who has a little bit more open mind, um, this might be very intriguing that there is a new form of science coming on the scene um, that is not of a finite science, it is of what is called infinite science. And if your uh, academic side is skeptical, remember there is the... Uh, the abstracts, the more academic abstracts up here in the top corner to sort of uh, present this in a more academic, rig rigorously academic way. But the rest of the slides will start to get into each one more in depth. And if you are only uh, interested in your specialty, you might want to skip the other ones um, because it'll start to become more triggering. So if you are more specialized, go to the slide that fits uh, your expertise and then see if there is something novel here that you recognize uh, from your training and from your extensive knowledge in the field. Welcome to the physics explanation, which will hopefully win and set the direction for the Nobel Physics Prize, and we're going to call it Spirit Physics. Uh, really, we lost one trigger, but there should probably be two triggers because there's two types of people who will look at this and say this is ridiculous. So it will be the people who read this first uh, quote and then also the people who are skeptical of Julian Barber's direction on physics. So let's read the quote together. It goes, New this is from uh, Hegel, by the way, uh, his Encyclopedia Logic, his Lesser Logic, uh, paragraph 98 in the beginning. And he's explaining... Um, really what the point of his view on metaphysics really is in a scientific sense, which is quite triggering because in modern uh, science, we don't ever think of metaphysics as playing a role. But part of the breakthrough on, on Hegel is that the way we think about metaphysics actually plays an interesting role that wasn't previously understood. And it doesn't reduce the academic merit, it fulfills it in a certain way. And it resolves a few paradoxes that we're running into with physics. So he says, Newton gave physics an express warning to beware of metaphysics. It is true, but to his honor be it said, he did not by any means obey his own warning. The only mere physicists are the animals. They alone do not think, while man is a thinking being and a born metaphysician. So he's not insulting physicists here. He's just saying that when we consider what physics is, we don't normally think of it as a metaphysical activity, but it is because a thinking being has to partake in the universal laws uh, that govern the universe and animals can't do that. Animals are too physical. So when you treat a physicist as just a physical, a man that is, or a woman that is, or beyond, um, that is, investigating the universe in a physical way, they're actually using pure thought to uncover the universal laws or, that are behind the sensuousness, the, the physicality of it. And animals can't do that. Animals really are just physical and not consciously thinking beings that can grasp these pure thoughts. And so he's making a little bit of a joke, clear on words. Um, but he's really saying something profound to you, that he's, he's critiquing one of the greatest physicists of history. And now we know that uh, Newton has a limited linear kind of physics that Einstein later came in and showed the limit of, that general relativity uh, subsumes Newtonian mechanics as a special case within the greater uh, standard model of physics today. But he goes on to say, the real question is not whether we shall apply metaphysics, but whether our metaphysics are of the right kind. In other words, whether we or not, or whether we are not instead of the concrete logical idea, adopting one-sided forms of thought, rigidly fixed by understanding, and making these the basis of our theoretical as well as our practical work. 
It is on this ground that one objects to the atomic philosophy. So this is where Einstein actually did uh, overcome or transcend the limits of Newton, is that there was a one-sided fixity in the conceptualization of the physical world that Newton was doing, um, that Einstein in his famous space-time equations and e equals mc squared had overcome. So instead of treating space and time as separate abstractions or one-sidedness, as Hegel was saying here, uh, Einstein came and said, no, they're actually connected. They're actually one thing called space-time. And that was just because he changed the way that he thought and conceptualized the world, and that directly affected the mathematical models, the qualitative nature of the models. And then Einstein did it again with phys uh, energy and matter where his equals mc squared, of course, is quite famous. Um, but again, it's just an overcoming of abstract one-sidednesses where energy and matter are treated as oppositions and not as unities that belong together interchangeably as fluid moments of each other, which is exactly what the equality in e equals mc squared shows mathematically rigorously through uh, Einstein's genius in these new conceptualizations. So Hegel is pointing out that all of our thoughts are doing this and that a true uh, physicist and actually is metaphysical about the nature of the pure thoughts behind the conceptualizations of the mathematical models we're using and that when we operate from a place of abstract thinking we end up in newtonian types of models that end up in contradictions or paradoxes that later have to be resolved by these more uh, properly metaphysical thoughts which he calls dialectical thoughts for anybody who studied hegel in a philosophical manner so how does this apply and how is this useful to physics today in terms of pushing the frontiers of uh, universal laws? And this is where Julian Barber comes in, in addition to Einstein and Mach. So we're uniting the work of these three, uh, or these four titans of history. And many people might not know Mach, but if you study Julian Barber, he, of course, figures out that there was an opposition between Einstein and Mach that Einstein respected. In fact, Mach, Ernst Mach was one of the few physicists that Einstein really respected and um, tried to figure out what he called Mach's principle in that the way we conceptualize motion in inertial frames is problematic because Newton had given these absolute reference frames or these, these absolute notions of space in Galilean uh, inertial frames. Uh, so Mach was trying to sort of transcend this by saying, no, it's all relative, but it has to be on a, a holistic scale. The entire universe is um, governing the motions between bodies by the relative positions. And Julian Barber realized um, through studying Leibniz, who Hegel overcame and transcended as well in his own philosophy, that something profound occurs when we take that Machian principle and really think it and conceptualize it in this metaphysical kind of uh, dialectical way instead of in these rigid ways. And so we end up with one of the graphics from Julian Barber, which is a fiber bundle, he calls these. And what he's showing here is there's a shape space that is actually the true characteristic of the entire universe and that everything that we think is space and time in motion is not actually changing the shape of the universe they're gauge transforms they're indifferent transforms of the shape and so he realized this because if it, if we think about absolutism the the changes of the universe must occur in a way that complexity is increasing in terms of the shape of the universe and that all these other transforms aren't essential they are what we think is time but he's not just saying that complexity or time is a function of complexity he's saying time literally is complexity and complexity literally is time and astonishingly hegel says something profoundly similar except that he's he surpassed Leibniz's um, ideas and that Julian Barber might not realize it but he is actually repeating what Hegel has said in his metaphysical science of logic but also in his philosophy of nature 
And of course, Hegel's philosophy of nature needs to be updated. But we now understood what he was doing in terms of the science of logic, um, explaining the true conceptualization of how we should think about space, time, motion, and gravity. And of course, the big, the big abstraction right now of the current standard model, the current uh, physical model, is between general relativity and quantum field theory where we can't seem to unite the very big with the very small in terms of time and gravity. Those two variables seem to be in paradox or in contradiction, just like how general relativity and special relativity had to overcome the contradictions of Newtonian uh, physics and what appeared to be non-local dynamics with the limitations on the speed of light. But this new conceptualization that Hegel introduces is what Julian Barber is repeating in still an abstract form, but the roots of it are true, that the universe is not uh, succumbing to a heat death in the inflationary model of the universe, but complexity is actually increasing if we think about it correctly, and that human beings are the sum total of this shape changing, these real shape changes beyond the gauge transforms, the invariant transforms of what he considers unessential to the true nature of the universe because the absolute doesn't have a limit outside of itself uh, to compare itself to. So it has to be relative to itself, and that's the Machian principle, that the whole is in the parts and the parts are in the whole. And Hegel has a whole dialectic on this, actually, and understood this principle very well. So what Hegel has done is he has basically what he calls transcended or sublated, not just uh, um, Einstein or Mach, but he actually sublated the tension between them. And he's actually ahead of what Julian Barber is doing, but Julian Barber is putting his, this new conceptualization into math, modern mathematical form. And that's the goal, is to put basically Hegel's science of logic and what he's trying to do in, uh, in a more nascent physics into modern physics and modern mathematical models to prove that these more dialectical conceptualizations will result in magnitudes of insight equivalent to equals mc squared and time-space models from the prior Newtonian abstract models. So he's uniting Mach, Einstein, and Julian Barber before they realized that they were oppositions that were driving them apart. In the diagram, we can see that these yellow orbs are Hegel's science of logic. These are the universal categories of pure thought. This is the metaphysics um, that he's talking about in this quote up here. And so Julian Barber is pointing to this metaphysical space, saying it's outside of what we consider normal space-time and that it solves the problem of time and gravity that is keeping general relativity and uh, quantum field theory apart. Hegel says that these gauge transforms are actually described by what he, by what he calls uh, quantity, pure quantity, and that this notion of pure being in pure quantity is what we consider space. But then space through these, uh, I guess, super sensuous processes these shape processes that Julian Barber is talking about are what create the negation of space into time and that the repeating of them is what motion is. It's not separate from space-time. And that matter is the, is the determinate being of the pure becoming and pure nothing of space-time. And so that's all that matter really is. When we zoom in and we keep finding subatomic particles, eventually we really do just find apparently these shapes at the end of it all. Uh, there's like an infinite regression that happens because the gauge transforms aren't essential. So we can see that Hegel's science of logic really is explaining these universal shapes uh, behind these particular shapes of the universe. And then it continues to the one and the many where uh, Hegel says gravity starts to form, general gravitation starts to form, and then being for itself is the, the shape that uh, centers of gravity and body dynamics start to come into play where we we abstractly consider them uh, inertias. And he's very against the way we conceptualize inertia, which we are now finding is the root of a lot of the contradictions in the models we have today. So it's very interesting to find that Hegel seemed to solve these problems and these paradoxes uh, 200 years ago. Nobody just seemed to understand the true profound depth of his conceptual universe. But then something else is very profound that uh, Julian Barber says, he speaks that speaks about ratios and that we have to return to the importance of ratios in determining how we do our physics. 
and in his section on quantity in the doctrine of being, uh, Hegel says the exact same thing, that really everything is in ratio, including the true conceptualization of the infinitesimal. The infinitesimal is not a quantitative determination. Uh, that's a mistake that Newton had made along with Leibniz and everybody else that tried to explain philosophically what that amount or that, that uh, concept meant in terms of why we can just get rid of it when we uh, ignore it in integral calculus and derivative calculus or in derivatives and integrals. And he said they conceptualized it wrong, which is why the explanations were never satisfactory on a metaphysical level, on a logical level. And he says it's because they were conflating this shape space. So qualitative changes and quantitative changes belong in different parts of the, the logic in different parts of this shape space, which we'll call sublation space because the movement from one supercentrist shape to another is what Hegel calls sublation. The universe is in this growing manner. And that's exactly how Julian Barber describes his origin of the universe with this Janus point concept that complexity is actually increasing in a growing manner, which directly aligns with what Hegel calls sublation. But the true nature of the infinitesimal that is philosophically and conceptually satisfying is that they are conflating two shapes. One is uh, pure being and then the pure quantity. So the infinitesimal is not a quantity, Hegel says. It's not an infinite reduction, a quality that's infinitely approximating a limit. He says there's just no quantity there at all. It really is just the ratio of two qualities, two moments of pure becoming. And when you make that kind of change, all the other explanations are superfluous because we're dealing with completely different shapes. Um, so ratios are very important. In fact, ratio uh, occurs in the word rationality because Hegel states that real thinking, really deep speculative thought, real physicists think in this dialectical rationality and that he has this famous quote, what is rational is actual and what is actual is rational, precisely because these abstract notions of these mixed shapes are preventing us from creating mathematical models that transcend the paradoxes that are keeping general relativity and quantum field theory apart because those are just quantitative categories. They're very large and very small and we're conceptualizing it wrong, which means we're conceptualizing gravity wrong and we're conceptualizing inertia wrong and motion and all of these uh, principles incorrectly. So as the logic grows, so does the shape space and the gauge transforms can change correspondingly. So the interesting part here also to show is if it doesn't look like Hegel's theory, uh, mathematics or his, his conceptualization is rel uh, relevant today, there are two quotes here uh, showing precisely where Hegel beat Einstein to space-time. He says space and time are not mutually external and contingent, but constitute a single determination. So he did that 70 years or so before Einstein. And then he's uh, predicting what the indifferent gauge transforms of Julian Barber and Leibniz and, and Mach uh, are talking about um, in terms of absolute indifference and only admitting of qualitative distinction. So when we read the, the, the sections of Hegel carefully, his logic is profoundly ahead of not only his time, but still today is relevant in terms of being ahead of some of our greatest thinkers that didn't grasp the true miraculous concreteness of the logic that Hegel was truly espousing in his physics and basically all other domains that we're gonna cover after this one. It's the same process, the same, same uh, shape space in all the other Nobel Prize categories. So this is the first theory uh, that we're speaking about and I hope that anybody who's been studying this finds it very gratifying or interesting and pointing in a direction where we can extend Julian Barber's work or maybe accelerate it by filling in the gaps um, to his mathematical models um, that solve some of the paradoxes that are still plaguing the math because the math is based on improper qualitative distinctions. Um, so if we get a few more people this direction, uh, we believe is very promising for the new world spirit. Welcome to the shape chemistry uh, slide, of which we hope will set the direction for a Copernican revolution in chemistry to help win the Nobel Chemistry Prize in order to introduce a new world spirit. Now we're dropping from 13 triggers down to 12 uh, from the prior slide on physics, uh, because there are some people who are gonna get triggered by this version of chemistry 
because one, we're referencing Hegel here, who is a philosopher uh, 200 years ago that had a fairly what we would consider a simplistic or even atrocious uh, version of a philosophy of nature. And then he doesn't seem to be saying very much about this chemistry stuff. So that's one trigger. And there's technically another one in terms of a lack of mathematics and maybe uh, rigor in terms of this new conceptualization, uh, how we're going to change the way we fundamentally think about chemistry in terms of shape dynamics and build off of what we were covering in the physics slide about Julian Barber's uh, Janus point and uh, the mathematics behind time being complexity literally and trying to bring that into a higher form of evolution that doesn't require gauge transforms he calls it so what we covered in the last slide though that does still provide an interesting and profound sense of value around chemistry is that really conceptualization is the problem right now modern uh, science in all the domains has reached such an incredible level of sophistication in some ways that there's contradictions starting to emerge in some of our highest models that can't seem to be resolved from within the models themselves or not yet anyway so the inner contradictions usually come from a limited form of consciousness, a limited form of framing the phenomenon that we're trying to describe in reality. And that's where we're sort of at in bridging uh, chemistry with more fundamental physics in terms of general relativity, quantum mechanics, uh, quantum chemistry, stuff like this. But let's start here on this side. There's a lot in this slide. Uh, but let's start here and say, first of all, there's something we're going to call shape chemistry, where... At the beginning of the universe, Julian Barber and his team are talking about central configurations. And this sort of sets the, the boundary conditions, you could say, for what kind of evolution, what kind of complexity starts to emerge out of these initial conditions. And what's incredible is that these kinds of central configurations and the way that he's conceptualizing uh, a growing universe very much approximates this kind of living spirit, this living kind of energy that Hegel talks about. And we're going to turn this into a universal kind of evolution, the eternal true life that maybe Christianity or other religions were talking about in the past, which if you're an academic will be very triggering. Um, but hang in there. The trigger also uh, is for this sort of religious conceptualization which doesn't normally go in chemistry, but the profound bridge here is that it's all the same logic. You talk about it spiritually, or you talk about it uh, in physics or lit literature or any of the prizes. Uh, so this universal evolution is actually the same thing that Julian Barber's team is covering with shape dynamics in terms of increasing, monotonically increasing complexity. From the start of the universe, um, this Janus point to today's level of complexity which is not a decreasing entropy or a, not an increasing entropy and a de decreasing complexity in a heat death but actually we are gaining the potentialities are gaining complexity and what we're, we're going to try and use here too at the beginning is that there's a hawking hartle no boundary problem where stephen hawking and uh, this hartle guy we're using the mathemat modern mathematics to show the, the end conclusions we would receive if we took the math back to the beginning of the universe. And what ends up happening is that the universe becomes paradoxical, that the, before the Big Bang, it's really just timeless spacelessness. It's something you can't approximate in, in any way. It's a singularity of some kind that has no dimensions to it. So the mathematics breaks down, or at least the current conceptualization. And so what you see here is uh, a new type of thinking about the beginning, a new conceptualization, which we saw Einstein did with physics, and it had profound implications for space-time and energy and matter as equivalent. The same kind of thing is going to happen uh, by shifting how we think about the beginning, how it derives itself into higher forms of chemistry. So this slide here is from uh, Flavio Marcati's presentation about a year ago on approximating black hole singularities using shape dynamic mathematics. So his team is trying to convert the abstract kind of math that we have 
into a more conceptually rigorous uh, kind by getting rid of unessentialities like like uh, sh uh, shape size. So gauge transforms, time itself, all these abstractions they're trying to get rid of and then reconstruct all these phenomenological structures, meanable and mathematical structures into this more elegant solution that's more fundamental and based on the true shapes of what, what governs the universe and the math that we're trying to approximate and solves these contradictions between general relativity and, and um, quantum field theory. So in this graphic, Flavio is showing a singularity, a map of these potentials and how they're trying to show a continuity through the singularity to the other side of the universe of this Janus point. Because when the universe starts up, according to Julian Barber, there's two types or there's two sides to it. And in a way, it's very dialectical. Basically, it's pointing at the dialectic, even though there might be an infinite amount of central configurations, because it's, according to Hegel, uh, it's in it's in contrast to the divine idea or the perfect idea or perfect reason, the real laws of the universe, which is really just shape dynamics. So in this way, they're trying to show that, well, if we can show a continuity through the, the, the singularity of the Big Bang, then we can show that there's you know, mathematical evidence to show the Janus point really exists. And it isn't just this abstract singular point that goes nowhere. Um, so really, it, what's important here is not whether the, the continuity through the singularity is occurring, it's just showing that we can translate all the mathematics that we know into shape dynamic mathematics. And the same kind of translation is what we're going to do for chemistry. So the big thing to take away from here is that Hegel is ahead of the game in terms of showing that what comes before the sort of created universe, sensuousness, is really a timeless spacelessness that the hawking hartle problem was talking about in terms of the breakdown of modern mathematics. But then there's Tim Kozlowski, also in these uh, shape dynamic presentations from about a year ago, was also trying to decouple these unessential forms of, of conceptualizing the universe uh, and trying to rebuild shape evolution, which you can see is parallel to this universal kind of evolution. That team is really just repeating what Hegel said 200 years ago, except they're not using what uh, what we would call shape language yet. They're still using abstract mathematics to approximate, which means they're reducing, which is a sort of interesting thing. Because Hegel often says to get to the real shape of things, the real truth, the real consciousness of things, you actually have to, there's a simplicity to it, where you actually have to um, attach yourself from all the excess debris all the sort of Tower of Babylon, finite human thinking, or we get you know ignorance building on ignorance um, that leads to contradictions. We need to sort of decouple that way of thinking from uh, the true way of thinking by grasping the simplicity of these universal shapes. And Hegel uh, lays them out in the science of logic, which is the evolution in this timeless spacelessness before the hawking hartle problem sparks the the universe the created universe and then we see this repeating universal evolution from the science of logic so what they're trying to approximate with mathematics is really the infinite contingency of the beginning singularity which is why the constants of the universe are all seemingly random is because in contrast to the perfect idea which has no none of these sort of approximations they're universal categories they're universally approximating themselves perfectly which is of course a paradox but there could be an infinite amount of these configurations because it's literally an, op an infinite opposition between the universals and what we would call the hyperverse, many created worlds and many different con central configurations repeating this universal evolution. So the only thing that stays the same uh, in terms of the evolving complexity of physics into chemistry is really this universal evolution of pure thought forms that are eternal and they're true beyond all these uh, kind of more less elegant approximations that we call the current laws of the universe. So this, these decouplings, um, whether with Flavio uh, or with Tim here, um, are very profound to try and show this evolving complexity. But Hegel already short, sort of did it in pure, pure uh, shape language in his science of logic. So we are just going to try this decoupling and reapproximate how these universals uh, evolve using our sensuous configurations. And then I think we will have a confirmation of what Hegel has said about them. 
but his science of logic could greatly speed up this conceptualization. This is very important. And what's very interesting and shocking in a way, very synchronistic, is that one of the other presenters talks about Kepler's third law as being a great example of how to do this decoupling between the abstract kind of mathematics we have today and into this more concrete conceptualization, sort of like what Einstein was doing with, with equals empty squared and space-time, where he was collapsing the abstractions, the one-sidednesses of our variables and showing that they're, that they're dynamic unities. So what Kepler did that was amazing, not only to uh, Julian Barber's team and uh, Tim and Flavio and Sean and these guys uh, that are studying this today, that Hegel also narrowed in on Kepler, Kepler's third law here as sublime. He called it sublime because what it's showing is that in the observable universe, we have dynamic bodies changing uh, as in orbits around a central body. But what is profound is that if you track the period and square it divided by the sort of radius of the orbits it and cube it, it, it has the same ratio, like 0 0.4, no matter what the planets are. So there's something staying the same in all the dynamic sensuous is changing. And so this is a great example Hegel uses, but also now the shape dynamic team is catching on that shapes operate the same kind of way. And Hegel's showing in his uh, section in the Science of Logic on quantity, he's really focusing in on how he Kepler's conception of the universe was this decoupling. It was the proper concrete way, the shape dynamic way of thinking about the universe, that if we would have listened to him, we'd probably be a lot farther in terms of um, phys uh, physics and chemistry than we are. Um, because chemical models are based off of a lot of these laws now um, and some of the emergent phenomena that happens in chemistry, but they're disconnected in some way. And so what happened though in history, Hegel say, states, is that one of the greatest transfers of fame, one of the most unjustified transfers of fame has ever, that has ever occurred in, in science um, occurred between Kepler and Newton. So Newton came after and sort of overshadowed Kepler. But it's great to see that this, the shape dynamic team is catching on to the proper way to look at and conceptualize um, physics so that we can get to this decoupling which reaches chemistry and then we put chemistry, chemical forms, uh, not just into quantum chemistry but into shape chemistry, shape chemistry, uh, chemistry shape mathematics using Hegel's shape centers, what he calls perhaps these kind of sing these logical singularities um, where in his philosophy of nature, he talks a lot about the center of gravity of bodies evolving out of these more primitive shapes. And it's actually in terms of the pure logic, the pure shape is called being for self, which the uh, Julian Barber team has not yet quite uncovered because they're using more of a Leibnizian model. But Hegel had gone past Leibniz to uncover these universal determinations. So we, we kind of show... the. Um, there's a really interesting talk by David Sloan where he's saying that this completely new way of thinking about the universe gets, gets close to this being for self because he notices that uh, you can get rid of these abstract notions of time and even, and even gravity by introducing these sort of quadratic frictions. And what's interesting is that one of the few things that Hegel talks about is essential that we need to talk about even in shape language is this concept of friction. Um, but what's interesting is that uh, David Sloan says it leads to a, a radical and counterintuitive conclusion, which is that the universe might be uh, operating like an open system when we've always assumed it has to be a closed system. So there's a contradiction here where it's like quacking like a duck, but it's not walking like a duck, or there's some kind of contradiction going on here where this friction, his math with the friction components is leading to this weird, what we would call, what Hegel would call a speculative moment where we're realizing the limits of our prior models by embracing moments that were previously opposite as actually belonging together in moments, in true ratios, uh, as Julian Barber likes to focus in on. The real truth is ratio, rational thinking. So here's a quote from Hegel where he's actually talking about this friction and a lot of people read and think, well, why is this, you know, friction is not really one of the most profound concepts. It's very simple, actually. Bodies touch and they, they lose energy in a simplistic way. I, 
I'm not the expert in terms of the mathematics, but I, I'm showing that this bridge between Hegel and what they're doing, this process of recognizing, is itself profound and novel. Because that's the hard thing that uh, human consciousness has not yet evolved to achieve, and we're on the cusp of achieving. But Hegel had already uh, done this in spades um, in the past. So here's his quote on, on what David Sloan might be uh, catching on to. Um, he says, that is why it is an empty abstraction to assume in mechanics that a body set in motion would continue to move in a straight line to infinity if external resistance did not rob it of its motion. So he's talking about um, Newton's laws, right? And so he says, uh, friction or whatever other form resistance takes is only the manifestation of centrality. Like we mentioned over here, these singularities, these shape centers are actually what he's saying is responsible um, not only for gravity, but also friction. And he says, for his centrality that uh, in an absolute manner brings the body back to itself. For the thing in contact with which the moving body meets, friction has the power of resistance solely through the union with the center. And then he gives a really profound example, which this team hasn't uh, grasped yet. But because these shapes are really universal, they occur at different levels of complexity. They're like repeating. So he says, in the spiritual sphere, which if you're an atheist also means in the, in the sphere of concrete mind, proper rational thinking, um, the center and unity with the center assumes higher forms, but the unity of the notion and its reality, which here to begin with uh, is mechanical centrality, must here too constitute the basic determination. So in your mind, you also have a being for self occur and there's a center to consciousness itself. But in terms of this lower level of just chemistry and physics, it, it is embodied by what we normally call in abstract consciousness, friction. So it's very prescient of David to start noticing this and that it's leading to this open system um, kind of thinking. Now, before we get into why this is profound in terms of open system thinking and closed system thinking, it might be laughable that we're trying to approximate what Hegel wrote 200 years ago to what these brilliant individuals are doing with modern mathematics and um, uh, forms of, of, of uh, well, math that didn't exist 200 years ago, not even close. But I provide these two other quotes here from Hegel's uh, writing to show that he was aware of the limits of his thinking. But what he's doing is so profound and transcendental in a certain sense, a speculative sense, that um, he's, he's showing why it's easy to misinterpret the simplicity the, the amazing clarity behind the simplicity with the, with the lack of sophistication of the sensuous symbols. So at the very beginning of philosophy, he says we have Thales. And Thales was a philosopher before the pre-Socratics. And he says uh, he had this principle of water being universal. Everything was water to Thales. And he says this was actually the beginning of philosophy in an abstract sense. The, ver the first shape basically started being noticed or recognized in water through this Thales individual. And so this looks laughable because now we know that water isn't the true universal. It's not the principle of all things, right? Um, it's just one of the, the elements. And now we have the periodic table and we know that there's many elements. Um, and they're not all just water, right? Water is a molecule. And these guys didn't know this uh, in the past. But look what he says here that is profound and why it's relevant today and why chemistry can, can take from him still in terms of the logic underneath the universal shapes and the shape language. So he says, water thus has not, not got a sensuous universality, but a speculative one merely. To be speculative universality, however, would necessitate its being notion and having what is sensuous removed. Here we have the strife between sensuous universality and universality of the notion. So this is uh, important because the notion is really the ultimate shape in a certain way. It is this dynamic moving shape logic um, at, at the highest form of concreteness. Uh, so when, we, when we're doing math, when we're doing this true new conceptualization of it, chemistry, physics, biology, they all have to be in terms of their notion, the shape type of logic, which we can then you know, couple back into normal thinking, we can still get the same mathematics. It's not a complete antith antithesis, it's just more fundamental. But in order to grasp this notion, you have to get past the sensuousness, what uh, Julian Barber and his team are calling gauge transforms or invariant um, uh, size transforms. Uh, and then he's saying that these, the ordinary way of thinking about things like Thales 
he was trying, he was grasping the non-sensuous shape. He was, he was recognizing something, but he was misaligning sensuous universality for this universality of the true notion, the, the invisible kind that is just the pure logic that's governing the laws of the universe in their approximate modes um, from whatever central configuration they started from. If I'm using that term correctly, it's approximate, but uh, he says the real essence of nature has to be defined, that is, nature has to be expressed as the simple essence of thought. So because we're dealing with timeless spacelessness, we're dealing with pure, a pure conceptual realm. Uh, the pure laws of shapes thinking themselves imminently spontaneously uh, in this universal kind of evolution and so he's saying what we're what what we're really bad at in science and what this decoupling is showing is that, is that we we need to decouple the sensuous universalities the abstract ways of thinking from this uni truly universal way of thinking to get to the true laws of the universe and that's what using real rational thought is um, so he says the simple proposition of Thales, therefore, is philosophy. And the reason why he's saying this is that most people look at uh, Thales now and they scoff and they laugh and joke about him that there's nothing in his philosophy that's really eternal or worth preserving. He's not really a philosopher. He's just doing bad empiricism. But when you really know how philosophy begins with sheep, he says, no, he was the, he was the one, first one to grasp it in the sensuous. He just couldn't separate them. He couldn't decouple them. Um, but it was the beginning of that decoupling process in terms of philosophy, but they just didn't realize it yet. Um, so he says, because in, uh, in it water, though sensuous, is not looked at in its particularity as opposed to other natural things, but as thought in which everything is resolved and comprehended. Thus we approach the divorce of the absolute from the finite, which is exactly what David, Tim, Flavio, Julian, that's what their team is doing when they're saying decoupling. It's just that Hegel did it in a, an incredibly pure sense, which could help govern the conceptualization, can speed up the conceptualization so that their team can speed up which models they want to apply and stop maybe wasting time um, doing these random combinations um, to try and figure out which ones result in the current mathematics from the shape. Uh, from the shape conceptualization. So hopefully this sh shaves down some time because Hegel knew exactly what he was doing and we're really bad at it. But he was at least a little bit ahead of the curve and I think this can speed things up. So now here's another example. It doesn't seem like uh, Hegel really knew what he was doing. A little bit uh, newer in history. So, you know, philosophy evolves after Thales and it goes through uh, Heraclitus and Socrates and quite a few philosophers, about 133, uh, we arrive sort of at the chemistry stage of philosophy when, when um, it starts to kind of purify itself. And he mentions Paracelsus, who is a pretty famous doctor, I think, or, or some kind of chemical biology. Um, I think it was a doctor, actually, uh, that was kind of famous for some of his his sagacity but some of it looks pretty boneheaded to us now where he was saying you know he says you know in terms of ancient thinking and the four elements which you know ancient thinking didn't realize that there was more than four elements uh, Paracelsus uh, said that it consists of our bodies consist of mercury uh, mercury or liquid sulfur or oil and salt and with many other ideas of this kind it is to be remarked first that it is easy to refute these names if one understands by them only the particular empirical substances. Uh, so he's saying again, when Paracelsus is saying mercury or sulfur or oil, these are the sensuous empirical, empirical substances. These are like the initial conditions, the central configuration results of how our universe approximates the shapes. So he says, don't fall for this. He, he is doing the same thing as Thales in nascent form where these are representing universal shapes. But because Paracelsus doesn't have the science of logic, he can't separate, he can't decouple them very well, but it's a little bit more defined now. You know, Thales did it for one, Paracelsus is now doing it for four or five, and he's saying it's starting to get a little bit better, but it is easy, even his day, back in the 1800s, to laugh at what's happening here. But if you really know how to recognize shapes, you can see that the evolution is continuing. So he says, it is, however, not to be overlooked that these names were meant much more essentially to contain and to express the determinations of the concept. So whenever you see him talking about the concept, he's really talking about these universal, timeless, spaceless shapes that are governing the, the laws of the universe. So he's just kind of showing how it's very contradictory.
and we're very ignorant in a certain sense that really when we go past the the sensuous the we elevate ourselves into the infinitely far above the thoughtless investigations and chaotic nature of the body's attributes which is what people focus on when they want to make fun of paracelsus oh we're focusing on the mercury and the because the people criticizing him are so ignorant um, of the universals that they can't even recognize what he's doing. So it's very profound that Hegel has this meta-narrative while he's literally reconceptualizing the nature of the sum total of all human knowledge from scratch. And now we sort of have modern teams approximating that. Now, to, there's a lot on this slide. To make the conceptualization sort of hit home a little bit more cogently, what Julian's Barber Barber's team uh, is sort of doing, or even uh, David Sloan's team and his graduate students, with this open and closed system approximation. It sounds like their team uh, teams are very ins uh, highly inspired by Leibniz, who was a philosopher before Hegel, and he was considered one of the inventors of calculus alongside Newton. Even though Newton not only overshadowed Kepler, but also overshadowed Leibniz as well. But now that we have Leibniz's work, we're seeing that he was one of the greatest thinkers as well. But here's what they're, they're sort of starting with. I'm trying to copy this diagram over here for you. So, might be a little bit hard to read here, but really this open closed system is, is important because it is approximating one of the universal shape dynamics. And that it's, we start with the finite universe, this finite point, the singularity, whatever starts our universe, the Big Bang. Even black holes go through this. So Mercati, uh, Mercati Flavio is using this for the Big Bang, but also for all black holes, big centers of, of mass. Uh, but Hegel says this doesn't just go for them. It, it might go for literally every body. That's why gravity, we have general gravitation, is because they all have these like being for cells, developing in more concrete, complex forms. And he's saying, okay, we start with this finite universe, and then we sort of get this open universe of beyond. It's just endlessly expanding into we don't even know what. There's, you know, if everything is in the, in the universe, then where is it expanding into? It's like pure nothingness. And Hegel calls this a bad infinite. So you can look at these as points, or you can look at them as entire universals. Uh, universes are universal shapes, but they're not sensuous universes. These are logical determinations of shape space. So this is the bad infinite that uh, David Sloan and his uh, sagacity and his incredible intellect and insight is uncovering the speculative moment where we're moving from the finite to the infinite. But we have to go through this stage of a bad infinite first where we get this contradictory notion where it seems like the universe is expanding as an open system and it's not really closed. But... The missing point here, and I hope this is useful if they end up watching this, is that Hegel already beat us to the punch, and he says there's actually two types of closeness going on here, and there's an openness going on here that closes itself. So what happens is you get this dynamic moving back and forth between the finite and the beyond. There's like a certain mechanical repeating going on. But once the, real, once the shapes realize a higher complexity, the genuine infinite um, occurs where we sublate or we overcome that open system and we start to close it. But the system closes in this kind of unique way. It's like a negative, neg it's negatively closed in this genuine infinite that is an imminent within the finite and its own beyond. They're seen together, um, as sort of like a charge determinateness. Now, when we get to this, um, this genuine infinite, what ends up happening is, sorry, this, this, um, this is like a genuine infinite in the negative sense. So it's, that's why it has this dotted line here is that it's not really solid. It's like a, a relation, like a, like a pure ratio, like uh, Julian Barber's talking about between these two. It's the true ratio. Uh, but then it concretizes itself and becomes more immediate. And then we get the, the affirmative version of, of the uh, dynamic here. So... This is not working too, too great, but let me just put it here for now. And this is technically the, the immediate concretization of the system as a whole. And so this is now fully closed. This would be the, the concrete closure or the affirmative closure or the positive closure, which you could read if I wasn't overlapping them. Um, but here's where Leibniz comes in. And I'll say this last little bit to help make this click a little bit more. 
Um, this is sort of where the Leibnizian monad comes in in terms of Hegel's science of logic. So this bad infinite and genuine infinite occur sort of in the, in the third stage of his doctrine of being. So it's kind of in the beginning. This is, these are still very early forms. But in terms of the monad, it, it concretizes itself as this one. This is what we would call the one, this big yellow circle. But what ends up happening is through negation, this uh, infinite negativity. So the, the negative closure is what he calls the being for self. It's this gravity stuff. So gravity is forming from this overcoming of the open system into the negatively closed system as the negation of negation of this limit of this ratio. But then that same negation in an abstract sense takes the one once it's closed in some immediate sense. Um, it, it repels itself as this concreteness and it creates many ones. So this is the one in the many of Plato and all these older philosophers. This is the shaped logic that they were trying to approximate. But this is where we might also get many central configurations later on. Um, it doesn't happen at this point in the logic. There's much more shapes that have to be developed. But when the universe, if there are many central configurations and the hyperverse is real and the simulation theory and all that stuff is real, um, it's coming from this moment of uh, creating individual monads that are in a plurality. That means they're interpenetrating and there's no real hard boundaries. This is too abstract. So Leibniz, in terms of his universal shape logic, was grasping this moment, whereas Thales was grasp grasping the abstract universal with water and Paracelsus was uh, grasping other universals with sensuous chemicals. Um, our universe as a whole is doing this. And that's why the universal evolution would start from a sort of one, a kind of singularity, and then start developing with may, maybe many universes all at the same time. So this is what uh, Hegel was saying Leibniz was grasping that was true, but the way he conceptualized it wasn't concrete either. He was missing the order of things. Um, and he, if you want to go read uh, how Hegel sublates or transcends Leibniz and this abstractness, um, you can go and read his Science of Logic, his uh, section on quantity, and I think, uh, or his, sec his section on being for self, which then... Uh, sublates itself into quantity. So that last stage is where you'll kind of catch him making uh, praises of Leibniz, but also critiques. So the team is very, the shape dynamic team is very much based on Leibniz right now. And this might be a, a profound speed up if we shift their attention to reading some Hegel in this specific spot where Leibniz is, is particularly relevant in terms of shape logic. So that's what I would say is very uh, profound and new. Um, in terms of a Copernican revolution in chemistry. If we can change the chemistry models, the uh, quantum chemistry, and unite it with general relativity and the shapes, uh, I think we can solve a lot of contradictions that are occurring in chemistry um, across the board, universally. So I hope this is useful to somebody who's specialized in the field. To other people, it might be very boring. It might like, seem like it lacks rigor, but there's this paradox that in genuine philosophy, what is true is actually, in some sense, more elegant. It's, it has a simplicity to it, sort of like an Occam's razor, but not too simple. It's like the essence of things. It's not too simple where we're missing things, but it's not too complex that we're adding on essentialities. So hopefully this, uh, this will be Nobel Prize worthy and lead to some very interesting mathematics like David Sloan has said, under the guidance of Julian Barber and their fantastic team. And this logic uh, evolves into the next stage into, of course, as you predicted, biology. So let's go and see what this direction looks like at the next level of complexity and the next level of shape dynamics, or in terms of this universal evolution. Now we will consider the slide about spirit medicine it's the direction we're going to set to win the Nobel Physiology and Medicine Prize by setting a new Copernican revolutionary direction in psychobiology. One thing to quickly note is that we did lose two more triggers here because there are some individuals who will view this and see uh, that this holistic sort of spiritual care is a bunch of woo-woo and doesn't belong in academic medicine and actually causes more harm than good. And so they might be very triggered by this, whereas a more holistic practitioner, um, naturopaths, will 
wholly embrace this sort of new direction. And also this phenomenological piece uh, where we're uh, identifying this universal quotient of the, with the mental world and the physical world will also be quite jarring to those that don't understand that thought itself has its own structure. Now in the previous slide with chemistry and also with physics, we were talking about these shapes and that they underlie and undergird, undergird um, each level of complexity in the universe. That's going to continue here, but instead of only decoupling this logic from sensuous reality in terms of the chemical and uh, physical form, but even in terms of the biological form, we're going to go farther. Uh, that what really needs to happen here is a new kind of medicine to address the global um, sort of trend, a very concerning trend, um, that the number one or one of the top five health concerns that is increasing year after year is the trend in anxiety and depression. And so according to the World Economic Forum, depression is the number one cause of ill health and disability worldwide in rich countries and poor countries alike. And uh, we can see that mental health disorders cost the global economy one trillion in lost productivity per year. More than 300 million people suffer from depression, um, as well as uh, anxiety in general. Uh, they're all going up. So it would be Nobel Prize worthy to solve this problem in a novel way. And it re requires understanding these uh, universal shapes, but now in terms of how biology gives rise to consciousness. So putting bi biological dynamics and living systems in terms of uh, shape dynamics in this greater kind of logic is in itself very profound. But now in terms of psychology, we want to introduce a few new concepts. So number one is this idea of the universal quotient, the UQ versus the intelligence quotient, the IQ. Now this is involving uh, these graphics here, where in the previous slides, we were talking about Julian Barber's team describing the universe as open or closed. But there's also another phenomenon that needs to be uh, considered, which is the observers. The observers in a universe um, have to be within that universe. And of course, the universe as a, as a closed system means that even our phenomenology, somehow our experience of the quality of the universe also has to be contained within these shapes. Now, the big breakthrough with Hegel here is that he gives us these, um, these categories in the form of pure thought. He calls it uh, real science. And he says that the observer is in the world. This is the universe, this circle here, and the observer is inside of it. And we seem to be perceiving the world. And Kant, uh, the philosopher Kant, said that we perceive the world in a, in a poor way. We have subjective idealism where we're trying to line up the, the laws of the universe with, our, with the laws in our minds. But Hegel comes along and says, no, phenomenology is actually much more profound. The absolute truth is actually already right before us in the qualia that we use to interpret the world. Because not only are they mimicking, but they are directly replicating the science of logic in that universal shape order. These are all universal shapes. They're the size of the entire universe in higher degrees of complexity. So the sim most simple complexity is down here. And then it just continues to become, uh, the, the, so the systems become embedded systems in higher emergent shapes. And consciousness is one of these shapes, but the phenomenology, you can see the thought bubble here, is just repeating these in a reflected form. This is what consciousness is. This is what rational thought is. And when we are being rational in terms of the laws of the universe, we put them in this, or, this logical order, this super sensuous order. But in terms of the way we interpret the world phenomenologically, it also becomes more rational the way that we, when we put it more in this order. So the less of this order, this increase in complexity of these categories is, is in this truthful order, the more rational we become and the caprice of the universe is what dictates our health. And often with arbitrary irrational health, becomes, it becomes a symptom of far greater problems. It's the root causes we saw in the, in the previous slides of many disorders. 
uh, including anxiety and depression. So we're just getting a repeat of Hegel's Science of Logic. Now this book is considered the most difficult book to have ever been written by a human being. And it's for free online. You can find it in several places. But here's the table of contents. Now these words look ordinary and uh, not very interesting or insightful. But these are actually the shapes uh, that shape dynamic physics and chemistry are approximating with the mathematical figures. But this is in their pure qualia in terms of the shape language. Hegel calls this a genuinely philosophical language of a universal absolute logic that's in itself in a timeless, spaceless way where it's moving in conceptual space-time in higher orders of complexity. So these categories are not moving in some arbitrary order. They necessarily, by the inner dialectic, the inner movement of the shapes themselves, have to turn into these other shapes without introducing anything extra from uh, outside of it. So all of these shapes look like the ordinary categories not worthy of our attention that we use every single day. The incredible thing is that when we think about these thoughts in this living order, this is the universal evolution that we were talking about in the chemistry slide. These are growing into each other in a living logic. And in spirituality and other organizations uh, who talk about this kind of mystical reality, are approximating this, but not in scientific form. This is the first time in human history that it's been put in an actual scientific progression that is determinate and can be uh, found in the different uh, parts of the observable, observable universe, which can unite some of the contradictions in the way we think about whole and parts, appearance, um, conditions, uh, finite and infinite, actuality, um, even subjectivity itself, the notion, the universality, the judgment, uh, syllogisms, all of these categories are just shapes in increasing complexities until we get to the most complete, complex shape, which is this sort of absolute idea. And our universe is following this in some sense, and same with our phenomenology. So the goal is to get as many people as possible learning this universal logic uh, and develop a new kind of intelligence that we're going to call the universal quotient. The better that you understand or an individual understands this order in the living way, not in the abstract way that we ordinarily think of these categories as separate from each other, that there is no real order to our thoughts. But we're not just saying we're interpreting the world itself in an ordered way. The thoughts themselves, these without even a physical universe, no gauge transforms, no not, these are this way of themselves and when we're evolving out of animal species on earth we are purifying this order and that's why our behaviors can seem random at first in the sort of carnal lower level drives is because they aren't they, they, they have the freedom to not align with these rational orders and these are each one of these is like a ratio uh, as julian barber says this is the hidden secret of the universe so even the growth of our pure thoughts are themselves ratios, and the universe is reflecting that as well. So we're going back and forth in a speculative manner uh, to try and obtain this living way and this truthful way of looking at the universe where the contradictions and the cognitive dissonance goes down. So when we experience cognitive dissonance, this is what ill health is. Cognitive dissonance increases stress hormones, it increases, it decreases memory, performance, uh, has real biological effects as stress is stored in the body and then it builds up in toxicity and diets go, go out the window and then all of a sudden we develop cancers and a whole bunch of uh, problems. We, we become lethargic, we don't move our bodies. Um, so it's, it's a new type of intelligence based on this logic where intelligence quotients are general intelligence which don't necessarily have to move in this order. Now this is where the rest of the graphic comes in in terms of an inner and holy healthcare. So there's a sort of play on words in terms of spirituality, but we can also call it holy healthcare like this. Because as we showed in the sec uh, one of our, the early slides to the Nobel Prizes, in order to have enough influence in the world, we have to deal with the spiritual component. But now we're dealing with it in the scientific way. So there have been studies to show that when people study divine text or spiritual text, there are health advances, that there is something in these texts that is universal. In some ways, we suspect that they are embodying shape dynamics, but not in the pure scientific form, but in the sensuous form where they're not decoupled. 
they're not decoupling the gauge transform versions, the empirical versions from the purely logical systematic versions. But there's enough inside of them to give structure in this universal way and provide relief. And you can see a couple of studies here showing that diabetes, hypertension, depression have gone down substantially from individuals who have memorized passages from either the Bible, the Quran, the, the Vedas and Hinduism and Buddhism. But we are going to supercharge this by giving the pure scientific version and educating people to say what is the most boring and common is actually the most profound. If we are truly present with the truth of things and we get outside and decouple the mundane interpretation of the fragmented reality, sort of what Newton did to Kepler and the concrete way of doing speculative physics, then we can return to a set of truthful thinking which is a lot more interesting because these categories are changing into their opposite in a sort of mystical kind of interesting way that human beings find interesting uh, in terms of uh, like even the sentence, for example, um, there are no truths right? There are no truths. So when you think of a sentence, if the sentence is true, then it means there are no truths, but that means the sentence then has to be false, which means that there must not not be no truths. There must be truths. And so the sentence flips back and forth, and we think that's our subjective logic. We, we invented this language, and the categories are just a product of human uh, caprice or artifice. But in actuality, Hegel says, no, the grammar in our sentences is doing this on its own. And we are, we are witnessing a sort of great pun, a great sort of joke that the gurus of the past and the great teachers of the past um, used to teach their students. So we're going to be showing the right metaphysical interpretation, both as the physical laws of the universe, but also the laws of phenomenology, the laws of our, our minds. And we're going to then create a universal periodic table of absolute shapes of these universals here called the Aptoaz. And the Aptoaz interfaces with current contemporary society's way of representing these shapes. So the Bible has its own sensuous version. The Quran has its own sensuous version. The Vedas use their own words and language. They're all saying the same thing in different finite words. So in this periodic table, we're going to show where the shapes occur universally across all the sources and then give a way to do a differential diagnosis on spirit or the concrete mind is what spirit can be thought of scientifically. And this differential diagnosis means that we prescribe perhaps dialectics uh, for people to understand, uh, to restructure the rational thinking in an sci infinitely scientific way. Uh, by finding which source they subscribe to uh, empirically. So if they come from a Hinduistic Hindu culture or if they're from the Middle East or you know, even uh, Christians, the, the differential diagnosis does not prescribe the same sensuous symbols for everybody because that's what's in conflict. That's what usually creates wars or um, a lot of uh, construct problems within the identities of individuals. So what will happen is uh, one of these new sort of spiritual doctors, these infinitely scientific doctors, will subscribe passages from the periodic table depending on which version they uh, need to see the sensuous symbols in because at first consciousness can't uncouple. Uh, these, these separations can't happen because uh, they're enmeshed, they're conflated together. That's why we think our thoughts can only apply to objects and not our objects themselves. Now this concept can be very jarring at first, that thoughts themselves are objects. Well then who's thinking the thoughts? What's thinking the thoughts? And this is where the spiritual stuff kind of comes in. But it can also be an existential thing where we're just uncovering a, a new kind of shape dynamic in the universe. So whether it's secular or traditionally religious, it's a nice unity. But these shapes are hard for us to see because it's an inner movement. So Hegel describes the external world as sort of being kind of chaotic and random. But these categories, these pure thoughts, are inward. They are imminent within the empirical universe, and that we can only see them in dynamical motion, kind of like that Keplerian example we gave in the chemistry slide. And uh, so Hegel recommends following uh, 
I think his name is Philip Peniel. He was a, a psychiatrist of the past that wanted to humanize people more uh, who might have mental illnesses by saying if you talk to them rationally in this inner order of things, that is how you not only discover the universe, but it also corrects the aberrations in consciousness that causes the being of the individual to make choices that are in an external uh, an external chaotic order, which could be harming them. And that's why we're going to call it an inner and holy health care model um, to sort of show that this inwardness is why it's so hard to grasp, but that the mind is an in, inward act and an inward uh, process. And that's what he means by it. And even though we're saying that the, the book itself, The Science of Logic, is one of the most difficult books ever ri uh, written, it's only difficult to consciousness that is already sort of damaged, fragmented, and outward. It's an external process that is not one of self-determination and self-freedom through wisdom. Uh, he says that the consciousness which is absorbing a culture which does not promote its own thinking, its own rationality, um, such as what some of the religions in the past, uh, Hegel, sort of critiques because he says the way that scholasticism sort of uh, handled Christianity or the way Brahman is talked about is indeterminate and you, know, you can never know the Tao and these types of things. Those types of disconnecting from reason is what he said stopped philosophical and healing uh, science from occurring, this new deeper inner logic. And he says that kind of beyond that we're not allowed to know, that you can only know in faith or in such things like this, is what we call dead thinking, dead spirit. Uh, even the syllogism and formal logic that's taught in universities, he says, is actually in this dead kind of external way, where it's not in one living uh, total, uh, one big shape dynamic thinking itself systematically and in a way where every move is justified and is not just taken for granted as self-evident. It's only self-evident through the, the logical principles that govern logic itself. So that's a little bit of a difficult thing to consider because our culture is currently not in this wise mode, which is why depression and anxiety is going up. But once we start teaching this in the way it was meant to be understood in its true metaphysical way, which uh, modern science now with these, these teams of uh, modern sci scientists and physicists, such as Julian Barber's team, is starting to catch on even without grasping the inner order. It's just becoming apparent because our thinking is becoming so advanced that the, the fragmentedness, the externalness of it, is becoming uh, known to us. It's peeking its head um, and showing us that there's a deeper inner order that makes sense of the contradictions that's sort of driving our world and our theories apart. Another reason why this internal dynamic is necessary is because what's happening in modern psychiatry and psychology is we're becoming more and more external. And that's what pills basically are, is basically taking an external influence and controlling our minds from without. So in some ways, we could be losing more and more control over our phenomenology by relying on external sources to approximate for the lack of order in our conceptions. We're trying to resolve logical contradictions in the phenomenology of our world and the way we parse identities by not understanding them, not learning about our internal world, by ignoring it, by placating it with external feelings. This is the uh, empirical feeling world which is sort of like the particular satisfactions. It's a particular satisfaction, it's not a universal satisfaction. A universal satisfaction is more like love or sense making or understanding or meaning, uh, which comes from thinking and self determining the order of these thoughts and tearing with them and meditating with them and uh, learning about them in this concrete way uh, rather than um, taking something from outside and sort of treating the symptom with a band-aid solution. This is the true universal satisfaction and that we desperately need uh, before we become so external to ourselves that uh, we, our, own, our own thoughts become painful themselves. So uh, we need to be very careful and the inner order of things solves that problem. Interestingly, this may be how Jesus or Buddha, or I guess with Islam, they're a little bit more rational in terms of these miraculous sorts of healings that these divine teachers and, and, and uh, well, just divine ones were doing in the past was that they actually were doing something mystical in terms of seeing this order behind the 
empiricism and then aligning their words with the it's basically an advanced form of psychotherapy they were seeing the patterns and the schisms within uh, the consciousnesses of the individuals and they were able to create linguistic interventions that were so powerful because they really were in tune with the true essence of the world this deeper shape space and they were able to see the shapes of people's minds and what their spiritual essence was and sort of what, correct what they were calling evil back then, the sort of ignorance that was resulting in, um, you know, cognitive dissonance, contradictions that would uh, disable people. And so perhaps these were so bad in the past that some of the interventions really were sort of Freud speaking or talking cure, uh, you know, in this incredibly powerful way that aligns with the true uh, the true logic of how the, the mind works and um, NLP and all these other therapies could greatly benefit as well from having people adopt this sort of miraculous kind of advancement in psychiatry, psychology uh, and in general therapy so that the externality and the learned victimhood um, can sort of be stimmied and get our species into this wiser mode of self-determining reason, uh, self-therapy, and a more inward connection to the true, interesting, mystical, and genuinely alive, vital side of the true profoundness of being present with the absolute that is imminent within the mundane. One last point to make before moving on is we describe what the inner means. The inner means with the, the mind, the spirit, but this holy has another dimension to it. So each one of these universals, these shapes, these categories, these pure thoughts, is the size of the entire universe. A universal means everywhere. So the universe is moving through these, these shapes, but they're entirely whole. They are holes in themselves. So you can think of this as pure being and pure nothing moving to pure becoming, let's say. These are the first three shapes that... that occur and create space, time, and motion in our universe, our empirical universe. Uh, these are the size of everything in the beginning. They are holes, but at first, the first shape is sort of indeterminate. It's an immediate indeterminacy that you can't know or say anything about because it's indivisible. It is the only indivisible element where there's nothing inside of it. In fact, it is so little that when it negates itself, it turns into pure nothing. So. This is a little bit of that inner dynamic, but it's just saying that this is what holy thinking is supposed to be in religious thought, that the categories of thought move in holes. They move entire universes at a time. And this is the sort of emergent complexity, whereas our ordinary thinking wants to break things up into parts and it gets all mixed up and confusing. There is a mixing that starts to happen, but it's more like embedded systems that are following the same principles. And so that's why it's a nice play on words to say, you know, it's holy as in holistic uh, healthcare, but in terms of logic, it's still holy logic. In fact, it is the Tao speaking itself. It is the sheer ineffability of language or even the logic of the grammar of language moving itself and speaking itself, not by going inside and saying anything about itself, but by saying something about its form as a whole. And in that is actually a pretty incredible depth of of wisdom that is currently missing in uniting our our cultures in what are called speculative concrete harmonies where everything is a moment a nice ratio that has its right place and the cognitive dissonance goes down not even just inside of our individual phenomenologies but in society as a whole because uh, the finite symbols are recognized as art and beauty uh, but the inner order and the holiness of it is restored in the systematic scientific way that modern secular science can respect without ruining the traditions that traditional religions are are concerned about. So this differential diagnosis is what gives custom and meaningful interventions in terms of a psychobiology, a psychological phenomenological intervention, um, which can hopefully address the problems of depression and anxiety that are growing not only because of a wealth problem, which is also true in exacerbating the problem, but this is happening even in wealthy countries, which means that it can't just be a material problem. It does have some kind of mental and, if you will, spiritual component where the logic of our, of our realities is not meaningful. It's losing meaning in some sense, and some people are describing it as a meaning crisis. 
But in a way, these categories, as they move in their necessity, their infinitely scientific logic is the most meaningful way to interpret uh, what happens in our contingent lives in the material world. And so it's a very beautiful, elegant uh, kind of uh, logic, uh, kind of science that's also an art, which we'll get into more uh, when we describe exactly, and we show exactly how this periodic table works in the last section of this presentation called the universal design slide. And so we'll show exactly how this works. And then people, uh, doctors who might be seeing this can put it together and, and uh, psychiatrists can say, okay, this does align with um, clinical construct theory, uh, Rogerian theory or dialectical behavior therapy, uh, therapy or any sort of cognitive behavioral therapy um, that is based on the sensuous uh, alignment with this universal systematic um, logic. Okay, so this should be a fairly novel direction in the field of medicine and hopefully no uh, worthy of a Nobel, uh, Nobel Prize. Welcome to the Nobel Economics Prize slide where we're going to talk about spirit value up here. You can see uh, that we have lost another trigger. In the previous slide, we were talking about healthcare and spirit medicine to win the Nobel Medical Prize. Uh, and we had 10, now we're down to nine. But this is a very controversial slide. We might take off more than one, but um, basically we're gonna lose people because they're gonna look at this slide and think it's ridiculous because of this triad here. The capitalism, socialism, and uh, capitalism, capitalism, socialism, communism dialectic is definitely in conflict right now, especially with uh, the war around the world. Um, so whether a capitalist looks at this, they might get triggered by communism seeing this here. Uh, maybe they're a communist and they see capitalism here and that's a trigger. Or maybe you see Robert Solo and a, he's a more conservative uh, econ economist or, uh, and you're a liberal, so that might be triggering, but you might be also um, a conservative and looking at the Venus Project, which seems a bit liber liberal, so then you get triggered because you want to be conservative. Or you know that the Venus Project is atheistic and uh, you might be more spiritual. As we talked about in uh, the last slide about holy books and the inner nature of the essence of the world. So there's plenty here to get triggered about. Um, but let's get through it and see if there's something novel here. A new uh, Copernican direction in um, resource-based economics, and uh, this circle doesn't seem to be useful. So <laughs> the Copernican, uh, Copernican direction really has to do with these three main points, uh, which are explained below, and a new type of eco economics that we're hoping to introduce um, based on what we've sort of learned. So we can see here that this is, this is a conceptualization of the universals that we think this should be in. This is a more harmonious dialectic of capitalism first and socialism, communism. Uh, you could say Marx did some version of this, um, but it's really just an extension of how to think with that inner logic that we got from Hegel's uh, Science of Logic. And we are on the Marxist.org uh, website that's hosting Hegel's works, but of course, Marx came after Hegel. Hegel was supposed to be the master of this, you know, sort of living order, this universal logic that circles back on itself. And so if you go towards the end uh, of his system, you start getting to objective spirit, he calls it. So most of the world is not thinking about these three in this way. But this could create a much more harmonious conceptualization and reduce the cognitive dissonance about the confusion around why they're the same and why they're different. So capitalism is um, the entrepreneurial class owns the means of production and they... Uh, in rampant capitalism, there's no social protection. So that's where you get sort of the Industrial Revolution was sort of a little bit draconian or quite a bit draconian with no unions and the workers were working long hours for little pay. Yet it was very productive. Capitalism, capitalism is very good at advancing and creating new products generally. But the trickle-down kind of economics seems to create a lot of suffering. Uh, then uh, socialism... Uh, capitalism is supposed to evolve to socialism, where socialism has what's, uh, has something different with it. It's the same in that the, the capitalist or the entrepreneurial class still owns the means of production, but the workers create unions and they protect themselves, so there's an internal tension between the two, between the entrepreneurial class who are making the production, making the value, and then the workers who are using their labor value uh, 
uh, and skill sets to to work underneath this uh, organizational structure and are generally uh, protected by their unions. Um, but what is different between these two and communism is that the essential relation of the means of production is changed. So in communism, the means of production is no longer owned just by the entrepreneurial class. It's owned by everybody, the union workers and the entrepreneurial class. And uh, it's supposed to be mediating uh, the value in a much wiser scientific way. Uh, in traditional historical communism, uh, ca communism was the antithesis to capitalism. Usually these two are in opposition, not these two. Uh, but uh, the, the real orientation is that communism, uh, if it does have a true mode, even though Marx and uh, the others in history never really finished it, uh, logically it should have served the function of a, tr of, of a sublation, if anything. And a sublation just means uh, it incorporates the two prior moments, uh, two prior one sadness is as moments. They, they change into each other and you're supposed to move back and forth. You're not supposed to cancel them completely. This is a totally different mode in a certain sense, but it's not completely antithetical to capitalism or socialism. It's the fluid thinking. It's the ratio between them and it's mediated with a higher economic wisdom. So this is the more, this is the way, uh, the more harmonious conceptualization or the direction we want to move. Um, so right now there's a lot of work to be done, but um, a lot of the slides you've seen so far are about changing the foundations of how we think about these concepts. With each of the Nobel Prizes, there's something fundamental that has to change in not just the, the higher order functions of, of what we're dealing with, but the, the root concepts. So this is where we're going to start. Hopefully you're not too triggered. But now let's get into the, the details a little bit. Okay, if you ask somebody of the new world spirit, you know, what are they? Capitalist, socialist, communist, uh, the wise answer, the speculative philosophical answer is that they are capitalist, socialist, and communist all at the same time, and that they complete each other. This is a concrete whole. This is the holy thinking that we were talking about in the Nobel Medical Prize. Um, they have an inner connection to each other. Um, so when we're being a capitalist, socialist, communist in the concrete sense, it means that we're going to introduce universal prizes. Now, the universal prizes are based off of the highest level of discovery, which are what patents generally serve. And we're going to win or attempt to win all uh, six Nobel Prizes. And each one is about $1.4 million US. And that money is going to go towards a central idea, a central prize. The central idea right now is that we're introducing this universal logic and we're uniting finite sciences into an infinite science like Hegel showed and then expanding that system with concrete sort of technologies, actual new um, ways of structuring society. And so this new singular uniting of all these ideas is the universal prize. The universal prize doesn't just go to some individuals like the Nobel Prize. It's going to be designed um, to give back the money to the people who help support the the research, the research and development to create the new value. Right, so you can see the cycle. The Nobel Prizes create this fund, and then it goes back to the people who are working. Now, the way that we we sort of give that money back is through an app, and the app is called WeWell, the Worldwide Essential Workers App. And as research and development uh, occurs, we're going to upgrade. Um, the amounts that we give back to people as they contribute to this this research and development process. And the app will be on a phone. It'll be um, sort of like uh, a gig economy, career economy kind of, kind of app um, that gives out uh, jobs in a much more customized way. And what's sort of unique about it is uh, as the research upgrades, so does the app and so does this thing called the flow dividend these red arrows that go back down. It's not just a universal basic income, it's a dividend tied to production and that you get at a minimum uh, a 90,000 Canadian uh, purchasing parity so that your the real buying power of the money doesn't change as the upgrading occurs, which is reflected in inflation, generally in the consumer price index uh, changing. Um, anything that changes the actual 
real economic purchasing power of this 90,000. And the reason why we chose 90,000 is because uh, studies show that it's the optimal per unit amount uh, that would give the most amount of happiness. So the most amount of happiness per unit dollar. After 90,000, happiness starts to, starts to starts to taper off, and you get less happy per dollar. You still get happier, but less happy per dollar. And the WeWa app will be a global worker-owned cooperative social enterprise app where the ownership model is based on the rationality, this holy holistic rationality, and that holy healthcare that we talked about uh, before. Um, but it has to be global because what happens in economics is there's a competition that, go, that goes on and there's a race to the bottom that occurs if there isn't a, a rational a ratio of, of sort of regulation that allows cooperative competition. Otherwise, it just kind of goes into the pure capitalist mode where we have global capitalism sort of running off and wealth concentration occurring at uh, levels never before seen. It's the highest it's ever been. Um, but it has to be whatever this the regulates the universal prizes. It has to be worker owned so that we don't end up in some kind of totalitarian you know nightmare. And worker ownership can generally mean that you get a, a sort of libertarian paternalism, where you get a sort of freedom, but there's rules that increase the chances of rational reasoning. Or when you're making decisions, it doesn't just go off in caprice where the society sort of disintegrates itself. Because if you introduce uh, democracy too soon, studies have shown that if education levels aren't high enough, if reason's not high enough, the society actually separates into its ethnic factions, into any political factions, and a civil war occurs uh, because the unity of the reasoning isn't strong enough, the, the reasoning that we talked about um, in terms of genuine rationality. So the worker-owned uh, ownership has to be based on this new, genuine, infinite kind of reason. It has to be cooperative in that the production of the app is given back to the people who make it in a fair way. And that that calculation will happen through the app, sort of like, I guess, how gig economy apps are doing it now. Um, it also has to be a social enterprise. So instead of just being a nonprofit or a charity organization, which has restrictions on how much money you can make, which in Canada anyway is $10,000 um, per year, a social enterprise is the sublation between um, for-profit and non-profit. So it's it's like this triad here. We have a for-profit, non-profit, and it's the the synthesis between the two, the internal sort of synthesis. Um, so that's where we're going to try and get the best of all worlds. Uh, and lastly, uh, when we make profit, uh, the profit is given back through the cooperative mechanism. So we can be competitive with international corporations on the global scale because we are being smart about being sustainable, um, uh, being, being cooperative without undercutting. And that'll be explained in a second. But it also has to be an app because the, the feedback needs to be quick enough to keep the reasoning and the, the, um, the needs of the individuals met in a real-time manner. And so that the app can continuously get gain feedback and improve based off of the worker experience. Bureaucracy is a huge problem right now, and Max uh, Weber was very uh, was very astute to the the problems of the strengths of bureaucracies. In terms of modern modern governments are strong because they have strong uh, bureaucracies and strong legal systems and strong rule of law, but they can also have a downfall in that if the response is not quick enough, uh, you can have bureaucratic obstructions just from the delays, which of course we see a lot in the hyper-partisanship and the hyper, the hyper, um, well, individualistic politics we have today. So then next, once we have this sort of structure to start paying people who work on the idea, so that's where we're starting with the New World Spirit, the New World Spirit will channel any funds, any awards, anything, anything made uh, as a good and service once we get going based off of this sort of seed money from the Nobel Prizes and any gifts that are given. We start working on another novel idea, which is a new rational agent theory in behavioral economics, where we have something called speculative agents. And of course, in um, modern economics, you have a rational agent model where the, the agents are self-serving. They, they look out for their own self-interest or else the models won't make sense. Um, and so, of course, Adam Smith and laissez-faire economics shows that when you design an economy 
where individuals can be selfish, their collective selfishness creates economic good for the whole. But the new thing that we're saying Hegel has done is he, he has connected behavior and psychology to our civil society and state life. And he does this in his Encyclopedia of the Philosophical Sciences in the, in the third section when he's talking about objective spirit, which is just community. But he's saying that as this logic grows, as society upgrades, so this upgrading here is very important. It's underestimated. Depreciation of, of assets usually is, is uh, uh, the only reason why this is usually focused upon. But in the affirmative aspect, not only is the quality of life going up, um, at least for a certain demographic of society, but it's actually fundamental to the growing nature of complexity uh, of the universe. So Julian Barber returns here with shape dynamics, uh, which we spoke about in the physics, chemical, chemistry, and uh, medical Nobel Prizes. Um, but when we say upgrade, the complexity of the logic is, is increasing to the next levels. And that has a certain uh, degree of value to it. But it also changes the way the rational agents play uh, game theory, play the economic game, and it moves towards a more and more cooperative competition. Whereas in the beginning, it is quite draconian. It is very individualistic, but it doesn't stay that way. And so as people become more rational in terms of the true rationality of the Hegelian kind, the Keplerian sort of kind, uh, where you, you think in concrete unities, the logic starts to create this inner unity and you start to recognize a higher reasoning behind all things in it. And it has this psychological effect of creating empathy to a higher degree, but not like a blind empathy, an actual thoughtful empathy where you remain an individual in the unity. So you have infinite diversity inside of a, inside of a collective. So you have a nice balance of both. So Hegel was not this totalitarian that people make him out to be in the past. He was actually against uh, some aspects of Plato's Republic as being too universal, too state heavy, where the guardian class sort of told everybody else what to do. And Hegel said, no, the true notion of anything has a universal, a particular, and an individual. And the caprice of the individual, not just the self-determination of the individual, but the caprice must be protected as well as the duty to the state. And that's a true speculative way of thinking of both of them at the same time. And that's the kind of state uh, that we want the New World Spirit to be in. The New World Spirit is about an inner connection based on self-determination. You only attain the, the connection when you understand the logic more deeply. So the sense of self kind of changes and it expands, the rationality expands, and you start seeing, or the individual starts seeing themselves more in other, in other processes and stops treating themselves as so abstract. Um, so as they change, they also grow in their phenomenology. The economy grows, the phenomenology grows, the logic is growing in higher levels of complexity. So when we study Hegel's science of logic, uh, we'll see that he's just repeating that in the economic sphere and that we're continuing to evolve and our new economic models have to really take into account the positive effects of the upgrading, not just in terms of quality of life, but a universal upgrading of the complexity of the quality of life and how to handle that uh, intuitively as the needs of the rational agents change. As agents become more rational, they become more inward. Their inner needs and their subjective needs uh, actually increase even though they're more uh, sort of um, collectivist or, or better producing goods and services. Uh, and they also have a higher wealth of needs. So unlike stereotypical historical communism, uh, real communism was not about us, you know, treating everybody as exactly the same. Hegel's really against that. He's, he calls that abstract equality that creates envy. He says, no, there's difference. People have different bodies. They have different needs, so you have to treat them that way. And if you read Marx carefully, he does say that. Um, just like Mills and, and other uh, more maybe neoliberal free market economists. But it's very important to realize that some of the model, behavioral economic models um, change. And Daniel Kahneman's Thinking Fast and Slow is one of the, the great books to show how many cognitive biases play into our decision making when the, the rationality or the information is limited. So true knowledge is reason and that actually will change the way we make decisions. Okay, that is a very interesting concept and a new way of looking at reason linked to logic. So another thing that needs to happen is when we start creating new economies, there's this problem of the business cycle and how virtuous and economic cycles will redistribute wealth in unequal ways no matter what kind of system is created. 
And in the past, uh, there's been restrictions on the top 1% to make them pay more taxes or you know, just, just oppress them. But that's not a sustainable model. The true model needs to be a Pareto change. And a Pareto change means you don't have to bring, bring down um, the gifted or the, the highly productive. Um, all you need to do is bring the bottom up. And so in this way, the sort of claustrophobic feel and the lack of uh, the ability to self-actualize at the highest potential of the, of the upper class, this sort of guardian elite, you could say, in Plato speak, um, is to allow them to keep being amazing um, and then having a way to, to work on this idea together where we do redistribute back, not just on a, on a tax, on an abstract tax, but measuring the economy in a new way where it doesn't feel like a, a restriction. It's much more measured, and it's measured based off of these four flow criterion. So what people really want in life, and Hegel calls this the consciousness of the notion, is that they want flow state. And flow state is an experience. And everything we do in life is really to serve this goal. This is the highest good and service there is. And it's not really a well-known economic fact, but this is really what it's all about. And there's four criteria to creating good flow, which requires designing good games. And games have clear rules, immediate feedback, uh, the challenge level and the skill level match each other. And the fourth one is that there's clear rules. And the rules we want to have are more speculative rules, more, a higher rationality. And then what we do is we, we sort of rotate what is needed to create flow for people not based on generic monetary calculations, which miss nuances and externalities, whether positive or negative. Uh, we have a better, more rational measuring. And then we rotate this to create a more Pareto-like optimization. And we sort of sublate this business cycle um, by focusing less on absolute production and more on relative ratio production, rational production, flow production, optimal production. When we, make, when we meet the right measurements, um, with the right sort of interventions, productivity actually goes up by up to 700%. So you become more competitive than just in the abstract capitalist moment uh, by treating people well, giving them that 90,000 um, per year, and you get this 700% boost, which makes paying the 90,000 actually practical in terms of upgrading goods and services. Because a, a sort of back of the envelope calcula calculation shows that in order to accomplish this, there's a, around a 700% shortfall in terms of global GDP at least with the current unequal economic paradigm. So it's feasible if you can put people into flow state. So there's another added reason to aim for this, these flow state games, to make the global economy a flow state game, where the rationality of the agents increases as the quality of life goes up for everybody as much as possible. So when we mean absolute production, there are factors that, that go into producing goods and services, and they're all based on working on this idea. Research and development ultimately translates into goods and services, and there are factors that help people do that. So to get into this a little bit more, we need to distinguish between three types of economics as a whole. There's monetary-based economics, uh, which is kind of what we have today, and then there's resource-based economics, which is sort of what the Venus Project does to get away from the the messiness or the, the speculative nature of Wall Street and disconnecting of real prices off of uh, real, you know, demand economies, uh, supply, supply demand economics, um, and get back to like you know getting in back, uh, getting back into equilibrium with the planets, making sure that we're not going to destroy our habitats. Um, but then there's another. There's, this is the new idea. This is called idea-based economics, which is sort of a sublation of these two. Uh, sort of transcending and blending of them where we, we're recognizing that the central value generator is what Robert Solo was famous for narrowing in on in his sort of solo swan model where they showed that um, the increases in productivity are large, largely driven by technological progress and technology I think Hegel is correct is really just the idea the logical idea reaching the next stage of complexity uh, so we then take that idea and we commercialize it into goods and services and then um, we use, usually trickle down economics or some kind of socialist policy to make sure that people get those, goods, those new goods and services in some rate of change that really usually isn't uh, very fair to the bottom uh, individuals because by the time they get the good service, society has moved on, it's gone out of style, 
and generally it has designed obsolescence into it, which you get it and it just starts breaking. So it's a perpetual grind on the bottom because we're not upgrading altogether in a harmonious way like this infinite logic. It's not a holy kind of thinking. Our species is stratifying. And the thing is, as Moore's law and exponential technological in, uh, progress uh, reaches these, these hockey stick sort of exponential trends, the stratification is going to get worse, which is what we're starting to see now. That the, the virtuous economic cycles show that if you are gifted, like if you have high IQ, if you have high levels of um, social prowess or high levels of just inherited income or even just beauty, uh, even just culturedness and, and life experience, those all play into an advantage that spirals upwards. You can participate in uh, producing more ideas, um, which you get rewarded for through patents and stuff like this, abstract patents anyway, um, that then gives more money to make the next patent. And then you sort of stay on the upper crust of the idea, whereas everybody else is sort of in the, the vicious economic cycle where you get less and then it starts to spiral downwards. And so you get people feeling disconnected from the idea and this universal logic, which is why we have a spiritual crisis of meaning. And so we want to restore that um, to a better degree, to a higher degree, so that there's a subjective and objective uh, value being produced. But the idea really is central. It is what makes countries rich and poor, Robert Solo said, the main differentiator, and it translates into technologies in a sensuous kind of way. So we want to measure these sort of privileges a little bit more carefully, but in, a, in an anonymous way, which we'll explain later. And then we're going to rotate them so that we're not holding back any of the, the gifted in any area. Um, but we're creating drastic improvements that will actually make life better for everybody, including the 1% and uh, everybody in the middle and the 99%. So it's a nice holistic way of thinking of everybody is an essential moment of the whole. So the last thing to focus on here is that the way we pay people in this new world spirit is that yes, we give the 90,000 as a sort of minimum sort of goal to hit in terms of monetary value, um, because that's where you can, you know, the breadbasket calculation, you get the, the basic, you know, keeping up with the Joneses and you feel secure. And security is an important part of philosophy um, you know, everybody since Plato, Hegel, Aristotle, Marx, everybody sort of says, you know, when the human basic needs aren't met, it can't rise up to this logic and improve its rationality. And then crime doesn't go down and all these great um, positive externalities from education don't, don't happen unless the mind is free from sensuousness to think about these super sensuous shapes that are undergirding their, uh, their uh, phenomenology and their, their uh, economic surroundings. So this is a sort of catch-all, and uh, this doesn't go up to, until everybody in the world gets it, basically. And it, you might think, well, there's, there's irrational spending, you know. Well, this is sort of going to be designed as a disposable kind of income in the financial part of the life areas, which we'll talk about later, which allows for this, compre this caprice or gambling, this need to, to sort of uh, address luck and chance in life. And there's a, there's a part of this money that is focused just on that because otherwise it just undermines the system anyway. So it'd be wise we're taking that part of human nature into account. And we're doing that because these other two elements require a deeper thinking of what money is actually supposed to represent. So in modern monetary theory, money usually has four main functions, but here we're going to lump them into two. So normally they're, they're thought of as... Um, uh, a unit of exchange, uh, a store of value, a unit of like comparison, and then uh, it helps you create trust against the future so that you can take loans and make sure they're repaid and stuff like this. But in terms of the two main categories we're going to talk about, we're going to talk about money's main function is to do an inventory of the objective real economy. So this is the resource-based economics, like how many human beings do we really have? How many goods and services? How many donkeys? How many, you know, how many uh, people does it take to make a road? How long does it take? What are the actual real economic resources needed to build a good and service? And then here's the more nebulous one. So there was a problem with money in the past that it needs to somehow figure out a measurement apparatus for something that's technically infinite, which is the subjective economy. So we have the objective economy and then the subjective economy. And so by lumping in the subjective economy uh, into the price mechanism, we have the real economy mixed in with this infinite, this finite economy mixed in with an infinite. And this is what 
resource-based economics is trying to get away from is that this is where the speculative nature of Wall Street and the, 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 the stock market is sort of rigged in a certain sense where the insider trading, uh, the insider trading is really just people who are close to the idea, right? And we know that since this makes all the difference, the closer you are to it, the greater uh, of an advantage you have. And so insider trading laws are really just supposed to create these red arrows so that the idea doesn't get hoarded um, in these abstract unities instead of like being this infinite kind of science. And so what ends up happening is the price can get unhinged from the real economy as, as the uh, bad infinite side. This is the logical shape um, from Hegel. The bad infinite is a repeating that is endless. It's a beyond that never is achieved. So you never get a universal satisfaction. It's always a particular satisfaction, sort of like animal desires or animal drives, where they just keep consuming without really thinking. And that part of human nature is in the subconscious. It's very uh, innate in a certain sense. And uh, we know it as greed. So when you become sensuous and you lose this interconnection to things, you don't have a subjective universal satisfaction. And so you, the, the way that the phenomenology works it, is it tries to approximate it with external satisfactions but the external is never uh, satisfying because the real uh, the real satisfaction is inward in that inner unity of meaning so that's why possessions when they do these studies and these surveys they show that you know people at the end of life don't care about the possessions because you can't take them with you it's really about experiences and love um, which is interesting that um, really the 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 material possessions don't really seem to create long-lasting satisfaction, but it can create um, short-term uh, satisfaction in providing as a means um, to those experiences. So then there's another determination that is new here, is that Hegel speaks of a genuine infinite. And people haven't understood these categories, these shapes, for 200 years, but we're starting to understand them now in this breakthrough. The genuine infinite is the, is the infinite of the bad infinite. It goes inward, and it, uh, it has a universal satisfaction. And so we call this flow state in practical terms and in empirical terms. And in other terms, the reason why it balances the infinitude of greed, the endlessness of greed, is because flow state is technically also infinite. And we give that the positive name of pricelessness. So that, that's why it's considered the highest good, the highest service, because we, we end up in flow states when we're working on the idea, where our, the idea within us, the universal logic that's in our phenomenology, these categories that Hegel talks about, um, when these align with the external um, order of the universe, you could say we have an immersive experience where we have a sort of timelessness, a complete self-immersion, and intrinsic enjoyment. It doesn't have to be extrinsic or external. And these are the three uh, measurements to know when we do have a subjective flow state achieved. And people will do anything for these. They're extremely meaningful. So that's why the only way to deal with the bad infinite is to achieve the, the flow state of the genuine infinite by grasping this inner unity and making these flow games um, bring the, the subjective economy back into balance. And that is done by these Pareto rotations, which we're gonna explain more in depth later. This is just the higher level theory of how these two objective and subjective economies are now gonna be brought into a, a much wiser harmony without the totalitarian, totalitarian oppressive mechanism of trying to negate capitalism or socialism or any of the one-sidednesses of a lesser logic that we've achieved in historical political economics when the rationality of the agents was still more, nation, more nascent. The more, uh, another thing that's really important to include in the pay is that once everybody on Earth gets to 90,000, let's say we get there, um, and they're all in flow states, so we have the 700% uh, production increase, and so it starts to become self-sustaining um, because it's a social enterprise, right? Profit is really just a way to approximate um, the upgrading of the idea as surplus value. And so it's really just us uncovering more and more of this universal logic. So we end up giving a flow dividend that adjusts for the level of productivity and the upgrading process that adds to this 90,000 based on the production levels. So it's not this static, stagnant um, sort of universal basic income that will eventually erode the purchasing parity and then people have to go on strikes and you get the business cycle and all this painful, uh, non-rational, non-harmonious, momentary thinking. So the flow dividend is to make sure that inflation and these uh, these after effects of the infinite, you know, value generation of the idea, it sends these kind of economic value shockwaves through uh, global society, the global consciousness, you could say. 
and we have very poor mechanisms of redistributing that and measuring it. But really, we are just measuring this logical process as, a, as an infinite science, as research and development to, into technological uh, development. And it's very important for us to get this under control because it is exponential. It is getting worse and worse and worse. We're stratifying because the cultural logic we have can't keep up with the technological logic. The external logic in the ideas and the technologies is outpacing our social cohesion technology, which is the logic, right? The science of logic of the infinite kind that uh, so far only Hegel has provided in scientific form. But of course, the, the Bible and all these holy texts have um, sensuous versions, but the sensuous versions can conflate and, and prevent decoupling of, the, of what is essential and what is not essential in this process. So this is the new kind of new world spirit economics, the new spiritual kind of value that is simultaneously uh, aligned with modern economic theories and will hopefully integrate in them and provide a sort of shape-based um, economics that integrates the phenomenology in this sort of subjective economy with these infinites that can throw the price mechanism, mechanism out of loop and reduce the flow state games uh, so that the economy doesn't become a flow state game for millions and millions, potentially actually billions of people. And we're destroying the planet because we're out of line, even with the external. Um, so we need to do something fairly quickly, which is why we're trying to win all six of these Nobel Prizes at the same time, to start implementing this new kind of structure um, to, to really bring a more optimal spirit to the planet, uh, both external and, and internal. I'd love to have your help. One more thing to note is that uh, Nobel Prizes generally are awarded for theoretical and experimental types of uh, ideas. Uh, so the experimental part is where you'll notice I mentioned the spirit license down here. And in the um, initial slides on the second slide, we bring up the spirit license that anybody that's going to look at this presentation will sort of um, sign into a favor. And then um, a couple of slides that are uh, look at the spirit license that if they want to contribute their talents to generating these new ideas, they are literally taking part in this process now. So we are using the Nobel Economics Prize or the process to win all the Nobel Prizes to win the Nobel Economics Prize at the same time. So it's kind of like process, um, you know, is the being in the product, you know, it's they're interchanging form is content, content is form. And so in terms of what we're doing uh, by building these, these, the story of being, um, for instance, uh, with the Nobel Literature Prize, which will contain all the other prizes, we also have design going on with the WeWa app, the Worldwide Essential Workers app, where we have um, a new sort of design model in the code. And uh, we raised about $18,000 for this so far um, without any uh, investor stakes, because if we sell any equity, we can't really do any, we can't really do this um, universal flow pay uh, because everybody has a sort of equal rational share depending on their how much of the logic they know. So when we get to the, the Nobel Peace Prize, uh, the universal meritocracy is how we're gonna show um, what kind of standard we use, what kind of uh, rational agent kind of standard we use to, um, to sort of uh, upgrade or sublate what venture capital and venture equity and all these types of investment vehicles are used to basically promote the development of the idea. Now it should be very clear that everything we do is really for the idea, but not the abstract idea, but the concrete idea, which is the Hegel stuff. So we'll be using his um, philosophy of right to um, basically uh, map out the new sort of political economic structure because uh, we think he was right. So if you want to take a look, his philosophy of right, even though it's about monarchy and some an antiquated stuff, the the inner logic um, is still profoundly accurate in a certain way where this constitutional aspect of the rational rule of law was deeply embedded and it was the restrictions of his time that didn't allow him to, to um, 
sublate, but we know that we have to be careful with introducing uh, even democracies or any model uh, because it all depends on the level of logic, this living kind of internal, simultaneously spiritual and systematic kind of universal knowledge or what we would call wisdom uh, in terms of our political economics. So this very practical aspect is what, if you're interested in this uh, project, you're participating in it. And that includes the founders. That means, you know, it's not like everybody else gets 90,000 and then, you know, a few people take off with everything. Uh, no, everybody is uh, committed to trying to make this work and uh, mistakes will be made along the way. But um, that's what the immediate feedback of the app is for, is to make the changes in a meaningful period of time by a rigorous meritocratic, a new meritocratic standard that's not based on um, factors that are invisible, uh, virtuous, uh, or vicious cycles, you know. Um, so there's lots at play here, but we hope this idea is intriguing. It's worth noting as well that one of the main concerns with these sort of more um, identity and different structures is that motivation is one of the things that creates problems where you have people working hard and people that aren't working hard, but that's why the games have to be based on flow state because they have to be individually customizable to the person's need. So Hegel uh, is likely correct in that lack of motivation or boredom is squarely related to the relation um, of a person's uh, psychology to this uh, vital, infinite kind of logical process. When we're disconnected from this, we end up in a dead kind of spirit, a dead kind of uh, self-determining mode where we lose this um, ability to produce. We become mechanical. You need extrinsic rewards, uh, carrot and stick kind of stuff where we've seen that in terms of um, cur current Gallup studies on the workforce in North America, um, roughly 20 to 25 percent of the workforce is actually engaged and probably not in flow state, but at least uh, not disengaged. But that means roughly 75 to 80 percent of the workers are in a disengaged uh, state where we are not getting the 700 percent flow return because they can sense that the, they're being alienated from the, uh, the idea, basically. So the value that they're producing and they don't identify with. And this self-recognition, this identity process, seems like a soft and unessential um, variable. But it's actually the center core, Hegel states, and we believe he's correct, that this priceless part, the subjective economy, is greatly undervalued because we don't understand the logic of consciousness. But now we do. Uh, for the first time, this breakthrough with um, Georg Wilhelm Friedrich Hegel has allowed us to understand this infinite economy that we use the price mechanism to try and um, sort of messily uh, handle. But really, now we know it was just a mechanism to relate people uh, to this feeling of belonging to the idea. And that motivation is a direct result of this calibration and these spirit games or these flow games. So we have a much more nuanced measuring apparatus now to uh, fix the problems with motivational models in terms of the, the workforce and labor force. Um, per, per size, uh, you know, in particular because of technological unemployment, um, forcing people to come to terms with what the point of human nature is, what, it, what is our function, and uh, it seems to come down to this philosophical mode of meaning creation um, where getting money or getting our basic needs met uh, is not enough to satisfy or have this universal satisfaction and so anxiety and depression might actually escalate as the meaninglessness uh, continues to increase because right now we're using the, the labor process as a filling in for the self-actualization process of spirit, Hegel calls it. And Marx says that this is what, you know, non-alienated labor and all this stuff is about. Um, but really it's about flow state games and um, learning about ourselves as these shapes um, in the process. And generally, people who have autotelic personalities are naturally good at this, but um, a lot of people aren't because the culture is so fragmented that uh, they lose this inner connection, what you know, a spiritualist might call the connection to the soul, the infinite vitality of life, and it becomes mundane and mechanical, which is explaining the 75% um, uh, lack of motivation in corporate cultures and also a general increase in anxiety and depression that we covered in the Nobel uh, uh, 
medical prize. So the motivational problem is being solved here, and it's a root problem in under understanding human nature, including the root problem of greed. But we know that the real, the real uh, beginning of human nature is this sort of bad infinite shape. But the the real nature of human um, uh, of human thought is really what Hegel calls rational thinking, genuinely rational thinking, um, which is dialectical, and uh, this sort of carnal spirit, the soul, sort of evolves into what uh, traditional religion was calling spirit, which is truly speculative rational thought at the highest levels of um, self-justifying logic that is systematic and, um, and imminent within itself, imminent critique. So um, uh, if anybody was looking to see that this is not possible, that's why Hegel is absolutely central and the groundbreaking revolutionary, because without this sort of breakthrough in who we are, um, we would keep using these uh, sloppy approximation uh, approximation mechanisms, which are not spiritually precise enough or uh, conceptually precise enough to handle um, the incredible potential of pure thought coming through human beings and human nature. It's important to note that the this uh, Prater rotation stuff and the flow games is providing a, a sort of guarantee that, uh, that Ben Bernanke won for uh, the Nobel Economics Prize this year, uh, 2021, 2022, uh, where he said that to, to make sure that a Great Depression doesn't form, you want to make sure that the banks play their role in providing insurance on deposits so that there's not a bank run. And a bank run uh, exacerbates what, what could have just been a recession into a Great Depression, which is what happened in the 1929 Great Depression. And so he says providing that security is where uh, you get a you get a stability. And that's sort of what these 90,000s and these Pareto rotations do, is they sort of have a, a guarantee built into them, a sort of insurance that is based on the idea squarely, that you have access to the idea directly. And there's a measure of meaning uh, a measure of meaning in terms of your connecting and belonging to this process of novelty and discovery. No matter, you know, it's adjusted for IQ, learning rates, learning styles, it's adjusted for cultures, language barriers, all these types of things that play into the real economy of producing uh, new ideas and, and goods and services. So the patent process will also achieve a higher rationality. Um, and those types of rules, the more particular rules, will be in the WeWa app to help coordinate and upgrade those rules real time as part of the the second flow criterion of immediate feedback to keep people in balance with their skill sets and uh, the challenge levels of what society needs um, as what we used to call jobs and careers. So it's it's important to follow Ben Bernanke's sort of suggestion um, and that will help um, ensure the business cycle stops uh, turning, through, turning through the value production process in these sort of quadratic waves and if you don't know what contrariety of waves are, look them up, but they're not necessarily proven, but this wave function of uh, the long-term and the short-term business cycle every you know, 10 to 25 years does seem to be happening, and we might be going through one here this year. So a tremendous amount of suffering can be prevented if we can figure out um, how to create these games so that the redistribution happens in a much more concrete, unitary uh, way where there's a higher rationality in the moments of the political economy. That should be Nobel Prize worthy. The importance of the idea cannot be understated, and that's why the Venus Project is one of the, the ones out of the many that we've chosen because um, Jacques Fresco uh, seemed to grasp this logic in an atheistic, secular way and had the sagacity to put the university in the center of these circle cities, these optimized resource based cities. Um, but the kind of logic he has is not the the infinite kind. It's a, he's approximating it, but it's still an abstract form, which is why he's negating spirituality in the abstract form of uh, atheism, whereas atheism and religion are actually on the same level when they're both abstract, they condition each other. So genuine philosophy is the sublation, the transcending uh, of those two as moments of each other, which sounds contradictory to those that are stuck in those two moments and they don't see the limit. But because of this higher level of in, inner logic that we're teaching as a new healthcare system, um, we can start to heal those contradictions in the new identity formation process that does create this higher 
sort of spirit of community in a secular sense as like almost like a team team sports right these flow games are like sports um but also in a deep inner meaningful way of uh, what traditional religion was trying to find in the chaos of uh, contemporary reality and the social production of goods and services so that should be a novel direction that could get a new uh get us on a new path towards a revolution in economics and hopefully win us the Nobel Economics Prize. We have arrived at the literature slide and it may be surprising that the previous slide was talking about economics and now we're jumping to literature when we would think that economics was a higher science than art. But the way that Hegel conceptualizes it the objective spirit sphere where civil society, the family life, state life, uh, that sphere completely develops itself and then turns into the sort of absolute spirit sphere where the first moment is art and literature is a subsection of art uh, where we give the Nobel Literature Prize for writing. But writing is in itself an art and has many aspects to it. We're going to call this uh, spirit words to try and get into a new aspect that's never really been covered before, but is communicated in various ways, uh, particularly by Nobel Prize laureates in literature. But you may notice we have lost another trigger. Uh, we were at uh, nine in the previous slide. We lost one because some individuals will look at the hero's journey and immediately become triggered because it's a bit patriarchal. Uh, when Joseph Campbell formulated it about the 500 greatest heroes in history, at least the ones he studied, and he said that only men could generally go on heroes' journeys like this. Um, that may have changed, but it's a stereotype, and we don't subscribe to that in terms of spirit. Uh, these types of journeys of reason can occur in many ways. Um, and also there are people who are incredibly formless in their art, and they don't like this monomyth kind of universality that applies to all types of storytelling or can. So there's an anti sort of uh, way of doing art. And we're going to include that as well, that perhaps in this hero's journey structure built within it can be a, a perhaps anti hero's journey as a palindrome, which is a speculative movement uh, in terms of seeing the opposites in things together. Now what is totally and and you uniquely new in terms of the way we're going to go about trying to win the Nobel Literature Prize is in terms of this cascade here we're really trying to solve the problem of cooperation that's how this presentation began human beings are facing existential crises right now uh, because we can't cooperate and cooperation is interdependence requires others interdependence is culture culture is communication Communication is language, and language is grammar. Now, this is where it's fairly new. Uh, this connection has been made in various ways before, uh, in broken, fragmented ways. But Hegel has achieved it in a more systematic way, where he says grammar is actually logic, and logic can either be abstract or concrete. He says we have an abstract logic right now, which uh, affects the way we, we create grammatical meaning. And if you have concrete logic, you can have universal meaning. Abstract logic can't reach this, it can approximate it. And then universal meaning is the absolute. Meaning has a embedded or implicit meaning of, of mind, mindness. It has significance to the person or the thing trying to comprehend whatever it is they're trying to define or say the actuality of. But here we're saying something incredibly unique, or at least Hegel is, that the kind of universal meaning he's showing us, that we're showing in all these slides across all domains of knowledge, is that the meaning we're looking for is the absolute kind because this kind of logic is in itself thinking itself. This is not a subjective human endeavor only. It is a speculative moving back and forth, uh, somewhat like... Wittgenstein's language games where they seem like they're kind of pointless but it pushes us to this 
sort of question of, well, where does the grammar come from? And where does the order of the universe come from? Uh, why isn't it all just random chaos? Why is there meaning in the first place? And it seems like once we try and answer that, there's this sort of absolute grammar that uh, we have profound artists in history trying to pinpoint. But it seems like the closer we get to this kind of meaning, the more um, ineffable it becomes, which is a bit ironic considering, you know, we're looking for the literature prize where we're supposed to be putting, uh, we're supposed to be expressing this sort of inexpressible, or at least attempting to show that in various linguistic devices. But the reason why this becomes a, a problem for cooperation is that the way we form meaning, the way we logic, the way we form grammar, if it's abstract, it affects all the higher levels. So then our grammar becomes abstract, our language becomes abstract, our communication becomes abstract, our culture becomes abstract, our interdependence becomes abstract, and the cooperation breaks down as abstract. So the difference between abstract and concrete, concrete means belonging together. It has a deeper sort of meaning where meaning represents the belonging together in truth of, of a subjectivity with its meaning, with its significance. And the absolute has a meaning that's sort of coming through us in all these different modes and different levels of concreteness. But they can be much better communicated if we grasp, uh, grasp this underlying essence of what grammar and logic really is. There's been attempts in history. So here's one in this slide by Leonard Bernstein. He was a tremendous composer and uh, musician, but in his famous lectures, uh, or his famous lecture, The Unanswered Question, he performs a master class in trying to rebuild the entire musical enterprise using phonology, building up a grammar, trying to show that there's a pattern in terms of making wonderful music, making wonderful art. And he runs through all types of uh, ling linguistic or artistic expression to make his case that there's a growing happening um, in the world of art that we can't see. We sort of intuit it through the immediacy of the beauty of the art. And Hegel says something profoundly similar in that beauty is the idea in sensuous form. And we mean the logical idea, the absolute idea in its, in its total concretion. And we're trying to show this universal quotient, this universal kind of intelligence. The better that we grasp this underlying universality, the higher this kind of intelligence is. It's related to uh, IQ, intelligence quotient, in general intelligence. But Hegel goes one step farther and shows there's, a, there's an incredible consistency to this kind of growing logic in all the higher forms. And it happens through what we covered in chemistry, the universal evolution. So how we're going to try and win the Nobel Literature Prize is pursuing this ineffability. And it's very difficult to do because it's inherent in everything we do already. It's in the beingness of things. And all we're doing it's coming to terms with it in a more explicit form as language and thinkingness, explicit realization. And Hegel gives a really great paragraph on why this is so difficult, but how it relates to all these different forms. He says in his Encyclopedia Logic, where you would least expect these kinds of you, you know artistic grammatical insights. But because it really is universal, it applies to all domains. And he says that here, he says, it will now be understood that logic is the all animating spirit of all the sciences and its categories, the spiritual hierarchy. So he's already speaking speculatively that what we normally think of sciences is not the dead kind. The dead kind of sciences doesn't have what he's about to say, but the alive kind merges the spiritual with the scientific in an infinite science. That is systematic, it has all the benefits of justification and rationality of modern science, but its presuppositions are questioned even more deeply. It's, an, it's a deeper skepticism, which we don't normally associate with spirituality. We usually think it's about dogma, but the kind that he's talking about is radically, truly, and remarkably universal. He says, they are the heart and center of things, and yet at the same time, they are always on our lips and apparently at least perfectly familiar objects. He's talking about logic. 
the categories of thought. He says, but things thus familiar are usually the greatest strangers. Nice ironic flip there, or nice juxtaposition. Being, for example, is a category of pure thought. But to make is an object of investigation never occurs to us. Common fancy puts the absolute far away in a world beyond. Sort of like Kant's uh, thing in itself. He says, the absolute is rather directly before us. So present that so long as we think, we must, though without express consciousness of it, always carry it with us and always use it. Language is the main depository of these types of thought. And one use of the grammatical instruction which children receive is unconsciously to turn their attention to distinctions of thought, of logic here. Logic and pure thought in these categories are the same kind of structure, these universals we're talking about. And he's giving us some direct insight that even children are doing this, but we're doing it in a bad way. We're doing it in an abstract way because when we're teaching children grammar or teaching them to read or uh, connect adjectives to predicates, we are using these absolute shapes that he's talking about up here that are the all animating spirit of the sciences and the and language and the spiritual hierarchy. But he says, when we learn them in this broken way, in this chopped up way, what is the most familiar is actually something we take for granted every day. We never think to question it. We never think to make thought itself an object, these categories that we're using that are so basic that they are immediately in all the distinctions we're making. And that's why language at first is pretty uh, blocky. Noam Chomsky uh, is trying to get to this universal type of grammar. Uh, and Leonard Bernstein mentions him in terms of an inspiration for the musical analogy. But I, we, we think that Hegel has done it across all of the domains and in a way that's applicable to them all in a familiar way. But the way that he uses them, the way is the difficult thing to realize. So they, he doesn't change the words. He still call, says it's being, it's, it's nothing, it's something, it's becoming. Words we use every day. But the way he's using them is in such a profoundly, in a remarkably clear way that we don't recognize it. His phenomenology of spirit and his works, the way he writes his literature, his masterworks, his linguistic style, is incredibly confusing at first. So if we try and go to a passage, um, you know, something like determination, we can say the in itself into which something is reflected into itself out of its being for other is no longer an abstract in itself, but as negation of its being for other is mediated by the latter, which is thus a moment. It is not only the immediate identity of the something with itself, but the identity through which there is present in something that which it is in itself. So most people will read that and not understand what he's saying at all. It sounds like he's word playing and he's using some special terms, but the terms are just being other in abstract. These words are not neologisms of a great profound jargon. It seems like it, but the, it simultaneously has this feeling of familiarity. So there's this incredible juxtaposition going on where it feels familiar, but it also feels incredibly foreign to the point of incomprehensibility. It, it feels like gibberish in some way. And what he's showing us is that the true way of talking, those sentences make perfect sense, but the way that we've learned grammar is too abstract to grasp the way he's using the words we, we think we normally understand. We're gonna try and show that with the Nobel Literature Prize for the first time, where what he's doing is actually incredibly clear, much more clear. His, e his UQ is much higher and that our goal is to show the universal evolution of the way he's using the words in, a, in this growing kind of way. And we're going to do that with this Nobel Surprise document. And Nobel Surprise is itself a play on words uh, because <laughs> within uh, surprise is, of course, prize. But it's going to come in as, as a surprise to the Nobel Committee is that if we pull this off with the right talent across the world, at first it's going to seem very simple. It's going to be a story. So this universal evolution is gonna start as the universal story of being, or story of being for short, and even shorter, the shortest level is actually a lullaby. It's three lines long. And we're calling it the eternal lullaby because of this universality, this eternal kind of meaning of the grammar in itself, thinking itself.
that we don't normally grasp. Then we introduce the character, the main character, whose name is B B Inning, for one version of the story that we're writing. There's multiple versions as we showed in previous slides, but this one has B B Inning, which is another wordplay because Hegel's first category, the first true thought he says of this kind of absolute logic that will rebuild our cooperation structure from scratch is pure being. So the main character's first name is B, and then his, uh, their last name, it doesn't really have a gender or anything yet, we can fill that in with whatever, um, is B inning. And the true dialectical movement is always inward. Well, it's inward and outward, but the true inwardness is the spiritual sort of development. So the last name would normally be being, but now it's be in ing to play on the fact that this is an Olipo kind of poem uh, that sort of tells the story in itself. So we have B B ing as the main character, and it represents one of these universal categories of the universal evolution, one of the universal shapes that we spoke about in physics, the shape dynamics team, and shape chemistry, and and uh, in all the other stages. So then B B ing is following this kind of evolution. That's what these yellow circles mean. These are the invisible supersensuous shapes that are governing the story's dynamics, just like the universe is following these shapes. And we're beginning the hero's journey of B.B. Inning, where we're, where we're doing something clever here. This Nobel Surprise document is the one that's going to contain all the other prizes. So the Nobel Physics Prize is the next level of science. This is the logical side. Logic comes first to Hegel, and then it evolves into physics. And then, of course, we have the Janus Point Shape Dynamics. But we're going to make it so that B.B. Inning writes the white paper or the abstract of the new ideas that we we're going to prove it's going to be in the story being written by b b inning by the multiple people in the new spirit uh, the new world spirit and then maybe b b inning changes their job whatever and they start working in chemistry and winning they win the nobel chemistry prize by realizing this insight in physics leads to the second one in terms of shape dynamics and it's a fundamental shift it's a paradigm shift a kunian shift in the science of or the philosophy of science at einstein like levels um, when he was redesigning space time and and you know equating energy and mass which are typical opposites uh, but then this discovery of chemistry kind of takes a derailment in any way that the we decide to write the story um, maybe they end up in the ukraine russian war and they come out of this abstract space into concrete into our time or some other time and they experience PTSD uh, or this rising anxiety and depression trend that we see happening in the Nobel Medical Prize that we're going to try and address with uh, inner and holy health care. And B.B. Inning then during the war might have a discovery of the holy kind of thinking of the Medical Prize and creates the Christmas Truce, which is a famous story about how in the middle of negation uh, they started to sublate or, or achieve an inner unity amongst the tension. But this is a more universal understanding, so there could be a Diwali Ramadan equivalent or any kind of spiritual uh, meaning that starts to heal oppositions in a powerful way. Once this discovery of holy thinking is connected to these shapes, it starts to become concrete and the universal evolution begins to show itself through B.B. Inning's hero's journey as an activism on idea-based economics, which we covered in the previous slide, to revamp society so that these types of wars um, can stop by making sure that um, the economics are governed in a more flow-based, intelligent, and wise way. And then B.B. Inning at the end shows that everything is like this. Uh, a new world spirit can emerge in terms of the cooperative element overall and start writing perhaps <laughs> master works like this, these uh, Nobel Literature Prize works that have these really high UQs, uh, universal quotients, and understands these universal meaning shapes. So these are the meanings that B.B. Inning is moving through, and they divide themselves in different levels of complexity. So this is the simplest one. We're just showing how all of the other prizes are going to be presented through the Nobel Surprise, the Nobel Literature Prize. It's a clever way to sort of write out all the papers in an entertaining way that proves that the form and the content kind of go together. 
and to kind of prove in an interesting way that this kind of grammar and this log, absolute logic exists, we're doing a study on the Nobel laureates. There's over 600 of them, and each one is supposed to give a Nobel lecture on the principle of how, why they won the, the Nobel Prize, what their work is about. And so far, the study is taking all the lectures and doing a word study and word comparison to see if any of these universal shapes, these universal kind of words, are used in the lectures in this sort of universal evolution, this growing way. And here's a few of the results so far is time, life, being. These are very, these are frequently used words. And one of course is being, where pure being and be beginning uh, might be a line. But we're gonna do these, this linguistic study to see if Hegel is right that underneath the highest ideas is this grammar. Are these universal shapes? And we're starting to do that now across not just the Nobel literature laureates, but we're, it should be true across every domain. So we have peace winner, Nobel literature prize winners, Nobel uh, peace winners, Nobel physics uh, winners, um, all types, chemistry. And we're just showing that we're performing that study now. It's part of the proving the theory in a experimental way, which might seem unintuitive at first, but it, once it clicks, the depth of this is truly remarkable. And Hegel goes on to say, and seeing that difference in culture on the whole depends on difference in thought determinations which are manifested, this must be so still more with respect to philosophies. And so uh, philosophy is sort of the highest level of wisdom. Uh, right from the very beginning, this process is happening, from the very beginning to the end with philosophy. And this is a section from Thales, who Hegel regards as the first genuine philosopher, uh, the most abstract too, but um, we covered in the chemistry slide why his philosophy has some kind of merit despite being rudimentary. So if we're going to have a wise, uh, a stronger and wiser culture that will create higher levels of cooperation, we have to take this linguistic process very seriously. Um, as well as these uh, thought determinations. This is another way of expressing the universal shapes. He gives an example about Plotinus and how art is sort of similar to the states he achieved in terms of channeling uh, through an inspired state, pure reason, these shapes again. And artists are sort of doing something similar because at first the meaning comes to them in an indirect sort of way where they have to get out of the way of, of the inspiration and let it come forward, either on a canvas or in, in works. It's a very immediate kind of reason, and it can have a lot of contingency to it. But the greatest philosophers are all trying to grapple with this, the invisibility, the, the super sensuousness of it, because it's not something that you can touch, taste, feel, whereas art is normally about this. Um, but we're, we're showing that it comes through the form of sensuousness and the form of beauty and not just any kind of beauty, objective art, real deep art to Hegel has this universal significance to it. Uh, great art, he said, is, is about God or this higher meaning that we can all identify with and self-recognize with. Recognition is a key process in what makes good literature. When we read the words, the audience has a feeling that their life experience is embodied in the words in some pure sense, in some sense of empathy and understanding and nuance. It has a, a mystery and a mysticism to it. Not many people will consider philosophy mystical. Usually it's thought of as an ego. And it's, a, it's a trap of the ego and it's full of, it's full of dryness and it's a science. But the way that Hegel describes it is probably the true essence, where there's a mystery and a mysticism. Real science, real philosophy, speculative, he says, which is another way of saying mysticism. But when he says mysticism, he doesn't just mean superstition. Superstition is this randomness that doesn't really convey universal meaning. It's very particular to the cultures at the time. They define the meanings in a non-rational, or it could be rational to their limit, the, in the past, the ancient Greeks used to throw snake entrails into the wind and see where they blew, and that would be a sign and all this kind of stuff. And to some degree, there would be some wisdom there, but this is a different level. The mysticism he's talking about is more like 
more like uh, Wittgenstein's um, bunny rabbit, where you can see it either as a bunny or as a as a rabbit. Um, uh, so what we're going to see here is a picture of a duck rabbit, where if you look at it carefully, this is a kind of speculative moment. There's an ambiguity here. And what's very beautiful about uh, Leonard Bernstein's lecture is he says that towards the end of his lectures that there's an ambiguity that happens in art that can be exploited to, to bring out this more universal grammar hidden within the sensuousness of the musical notes or the melodies we're getting another snapshot over here where if you look at it one way it's a it's a duck and if you look at it the other way it's a rabbit and this flipping back and forth is also present in the in our language in sentences like speculative sentences or semi mystical sentences like there are no truths but if you think about that if there really are no truths then the sentence itself is a truth it's making a truth claim so then if there are no truths that means that the sentence must be false, but if it's false, then it must be true. So then it starts flipping back and forth, kind of like this rabbit and this duck uh, graphic. This seems like something that human minds are doing on their own. But the mysterious thing Hegel is saying is that no, this is embedded uh, objectively in the, the way that our minds make meaning, whether it's through English symbols, whether it's through Latin symbols, German, Russian, there's an objective kind of meaning process happening in our grammar through these, these universal categories that we never think to question. We don't just have speculative sentences, mystical kind of sentences. We also have mystical kind of words, Janus words, um, which is kind of a nice play on the Nobel Physics Prize with the Janus point in Julian Barber's work. But the kind of mystery Hegel is talking about is a rational kind of mystery where it lies, uh, it lies beyond the compass of understanding, but that doesn't make it irrational. It means that the world in this logic is so incredible that as we're learning about it, it seems miraculous. And it is incredibly mysterious how this flipping happens. Um, and this ambiguity sort of opens up that shows the true dialectical nature of the movement of the ratios of the world, including how our language is, is mimicking this and becoming more refined in some sense. Um, hopefully becoming more refined. And he said German was particularly good at this sort of speculative meaning with words like sublation or, or aufheben. Um, there's an inherent playfulness in words, not even just wordplay that we give to the words, but inherent within them themselves. They are playful when you think of them in their non-rigid way, which is in this back and forth. And really great um, literary agents are masters at this. They know, they have an intuitive sense of how the, the grammatical rules, the linguistic devices, the way phonology mixes with phenomenology um, and many other forms to, to create syntactical meanings and semantic meanings. Uh, that's what they're doing is they're just doing this logic and trying to approximate something that has a deep, profound meaning. But in the end, what we're showing is it all comes down to these universal shapes, universal evolution. And that word universal is being overplayed here on purpose because it's the hard thing to grasp. But really, this growing structure is about the story of, of being. And because we're all being, it really should apply to all of us in this playful way if we look at it properly, in this speculative way. So really what we're doing here is creating ontologies. And the story of being, the universal story of being, um, we're going to try and write in terms of these ont ontological structures at different levels of competency or different levels of complexity. So we have complexity one, complexity two, complexity three. And then people from all over the world can help write the story in these language games uh, we showed in previous slides, but we'll show more on how to actually practice this in the last slides of this presentation. Right now we're just uh, mapping out the theory, why this is Nobel Prize worthy, why this is not just playing a game randomly but we're actually working on incredibly profound uh, principles that underlie what artists have been doing and ling linguistic and Nobel literature laureates have been doing for uh, many, many years. So in the first competency, the ontological structure is here in the brackets. So not only can it be just a, a 
a literary form of a book or some kind of written form, but it can also be a play. Can, we have an act one, act two, act three. If people want to turn the lullaby, this first competency is the lullaby, into different forms they can, but it must preserve the ontological structure, this universal shape meaning. So the first one is logic itself, the second one is nature, and the third one is spirit. Hegel calls this the absolute syllogism of highest rational meaning. These are connected together as a three-part structure in this order. If it's in a different order, it'll be less rational. And this is inside of everything. So the first number represents the order at this level of competency, and the second level represents the logical number. So the science of logic lists these categories in the table of contents here. So we just numbered all of these as it's growing. These are becoming more and more complex. So these numbers represent where in that order they're occurring. So at the very highest level, we're going from the very beginning to the very end, but we're only making one leap in the middle. It's much more complex, but if we want to teach children this, uh, this is the simplest way you can begin. And the, the second brackets are the hero's journey categories. So number one is a call to action. Uh, number four is a crossing the threshold into the unknown world. And then the last one is a return crossing with threshold number 15, where the hero comes back after being transformed. And we're talking about a sort of dialectical transformation here of B beginning as an abstract agent. Um, but the sentence is very simple. It goes, all B beginning was logically being in the beginning and grew up becoming nature, thinking, leaving home, disagreeing. So the key word here is logic, logically, and it's transforming into the next step. And it does that through a negative moment, a negation. So we're, we're performing all the universal moves, which might not make sense to people who are still in sensuous consciousness or what Hegel calls pictorial thinking. Um, but in essence, this is the shape language in artistic form. And it goes to the next level where BB inning crosses over. They leave home. Home is where the hero's journey begins, kind of like the Shire in Lord of the Rings. Um, but then they cross over into the unknown world. So here, nature is a completely new world from the logical world where BB inning began. And in terms of Hegel's science of logic, there's a painful, it's a separation moment. So there's a lot of pain and tearing. And he says, it's sort of a privilege because it allows B beginning to be external to itself. He doesn't use B beginning, but he says being is external to itself so that it can start developing its thinking capacity. But it must tarry with the dialectic. Tarry is an important word. So it goes, B as nature worked hard and tarried long because they were unseen fleeing. So when something is fleeing from something else, it's actually conditioned by it. It's not really free. Um, fleeing is just a, a, it's a conditioning basically. It creates the bad infinite. Then the next stage is after tearing and working hard for a long time, eventually BB and he wisens up and they, they learn the lesson that they're supposed to learn through the work. And then they come back home after having achieved the hero's dream. If they fight the final, final boss and they transform into the true hero. And, this, and it goes, be, be, uh, but be knew better, matured into spirit wisdom forever, and returned home in well-being, suffering. This is the genuine freedom, the return moment that incorporates the negative moment. So this is really what the shapes are doing at the highest, simplest level. Uh, most of us are learning this in some kind of fragmented form. We don't put it in this way. But it's not very interesting unless you're a child learning this for the first time. It's like basically one, two, three. But the second ontology is more complex where we take the each sentence of the lullaby and we break it into its three nested logical forms. And we just deepen the story. The story stays the same, but we deepen it. And we put more categories of uh, determinate being here. So logic actually has doctrine of being, doctrine of essence, and doctrine of notion within it before it reaches nature. So we can fill in the plot line more. And we can align it still with the, the categories of the hero's journey by saying, okay, now the first, the scene one of act one, or the second scene one of act one is the call to action, but also now we can do the denial of the call. And then we can also have supernatural aid as the third moments. These were missing in the, the less complex version. And then we get into nature and then it has its four and then it's four or it's three is three. So at this level of competency, the ontology is getting deeper. And then, of course, competency three is a taking of each one of these three scenes and developing three scenes within it. 
So we have this triadic or this trinitarian kind of structure deepening the meaning of the story, even though the plot line is basically staying the same. It's the interesting thing is the deepness. And in some sense, our real lives are doing a version of this uh, as we move along linearly in space-time. There's this sort of spiritual, logical dynamic deepening, depending on how rational we are and how much we tarry with the deeper uh, kind of purpose of life or the deeper meaning of it all, our life experience. So these sentences haven't been written yet. They're just here to provide the backbone to create the universal evolution for everybody from every culture to write in their truth, their meaning into the story. Because this really is uh, the logical categories that once we, we teach it, will make sense in basically every culture. Uh, so really, the way this evolution is occurring, this growing, uh, is, it's been expressed in many other ways in the past. There's art and then religion and this philosophy. But the Kabbalah, the Sephirot um, of Judaism, is sort of the, the most mystical part. It's likely the most speculative part where the plurality of Ein Sof, which is the, the beginning God, the indeterminate, the ineffable, the Tao in some senses, but in the Judean tradition, it's, it's one God. So it's not supposed to have many gods. It's not polytheism in their uh, religion. So they speak of emanation and effluence, this flowing forth. So in a way, B beginning is actually, it's the same character growing in different forms. There's a continuity. There's an effluence happening in the story because that's how real ontology works where things are separate and distinct but they're actually also the exact same thing this is what religion generally calls the reality of realities b beginning is moving into different realities as they're coming it's, a, it's sort of like a coming of age story <laughs> you could say in the metaphysical sense but also the natural sense and then the spiritual sense the world of mind um, more directly, in terms of the Christian religion, we have direct comparisons with uh, linguistics, where in the beginning was the Word in Genesis, and Jesus was the Word. The Word was made flesh, and the Word was with God. So this Word is representing these universal shapes. It's just that it's not really in its scientific order in religious form, um, because it's, very con it's, it's contingent on historical events, which are particularities. So the essential logic, uh, the ontology behind holy, holy texts is likely, Hegel got it right, likely one of these ontological structures at different levels of complexity and different um, chronologies. But in terms of the logical chronology, this is the timeless, spaceless shape progression, the effluence and the emanation that all these great divine thinkers were trying to communicate to pictorial thinking beings that weren't rational enough or mystically specul speculative enough to grasp the real meanings. So they put it in a way that the, the general population could understand in terms of uh, pictorial forms. And so we're drawing inspiration from this and saying that actually they were hitting on something uh, true. And we're going to fill out uh, a version of this with all the cultures around the world lending their, their insights. And uh, it should be quite quite interesting and quite meaningful uh, to everybody who's participating, um, whether it's at the lullaby level, whether it's at the teen level, or whether it's at the undergraduate level. This is basically what the story is based on. And the Nobel Physics Prize, of course, would happen here in the space-time matter. The physics side of things, the chemistry side would happen here in the ontology. Um, of course, the, uh, the economics prize would happen in objective spirit, which is the second sphere. And then uh, the spiritual meaning side in terms of peace and and literature itself would be here in the art religion and philosophical side um, so this structure really does it all and it's probably the first time it's been put this way where we see even the, the sort of the second number here the ontological number uh, is 1.5 2 41 59 79 80 108 127 144 148 184 203 in the next section of the lullaby, it's just repeating those numbers. Even though the other numbers are changing, these numbers are just repeating. The logical numbers are repeating. So the science of logic is repeating in Hegel's encyclopedia across all three of these domains. It's just the logic in three different forms, which is um, sort of solving the Trinitarian and monism uh, and polytheism. All of these panentheism, pantheism, like 
all these modes of what God was supposed to be the highest level of absolute meaning make sense in this these concrete structures of speculative meaning where it's all happening at once in its correct moments. And that momentary thinking is the rational, ratio-based thinking that we, we are missing in terms of the way we create uh, language, communication, culture, interdependence, which is why we're lacking the cooperation to solve the problems like the doomsday clock and all these other things that are becoming increasingly urgent as our external technologies um, radically and exponentially increase. I hope that was very uh, enlightening and um, something new. And uh, hopefully you'd like to participate in helping get us, getting us this recognition that we really do need an intervention of an incredible magnitude that resets the, the foundations and, and um, creates a Copernican revolution in literature and the way that we create connection, even through art and the immediacy of the life experience. The universal story of being should be an interesting way to increase the UQ scores, the universal quotient scores, as people learn by contributing their wisdom in this sort of speculative back and forth where they're informing the story and the, for, the story is informing them. And we're learning as we go this, this deeper way of connection and community that is inherently more, more playful, but also carries the, the resolution to the existential crisis uh, and maybe even the existential angst that the externality of our, our self-development might be creating um, that can be grounded upon something we all can believe in, whether secularly or religiously, philosophically or artistically, literarily. <laughs> We've now arrived at the last uh, Nobel Prize, and this one is Spirit Community, creating a Copernican revolution in peace for the Nobel Peace Prize that we see down here in the corner. You can see, uh, compared to the previous slide about uh, the Nobel Literature Prize, we had eight triggers. We're losing one more trigger because there are individuals that will look at this slide and become triggered by the fact there's a dancing plant here, making this not look very rigorous or academic, um, but also because there's a lot of abstract metaphysics going on in terms of the peace process, when really the Nobel Peace Prize is about concretely building uh, fraternity between nations. And this looks like it's a bunch of theory that has no practice or real meaning. It's, it's really, has no bearing on international affairs and the real human suffering that's taking place as we speak. And it's going to drastically increase as these global problems continue to intensify and you know create hundreds of millions of climate refugees or um, the nuclear war, uh, the 90, 90 seconds to midnight sort of threat in terms of geopolitical tensions worldwide and in terms of the strife the cultural strife that the pandemics created all over the world uh, increased anxiety and depression many of these things are existential level threats we have species uh, going extinct at, at rates that we're we've never really seen before and we need to do something quickly the real point of this slide is to fix this problem of having too much external connection and not enough what's called internal connection and intimacy. And the external connection we touched upon in the Nobel Medical Prize, where the inner and holy healthcare is going to rebalance and repair the fact that we're losing more and more control of our minds and the mind-body connection because we're relying on external sources of stability when the power of thought at least according to hegel is infinite and the real strength behind the sort of world of uh, false appearances or illusion or emptiness the sort of 
Buddhist Nargajuna says that the, the world that we think is real is actually the least real and there's something behind it that's more permanent. And uh, we found in the previous slides that there is something more permanent, but it's also scientific. Um, so this is the sort of bodily kind of externality, but there's also a social kind of externality where social media might have increased the level of connection or the quantity, but the quality of connection seems to be reduced and exacerbated by the fact that we have so much external connection now that feels superficial or we're comparing each other in ways that our culture doesn't really seem ready for, that we've lost that sort of tight-knit community feeling of home that tribes used to have, but we've also gained a sort of more universal exposure to the true depth of what the human species is capable of. It just seems like the growth rates seem to be out of proportion and anxiety and depression are going up because of that because we can't really relate to each other. The, the diversity is so large. But we don't want to reduce the diversity because that's actually where some of the, the greatest spice of life comes from. But there has to be some kind of unity in the diversity that is not oppressive, that brings us back together in terms of an internal connection that we would otherwise call, in colloquial terms, cooperation. So the real problem is not necessarily, not necessarily artificial intelligence, climate change, nuclear war, all of these external problems. The real problem is that we can't cooperate and it's leading to these, these existential threats, basically, including how do we program an AI if our logic is abstract too? We're going to create an intelligence that is mimicking the lack of maturity in our wisdom. And because it's millions of times more powerful, potentially, we have a significant concern to the point that we have Elon Musk uh, seeking FDA approval, at least in the United States, to put um, computer chips in, directly in our brains to wire human minds directly to the internet. Very uh, incredible things. Our species is at a turning point. And there are a lot of those in the spiritual community that feel like this is uh, the wrong move. And in a sense, they're right in terms of the internal connection is missing to mediate this level of power wisely but at the same time science does have virtues to it uh, we just need to implement the concrete version the infinite science that hegel gives us to make sure that we don't lose that internal cohesion and then we inter we, we return to a living kind of logic this life this metaphysical life doesn't necessarily mean uh, plant life even though we have a dancing cactus here uh, the sensuous world the material world approximates this kind of deeper reasoning to things. And it might not look like we're saying very much. If you've gone through all the slides, it seems like there's not a lot saying. Everything is so general. But that's the point, in a way, is this really is a universal kind of everywhere pervading sense of truth. And so the, the Nobel Prizes will be won, not necessarily just on specialized jargon or neologisms but it'll be rec it'll be a recognition process so that's what this word here is for is all we're doing is we're recognizing that what we're really doing has a pattern behind it that is scientific and logically coherent and systematic and corresponds with reality in a surprising way but we're we're recognizing in all these diverse forms what is missing that should be uniting them in an essence, the one that we're seeking for that higher cooperation. So just the process of recognition allows us to, to sort of embody Plato's uh, famous dialogue about learning as remembering and returning to this sort of higher state of realization and actualization. So this should save decades and decades of conceptual qualitative work in terms of restructuring how we think about ourselves and the domains of knowledge and the epistemological limits we've reached. Much like how in previous slides we talked about Einstein creating revolutions in physics because of the way he thought about nature changed. And it's, a, it's a, like a quantum leap. And we're doing the same thing. Uh, more practically, at the end of these presentations will be the Universal Periodic Table of Absolute Shapes, the up to as, which we've referred to in previous slides, but haven't explored yet. This is where it gets a little bit more concrete. 
in terms of working together and historians will very much like this in addition to another document called the synchronicity document which increases that interconnection by showing this recognition process in a astonishing new way uh, to the point of where if people are not only attached to sensuous symbols um, in a super sensuous way in the bad sense versus the good super sensuous way the metaphysical way in rational truth um, if they're not just attached to that kind of sensuousness but people as well historical agents rather than the truths they embody then we have a solution to that that's more practical but for now the theory for those who are studying the the theory in their specialty or as their specialty these general terms should start aligning sort of like putting a pair of glasses on it'll start taking pieces that already exist and putting them into a new order, a new combination that will resolve paradoxes within the field, long-standing ones as well. Because the conceptualization is literally creating Copernican-level revolutions of insight, or what Thomas Kuhn would call revolutionary science versus the sort of normal progression. That's the kind of tectonic uh, architecture that's shifting here. So we're essentially just trying to solve something that seems so simple cooperation but it's been sort of plaguing humanity for millions of years because of this dialectic of externality and internality so how do we get towards this sense of peace then this higher level of cooperation we have five basic points to win the nobel peace prize and there has to be a practical element to it either you can't just provide a theory this one has to have an embodied meaning where we're going to work together we're not just going to create peace and say how it's done logically we're actually going to embody that logic and pursue an objective together to create a story that will unite man uh, humankind in this higher sense of cooperation and meaning making that is scientifically creating scientifically valid in building bridges between territories of knowledge or culture that have historically been in opposition or intention so the first thing we need to consider is number one, universal design. So universal design is about designing a human experience in a universal sense for everybody, no matter where, where you're born, who you are, uh, the principles apply to you in terms of creating flow states uh, and a sense of a no envy principle. We're using this up to as for this universal recognition process to supercharge it because that's where meaning actually happens. A lot of this, recognizing is what we're bad at because we're enmeshed in sensuous reality and we can't see the interconnection behind things because we're stuck at the realm of appearances and the evanescing and the becoming and the coming and going of what is not eternal truth they're just particular truths or finite truths that disappear in the process of history so we found a way to design um, in a much more universal way much like how uh, universal design is already a term in the ordinary sense for disabilities where when you're designing a building or um, architecture you're making it so that it's accessible to as many people as possible uh, of different abilities so we don't fall into ableism or any of that kind of stuff but it's it's mostly just focused in the physical sense and in some cases the most severe forms of mental disability but this kind of universal um, design is even for the spiritually disabled. And for the, those who are religious who are watching this, hopefully you're not triggered by the scientific references, but hopefully the secular crowd is also noticing we're moving back and forth in this rationality that is not common. So it looks contradictory at first, but once the logic starts to sink in, this universal design principle applies to all domains, and we can design new experiences across all of them. One of the first things we have to do, though, to create this peace in this new design of society and culture is we have to put education into its proper context, into its proper position. So the one type of education that will create peace is really the most wise education. It's an education based on wisdom. And we have a name for that domain of knowledge or seeking of wisdom, and that is philosophy. But not any kind of philosophy. The kind of philosophy we have today, Hegel calls abstract philosophy. It's not really real philosophy. It's too external to itself, which is why it's been 
demoted from its true place at the top of the tree of knowledge, the pinnacle, as the living sort of knowledge that retains the inner connection that religion was grasping in the concrete totality of everything. Uh, this genuine philosophy is speculative and grasps the sort of mystical nature of the mundane as this universal kind of infinite logic which sublates traditional oppositions such as religion and science where sublation as we'll get to in a minute um, is the actually it might be good to talk about this now this kind of education is based upon transcending ordinary conceptions of what Hegel calls abstract negation where things are left conditioning each themselves at the same level and you can't get out get beyond the limit so much of tension uh, much of the tension in society is based on this but this word sublation is very important because it's a speculative term it's kind of mystical but not mystical in the super, superstitious sense but in this new absolute way of thinking in terms of our thoughts themselves being objects that can be aligned and thought with in a specific way. The way we use them ordinarily is in a sort of random way. We never think that our thoughts themselves are, are organized in a, in a specific order. You know, we, we look at a computer or a chair or something, and that's an object that we apply our thoughts to. We think about objects, material objects external to us, and we might have objects in our mind that are imagination, but they're usually just repeated reflections of material objects. But the, the, the categories themselves, such as being, what is being, everything has being, so that means being is nothing. But actually, in terms of pure being, it becomes a determination of higher forms that don't necessarily have to have material objects. These are metaphysical objects of pure reason. And uh, it sounds like it's not grounded on anything significant, but the way that Hegel does it, it is actually more skeptically grounded in a truer science because the current foundations of the sort of abstract kind of philosophy takes it makes assumptions that aren't justified so this genuine kind of philosophy based on sublation is what we want at the top this is the new universal kind of education because it's genuine philosophy is not like other domains of knowledge which are particulars it's not a particular amongst particulars and Hegel gives this example of you know, cherries, where if you look at uh, cherries, they are a type of fruit. But philosophy is not like a cherry amongst, you know, oranges and, uh, you know, apples or whatever other fruits are. It, it is like the fruit category itself of which pervades all the other particular fruits. And so it's, it's the thing that provides the internal necessity, the scientific connection between all of them, including metaphysical logic, including religion, including art, including things that aren't traditionally seen as having the systematic totality. They do if you think about life in this living, sublative way. So sublation has three parts to it. And we'll kind of go down here now and say that sublation is a movement. It is a canceling, a preser preserving, and a raising to a higher emergent category of thought or level of thinking. And if we go back to this sort of universal school of self-determination, that when we're learning, the best way to learn is through this process of self-recognition, that we move at our own rate. But when we're doing that, we're, you we're all using the same sort of shapes, these universal sort of peace shapes, which in the previous uh, Nobel Literature Prize slide we were calling universal meaning shapes. Well, in this slide, these shapes, if they're in the wrong order, will not create peace. It'll create cognitive dissonance and bias and what Hegel calls one-sidedness that will war with the other one-sidedness. And they won't be moments. They'll be like rigid fixities that war to the death. It's very painful to be in this sort of culture. Uh, but when you're when you're thinking about it in the wise way, when the categories move from each other, they actually move and develop themselves. This movement can be in that painful way or in the peaceful way. And the peaceful way is the sublative way, where you're preserving and canceling and raising to a higher unity. 
and you can see these arrows are pointing that it's happening at every stage. It's happening between these two categories. It's happening between these three categories. It's happening between this category and this new category. And within this bigger category, between these two nested categories, and between the sublation of the nested within the nested as the transcendence inside the bigger one. And then, of course, to on and on and on further and further layers of uh, concrete thought. They get higher and higher levels of complexity of which our consciousness is one form. But sublation is something that we're very bad at in the beginning of human consciousness, in the sort of carnal drives, we're more animalistic, and we don't move in this fluid, rational way, this living way. These categories are literally growing into each other. Instead, what we do is what this paragraph is about here with our cactus friend here. We'll call it sub sublation cactus. <laughs> Uh, the thing is, it might be confusing to read this, uh, difficult to read this text with this cactus moving in the background, but the point is that behind all of our ordinary words, in the background, like this cactus, is this sublation process potentially happening behind our backs without us even realizing it. But it happens by accident at first, which is why it only happens rarely. And most of the time we end up speaking the ordinary sense where we war with each other and we lack that cooperation because we don't understand the categories of thought and language and grammar that we're using. So it's kind of arbitrary. It's like a, it's like a hit or miss kind of thing when we're trying to communicate. And so Hegel says that when we're even embodying domains of knowledge which are orientated towards figuring this out, such as philosophy, we're not even doing philosophy correctly. So he gives a paragraph on describing what is wrong with the way we think, even when we're trying to be philosophical. So he says, we're going to connect two words together. Hopefully it'll make sense because it's a, a very general concept that's hard to miss for um, sort of pictorial sensuous consciousness, the carnal side of ourselves, the immediate side that thinks the world of appearances is more permanent than it is. So he goes, the relation to of the earlier to the later systems of philosophy is much like the relation of the corresponding stages of the logical idea. So he's describing his history of philosophy, where in the past we have older philosophers having their ideas of what the truth is, uh, such as, you know, Thales thinking that water is the all pervasive universal, the ultimate truth, which we now know is not true. <laughs> you know, it's just one element, element among many. Or you have people like Paracelsus saying that, oh, you know, the body's made of four elements and, you know, it has sulfur and, uh, you know, salt in it. And it's, it's four chemicals that creates everything. And we now know that that's the body is incredibly complex. Modern medicine is incredibly advanced. But what was happening in history was that one system of philosophy was being usurped by another one. They, they're relating to each other. And he's saying it's actually in this incredible way relating to a metaphysical logical idea so instead of a superstitious or dogmatic idea this one can actually be logically thought and comprehended which is why it's it's a scientific enterprise as well as a spiritual one and it's moving itself through history philosophy is actually growing in a universal evolution like all the other shapes and he says in other words the earlier are preserved in the latter that's the tr the right way to to work with philosophy when you're doing it in the way of the idea the logical idea but they're they're sub, sub, uh, subordinated and submerged so that's not what normally happens in terms of history we don't necessarily think that the prior ones are subordinated and submerged it feels more like we're just getting rid of them because they're wrong like Thales was wrong water is not everywhere or Paracelsus you're wrong the body isn't made of just sulfur and all this stuff it's much more complex so it seems like we're discarding them. But here, in terms of the true way of the living logic, we're actually doing an absorption and a transcending over and over again. He says, this is the true meaning of a much misunderstood phenomenon in the history of philosophy. The refutation of one system by another, of an earlier by our later. So refutation is the word we're gonna link here with sublation. That when we ordinarily think of refutation or change, we think about it in the oppositional way where we have two sides like this, not flowing into each other as moments, like as a ratio, but they're warring with each other. They're fixed and they stay in their opposition only and the fluidity between them doesn't occur. Because when we think we've refuted somebody, we think we cancel this side 100% and we're right. 
when we re in reality what's act actually happening if it's a true advance is when we think we've totally canceled somebody we're actually probably absorbing and clarifying their limit their principle and then including their truth within the higher system of our own but with the limit sort of transcended behind us and its proper clarity so real refutation in the living logic in the sublative way is really just clarifying over and over again what the limits of our thinking are it's about clarity of thought so this is what's misunderstood is we're not doing it in the sublative way he says most commonly the refutation is taken in a purely negative sense to mean that the system refuted has ceased to count for anything and has been set aside and done for that's the total 100 percent throwing the baby out with the bathwater. it's gratifying to the small ego because we think we've won and totally canceled our opponent but it doesn't work that way were it so the history of philosophy would be of all studies the most saddening displaying as it does the reputation of every system which time has brought forth now although it may be admitted that every philosophy has been refuted it may be in an in equal degree maintained that no philosophy has been refuted and that in two ways first every philosophy that deserves the name always embodies the idea and secondly the system representing represents one particular factor or a particular stage in the evolution of the idea the refutation of a philosophy therefore only means that its boundaries have been crossed and its special principle reduced to a factor in the completer principle that follows thus the history of philosophy in its true meaning deals not with a past but with an eternal eternal and veritable present so he gets into some pretty interesting things here where he says that um, it's like a, these aren't aberrations of intellect, they're actually a pantheon of godlike figures. These figures of God are the various stages of the idea as they come forward one after another in dialectical development. This dialectical piece has been in history for thousands of years, but the way that Hegel does it is, has never been seen before. And it's very hard to comprehend, but when we think in this logical this living way sort of what christianity and and any holy text is talking about when they're talking about the the life of the word there's it's a way of using the words we're using the same ordinary words but the way we're doing them has to be in this sort of pre preserving way this growing way like a plant so that's why the plant is here this cactus is because the seeds of a plant don't just cancel themselves and then stay there and you get a spontaneous plant growing out of nothing. No, the immediacy of the seeds are what are cancelled. The limit of the seeds are cancelled. And it sublates itself into the next stage, which might be the stem. And then the stem might cancel its immediacy and then grow into the leaves or the cactus arms. And then it, it eventually reaches the bud. And in here it's depicted as the face, but it's usually in a flower. It's like a bloom or a fruit or something like that. But it's the growing nature, this plant-like unity this is how the categories of our thoughts are when we're in a peaceful mode of mind rather than in the oppositional kind. So that's what he's describing here. And when we're doing that, the, the previous ones, the previous stages aren't forgotten. They're carried forward, that the, the, the plant is still rooted in the ground. Uh, much like the, this pantheon of godlike figures just means these categories of thought, the universals that are within any philosophy that deserves the name, any philosophy that is a genuine philosophy, rooted on not just the not just the immediacy of appearances that are empty there are particular truths that are like the fashion of an age you know once the age changes like the romantic period or you know the bronze age or something like that that those truths uh, the evanesce they disappear too but real philosophy has eternal truths that's what these yellow circles represent these are universal truths absolute truths that carry through all forms of becoming all ages since the beginning of time which we sort of showed in the previous sides in the other Nobel prizes so here even at the highest level of human knowledge the highest summit of wisdom itself the basis of what peace is supposed to be about in terms of a way of thinking and being where your thinking is your being and your being is your thinking even those two are in harmony in a dialectic a true ratio rational thinking in this metaphysical living absolute sense this is the logical word for that sublation english and other languages don't have a word for this because it's so foreign even though we're doing it by accident every day uh, but it's it's really the movement of these um 
this infinite science that is the science of logic to Hegel, this growing level of our, the nature of our thoughts. So we were talking earlier about how peace and health and all these other good things are based on this universal quotient, UQ instead of just IQ. This is the deeper grasping of not only these universals growing into each other, but the nature of the growing itself, the movement of them within themselves is what dialectic is. And it's, it's transcending, but it's creating. It's doing two things at once. It's a speculative movement. It's hard for ordinary consciousness to grasp. It wants to do one thing after another in a very analytical, sort of jarred, fixed way, very mechanical way at first. Um, so in some sense, the better we are at sublation, the better we are at peacemaking. No matter what the domain of knowledge is, no matter what the culture is, these are eternal truths and you universally apply to all cultures, all people, all races, all colors, all genders, all everything uh, that is in the finite world. And in a way, this is what peace really is. It's, it's, it's education as peace, but it's not the random kind of education, the abstract kind. It is the living kind you can see here versus the tower kind, and this is a reference to the Tower of Babylon, where in the past somehow these ancient thinkers knew the difference between these two modes of knowledge. And it's because, Hegel says, ancient history in some sense is paradoxical, where people who were closer to the immediacy of life, like when they were first discovering these thoughts, when they were you know, thinking about causality even, or things we take for granted today, were you know, when we're coming out of animal nature, we have, we have to learn how to parse reality in this higher way. Uh, they were distinguishing between this logic that was like, it was, it was immediate, but it was flowing compared to this abstract kind that was growing in them and could build on itself in a dead way. And then you get abstractions on abstractions that don't go anywhere because they're not grounded on eternal kind of truth, real laws of the universe. They're more like imaginary laws based on our own biases. And so... This is where this concept of righteousness comes in, which has a bad name, but it is very likely based on the right order of things, the right logical thinking of things that aligns your being in a wise way with your thinking and vice versa, because wisdom is not just a theoretical initiative, it's a practical one. And that's what gets back to the Nobel Peace Prize, is that real wise philosophers or wise individuals or even divine ones that had revelation happen to them in various modes of sensuousness across religions, they somehow grasp this right order in a practical way where they would live it, not just think it. So in some ways, we already have a version of this. We call it rehabilitation. And that's why in prisons, where people have acted on the sort of the dead kind of logic that has led them astray, um, we now know that when you treat criminals like criminals, they become hardened criminals. The best way to heal people, and Hegel, we talked about this a little bit in the Nobel Medical Prize, the higher level of psychobiology is to speak to people as if they are humans, as if they are rational and they have the nature of goodness inside of them still. And of course, in extreme cases, that is really clouded. But in a lot of other cases, it's better. It's a better investment, even in terms of money, state finances or whatever to treat human beings like even bad human beings um, as human beings and it increases the chances of them reaching this higher divine insight so they can self-regulate and realize there's something deeper a higher reasoning to life that is beautiful even though they might have been subjected to the terrible you know the folly of having an abstract fragmented tower of babylon type of culture it's very external they're lacking this internal connection so in prisons, rehab actually has a much better return on investment, you could say, in terms of healing people and gaining a higher level of wisdom through the strife, through the pain of experience, and sublating that pain into a higher self-realization. But in the prison mode uh, of this kind of logical teaching, we use sensuous religious symbols, so Christian, Christianity or some other higher logic to break out of the or transcend the limited small egoic thinking that generally happens when crime is seen as an option as the only option or meaningful option in self-preservation um, so we're, we can upgrade that and get a much higher turnaround because there's an arbitrariness to the sensuous symbols that are embodying this living logic if we give it more scientifically more purely 
uh, it might actually get more of a secular uptake as well as a religious uptake that the the individuals who were lost or didn't get this proper education either through being abused or being disconnected from the inner unity of things through some kind of abstract negation, whether biological, genetic, uh, the family abuse or societal abuse or prejudice or racism or whatever it is, it's disconnected them from the, the soul of this immediacy. And so religion is a great way to try and get get into it because uh, it does have uh, that essence, but the, the pure form underneath the parable and the sensuous symbols and the, the tales of the teachers is this this order um, so that's why the we circle back around that the right order is this sort of genuine philosophy philosophical way of thinking about the universal peace shapes in the science of logic i hope that makes some degree of sense um, now to get on with the rest of our points now that we understand what genuine philosophy is really about abstract philosophy doesn't do this it, it chops things up and it treats them as particular topics which is why you know we give PhDs to the people, the top researchers in their fields in every domain, but you know that's that's a that's a hallmark. That's like a, an antiquated sign that philosophy used to be in its proper position, uh, like in ancient Greece and and in the more immediate modes of society, I suppose, even though they weren't perfect. Uh, that's that's now disconnected from philosophy. Particular philosophy, you know, doesn't really. It's like, well, why do we give people doctors of philosophy like PhDs? Why don't we just, you know, name their title after their field? Well, it's because real philosophy today is not real philosophy, or, or philosophy today is not real philosophy. Particular kinds of philosophy. Um, so hopefully that makes a little bit of sense. Now on to point number three in terms of creating peace and cooperation. We have a uni the universal prizes that we talked about in the Nobel Economics Prize where we deal with materiality in a much more flowing way so that people can liberate their minds and start thinking about more than just their survival instincts, kind of moving up the hierarchy period, uh, hierarchy of Maslow's uh, pyramid, where self-actualization and then community actualization occurs, which Hegel calls spirit. But then we also have this new principle coming along with it called the universal meritocracy on how to win those prizes and be a part of them. And this involves what's called the what we're calling the wisdom quiz and using wisdom to d distribute the Nobel Prize money, as we saw with the spirit license and the 90,000 being optimal enough per unit dollar to get people satisfied in their particular satisfactions to get to this more universal kind. And um, the wisdom quiz is quite simple. It's um, a little owl here. We just get people to tell us what their principles are and we start framing them in terms of dialectical truths. And we ask them how to solve these world problems. And then the real test here is these 26 crucial dialectical epoch conflicts or the apocalypses uh, to create a neologism. That if these 20 or 27 conflicts here are not sublated, that means they remain in their opposition, then this is what creates all the strife and lack of peace and lack of cooperation in the world. So if you're trying to build a team and somebody comes in and they're in an abstract mode of consciousness where they're not sublating in that living logic, they will find somebody in your team to war with on the other side. They just It's like chemistry. They just start creating these chemical reactions of thought where they just start fighting. And this is happening at the individual level. It's happening at all levels, um, which is what this graphic down here shows, is that first these tensions happen within ourselves conceptually, and then we either splinter ourselves or have schisms, or we try and unify them in a self-love. But then we can also have it with the kind of work we, we do, and it can be... You know, fulfilling work, or it can be alienating work, like Marx was talking about. That work is technically a process of self-development. And this can lead to interdependence between individuals, and this can lead to family life fracturing, and this can lead to friend fracturing, and civil or, or identity in civil society can be fractured, and then our state life, and then internationally our state can be fractured, which is happening between Russia and Ukraine right now. And then the world spirit itself remains fractured, and the cooperation low. The realization of the world spirit is low. Um, so it, it kind of permeates, just like in the Nobel Literature, Literature Prize, these structures grow into each other, and that's why they're dependent on each other. If the foundation elements are sort of corrupted, then the whole structure is based on something a little bit more uh, unstable. So the wisdom quiz is to, to kind of expose which of the dialectics are in this mode of tension and are volatile and explosive. So the first thing we do is we start teaching and seeing where people are. So when we start creating this new world spirit team, we start sublating um, immediately. We start teaching that lesson in a practical sense. 
And this is sort of a new universal form of diplomacy too, that all diplomats within the United Nations or any peacekeeping initiative are, are really just going to culture and sublating these over and over again, meeting people where they are in their cultural development. Uh, this is just supercharging it with clarity and saying, this is really what we're doing. And some of these aren't necessarily strict dialectics. Dialectics require necessity between universals. So these particularities are, are like different kinds of judgments, um, but some of them are objective. Um, so particularly between atheism and theism, um, but we've selected three in particular that are in incredible tension right now and undermining our ability to do almost anything together with millions and billions of people. And that's embodied here with this um, bottom graphic with the colors. We have a universal trust, if um, it's possible to read it here. It says universal trust. And right now it's at a zero because we're going to build this number up. But we're going to build it up with these three main dialectics, these triads here of male, female, so male trust, and then female trust, and then LGBTQ plus trust. So these two are in opposition, and this is supposed to be the middle ground, but also non-binary is the transcendental sublative uh, intention. And then we have to build trust between the sort of political economic dialectic between capitalism, socialism, and communism. So the first two are in opposition and communism, at least the way Marx meant it, was supposed to be the sublation and not the cancellation of them, as we covered in the uh, Nobel Economics Prize. And one of the most pervasive and highest, le actually the highest level dialectic in terms of Hegel's encyclopedia of the philosophical sciences, of which we should be basing these schools on, uh, new schools, um, maybe in a religious sense, righteous schools, uh, is that art, religion, and, and science or philosophy are themselves in tension. Art is not normally thought as being the opposite of religion, but Hegel considers them that way, and we think he's right. And then science is supposed to sublate these, but it's doing it in an abstract sense rather than the genuinely philosophical sense, where the abstract sense is trying to cancel them in some sense, fundamental sense, which is where atheism and secularism kind of comes into direct opposition, even though it's supposed to be the sublation, the transcendence. But it's it's not grasped in the concrete infinite science, which is why it doesn't elevate to real philosophy because philosophy has been demoted to a particular amongst all the other finite sciences. So that's why the loop is eating itself in a way. It's, it's, that's why it can't truly sublate because we're not clear enough on what philosophy is supposed to be. But Hegel was. So in order to really start building peace in macro steps, very large, simple steps, is we have to correct the way we conceptualize these, these three dialectics and then show that we need to stop the canceling this refutation in the wrong order, whether through men's right, rights activism or female feminist uh, feminazi activism rather than true activ uh, feminist activism, which is more of the LGBTQ transcendence. And the stigma against them needs to also end that these are all moments in a ratio, uh, a fluid kind of thinking where their truth is preserved, their limit is canceled. And they're raised to a higher unity where they're allowed to all function together, whether in their traditional roles, their religious roles in terms of uh, biological reproduction or in terms of liberating uh, women in terms of the master slave dialectic uh, uh, in going to school and accessing their high levels of reason. Um, and even though Hegel looks like he's very patriarchal, he makes a distinction that's not commonly understood especially by his time, where the earlier stages are the irrational stages where we fall into these sort of abstract determinations, but higher levels of concrete reason, like in the idea, like he's talking about in this quote here, actually does sublate all of them, and you attain uh, the momentary thinking that overcomes the limits. Same with capitalism and socialism and communism. These are sublated moments. We don't get rid of capitalism and communism or socialism. They mediate each other. And then same with art and religion the concrete truth of religion is preserved in a true philosophy. So a, a real theory of everything, where everything's in an inner connection rather than this external connection. And art is a way of trying to communicate that as an inspired medium. And so these are moments that are moving, uh, but what is essential is really these universal categories that are in a, in a totality that circles back on itself. Just like the Nobel Lit Literature Prize, the story of being is a circle, it's a leaving of home, um, uh, a separation from self, and then a return to self, like in the hero's journey. So the trust between these is low because we have a fragmented thinking. So the first thing we can do, which is a, uh, a quick win, in, a deep quick win in terms of 
building fraternity between nations for the practical component of the Nobel Peace Prize is really finding a way to sublate these and start building trust on them. And then all of them together will start increasing the universal score. And there are certain qualitative, qualitative advancements of complexity in terms of cultural development that can't really be attained stably until certain levels of universal trust are reached, which means that the universal quotient has developed enough to create new stable categories of thought that doesn't um, succumb to the more carnal, abstract thinking of reputation where we're canceling people. Now, the interesting thing here is we can extend this principle of trust building to what has been happening in history since the beginning. And Hegel states that there's something called the slaughter bench of history, and most people think that he embraces violence. And in the beginning he says it can't really be any other way because reason is not high enough to not do the animal uh, tribal um, territorialness. So at first, all that default thinking can do, all that animals can do is follow their instincts. And all that initial humans can do, like Neanderthals or early hominids, is that thinking at all is at first abstract negation. It's like that oppositional moment that creates distinction. So distinction is really the abstract moment. And that's how self-consciousness comes into being as we realize that our object is our object and that we are something separate from the object. Um, and then that's like when we other the other, you know, it, when we other the, the object, it turns into potentially something we don't understand. And so we negate that because we don't identify ourselves in it. And the real process of trust building is when we see ourselves, see this universal reason in the other, which creates a commonality between us that sublates into the next higher shape of self-development. So the othering process metaphysically is really what Hegel's talking about in the wrong form of reputation uh, that ruins trust as well. So the slaughter bench is the result of this nascent thinking, this default thinking of abstract negation that hasn't yet negated its own self as sublation. Because the negative way of talking about sublation is the negation of negation, which might not make a lot of sense, but it's, it is, we're speaking in this sort of shape language that is sort of transcending and, and moving leaps and bounds over our particular ordinary sensuous categories. But the slaughter bench eventually comes to a sort of end. The violence ends in a sort of higher level of science that we're starting to see happen in terms of the world where you know, even though Russia and Ukraine and the geopol geopolitical dynamics of the state are in tension, uh, most nations are in cooperation when it comes to science. You know, we have the SI units internationally that unites how we measure things and it creates a common language. So the, 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 the negation actually goes internal and it starts turning into a more peaceful process where the conflicts are conceptual. And we realize this unity as belonging uh, to all of us, uh, which unites us in a super sensuous essence in our sensuous particularities, which means that you can have an infinite amount of expression uh, despite having the same sort of logical um, system to, to sort of structure that reality that is including skepticism within it. It's not like a, a group think or a, a hegemonic uh, structure that you can't question. This is not dogmatic in the sense of being unscientific. It's self-evident only because it can justify itself rationally from its own principles, which is what science really is about. Um, the scientific method is about testing our hypotheses using our principles and making sure those principles are grounded on reason. So all wars as well are basically ideological. They're happening because these internal categories are in conflict between two sensuous bodies and it's trying to sublate it by clarifying clarifying itself in this in this battle that eventually exposes the true limit and then the victor is supposed to embody the battle or embody the progress but that's not always true sometimes they can cancel there's two results to a dialectical movement they can either nullify themselves and cancel themselves or they can negate the negation and come out as a, a higher unity so this includes the Ukraine-Russian war, even though Putin says that, you know, this isn't about communism or capitalism. Um, those are both ideologies. But if Hegel is right, it actually is. And they're just putting up facades uh, saying that it's about materiality or something like that. But really, real enduring world wars are about ideologies. So it seems like the Cold War didn't resolve, uh, it did not sublate the, the sort of social, uh, the, so the political economic dialectic. It was left in abstract negation. Um, so that's maybe what's 
um, biting again as NATO uses sort of um, Ukraine as a proxy war with Russia as things heat up here. That's why it can, it's, it's kind of concerning and why we're 90 seconds to midnight, which is closer to midnight than even um, the Bay of Pigs crisis when we had that nuclear showdown, when there was a nuclear showdown between the United States, the East and the West. So this is growing um, as we speak. So that's why this presentation and this nation, this, this notion of sublation has to be understood in the universal sense. At, at first, consciousness doesn't think these categories are important because it's, our realities are dialectically backwards where we think the sensuousness is really the profound thing and that the categories of our minds are so taken for granted. They're, they're not even worth exploring. It, it, when you tell someone to think about being and how do you think about something and, and cause and effect, they're so boring that it immediately arouses anger and impatience because of the way the movement hasn't sunk in. So that's why really if we have to test for one thing to start the peace process, the one thing is not to focus on any one category. It is to literally focus on the movement itself. And if we figure out sublation, then it doesn't matter what the dialectic is, what the triadic pair is that are in opposition, um, that are unsublated. It can be sublated. People will learn how to sublate that, whether through the wisdom quiz or they're just learning this pattern is repeating over and over and over again um, across pretty much all domains that have universals in them or have the name of philosophy in them. So when we learn to sublate, it's this inner movement that, that is no longer this external connecting. It is an internal connecting of necessity. These shapes belong to each other. Internal connection has this feeling of belonging, which for human beings feels like love. It feels like home. It feels like friendship. It feels like virtue. So the universal logic behind that is the is this concept of sublation. And we need to do it urgently on these three dialectics because they are driving themselves apart. Okay, so that's the recognition process that we want to start happening. We want people to start recognizing when something is in sublation and when it's not. And start self-determining these universal peace shapes wherever they are in whatever dialectics. And this could be a should be the Copernican revolution we're looking for. It seems very simple, but if we had diplomats in the United Nations realizing that all their particular interventions are a version of this, except less clear, this is where we can make huge strides. And a lot of the conflicts are religious or spiritual or on one of these categories in some way or the other, ideologically, somewhere across Hegel's encyclopedia or somewhere across the story of being. The story of being will be beginning, sublating, we're showing um, through a collective effort that we're writing a story together that is be beginning as a character sublating into higher <laughs> beautiful forms like this kind of growing cactus it's maturing in this higher level of wisdom life experience can usually lead to wisdom because we absorb enough life experience to start recognizing the patterns intuitively and so that's why we have a sort of association of old age with wisdom because the mind starts doing this automatically if it's not uh, traumatized or deteriorated by the pain of experience and we do start achieving a, a wisdom but by that point the youth don't usually listen to the elderly because our society is in such conflict even on the age dialectic ageism is becoming a problem as the retirement age goes up and all these old limits of what it meant to be human are now being challenged uh, anti-aging putting chips in our brains uh, the fact that children can now learn through the internet what took their parents you know their entire lifetimes to learn it's uh, an incredible power, power, ba power balance shift that the wisdom of experience might be losing its hold and that's another concern of why we need to get the youth and the elderly realizing this is what they're doing and bringing us together in a proper scientific spiritual thinking where we're bridging these oppositions that have been long-standing for thousands of years I hope this is uh, I hope you recognize the profoundness in this um, there's plenty of places you can go and read up on it, but um, to move on with the peace process, the meritocracy has to be based on sublation because all other notions of meritocracy aren't meritocracies. They're just some kind of privilege of IQ or processing power or beauty or prowess or some kind of uh, inheritance that is approximating some kind of sublation in an abstract way. Um, but it really just leads to a bunch of experts that are usually treated as ivory tower uh, you know, it's egoistic development that 
negates the blue collar. So the white collar and the blue collar, the academia and, and real civil society are usually in opposition. Um, so we don't want meritocracy, meritocracy just to be based on experience because that's particular knowledge or expertise because that's just like the, it's not the genuine philosophical knowledge. It's just the siloed knowledge supercharged with, with um, this sort of abstract kind of refutation, which actually exacerbates the conflict and makes things even worse sometimes. So it's, it's really important to make sure the, the meritocracy is not the false kind, but the true kind, the universal kind, based on what is the essence. If this is the living essence of wisdom itself, is what you can think of sublation as. Those might sound like empty words at, at first, but that there is an order to what I just said that takes a while to learn. But it's, it, it actually has this effect, um, much like, um, hopefully there's some physicists in the crowd, but in string theory, which is trying to grasp this sort of essence, it's one of the most abstract theories that is supposed to be the most universal or absolute. It had five versions of it in the past. So if you wanted to learn this sort of logic in the past through string theory, which was one of our best hopes beyond religion, at least in the secular world, it uh, had five camps and it was a lot to learn because it seemed like they were all different. So you had to learn the jargon of each one and it was like, you know, a 500% increase in cognitive learning. And that's kind of what's happening with all domains is we're getting this information overload. But in terms of the five categories of uh, string theory, um, one uh, genius uh, of an individual named Ed Witten came and realized what was common to them all and that they were all saying the same thing in five different ways and he created M theory which unified them in one more universal education on that level of thinking where you could learn one version of it and then you could turn it into its particular five particular versions which was a lot more it was a lot more efficient and it's what ephemeralization is about uh, the Buckminster pr principle of doing more with less we're getting to the essence of things, which Steve Jobs and you know all these de the great designers of the past, architects, grasped in some kind of form, um, where we don't have uh, excess baggage that's unessential, and we don't have um, a loss of essence, which which destroys the form. It's the perfect amount, or as close as we can get to efficient, efficacious, elegant kinds of communication and learning that addresses the sort of information overload that we're getting uh, by not grasping the unity of an infinite science. Um, so the meritocracy is sort of based on not just understanding that kind of uh, education, but the, the way the process itself has to be scientific in this infinite way as well. So this will be how we start distributing resources based off of a higher wisdom that is more integrative and that the people who are better at integrating in the, in the true way are the ones that have more, more power in society because we're addressing directly what's wrong with the expertise that we have today. It's more of a, how can we overpower somebody rather than cooperate with them? Okay, so now we have uh, the universal diplomacy is based on the sublation. And the people who are doing diplomacy obviously pass the wisdom quiz. But then the way we conduct ourselves can also be structured in terms of ever living meetings where we can question the diplomats and the people who are, who are um, saying they're the authorities. There's a way to uh, work off of Eleanor um, Ostrom's principles of uh, kind of self-determinating communities. Um, they're, they're like these pro-social principles. And um, we incorporated them into a meeting structure where it's a, a turn-based system that, that has flexibility. And um, we're also gonna try and embody a higher wisdom instead of a utopic one, instead of being naive and saying, okay, you know, kumbaya, or this is all going to work out. Well, Hegel actually says, no, in the beginning, because reason is low, the abstract negation can't really be avoided. It can only be channeled in a wise way. So because people want to fight or it's entertaining to have the competitive aspect, and we will always have the competitive aspect, but there's adversarial competition and then there's cooperative competition. In the beginning, there will be adversarial competition because we have a lot of pain in society. So to, to, to sort of channel that competition in a productive way to teach sublation, we have something called the Universal Sublation Championship, where you can get two individuals, whether they're philosophers, any domain of knowledge. Uh, philosophers are in every domain, as we now know, if you think about them in their true essence. 
um, all over the world we can get individuals sort of competing on certain dialectics, certain topics that are usually in, in um, tension, probably these 27 at least. And they can say their skill sets, what is governing their logical process? And so here we have this person has um, from one of the poorest nations in, in the world, I think this is Burundi's flag. Um, they, they've studied Hegel, so they, they sort of get these points, and then somebody from a maybe more privileged country will have a different set. And then we can see how their, their reasoning uh, progresses, and we track not who wins by abstract negation, by force, which is generally what these championships are about. Instead, we're doing something counterintuitive, and we're actually measuring who is actually more cooperative, who's better at sublating and clarifying the topic, even though they might lose. So even though their, their original position might turn out to be wrong, if their form of the argument is more sublative, they actually win. And that's where we track the partial sublations, abstract negations, the partial negations, all these sort of measurements that are measured in the sort of the spec team. And spec team is a play on specul speculative logic, that sort of mystical, true, infinite, scientific, scientific kind of logic that Hegel develops his entire science of logic with. Uh, where we're using this spec team to measure um, as the conversation goes, kind of like a sport, um, first quarter, second quarter, third quarter, and which dialectics are in um, tension or they're trying to be sublated. And usually when you're trying to solve one, the nested or embedded complexity of the other dialectics comes out because they're part of the clarification process. Um, just like with how the universe works in terms of shape dynamics. Um, so in this one we use free will as an example, but you can have multiple participants, but in this one we have three and it tracks um, what the positions are in terms of the dialectics. So positions one, two, or three in terms of this triadic structure. If we can frame the topic in terms of triad, sometimes we can't if it's too contingent. Uh, but the ones that are most universally in conflict across the planet are these uh, ones that Hegel is talking about. And we sort of track their negations and their sublations and you know, there's these elephant in the room motions that we also track where the way that the ordinary consciousness works, it, it skirts around the real issue sometimes. So we track that for each quarter and then we add it all up and then we see who is the, the victor in terms of the positions, but also in terms of the process. And so we can see that there's different um, emotional ex experiences that people have as they go through different combinations as they move back and forth in the dialectic. So the red dot represents one person's position uh, and then the red line is the other person's position or where they think each other are. So it's not just where they actually are in truth, but where they think they are. So there's a compounding of subjective abstract thinking building upon itself into where we think we understand somebody, what we're talking past them. Or, you know, there's actually, when you work out all these combinations of how to have a conversation the wrong way, even with just one dialectic, one opposite pair or one topic, there's around 18,000 combinations of the untrue way of perceiving the situation and going about the conversation, which is why it's sort of miraculous that human beings can cooperate at all. And then we only have one real case of genuine freedom where both people are sublative. They're coming from the synthesis or the inner synthesis where they can see the moments as, or the, see the sides as moments and then mediate with real reason and wisdom to experience the full scientific consideration of the, the spectrums of whatever phenomenon we're dealing with because bias wants to limit that exploration and cause fixities in one sideness because it wants to discard the other side because they're, they're uttering it in a way that they don't understand and they can't incorporate the reasons. So they see it as an irrational evil or something that must be destroyed. Um, so this is just our quick little table to, to sort of help measure in real time as the conversation is going on and make it a game and then give it a score at the end of the internal sublation of, of how it actually was sublated on, in terms of the content of the topic and then externally is what, what did it look like? How did people act? Did they hold their positions and pretend like they didn't sublate to save face to their community? Or So there's a bunch of different ways, uh, games people play when they're trying to sublate. So these tools are, are sort of to interface and be real about the abstract negation because you can't have sublation without the distinguishing first abstract negation moment of difference, of tension, then we negate that negation. Um, so that's how we're going to embrace the sort of competitive nature while teaching um, people to increase their UQ in a sport kind of way. It's fun. 
then the sort of last thing is this translates directly into human rights because in a way human rights really are just getting to the essence of what makes a human being worthy of being protected and having genuine freedom and if you look at the universal declaration of human rights they're in many ways approximating what hegel has done in his philosophy of right and saying that you know the reason why he liked the the evolution of philosophy is that in the beginning one person was free the king or the the monarch was free and everybody else was sort of a in some version of slavery to the king and then we kind of had an upgrading to something like uh, uh greek democracy where we had sort of a particular freedom where we had this sort of king and the aristocracy or the athenian uh, citizens were free to you know pursue philosophy that's where we got descartes and uh, that's not where we got descartes uh, where we had plato and socrates and aristotle and the great beginnings of formal philosophy according to hegel out of the religious mode of oriental philosophy which was also profound um but then that's that's only particular we there's still slaves in athenian society people don't realize that and then we have in the roman times uh in the christian era hegel said jesus embodied the universal freedom where you deserve freedom no matter what your birthright was or what your class was just because you were the notion he calls it in sensuous form consciousness the essence of reason the beginnings of spirit you deserve this freedom uh, and the opportunity to actualize it and so we've been sort of actualizing that principle ever since in various forms of um, religion, art, and philosophy and science, uh, including modern liberal democracies or um, China's kind of blending of central authority and, and free market economics. Uh, so this, this translation of an abstract theoretical logic um, into practical human rights will create uh, a sort of true advocacy in these universal tickets of speculative learning where we can track people's learnings in terms of the wisdom quiz and give them an opportunity to pursue genuine philosophy. And even for children, on average, children can ask for up from 73 to 400 questions of why per day. And every question that doesn't get answered, um, it, it actually can reduce the, the child's uh, ability to maintain the concrete thinking they have because in the beginning, before children learn abstract thought and they start building these sort of like Tower of Babylon personalities, you could say, um, they lose the inner cohesion of things as the soul. Um, they are speculative thinkers a little bit more. They're not clear thinkers in terms of being able to create distinctions, but they are able to ask questions that adults don't normally think to ask because they take them for granted. So the more of these initial why questions we can answer um, the better, but most of the times, most people or parents are overwhelmed by the current hyper-inflated society we're in, this progress to infinity that's creating anxiety because we're moving so fast at this exponentially growing rate that they, they get tired of answering questions or, you know, make up answers that maybe aren't as <laughs> philosophical. Um, but whenever a question of why is asked, that's the reasoning process taking place. So the why is really the sublation. Why does something happen? Why does these two moments belong together, male and female? Well, they sublate based off of binary thinking and non-binary thinking. And, you know, um, we want to preserve that innocence and that curiosity because that's the genuine spirit of philosophy that results in a higher wisdom. Uh, okay, so this is basically how we're going to practically and theoretically translate the science of logic um, into fraternity building and concrete cooperation building. Um, and hopefully uh, address the triggerings that are happening more and more and more in society, either from the conservative side, the liberal side, all the different sides. They need to be brought together in these inner rational thinkings that traditionally have not been achieved because if you do have a diplomat who's scientific and has uh, rigor, they don't usually have the spiritual background to sublate the art and religion or the science and the religious dialectic, where we have 85% um, of the world's population in some version of spiritual orientation. So we need to bridge even the scientific and the spiritual dialectic, which is usually in professional organizations, one of the ones that is ignored because the, the contingency and the sensuous symbols of the art of, of religion generally gets in the the way of rationality rather than serving as a medium to get to rationality which is what we're going to do in a sublative living logic of peace 
I hope that makes a great deal of sense. And if you're excited, uh, you want to do uh, this new kind of prison reform, educational reform, um, diplomacy reform, competitive reform, all of this stuff together really comes down to understanding the essence of wisdom and its movement logically, universally, absolutely as sublation. And we can overcome the slaughter bench of history as a process of meta self actualization that happens in the immediate inner mode of our consciousness, which is reflected in our states as a community spirit as well. The inner spirit and the outer spirit are happening simultaneously in a true speculative, um, cohesive moment of self determination, freedom, and, uh, and learning. It might sound a little bit naive, but to build off the Nobel Literature Prize, we need to use the process of sublation to write a story and imagine a story so powerful that it could literally unite the human race. That's the story we're writing here that contains all the Nobel Prizes inside of it as the Nobel Surprise document. But we're going to be using this peace process to do it through the games that we're, we talked about in slide number two with the spirit games. And now what we're going to, to do is um, now that we're done explaining the theory of the Nobel Prizes, we're going to get into the practice and showing how we're going to start playing the game. If you feel like there's something new here, then um, you can start participating. And it's all in development. This is version 1.0. As we kind of see up in the top corner, we're going to be evolving as we go as part of those Nobel Economic Prizes and getting people's feedback. So even though this looks maybe a little bit chaotic, uh, or rigid in some sense, we're very certain about this direction. There, there's a lot of um, improvement that can happen uh, in a genuine sense. And we can share the, the sort of recognition with you if you're interested. One more thing to note in terms of the Nobel Peace Prize is the sublation logic doesn't maybe seem to add anything new because we've had plenty of highly trained diplomats and negotiation professionals try and tackle the subject, such as um, Marshall uh, Rosenberg, who created uh, the Nonviolent Communication School. And it looks sort of silly here that he has a giraffe and a jackal on his hands as puppets, but it is quite simple um, what we have to do. He's using sensuous symbols to approximate negation and, and uh, abstract negation and sublation. So, of course, the jackal is using language, jackal language, which is in the abstract negation mode to create otherness and blaming and, you know, all these types of uh, separation dynamics of othering. And then the giraffe, of course, is trying to, probably trying to sublate in some way as an opposite. And the paradox is that uh, we need this sort of oppositional moment to create the sublation moment. So... Um, people like Marshall Rosenberg were grasping the essence of the logic, but not being able to cl uh, clarify it enough to communicate the scientific order of it. And not only was he creating this this new school based on implicit sublation, um, but so was Gandhi. And uh, passivism, in a certain sense, isn't necessarily about being pushed around. There's still strength there, where if you you don't you're not the aggressor. But if somebody comes to harm you, you can defend yourself. And that's the sort of wisdom that the New World Spirit um, embodies. But as soon as you use violence, which is the abstract negation, and it feels like a, a nice psychic release, studies show that human beings get a psychic release whenever they um, externalize a frustration or an unsublated negation. Uh, so we think that it's t teaching people things, but usually tough love doesn't work. Uh, it actually preserves the negation. It doesn't actually get to the, the commonality or the universal uh, that looked like it was in opposition, but it's actually the commonality. So the sublation is really the only way to make a stable progress because it, it, it only cancels the limit, but it preserves the truth between the two sides. So they become fluid moments and you don't get this restricted, oppressive kind of illusion of stability. And this is the principle that of the logic that uh, Gandhi grasped which is similar to um, Marshall's here. So what they're sharing in common is, is the uh, science of logic, except that they're not putting it in scientific form, they're approximating it in a partial form. 
And this is where we're putting it in, into its clear form of what's happening behind all these symbols and cultural um, examples. And this is the power, this kind of extreme kind of clarity is what is present in all forms of non-negotiation uh, theory or um, conflict theory. And we're hoping that this clarity uh, brings us to a new level of, of wisdom that appreciates what these great figures in history um, have dedicated their entire lives to accomplishing. And not only them, but virtually all uh, Nobel Peace Laureates have been embodying some version of this logic, we think, in uh, tremendously honorable and courageous ways that hopefully we can do justice uh, towards and create real ground steps, not only in terms of a new universal logic of peace, where that alone could maybe inform uh, the peace process, but also in embodying that as we create this new universal story of being uh, about the essence that unites us all, while preserving our the beauty in our identities. Something more needs to be said about the peace process in a more practical sense. When we're considering dialectics, we need to consider something called double binds. So double binds are what we think are the root of all oppression, all crime, all misunderstanding, all jackal type of languages inside of the mind, inside of individual minds and interpersonally between individuals in small groups and in large groups, uh, including states and international affairs. It seems very simple at first, but what we're trying to describe here is a meta process that can result in and likely is the res is resulting in, in personality disorders and also uh, disorders in constitutions of states in terms of their internal policies but also in terms of their diplomatic external policies and it really is something as simple as grasping the dialectical nature between opposites so clarity is really the true path to peace when we're unclear about our concepts, the words that we're using, we use them in a sort of sloppy way that ignores their real logical movements. And when we're not being reasonable and rational, the ordinary use of that word is in a small way. It's in a, a truncated way. It's not the real way, which is a living concrete totality like this little dancing plant here where the stages belong together. When we use our words, we're not using them in a belonging way. The way the dictionary is organized, for instance, is in a way that's alphabetical, but it doesn't have a sort of logical necessity. The words sort of are, are connected together in a contingent way that sort of approximates an internal connection, but we need to reorganize it in terms of logical connections. So in this diagram here, we have an old reference <laughs> to maybe the baby boomer generation or um, but when children are growing up, they're learning the culture and they can take positions in that culture. So the red dot here is position one, and this could be taken by person one, like a parent, and then per a second person is in this dynamic and it could be a child. Now, if somebody is in the red mode, this is the jackal language that Marshall Rosenberg was talking about, where they can, they can in the relationship with the other person, start trapping them as well and that's what this sort of triad is all about is that these reds mean they're fixed they're not allowed to be in that fluid ratio type of thinking where they belong together and that you have to stick to your one side and uh, there's no real movement and that also means you can't grasp the synthesis the inner synthesis not an external synthesis um, of that belonging it's a realization of the belonging so if a parent puts a child into a position, a conceptual position, where the, instead of people or instead of having people in these positions where there are con concepts in the mind, dialectics in the mind, these universal categories that we're talking about over here, right? These are sort of these harmonious harmonies. This is how the real spirit thinks in holistic ways while having distinctions. But this is not what's happening in this dynamic, which can create 
schisms in the mind because the concepts are cut in half. They're, they're treated as opposites that can't be resolved. These are internal contradictions in the mind. And they're, when you're with a parent who, who's been raised in this culture, uh, they subject their children to these schisms and contradictions deep within the foundational personality formations when the identity is forming on a nascent level between you know, zero to four years old, consciousness is on average uh, budding and coming on the scene through this sort of Lacanian uh, reflection moment. I think that happens around four years old. You reach that critical mass of awareness where what Hegel calls the notion starts reflecting on itself in the world of pure thought. So these concepts become uh, unmeshed. They, 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 they decouple from the sensuous world, objects that are external, where the where consciousness is immediately immersed. So when the sensuous reality changes, consciousness changes immediately, like an animal does. But then something incredible happens where there's a reflective moment that the the thought forms in the object reflects on itself in the pure moment of shape space, basically, in the pure wor world of thought, where formal consciousness starts to develop. And these concepts can become more unhinged and, and grounded on themselves and the laws of the universe are priming for these it's like the correspondence model of truth but then the coherence model of truth starts to to build inside of the mind of the child but if we have that building that coherence mechanism working in a schism kind of way the internal contradictions don't get resolved and the personality starts to itself become a schism and we can start developing um, borderline personality disorders schizophrenia a lot of uh, disorders in personalities that become entrenched as more and more dialectics are stacked on this unstable foundation where the opposites aren't allowed to reconcile in a third, an inner dialectical synthesis, a true one. So when a, a parent is growing up, they experience the schism and this dotted line represents uh, a synthesis that's not allowed to be known that connects these, this ratio in a harmony. It's like the transcendental reason, the, the why of those 400 whys of children. The more those whys you answer, the more of these syntheses you're, you're telling them they're allowed to know. And that's what children are doing. They realize the pattern early on because they have speculative thought, more speculative thought to question things that we don't think to question. Uh, so the less of those questions that are answered, the more schisms are in the personality. And people that have desperate lifestyles are on the bottom part of the upgrading of society, as we talked about in the Nobel Economics Prize. They don't; their parents don't have a lot of time to answer these. Number one, and they're educate. They're usually suffering a lot of trauma. So when they do go into the formal education system, because we don't deal with privilege properly in this this dynamic properly, they don't have the freedom from sensuous reality. So when they are in class, they have ADHD type symptoms. They can't focus. The inner world of pure thought is ungrounded in itself. And that's why we get what we call these, these uh, inabilities to learn. But really, anybody would act that way. We have to create a, a more just society that understands this mechanism of pure thought. So when the parent is experiencing this kind of upbringing, you get an abstraction that builds on an abstraction that builds on an abstraction. All of these three dialectics are unsynthesized. They're connected immediately. So it's implicitly happening whether the pe person is thinking about it or not kind of like how hegel uses the example of digestion even when you're asleep and you're not thinking about digestion your body's still following the laws of the universe and allowing you to digest the laws of biology and chemistry because the universe itself is concrete in some sense whether or not we understand it the goal is to make what is implicit in being explicit to our spirit to our thinking in a concrete way the abstract way the babylonian way the dead way is what creates these abstractions which can't be not only not synthesized they can't even be questioned so that's why the people have borderline personality disorder their bodies literally try and protect them from this random process of pure thought by either splitting in half and taking a side um, which means it's splitting they can go from love to hate they can go from opposites very quickly because they they're not allowed to come from the synthesis so they just randomly bounce back and forth and what's called splitting as a defense mechanism uh, to bounce around the, the schism that remains unsublated. But then there's a second defense, which is, which is dissociation, which is that pure thought recedes from the material world, which makes no sense, and it goes into the pure thought world, and it hides there in a certain way. Um, but, but because it can't synthesize, the, the internal world of reason 
can, is still within the mode of being. That's why people who have borderline personality to refine relief in dialectical behavior therapy, because dialectical behavior therapy allows them to meditate and return to the internal world without having to explicate it in reason. So that's why you often get people who have a lot of traumas gravitating to new age philosophies, these sort of mystical paganisms, meditation routines, which require no, no real um, rigorous thinking. It's an imminent being, which is true. Uh, Hegel says the um, 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 the meditative moments of, of Buddhism or, or um, Hinduism actually is, is the moment of returning to pure being and the being within self. So this is an essential moment that we get when we're trying to return to the truth of pure being, but it's the beginning state of pureness. It's like returning to the soul where everything is allowed to sublate and come back concretely. So this moment is true, but it's just the beginning. It's like the moment of faith when you return to the first moment of, of spirit as pure being, which is concrete and, and all the sublating stuff is happening. You're, you're returning there. But because people of that level of trauma are allowed to sublate, they can't develop the soul in the holy thinking. The, the universal categories are not allowed to develop. So they want to dwell in that space, that implicit space, because it's beautiful. And that's where they try and say that the, the solutions to society is to meditate and return to this inner world. But that's the start. They have to learn that it is safe. And in fact, it's profoundly safe. It, in fact, it's only safe in the external world, uh, in the Babylonian world, to, to go into in developing the soul into spirit, the being within self, into being for self than being in and for self, which means that the sublating is happening explicitly for consciousness so that it can align its soul with its will. And that's where you get wisdom. So this is what is really the culprit behind all the sophisticated construct therapies and, and all the diplomacy that we're doing even between nations. You can have a nation here, nation one and nation two, and this same process of dialectic is happening in group mind as well. So international policies can also be schizophrenic or they can be in the mode of borderline personality disorder or borderline national disorder, you could say, because they're not allowed on a cultural level to sublate. And religion can kind of fill this for a while in an immediate way, but it's not connected in the systematic totality, uh, which is why the, the, the Bible or the, the Quran or any other holy text is not allowed to be developed further because we don't trust the current Babylonian culture to change what these incredible masters of divine insight had reached inside of themselves and were trying to reflect to us. So their the divine teachers are right. The ones that are the um, the popes, uh, the the imams, the, the 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 holders of the faiths, they're right to be critical of changing the faith in any way because if we're not coming from the right order of things and we're making changes in the abstract mode, we start getting these abstract, unquestioned, non-divine connections we fill in the synthesis with caprice and hegel calls it filling the holy of holies with like with particularities of, of random consciousness and that is the most aggravating thing to spirit because we know it's not true we, the truth is universal in this essence kind of way so we want to fill this with with the actual science of logic the divine kind running by the internal dialectic a speculative mystical scientific thought which as we told you before is not just superstition. Superstition is the sort of filling with random caprice. Not in all cases, but in a lot of them. And so when we are allowed to question the synthesis or question the, the, the schism and make it safe to start sublating, this is where we overcome double binds. Because then the logic starts returning to building on itself. Once you get the first one, this sub self sublates into the next one and they connect into systematic totality which is the, the harmony of the soul explicated as infinite science in the spiritual kind of thinking, the Kabbalistic sort of eminence and effluence kind of fluid moments of rational thought, true shape space thinking that emerges in higher levels of complexity. They're still coherent in themselves. So double binds to, to just to explain them quickly is sort of what these triangles are about. These are the configurations of sort of shape space on one concept. So, you can take positions in them. And the red dot represents two people are taking a position in terms of D1, position one and position one. So these people will think they're agreeing because they're in the same group think. 
you know, so if you if you believe in free will versus determinism, these two people both believe in free will, but they likely have not come from the synthesis. It's probably some kind of external dialectic. So they're in groupthink. If anybody tries to challenge them, there's no fluidity. They're rigidly opposed. So if you try and oppose them, uh, you'll experience a tremendous amount of pain, like in this one. So this is pretty bad because it's it's just saying groupthink in different orientations. This one looks the same as the top one, but you can see there's a little pink dot here. So that means that this person is actually in position two, but both of them think that they're in position one. So the group think continues, even though there's a contradiction that is emerging, but it still feels like friendship because the delusional kind of <laughs> thinking is holding them together. And then you can kind of start getting the division where the third position is like being in between. This is called no man's land. When you're in between, when you know the truth isn't on both sides necessarily, then you're stuck in no man's land, which is approximating the universal, but it's not giving you the reasoning that's mediating the true positions. So you're stuck in this kind of like um, riding the fence or, or sitting on the fence. And that's also very hypocritical and people don't like that. In fact, it's more dangerous to be in that position than being in the groupthink positions because at least you have support groups in their groupthink positions on either side. But when you're in the middle, there's a smaller group there. And it's not just centrism, it's a bouncing. You know that even centrism doesn't have the full answer. So that's what this red bar means is that as they start the positions start changing they they start getting more and more jackal like more an abstract negation the only place where peace starts is if one of them starts coming from the synthesis the sublative space so this person is now sublating this person is not so this person conditions the level of the conversation kind of like a lowest common denominator but these people who grasp true living logic the sublative kind of lo logic in the universal absolute sense in the across all dialectics not just on a couple they become infinitely loving because they understand how conditionality works and they're willing to create space for that person to start sublating because there's probably a trauma inside of them that's holding the fixity so they understand the trauma as this building abstract babylonian process in terms of the christian faith but it happens in all types of faiths uh, and even hinduism has the sort of carnality of it they have a lot of sensuous symbols to show how how when you get fixed you're in the mode of one of the gods right and that the gods have their limits that's why they they belong together um, to sort of balance themselves in brahman or the true the deeper truth so then you get the next mode which is more jackal like more uh, polarizing where you actually have the oppositions explicit even though they might be in the same position so here, this person in the pink dot is actually in position one, and this person here is known to be in position one, but this person, position two, uh, person two thinks this person is in position two. So even though they should be agreeing, because the, the perception of the situation is skewed, the dialectic takes on the delusional kind. And that's where they start talking. They're using the same words in the same kind of way, but they're... The, the external meanings or the expressions of them look different, so they conflict on the falsity of the symbols, and that's why they can't get out of the double bind. And the double bind means you're not safe in any positions. So we're, we're displaying no-win situations here, basically, and the only true one which, which resolves all these painful positions, whether you're in the first position, D1, the second position, D2, or the third position, D3, if you're on this level of existence, this is samsara, it just keeps going in circles because... The inner necessity that's connecting them and making them belong to each other, even though they're trying to separate from each other, that's not grasped. So you're stuck in this forever because true dialectics are, are eternal. So you can struggle in this way for the rest of your life. And that's the divine insight that Buddha was teaching us. And same with Jesus. Uh, and same with, um, well, anything that has the name of philosophy or spiritual truth. So the only true way to, to peace is if both people learn the sublative process and start coming from the synthesis from the internal synthesis not even just an external synthesis this is a big reason why hegel critiques Kant's version of the antinomonies because the antinomonies are staying here not grasping the inner dialectic which is what we're teaching now and has been missed for 200 years um, so if you don't if we don't grasp what double binds are as the root of all oppression all poverty all crime all hate all disconnecting from a higher spirit we end up in some version of hell on earth, you could say. And children are particularly, in their innocence, exposed to this. Their speculative thinking is made abstract 
when the soul is supposed to be concrete. The subconscious is initially permutating itself with the in, in the most rational way it can. Studies show, and that as as it gets uh, truncated information, it starts developing these schisms of rational thought. So a double bind is different from a no-win situation. It's more sort of insidious and harder to solve, which is why in psychology it's one of the if we can solve a borderline personality disorder, it's the holy grail sort of because it's so tricky. It looks on the outside normal until you get into these schisms because the the mind is so smart that it starts creating incredible defense mechanisms that cover these up and they, they blindside um, psychiatrists and psychologists because they're incredibly usually incredibly hypersensitive, intelligent people develop these schisms because the pain is so unbearable to the people who are so close to it. Uh, so... A no-win situation is where you can still get out of it with rational discourse. It's it's where you have somebody in the red mode trying to put the other person in a schism. They're saying, okay, you're not allowed to move. You're, you're stuck here. And they usually end up in a contradiction where it's like no matter what position the person two takes in terms of an interaction. So this person could take a conceptual position on any of these three points and they lose. The person, person number one dislikes them. Um, so they can't reach this like harmony with each other as moments of the discourse so the the relationship remains unsatisfying but in the conceptual space in terms of the dialogue going on person two can actually do a perform a meta move which is that they ex explicate the the way that the talking or the dialogue is happening itself and they can say hey you know my partner honey uh, dear or you know friend um, or even another nation they can say, hey, okay, like, let's get out of the con concept and, and say, look, you're, you're putting me in the win positions where if I take this and I do what you say, you don't, you're not happy. If I do the opposite of that, you're still not happy. And if I do anything in the middle, you're still not happy. So no matter what I do, it's a no-win situation for me. And if you explain the no-win situation to another rational person, they'll, so they'll usually pick up on it and become rational. And like, oh, you're right. The real problem is on a totally different dialectic, on a different, more embedded uh, dialectic that is unsynthesized. So if you were to remain, if we were to remain on this superficial dialectic, we would never get to this, the sublation because we're on a completely wrong topic. And because these dialectics are nested in each other, uh, they build, the confusion builds. So that's why when you try and resolve one, it starts rational, but then eventually it starts to spiral out of control as we realize there's a whole bunch of unsublated dialectics in the dead order, killing our spirit and disconnecting us from our souls. This deeper subconscious concrete logic that is not based on the caprice of nature or animal nature, but on genuine reason. That's why a no-win situation can be the starting point of escaping because the meta narrative is allowed to be explicated. The meta, that's basically saying to your partner, hey, this, the synthesis is not there. And you're pointing to this. And if this person is rational, they will let you talk about that and say, oh, you're right. And then start doing a meta correction. So that's why it's possible to get out of no-win situations. Now, a double bind is more insidious in that it is a no-win in, in a no-win situation. So first of all, you're put in a no-win where none of the three positions are satisfying. But when you try and make it a meta commentary, that itself is a no-win. You're not allowed to even reference the synthesis. If you even try and reference the inner contradiction, the other person is so damaged that they get angry just in mentioning this, this topic, the sublation. And they can say, oh, you're diverting from the topic, you're red herring, there's a whole bunch of sophisticated ways to say that this is inappropriate. And then all of a sudden, not only are all the positions in the samsaric moment not allowed, but even the sublation, the moment of escape, the general liberation, the transcendental moment itself becomes restricted as another no-win, the meta itself. So if the, the way to escape is itself a lack, then there's no way to escape this in the traditional sense of rationality. The, the trauma has to be sublated, like where the schism is really happening has to be found in an implicit way. And this is where psychiatrists and therapists are very uh, highly trained in recognizing dialectics. Uh, construct theory um, tries to do this. You try and find the root, the root oppositions or the root contradictions that are creating the perceptions that allow the, the gridlock basically and the, the double binds to occur. So that's why double binds are likely the root of all oppression because they can't be resolved with reason because they're so irrational. 
this fluid moment is almost completely gone and you end up in this mechanical dead kind of interaction at all levels uh, it, within the self within the work within interdependence between people within families friends civil life state and international relations and then spirit itself can't really form in a concrete manner this is what we need to solve and then not only solve it on individual dialectics but start connecting the dialectics to each other in that sublating spirit over and over again to to sort of massage the soul to massage the concrete logic um, back into its uh, higher scientific or infinitely scientific mode where these double binds can be resolved if not between people as the overriding culture that creates space for the, these types of things and gets to the razor sharp clarity uh, and pinpointing what kind of trauma this person has experienced and getting to that sort of mystical meditative even ayahuasca like reconnection with the higher logic of the universe the true kind that is a universal satisfaction and it is a sort of mystical science that uh, astrology and these types of mystical arts are trying to approximate they sense that this this essence within things is there um, but they're not doing it in the systematic scientific principled way which means that it's always got an element of judgment and caprice to it that could distort the truth if you're a medium or you're a psychic or whoever you're turning to to try and approximate this dynamic is is not uh, is off or is is not quite in tune, which can sometimes happen to the best of the best. So this is a way to sort of embrace the secularist interpretation and also the mystical, spiritual, uh, new age, religious interpretation. We're all doing the same kind of thing, and really, it's it's as simple as recognizing how double binds create these impenetrable situations. And right now, um, Ukraine and Russia, uh, even with North Korea, all of the problems that we have on the international level are some version of this as well. And United Nations diplomats are trying to sublate, basically. And we're coming with a new level of clarity, because clarity, as we said in the beginning, is really how we, we get to the truth and to a higher wisdom. It sounds very simple, um, almost as simple as a jackal talk versus giraffe talk in terms of nonviolent communication in Ro Mar Marshall Rosenberg's theory. It was about, uh, you know, Gandhi, like we said earlier, is also doing this, but he is getting into this deeper mystical version of it um, that Marshall Rosenberg was somehow in tune with implicitly in his consciousness as an incredible human being. But now we can make it explicit and start learning it in steps. So this is really um the path to peace and it wasn't mentioned in the beginning of the talk but it really is foundational um in terms of uh, getting to the to the root of resolving why why we need to be doing this um this style of psychotherapy interpersonal relationships friendship itself is limited by this very simple but powerful dynamics to heal our world, heal ourselves, and uh, get on the path to a more universal satisfaction. So here we are nearing the end of the presentation, and we've covered a lot of uh, material, but we're really returning to the beginning, uh, where we started off with these sort of triggers, these alarms. And uh, we don't have any triggers. We're not losing any triggers for this slide because all we're doing is we're showing <laughs> what the triggers are. If anything, it's going to relieve stress from people um, that have, them, have to sort of face cognitive dissonance like we showed in the double bind slide. Uh, but now that we've sort of covered the theory, and for most people it might not seem very profound like what has happened because the way the nature of the thought is occurring is in a, a way that's ultimately familiar so familiar that if you're not understanding the motion, the way, the truth in the life, if you're a Christian watching this, but that's what they're talking about, like the way we use our words is the sort of hidden secret. There's a logic behind it. And if you need a way to, to grasp the true magnitude of what looks completely irrelevant and that nothing has been said in the last, you know, four hours of these slides or whatever the, the duration is, it's because this inner nature of the connections is missing. You're still too external to it. And we're trying to bring you into the internality and grasping how these simple moves are actually universes apart. 
in conceptual space. We're literally thinking on different dimensions. So to, to give you an idea of how to quantify it, we, we did it in the beginning slides where the conceptualization, the way we think about reality is the fundamental root of how we structure everything else. All the other abstract thoughts fit on that or sit on that foundation. So a good example is when Einstein did that with space and time, normally we think of space and time as separate things. They're not really connected. That's how ordinary thinking thinks about them externally. But what Einstein did is he, for a brief moment, grasped the inner shapes, grasped the inner connection where he realized they belong together in what's called dialectic. And most people don't do that, right? So it doesn't seem very significant. But now we know how significant the ramifications that it's really had. And so that's what we've done six times in a row for each Nobel Prize is the level of change that we're making it looks small. It's like a tiny little tweak that can offset your path. Um, you know, if you travel along it long enough, eventually, you know, if you're a cosmologist or an astronomer, it's like if you, <laughs> if you deflect your path by like uh, one degree after like six million light years, you know, you're in a different, uh, different galaxy, you know, you're off by that much. Um, you know, and a simple example is if you're trying to walk to a one town and you you angle your body like you know four degrees off the center path, then after you know fifty kilometers, you're you're in a different municipality or something, um, or you know maybe a hundred kilometers or something. So these tiny adjustments at the foundations have incredible effects as we go out from them, and so we believe that Hegel has done this not just once for the philosophy of nature he, he's done it for everything like six times if once this clicks for people it'll be like what hegel had done for physics times 600 percent. so you just experienced a version of that and if it feels really confusing and you have this feeling of like almost boredom that's because the the magnitude of it is coursing underneath your consciousness in a way but now, instead of doing it in a, just an artistic or a religious sense where you have to like turn off your rational thought and like let it you know channel through you and you know of course we know how that can turn into bad things and cults and all this type of manipulation, Hegel says, no, we can actually think these determinations scientifically for the first time in a systematic way. It's really great because it doesn't negate, it doesn't throw the baby out with the bathwater with what religion and art, art, artists are doing, it actually is clarifying why there are essential moments in history, why we could not do without them. So if you're religious and you're feeling negated, well, this is your truth coming in as a moment of the true ratio um, between the super sensuous shapes and the sensuous empirical reality. But if you're secular, you'll also be relieved that we're not building some kind of cult here that you have to submit, you know, and you can't self-determine. No, this is all about self-determination. But in the living logic that religion wants us to do it in this concrete way of doing a systematic kind of science that is ultimately self-justifying, um, but not in the bad kind of circularity, but in this sort of true kind of speculative thought which circles back and justifies itself in, in true reasons, deeper reasoning. That is simultaneously metaphysical and epistemological, and that all the stereotypes of Hegel in the past were really cutting him up in these one-sided abstractions that he was trying to warn us about. So that's how we ended up here. Okay, so now let's get to something more practical, because if we're going to win these Nobel Prizes and change the world with a new world spirit, um, Hegel says once you understand these, these huge fundamental shifts, world spirit starts coming through you because you start aligning with uh, the deeper inner logic that the divine ones of the past were seeing and were trying to communicate to a, a, a really <laughs> early version of human thinking. But now, in order to, to win them, you know, the, the point of philosophy is not just to describe the world. The point is also to change it, but to change it in a wise way. And that's a quote from Marx from anybody who's paying attention. So, of course, we're capitalist, socialist, and communist all at the same time. So if you're triggered by that, don't worry. Your moments are coming in the practical implication. The, the capitalist moments are coming in the practical implications of, of implementing these ideas and working together as a team. So we're going to call this practical stage the five stages of the stream of spirit because in a way we're just sort of repeating what corporations or any organization does and, and we're sort of doing recruitment. You have to bring people external to the internal. But we have to do it in a, in a smart way because if you don't uh, really uh, 
terrible things can happen. The slaughter bench of history and all these things uh, that have happened in the past without this deeper wisdom occur. And we already know that the, how people are going to react from ordinary consciousness or pictorial consciousness, Hegel calls it, is that they're going to see this completely as outside the Overton window. This is not even understandable. It's gibberish. It's incomprehensible. It's just a bunch of woo-woo, voodoo, stay away from these people. They're a cult. That's what happens when you first start bringing New World Spirit on the scene because that's how dialectic develops. So the, the sort of onboarding process, uh, we're calling the stream. And a stream is not coercive. It's not forceful. A stream re requires an embracing of self-determination. People only come into the New World Spirit if they understand what's happening. There's no uh, pulling the wool over anybody's eyes. There's no wolf in sheep's clothing. There's no... The truth that they're missing is, is already hidden from them through the confusion of the kind of culture that we're born into. Our, our, our culture, as we can all sense, is somehow missing an inner cohesion but we're scared of that inner cohesion because we're on the verge of a, a world government of some kind. You know, wealth concentration is at all time highs and we have these, you know, billionaires and soon to be trillionaires. And, you know, we don't want to end up in some kind of nightmare of totalitarian oppressive regime, you know, where you're, you're like a slave of some kind and you can't think freely and there's no real freedom. Hegel is the opposite of that, even though in history people blame him for Mussolini's regime and things we talked about in previous slides. The real and true living Hegel his living philosophy is actually a world spirit, not a new world order that is external to the individuals. The individuals determine what the constitution is that fits their level of freedom, which is governed by the limitations of their reason. So that's why it has to be a science, but it has to be an infinite kind of science. That's not the dead kind that atheists or religious people are generally negating atheists about. But atheists are correct sort of in the form, they're just wrong in terms of the content, or at least the connectedness of the content. But the empiricism and the, the a priori and the a posteriori, which are fancy philosophy words, uh, those are usually in contrast uh, or contradiction between the sort of heavenly world or the world beyond and then the, the world that's present to us. So we're resolving that and we need to do it in the scientific way that, that sort of treats both of those uh, moments of atheism and theism or metaphysics and empiricism or a priori and a posteriori as a, as a ratio that belong together as moments. We are supposed to move between them. So the stream is based on this inner determining. This You have to think it for yourself. It can't just be an external thing. And so we thought, okay, there's five ways to usually um, do a sort of public relations um, education campaign or orientation to get people comfortable with deciding whether or not they want to cross the threshold and, and enter the, the culture. And this culture will be pretty strong. So we want to make sure people don't join it unless they they are scientific, basically, uh, in terms of the, the living kind. Um, because what will happen is they bring the double binds into the organization and then the negation starts up from within. The dialectic rips you apart and, you know, the path that hell is paved with good intentions. That kind of irony starts up. Uh, but we're not going to fall prey to that because this wisdom is is accounting for the skeptic the skeptical moment, and we're seeing the first version of this in the very first stage of the stream, which is called the smashing room of absolute negation. Now Hegel says that the true logic, the true science, begins by a sort of ego death where you have to absolutely negate what you think you know as potentially false knowledge. In the religious world, this is the carnal knowledge, this is the ignorant knowledge, the empty knowledge of Buddhism, it's, it's the original sin of Catholicism. Every religion has a version of this, two types of knowledge. And we're making a distinction here that, that Hegel also makes in that you have to get away from that kind of knowledge to get to the true kind. And the, the philosopher who got closest to this originally was Descartes. So if you studied philosophy, Descartes is quite famous. Uh, I think he was in the 16th century or 17th century, hundreds of years ago. And he said that I'm going to get to a new foundation of truth by negating everything I think I know because my senses are lying to me and all this kind of stuff. But Hegel said he didn't go far enough. He didn't negate the self itself as a presupposition of, of knowledge. So the ego is so immediately apparent. It's not really apparent. It's, it's so immediate to us that we never think to question it, question our own consciousness, our own ego. And so that's what Hegel does. He says, no, we have to even do that. So when you do an absolute negation, you have to be more Descartes than Descartes. 
which means you have to negate the self itself and get to objective negation, which is that you're not necessarily thinking these things. These shapes start developing themselves imminently, which is really hard to understand. And we know nobody is really going to understand it at first because only the divine ones seem to have grasped this in a concrete sense. So in the first stage, when people first come to the organization, they aren't going to want to know this theory. The, our society is in such pain that they're going to just want to smash and externalize the unsublated negations. Uh, so we have a smashing group that is just there to basically get all the pain out and just negate everything. These individuals don't care about rationality because they see the world as irrational. There's, the world has been irrational to them and they've absorbed that irrationality and got disconnected from their the concreteness of a subconscious logic or the soul, if you want to speak about it in religious terms, or divine inner inspiration, if you want to be an artistic, uh, in the artistic expression. So this is where, through inviting in the absolute negation, instead of ignoring it or chastising it or berating it or judging it or thinking we're better than anybody and we have this elitism going on, we believe the, the wisdom is higher, but in terms of the human experience, we're all sort of um, equals in terms of overcoming the, the negative nature of the dialectic. So this is where the negative moment of reason happens, is uh, kind of what Hegel calls it. And of course, as we allow people to smash, eventually it starts turning into its opposite through something that um, um, Carl Jung uh, called, he had a concept for it, uh, starts with E. Because I'm making these presentations in, in this raw format, I'll just leave it up to you to look that up. Maybe we'll cover it in the next slide, actually. But for now, we're just saying the first slide is inviting in this negative process. and We're not being naive. People won't listen no matter what the New World Spirit says or does. Uh, we started with this as one of the main problems at the beginning of the presentation. So we're going to solve that here. Then the second one is moving on. Uh, there's a way to graduate from that level and go to the 11 life areas, where a classic problem in philosophy is people just are too broken or too sensuous to tarry with pure thought. They're too distracted by the everyday means of survival. So if you're in a desperate situation, philosophy is very hard to obtain. So you want to make it easier for people by solving some of the economic problems uh, in a comprehensive way. Then you can graduate to the Pareto rotations. This is a very um, challenging part of the presentation. It's pretty much where the rest of the triggers are going to get burnt. But this is how we're going to deal with uh, privilege and the virtuous and, e and vicious economic business cycle problems that even when people have tried to sort of create these foundational changes in the past, they just end up resetting themselves in this dialectical irony um, where, you know, the oppression, the way that they did it in a coercion rather than a stream ended up correcting itself and uh, repeating the cycles in a lower level of wisdom. So then once that is understood, the fourth stage is the actual sentence game, which we covered in slide Number five, I think, where we showed the three steps of picking a story, uh, scheduling a game, and then playing the, the sentence game. So it has to be fun, and it has to be inner and outer rewards, which is why we're sharing the Nobel Prize money and all this. And then the fifth stage is something called universal design, where we get into the sum total of everything we've covered. And uh, initially, we were presenting this idea, the Nobel Surprise, starting with this concept, but it was overwhelming literally everybody because the conceptualizations are so groundbreaking that even the geniuses in our current age are still within pictorial thinking. So the this type of thinking isn't just high IQ, it's UQ. We're, we're thinking in a transcendental or sublative or lateral sense. And if we get our geniuses making that speculative transition, then we start getting a, an incredible new kind of meritocracy that makes these slides a lot more simple in their essence. and. And it solves this problem of, um, you know, we have too many siloed academics, uh, too many holy texts. Uh, these people, even the greats in our current societies can't work together. So we're scientifically and spiritually disabled. So these are the five stages of the stream we're going to get into in more detail. And it's all about turning the theory into practice now, which does require a lot of knowledge about spreadsheets. So that's why we don't start with it. Um, because spreadsheets are generally seen as dead and dry. <laughs> and what we're trying to, to communicate here is actually the literal nature of uh, eminent and effluent being flowing. We're literally trying to create flow states. So spreadsheets seem like to be in opposition, but for now, it's one of the best ways to handle the incredible abundance of this radical tectonic shift in the way we think, which will shift the way that we be together as well. Hopefully this is a good uh, top level survey. Um, as we get into the last section of this presentation and uh, we start actualizing
this profound uh, kind of wisdom into the world as the new world spirit. Welcome. Now the first slide of the stream of spirit loses the trigger immediately uh, from seven down to six because many individuals might read this and think it's radically insensitive in terms of making fun of nuclear war when we are literally the closest to midnight in, in terms of the doomsday clock that Einstein and others in the Manhattan Project started uh, to, to protect us from nuclear war. So it comes off as insensitive and not very academic in terms of the the alarms and the, the campiness of the presentation. But this is a lot more serious than it looks. There's a lot more behind this. But we're, what we're trying to say is, no matter how we start this first moment of the stream of spirit, people won't listen no matter what New World Spirit says or does. It doesn't matter whether this is sophisticated, it doesn't matter whether we use nice words or politically correct or anything. Anything in this mode, when the New World Spirit is moving into the real world and trying to engage with contemporary society, there is a level of pure contingent irrationality that is within the being of nature itself. And this is what new movements always come up against because it allows for this radical moment of freedom, this caprice that allows sort of free will or at least determinism of some type to occur where you have the necessity of the opposition of determinism in law and then the ability to not follow determinism in law, having that opposite pair to define each other. So we're instead of being naive and thinking, you know, kumbaya, this is going to work out perfectly fine and the utopia is going to manifest, the first moment Hegel states is always abstract negation. And only people who have reached philosophical consciousness can negate that abstract negation immediately. So you can get to a sublation, like we talked about in the Nobel Peace Prize. But before that meta-reflexive moment of sublation occurs, the default mode of thinking when we come up against an other that is unknown is always abstract negation. It's the moment of separation. And this is why people in the beginning don't listen no matter what you say or do if reason is too low. Because reason is a process of recognition, a recognition of the universal in the other, which is simultaneously in oneself as the being and the thinking or the phenomenology of a consciousness. And so this process is the full-on realistic, uh, pessimistic moment that then sublates into the optimism out of a, a wisdom instead of an indeterminate abstract identity, a sort of uh, assumption that things are going to work out fine. There's still an optimism here, but this moment has to occur in the beginning. And the point of it is to take all the memes, take all the trolling, take all the pain that is unsublated in current society, take all of that and externalize it in a sort of safe manner or a manner that is at least a little more safe. And um, it's serving a, a profound kind of function, a practical function. We're moving out of uh, theory here and we're getting to practice the, really, the real messiness of the actual world and we're saying there's a metaphysical, psychological process occurring here that uh, is talked about in the past through philosophers like Descartes. And if you look up at the, ta the top tab here, you can sort of see um, a, a, a tab about the cogito ergo sum, which is from Rene Descartes in terms of canceling everything he thinks he knows and this sort of absolute negation to get to, to the truth and build a new foundation of epistemology or knowledge on top of that so that it's a, a stable structure or maybe a system of, of actual knowing that is not ba based on the emptiness of appearances. So that's why he says, you know, once you get rid of everything you think you know, uh, the only thing left is the, the self, the thinking itself, the, the, the thinking self, the I, the cogito. So the cogito is thinking, therefore it's proving its being because if a demon of some kind came to try and trick 
the, the cogito, that it's not thinking, that it's not there, then in the process of the trickery is the thinking. So you can't get rid of the thinking. If it's there at all, it realizes that it is. So that's where Descartes had a, a moment of truth in terms of the negative moment of consciousness. But Hegel comes along and states that he didn't go far enough. Descartes wasn't uh, Cartesian enough, you could say. Descartes wasn't Descartian enough. And the absolute negation wasn't a real absolute negation because there was an implicit assumption that Descartes was making that was so immediate to him, so absolutely present, that no one ever thinks to question it. Just like back in the Nobel Literature Prize that we talked about in terms of Hegel's quote of, you know, the, the logical categories that we use every day, like ising or being itself. We never think to question that as a category itself. Just like with our ourselves. So why does thinking have to be attached to the, the self? And Hegel says, it doesn't have to be that way. That's an assumption because we are implicitly already being that. We think that our thoughts are coming from our own minds because we don't know any better. And uh, our thoughts are usually disorganized or confused. Like each one of these represents a shape, sort of like the um, shape space we're talking about in the Nobel Physics Prize. But the blackness inside them means that it's coded in what feels like universality, but it's sort of empty and unstructured. It's not scientific, infinitely scientific thought. Some of them might be connected in these semi-scientific arrows uh, or connections, but for the most part, it's not really grounded on a true foundation of science. It's usually just empiricism and we're doing pattern recognition. And that's more about correctness, not necessarily about actual truth, according to Hegel. So the mode of science we have today is an advance over random caprice, like complete caprice uh, and superstition, but it's not quite real science, it's abstract science. This is finite idealism or subjective idealism, Hegel calls it. And this is where Kant, the philosopher Kant, for instance, was stuck. He was stuck in this mode of thinking that our, our thoughts are not objective in any way. But if we get rid of that assumption and become absolutely skeptical, that we don't even assume that thinking comes from a finite mind, and we don't even assume it doesn't come from a finite mind, we just cancel it. Just cancel everything that we think we know, every presupposition, then this is where we get to a true, genuine canceling of everything, an actual, uh, ab absolute negation. So Descartes cancels what he thinks he knows. And that's how we get to the Kagikido. The, the eye here is an actual universal. It's one of these shapes, but in the beginning, for him, it's indeterminate. There's no thinking going on. It's just being itself. And then as soon as it thinks it is itself, and this black dot here represents the, or the black sphere represents the world of nature, the finite world, the world of empirical reality. And basically what Hegel comes along and says, well, you can't assume that either, Descartes, so cancel this too. And what ends up happening, for Hegel anyway, is you get to the true absolute negation because once you cancel that, it cancels all of that and it even cancels any imaginings of this. This is the heavenly God world. So the true beginning of knowledge doesn't begin even with an assumption of God. It is the true atheistic beginning, the true scientific beginning. And this is the completed absolute negation, the real one that Descartes was trying to do. But he was too human. He was not skeptical enough uh, to actually reach this true state of epistemolo uh, epistemology. So if we we're studying godless, what about all that, you know, Nobel Medical Prize, you know, holy thinking and all that? I thought we were doing that sort of, whole, sort of holy text and Quran and, you know, I thought there was divine truth there that was very healthy. Why are we canceling everything? Well, it's because this canceling is in terms of religious interpretation, what we would call uh, grounding our faith on spirit for the first time, because we're canceling our sin, our sinful thoughts, but not just canceling our sinful thoughts, we're canceling literally the being of those thoughts itself, the finitude itself, which is canceling original sin in terms of the Christian uh, representation. So we are literally canceling our separation from the divine by canceling the, the grounding of the finitude of that separation in ourselves. 
So once this cancellation is absolutely completed and it's finished, it even cancels its own self, the canceling itself cancels, then we end up literally with less than nothing. There's nothing to even compare nothingness to. This is what Hegel calls sheer immediate indeterminacy or pure being this here. And the reason why it's a square, not a circle, is because there's nothing to define it by. The square is just a representation of immediate indeterminacy. To determine something, you have to have an opposite pair of some kind forming. And so an absolute negation gets us to this state, which it's yellow here because it is a universal shape, but it's not a shape defined by anything. This is the Tao. This is the ineffable. This is the Lord that is the beginning of wisdom in Christianity or the Brahman. Uh, before Brahman differentiates into uh, Vishnu and Shiva and all the other polytheistic gods, or Ein Sof in terms of Judaism. Um, this is Allah. The Quran has a, a version of Allah. There's many names for Allah, but there, there's a name for the immediate version of Allah, and it's the powerful version, the mighty, the authority. That is, we can't know anything about. So this is where true knowledge begins paradoxically with less than nothing we can't even say it's nothing because we have to have something to compare it to we, we canceled everything including the connection to anything else we thought we knew so when that's done you get to so little of nothing that nothingness itself true nothingness can't actually exist because for nothingness to exist existence is more than nothing already so that means that nothingness can't formally exist so by that moment of inner contradiction it elides from the canceling into this state of of quasi you know being which is what hegel calls pure being and pure being is just indeterminate immediacy or immediate indeterminacy so you can't really get less than this but in some ways this is the true less than nothing the true ineffable of which everything else starts to build. So how do you connect any other thoughts to this as the foundation while well, you connect pure nothingness to it? Because nothing is not really something. It's not You're not connecting something affirmative to an affirmative. You're connecting a sheer immediate indeterminacy to a nothing. So this gets pretty metaphysical and it, it, it solves the cataphatic and the apophatic beginning of the true metaphysical knowledge, true skeptical beginning where this is not a god, this is not this is something objective. Hegel calls it objective logic thinking itself. There's nothing here thinking this explicitly. There might be something implicit, but we don't know what that is. It's not saying anything. It's ineffable at this point. But just in the beingness of this, like just in the just it being there, is it starts to create a distinction that is no distinction with the pure nothingness that is its content and its form simultaneously it's a speculative moment hegel says this this is this mystical sort of language game objective language game that language is doing in itself so this smashing room of absolute negation is really this descartian move that we're trying to do without imposing anything on anybody you let the negation work itself out and it's because people just don't Aren't, they're so traumatized that the randomness in, in consciousness and free will has to have a moment of freedom, at least within the bounds of legality in, in our modern world or in modern society. So what I want to show now is um, what the Smashing Room actually looks like. So if we go to discord where there's a lot of this stuff going on one of the discord servers is called the smashing room of absolute spirit or the smashing room of absolute negation and uh, we have some instructions that are very simple smash your heart out let the best best smash win so what might end up in, uh, occurring is that people will eventually come to unload and try and beat the system to try and negate any rules because that's what negation does it tries to negate any limits so the challenge is to try and destroy all of this. And eventually it might turn into a little bit of a game at some point, like to see who can have the best smash. 
And so we have different levels. There's the amateur smash, the smashing intermediate, and the smashing expert. And then smashing go to jail is a little bit of a joke where it starts to get pretty risque. But then there's smashing actually go to jail where we're warning them that if they cross the line and they start posting illegal content, then we will um, have to close their account, Discord might track their IP, whatever. We're warning them to not cross that line. We're giving them a lot of space, but that line is not something that can be crossed in the current epoch without consequences of some kind. And that's also to make sure that the server is protected because Discord will shut down the server. And there's a lot of raiding and a lot of um, social stuff that goes on in terms of self-sabotaging like, channels. And so we become very aware that this is uh, an interesting dynamic at this level of experience. But then what happens is once the smashing is done, we have a done smashing channel where it won't really be done smashing. This is the beginning stages of an inflection point. It won't be really real, real smashing finishing. It'll be a, a facetious kind where it's still going to get spammed with memes and trolling and you know racism and sexism and all the isms, ableism, people making fun of people, jokes everywhere, insensitive jokes, uh, pervert, perverted jokes, um, tons of things like this. Basically the worst of human nature. Uh, some people would call this a cesspool. But then this will get spammed a little bit less. But then we'll have actually done smashing where we'll have moderators who start deleting some of the content, but it'll still probably get spammed. And then the final one really actually done smashing is where we'll start deleting all the spamming on this channel and trying to keep it clear for people who are getting ready to make the transition. They're tired. They got it out. They are, the negation has been externalized. The abstract negation has been externalized enough that it can now be negated itself as a whole. And so the, we have a voice channel as well where people can come in, talk in, and expose some of the negations in other ways. But what might end up happening is that a hierarchy usually sets up between the players. It just happens naturally where they'll be the best smashers versus the small. And they start judging each other because the negation isn't just negating us. It starts negating its own self dialectically from within. But because they there's a limit within side, like because these individuals have a commonality that they understand the pain of experience, this existential crisis, this meaninglessness that starts to occur when trauma has been inflicted randomly through the caprice of nature or a random accident or, you know, it makes us believe there is no uh, absolute truth. And so it gravitates to that at first, but in a paradoxical sense, it creates a commonality and a sense of camaraderie. If there's any reason at all, if it's, it's complete uh, psychosis or loss of any kind of reason at all, then, you know, that's a sort of mental disability where maybe the brain chemicals aren't allowing any sort of coherent thought. But anything less than that is probably going to end up in some version of this. And it's to get people to a point where they'll ask a question. And that question is, okay, well, what's the next step to get out of this horribly painful world of uh, randomness and chaos? And there will be a moderator or somebody waiting at these levels uh, for people to ask a question, that question, and say, okay, we're actually serious about moving to the next level. And the next level is to not know who they are because we don't want to link them back to this outletting. We want to let people know that this is an anonymous thing. And uh, once they're ready to embrace their rational self, the spirit within, that's where we'll ask them to create an anonymous email and we'll email them the wisdom quiz that we talked about from the Nobel Economics Prize, where we talked about the universal meritocracy. And that's where we'll start the interfacing to see where the abstractions are in their, their universals or their shape space. Um, so that's basically the smash. Now that's the smashing room. And once we send the, the wisdom quiz, which I suppose I could pull up here for, for those who might not have uh, viewed the other slides, it's just a very simple test uh, to get people um, onto the path of sublation which we talked about in the Nobel Peace Prize is the living essence of wisdom. And so it's a very gentle process once people have the toxicness and the trauma out a little bit more. And it might not go away, so they might have to keep returning to the, the smashing room. But it's to start creating a, a separation so that spirit can start coming through them, this infinitely rational side. And Hegel says that 
pure thought is infinitely more powerful than the caprice of nature in terms of overcoming and sublating in that living kind of spirit. But now let's go back to our slide and show the deeper philosophy behind this. Um, so yes, we talked about Descartes, um, but this is actually building upon some psychiatric principles of understanding how human psychology works. And so Hegel talks a lot in his uh, philosophy of subjective spirit about Philip Pinel, uh, and he's considered the father of modern psychiatry back in the 1800s. And Hegel was very impressed by this man compared to the other uh, schools of psychology back then, which were alienating and treating the mentally ill as subhuman. And this man, uh, Pinnell, came and he actually went the opposite way and he started humanizing psychiatric treatment. And Hegel says something very shocking that when you treat a human being like a human being, you increase the chances of spirit coming forward, this rational side of true human uh, an instinct that is no instinct. And so this man was dialectically on the right path, whereas the others were in the negative moment of reason only. This man was starting to sublate and seeing how the mind really works and that it started improving the, the results um, in terms of addressing dementia and, and early nascent categorizations of the illnesses. And so this is the direction that the smashing room is taking, is that the individuals that come in will post things that are shocking and uh, will want to judge them and will say, how could anybody ever do this? And the depth of human despair is quite uh, jarring at first. But the goal is to not give in to that kind of negation, holding the seat of compassion and this rational side for them, holding that space so that they can purify their consciousness and come through is really what therapy is about. And it's a humanizing kind, it's a rehabilitation, including with prisons, right? This is a version that we're trying to do in prisons now because we even learned this lesson um, through billions of dollars of, of um, prison uh, costs that when you treat human beings like criminals, they turn into hardened criminals and reoffending rates go up. But now we have strong data showing that if you have proper rehabilitation and education where we start humanizing uh, individuals who have fallen through the cracks, reoffending rates go down. It's not perfect, but that's why we're introducing the holy and the holy healthcare because the living logic is really the only thing strong enough for a self-determining kind of emotional resilience that can handle um, the abstract negations of society. So this is the model that the Smashing Room is built upon. And of course, we've come quite a ways since uh, Philip Pinnell, but the, the DSM, the Diagnostics Manual, is uh, itself not perfect. Um, so we are constantly improving, but this is the direction we want to improve and to actualize the new world spirit. Now, in terms of how the psychology of this actually works out, it gets into a little bit of philosophy and this concept of potentiality and actuality. There's spirit and potential, and then there's the actualizing of it in terms of this higher, this higher science, this higher level of actual rationality of ratio-based shape dynamics. In our phenomenology, in, in, in the physical universe as well, and in the metaphysical as well, in the spiritual. But Aristotle was one of the first to make these uh, dialectical distinctions between potentiality and actuality, and we're using the spirit room or the, the smashing room to get to an actualization. It's a process of actualization. And there are psychologists and psychiatrists that have realized this, and one of them was Carl Jung in his concept of enantiodromia. And it's based on this idea that if you take one extreme and you, and you push it to its absolute extreme, it turns into its opposite extreme. And they start interchanging between each other. This is repeating the dialectical principle in its purity. Uh, Carl Jung is applying it in the concrete sphere of subjective or the, the philosophy of spirit, the world of mind. But even in the metaphysical, in the philosophy of nature, and the philosophy of spirit, across all three domains of um, reality, dialectic is occurring. But enantiodramia is the version of, of um, the, or at least more modern version of it in terms of psychology. This is what Carl Jung was touching on in terms of the metaphysics. 
but the metaphysics is kind of based on Heraclitus' flux and becoming. Um, and Aristotle has energia, and teleki is the fulfilled energia, this actualizing potential, which is very nebulous. People don't really understand what Aristotle was saying, but we think that it really is lining up with not just Heraclitus, but Hegel says there's the metaphysical, pure logical notion of it called pure becoming, not just the becoming of sensuous reality or uh, empiricism, but the logical categories themselves, the pure ontological categories as objects in themselves are thinking themselves through their own necessary dialectic through the oppositions between them it's it's very um it's very hard to contemplate this level of abstractness but it gets into these determinantnesses these mixed kind of states of things that explains more deeply what aristotle was touching upon with energia and even heraclitus with um, this concept of flux and becoming so the way that we're going to think about it more in terms of the infinite logic is we have these trinities or these triads of opposition and then reuniting or return. So the confusing thing about determinateness in explaining uh, the enantiodromia of what we're trying to create with the smashing room is that we are creating a, an energy, a process of becoming, becoming from the irrational caprice to the higher level of rationality. And everybody's going through this, Hegel says, you know, from children, we're all passing through these stages. And we're doing this through a determinateness where we're moving from that pure being, from that stage of, you know, can't make any distinctions, the Tao basically, and we're building these rational universal structures on top of them, on top of it. So the, the difficult thing about determinateness, if we have any Hegelians studying this, he uses it in two different kind of ways, much like Aristotle does it. Uh, uses energia and potentia and, and, and entelechy in interchangeable sort of ways, but also in oppositional ways. So there's the same thing happening with determinateness, which is this quasi-state between being indeterminate and being determinate. So the first way he means it is in this first circle only in contrast to quantity and measure. But really when we think about determinateness in this mode, it's the noun form. It's a completed form, com completed quality is what Hegel calls it. But when this is existing on its own, even without an opposition, it is in this sort of state of potentia. Without a clear opposite, it's, it is this kind of indeterminacy that's not being compared to anything except maybe within itself. And so this is sort of the complete actualized determinateness. And in terms of a physical representation, it's kind of like quantum superposition empirically. It's kind of like this indeterminate state that can have states sort of within it, but it's not actualized. It's still just potential until the wave function collapses. Now, these categories are not in the empirical world. This is not actual superposition of any material things of space-time. This is in the pure timeless, spaceless realm. And uh, we're just making this clear that Hegel's speaking about it in its noun form. This is not pure being or the true beginning. This is a more concrete category later. It's a completeness. So something has already taken place. So what has already taken place is this process here. And uh, we're saying this is version 1.0 because the way that when we read Hegel, he's moving in gestalts in a certain sense where, where you have to do the whole and the parts at the same time. They're interchanging in their own dialectic. So you're, we're doing sort of a, a partial negation. We're figuring things out. And then all of a sudden it'll just click and spontaneously erupt into a new entire quality of thinking. And this is enantiodromia in a certain sense of consciousness development in higher complex shapes of consciousness. And interestingly, Hegel literally calls them shapes of consciousness in his phenomenology of spirit. So this, this shape dynamic stuff that we're doing in the Nobel Physics Prize and the Nobel Chemi Chemistry Prize really do have a place for... Uh, a place in philosophy, or at least the genuine philosophy and not the abstract kind. So this second way of thinking of determinateness is determinateness in the verb form. So we have the noun form here, it's like an immediacy in itself, and now we have a verb form. So Hegel sort of begins the, the indeterminate pure being, that square, we'll put it in a circle form here, um, with a dotted boundary, meaning it's indeterminate. 
Now, this is something that's hard to grasp, but the movement out of itself is not, there's nothing inside of it that's not itself driving itself. It's, it's literally coming from its own notion, its own concept of itself. Because it's indeterminate, just being there starts to uh, move itself immediately. It's not a real movement. It's like an immediate movement, which is a contradiction. But it's a spontaneous sort of becoming that's rep starting to replicate the Heraclitus becoming. But it's not real becoming yet. It's not energy yet, explicitly. It's what we would call unrealized realizing. So what it's turning into is the pure nothing. It's a pure nothing. And it's a cutting in half. That's what this lightning bolt means. It's, a, it's like half a moment of a moment of thinking. It's like half a moment of becoming. It's not even a full moment. That's how abstract this is between pure being and pure nothing. But then what ends up happening is the unrealized realizing um, reaches the next stage and becomes a realized realizing. The connection between these two things becomes a little bit more concrete. And so they start referring to each other because the, the pure nothing becomes a non-being referencing a being. But the being is still indeterminate in reference to an immediate non-being of itself. So now it, there's a sort of knowing or preservation of the moving back and forth. So this is what likely energia means with Aristotle. And people have been trying to figure this out for thousands of years because he's using, Aristotle is using these words speculatively. And that's why Hegel said he was the greatest genuine philosopher um, before the system of real genuine philosophy came about with Hegel's own system. So and energia is the realized realizing that we know we're turning into something else that is not the original state and so it's flipping back and forth into what are called the moments of becoming coming to be and ceasing to be so this is ceasing to be but simultaneously it's also a coming to be it's the coming to be of the ceasing to be that's the true speculative moment where these moments of coming to be and then or ceasing to be and then coming to be so it goes from this moment here to the next one they start interpenetrating. We realize they're happening simultaneously. But before that happens, it's really just this energy. Uh, it's a fulfilling, but not yet fulfilled. So Hegel calls this sort of self-sublation in the unrealized realizing. And then the realized realizing is where we get into the Heraclitus kind of becoming, except not in the material world yet. The material world is approximating this. This is the metaphysical version that Aristotle was a little bit closer to. Who's getting to the metaphysical logic of it so we don't normally think of of it on this abstract level but it is really um, quite incredible now where we go from here is that we actually go from unrealized realizing to realized realizing to an actualized realizing so this is where the distinction between potential and actuality begins uh, more concretely is when we're in this in, um, initial stage of becoming this is just a potential it has to actualize itself into what it really is in an opposition so you can think about the this energy as it doesn't sound like it's very prof like very insightful but the space between true opposites is infinitely powerful you cannot separate these pure thoughts from each other it's like trying to rip the universe apart. There's infinite amount of energy between these pure thoughts turning into each other imminently. So this is the incredible way to think about it. These are entire universes, but because they're, they're spaceless, timeless universes, they're really just points. They're less than points. That's how we perceive them from our material universe where it looks like there's space and time and all this stuff. But the space between the pure nothing and the pure in, in, immediate indeterminacy, indeterminacy, this is not a real space. It's happening immediately, but we're just depicting it here. This is infinite power. And this is what creates pure becoming for Hegel in two moments. But then those two moments, as realized happening together, is what pure becoming is as a negative unity. It's a sort of repeating of this moment up here, of the unrealized realizing um, of the, these two moments belonging together, but then they belong together in their negations of each other. But when we realize that positively, it changes into something else, a higher level. 
just like this realization process from the unrealized realizing to the realized realizing, where the ind indeterminate finds itself in the pure nothingness. Um, so it's it's not like a conscious realizing. There's no subjectivity here. It's just the process of it rep rep replicating itself and then the immediacy of that creating the next level. So it's the connections building themselves logically. Uh, so this is the negative unity um, where they're not necessarily interpenetrating yet. They're not doing this speculative move perfectly yet. Um, but then it does. So this is what kinesis is. This is what motion is. Even though there's no space or time here, it's not empirical motion. Empirical motion, space and time are repeating this. And when we see this in, in, in space-time, that's what Einstein was talking about with um, curved space and that matter curved space and that it can change motions in, from straight lines into you know orbits. Um, we, we proved that with stars, uh, that lensing of, of stars in their gravitational fields. So this is not inapplicable. It does have incredible consequences. But then once the pure becoming moves from its negative unity, the kinesis, to uh, its actual sublation, this is where we think that entelechy, this incredibly nebulous word, that is often a stability in the instability. And so this is why we think this moment of determinateness, this is called actualized determinateness. This is uh, what Hegel calls pure determinate being. It's the first stable being from the flux of the pure becoming. But it is not completely separate. It is being mediated by this, this pure nothing moment into its stable form. So this is a constant flux that is mediating this stability. So if this flux stopped, this stability of being, this quality would disintegrate as well. And this is sort of what entelechy seems to mean in the way that Aristotle uses it. But it's, it's kind of interchangeable because once you get the actualized determinateness, right? We had unrealized determinant, uh, realizing, realized uh, realizing, which is forms of determinateness. And now we have the third form, which is the actualized form, the stable form. But then determinateness, the en energia, the energia starts up again, but now in the mode of this kind of potential. So this is the potential again because it's back in the mode of indeterminacy um, it, instead of having a dotted line though it actually has a solid line around it because it's stable in comparison to this flux where everything is the dotted line so it's be that that solid boundary is why this noun form has a solid boundary because these states of mediation have been completed already but now this is a more stable form it's called it, you could think about it as determinate determinateness this is actualized realizing not just realized realizing, this is a, a kind of higher stage. And then this actualizes itself through another process of becoming. And that's how all the stages start becoming more and more concrete until we get to this level of determinateness and quality and measure. And this is what we think, this is the interplay of the words, how we think um, the process of psychology, this, this enantiodramia is happening is that when we're allowing people to externalize, we're allowing this process of becoming to work its way out into its higher notion, its higher purpose, its higher end, its higher form. And then that purpose can now actualize itself into higher forms. So this is not the most concrete uh, way that determinateness or um, the opposites dialectically evolve. We have sort of the, the nascent form, the verb form of determinateness. We have the noun form of determinateness, but we can get a higher level which is what essence is of completed, actualized, returned determinateness, where it has a solid boundary, but it also has this dotted boundary um, coding it. And then this starts up another process, which we call essence. And this is a, gets into more of the, the, the shapes. This is the next highest shape of this process of potentiality and actuality working its way through. In our psychologies, it happens in the universe too, um, but... That's how we explain the deeper shape space of what the, the smash room really represents here. So it's not quite as simple as it initially looks. There's a lot more behind the scenes um, that we think can, think can get people onto the path that eventually they will understand the other stages and then the, the concept of the Nobel uh, Prizes and the Universal Prizes and then also addressing crime and 
um, all these unsublated negations. And we hope that was uh, very enlightening for any Aristotelians or Hegelian philosophers. We think this might be some of the first, uh, first academic um, expressions of this level of philosophy. This is the genuinely philosophical version um, that sounds completely crazy at first, but it's just crazy enough that it, it just might work. So hopefully you're still with us after losing a trigger, but this stage is necessary in terms of a wise starting of the stream of spirit in the practical mode of, of actualizing the new world spirit. From its potentia to its concrete actuality and solve this problem of having people starting to listen in a self-determining way, not in a coercive way, in this beginning of genuine freedom, even from the irrationality of their own selves, the abstract negation that's actually controlling them from within. So the caprice of nature is actually still creating unfreedom within them because pure thought is the liberation, the genuine liberation of these shapes that are what consciousness is and wisdom really is as a self-determining from within, the wisdom from within. Welcome to the second slide of the stream of spirit. Stage number two is called the 11 life areas. And this slide is a lot less controversial than the previous one about the smashing room. And so we're not going to drop a trigger. This is one of the only slides where we're not actually losing any triggers um, because this is almost common sense by this point in terms of public health and uh, we want individuals to arrive at this stage after going through the the previous stage which because we're being wise about it we're not going to put a time limit it could take some individuals an hour to get out their frustrations and start sublating and get to the wisdom quiz but it could take some individuals a day a week a month a year Maybe some individuals have so much trauma or, or psychological conditions that are creating what Hegel uh, describes as floating heads, like these, these sort of psychotic states between the inverted world and the, the rational world. So there's these sort of extreme states of almost psychosis that is ungrounded in a, in a shape space, a phenomenological shape space that, that has no real structure or systematicity to it that we would, we would deem as reason or rationality. So we're, we're allowing that space and that time before they arrive at this stage because now we're starting to get inside closer to the new world spirit and people need to be aware of whether or not they want to be a part of this. So all of this stuff by this point, it must be said, is all anonymous. We don't want to know who anybody is because the next slide is it's really important to protect individuals um, from, from this the incredible power of what we're trying to do here to create these Copernican revolutions that change fundamentally how we think about ourselves in the universe which at first always has an unstable moment of becoming this in on <laughs> um, but at least in this stage it's starting to get a little bit more rational uh, still a little bit more a little, a little bit unstable but we need to go through this up this progressive uh, practical stage of getting people from the irrational caprice of current society and this abstract culture that's creating Fragmented relationships, fragmented language, fragmented grammar, fragmented everything uh, virtually. And when we say we're trying to get people aligned in this new kind of logic, we don't mean abstract, this normal kind of formal logic that's very boring and what Hegel calls the dead bones of spirit or of logic. There's a living way to do this, and that's the shape space, these universals that we're talking about. And we're trying to get people to, to overcome these problems that are preventing the current contemporary world spirit or the current contemporary global culture from achieving this higher level of, of infinite science. So the second problem we're solving is that even once people start listening, they are too broken, desperate, and sensuous to focus on or tarry with pure thought. And this is a theme uh, that we covered a little bit before where philosophers in his, history have shown that if we're enmeshed on the lower levels of the Maslow hierarchy of the pyramid, uh, we don't have time to think about self-actualization or community actualiza uh, actualization or self-transcendence. So we're starting to get the Maslow uh, needs met 
at the bottom levels first and we're doing it in a comprehensive way rather than in this piecemeal or band-aid way which is treating human beings as siloed organs rather than uh, complete personalities and, and people with dignity and many many facets. Um, so the 11 life areas um, are building off of already accepted concepts such as the social determinants of health and of course there's I think around 21 in total uh, at least last I checked and you know it covers everything from income education unemployment work-life conditions food security housing early childhood development social inclusion uh, non-discrimination social or structural conflict access to affordable health services and decent quality so these are trying to approximate universals um, and there's an upgraded version called uh, the ecological determinants of health which is going beyond even the siloed human version of the social determinants of health and getting into the greater dialectics which we sort of covered earlier in terms of Hegel's encyclopedia of connecting the Nobel Physics Prize, the Nobel Chemistry Prize, to the Nobel Medical Prize in biology, to uh, the economy, and then to literature and art, and then to the peace process itself in higher political, social, um, spiritual, philosophical dynamics. And so we're really just expanding this kind of law, this greater concrete logic. And we're saying, well, not only can we break it into the 21 social determinants of health, we can break it into 11 categories, which might be a little bit more comprehensive, even though there's less of them. They're less particular and they're more universal and they encompass all those other categories. So if we click on this graphic, we start getting into the spreadsheets. Now the spreadsheets um, are not very satisfying to, to people at first. That's why we're introducing them later on in the, in the process. So we have the smashing room as the first. But now we have the 11 life areas. And when we open up the document, it's very rudimentary because we're using open systems. And yes, we're using Google, so eventually this will have to be turned into an app. But for now, we're not taking any money from non-ethical sources. Or if we do, we have to start sublating them. So this is a beginning stage to, to get people who are understand the power of this to start using it. And then as we start attracting more, more talent, it'll develop into a more uh, rigorous structure but on the side of course at the top we have of all of our spreadsheets um, the Nobel Peace Prize categories of trust so we're trying to build universal trust uh, to upgrade society together in more stable determinate beings like we talked about before actualized determinateness uh, by you know taking these dialectic triads and these opposite pairs and um, sublating them into concrete harmonies of, of moments of ratio thinking, rationality. So that's the male-female, um, capitalist, socialist, communist, and then art, religion, uh, science, uh, not to forget about the LGBTQ+. Uh, anybody who's coming to this process, because it's truly a universal New World Spirit, uh, they can be embodying all or any of these modes, or, or maybe even none of these modes. But it doesn't matter which moment they're in, the system is structured to start sublating with them, start getting this living kind of spirit and interaction. Uh, part of that is to show the trust increasing. So these categories are connected and they update. It's kind of like a, a real-time updating. So as we start sublating with more and more people, these numbers start increasing. And we might go person by person or, or issue by issue. Uh, but with each sublation that we deem as an actual overcoming of an opposition, whether in somebody's phenomenology as a person or as a community or as a state or in a constitution or any level of the of the logic of this new encyclopedia of the philosophical sciences, it adds up here. And then we define standards where when we reach a certain level of trust, then it, it sublates into higher universal trust and new things will be possible, new qualities of experience, literally a new quality of life for everybody. Um, so if we see imbalances in these numbers, then we know we need to start putting more focus on whichever one is lacking and to get that rebalanced because if there's too much focus on the other side it, it increases the abstractness and the people start warring and realizing that they're not being treated as an essential moment of that dialectic and this goes for truly universal categories if it's a, an unessential one or caprice or just opinion only and it's not really grounded on anything wise then these dialectical oppositions and these enantomias don't really um, start up in the same way 
there's a different kind of dialectic that applies, which is like the infinite judgment and the, the different kinds of syllogisms that Hegel speaks about later. But these are the biggest three. There's, there's hundreds, but these are the big, big three that are ripping our society apart right now. So we can start addressing them with the 11 life areas through a chat where we can just have people coming at whim if you would like, because it's all anonymous, um, you can just start leaving messages for people in this column. And it's a very rudimentary chat column where it can get quite long, <laughs> but it's a very simple way to leave messages for people if you see that they're struggling or if you want to encourage them in their life areas or whatnot. And it's a nice little record without having to build really advanced systems. Um, but then you can see that there's services listed at the top here and they have their own little column above the graphs. And so this, this service pertains to the physical life area. So these are services in regards to helping that person partake in something to do with the, their physical life area. Um, and the next one is mental. And the next one is academic, as you can see right here, academic. So these will be academic services. We haven't uh, filled these all out. We're, we're building them. We're attracting the people who might want to provide these in this new world spirit for that 90,000 in the Nobel, Nobel Economics Prize. Uh, because the value is not going to be measured necessarily in the in the old way, which didn't take care of the subjective and the objective economy properly. They're getting these, you know, speculative, the wrong kind of speculative economies that are disconnecting the real economy from the from um, I guess the the real inventory of it because of the subjective problem of the infinite, the bad infinite inside of greed and. Uh, that side of the economy. So the services will not just be, we're not just trying to help people measure their lives. We're trying to actually get them connected to world-class services, which is really what the market economy is supposed to do, but it's not doing a good job in terms of upgrading everybody all at the same time. We're leaving people behind. And in this new world spirit, we're going to try and leave no one behind. Um, but yes, here's the 11 life areas uh, listed with these charts. And um, the charts are are um, supposed to be uh, above <laughs> for some reason we're still figuring out the Google Docs but really each one of these graphs is representing a life area and somebody's performance in it so if they're having a hard time the graph uh, trends downwards but we're um, we're trying to show them that they can increase their scores as they do these interventions and it's kind of like life coaching. It's all these other industries. They're trying to do this, but we're doing it in a more comprehensive way to try and get this person at a baseline. So level of well-being so they can handle the next steps um, where they really have to start being introspective and getting to the inner contradictions of why their rationality is not achieving a higher level of wisdom. And so here you have the dates where the individuals update these anonymously. So they just come in and they put the current day. They don't have to do this. But it's, they have to do it, maybe uh, we encourage them to do it once before going on because it's a way to determine if, they're, if their life errors are so low that they're feeling suicidal. So that's what we're really checking on here is if these categories are below a certain number, below a four, maybe a five or four, uh, we're starting to get into depression and anxiety because they're not sublating as fast as the absolute reward structure, which is based on you know people with 150, 160 IQ, and they're basically trying to lead the innovation of society. And it's kind of like a race where we're sort of leaving the pack behind, like people in the pack at the end are, are running as hard as they possibly can to keep up with this, like, you know, if you visualize that as a tribe running across the plains of, you know, Africa uh, in our prior stages or something like that, then you have the really gifted, strong, privileged people sort of leading the tribe. And then the people at the end are sort of struggling to keep up, especially if they're being chased by predators of some kind so in some sense this is an, a, a version the modern version of that is that people who are getting left behind are struggling to keep up with the sublating of the gifted and so if it gets too low and they're suicidal that means that any other introspections that might reveal contradictions in their identities might push them over over uh, a limit that we don't want to go beyond and create despair and hopelessness before the moment of spirit and, and hopefulness gets created or or the belief in that uh, through the logic, the in, imminent logic, the self-determining kind, not just in faith, but in thinking. So we really want to be careful and make sure that uh, we have a, a system to measure this and, and completely, as completely as we can. And be, that's why it has to be anonymous is because we want people to be honest 
with how they really feel and stop putting up this fake facade that we see through the external connections in reality in our current society through social media and po posturing and all these these social dynamics that are missing that internal connection religion is approximating it but we see that there's a there can be a superficiality to that as well so they put the date down and um, then they just give a number from one to ten how they're feeling like they're growing in that life area so in terms of life coaching we've discovered that the absolute numbers aren't really as important as the feeling of growth. And this gets back to the Janus point, shape dynamics of the growing universe, that fractal repeating of the logic is occurring at every stage of complexity. So in terms of our lives, we need to feel like we're growing towards these higher actualities of ourselves, these entelechies. And um, if we don't feel like we're growing fast enough, that's what starts creating despair and this feeling of falling behind. So the actual achieving of the goal is important, but in terms of the feeling of well-being, that growing nature is what creates hope and a sense of uh, satisfaction even when we haven't attained the ultimate goal. So it's that platitude and that you know aphorism of you know, the journey is just as, um, just as important as the destination. So we're giving a scale from zero to 10, 10 being like they're absolutely growing, they're on track, they're, they're, they're inspired, energetic, things are in balance. And zero is the opposite, where they feel like they're never going to achieve their goal. It's hopeless. So they can do that for each uh, life area. Um, we're saying physical, of course, how you eat, diet, stuff like that. Mental is, of course, how you're sleeping. Are you meditating? How's your your hormones, basically, uh, and your stressors? Academics, how are you learning? And are you learning in this sort of rational way and not just in this arbitrary way? Um, so this gets down to the shape space eventually to genuine philosophy has all the domains uh, within it in a concrete infinite science. So we want to upgrade all of the academic learning in terms of the Hegelian uh, version that's going to win these Nobel prizes and hopefully reset the education system. So we can get the, the wisdom back into, into the domains. And then of course the spiritual satisfaction is um, the realizing of the inwardness of those, the, our, of our, the connection to those universals. And recognize him. It's this recognition process that the absolute is already present. We have to just really get in touch with who we are. And um, that's what meditation and, and the retreats and having really intimate connections and radical honesty and all this kind of stuff happens. Then, of course, family dynamics greatly shape us and making sure families are in touch with each other and, and are healthy and non-abusive and sublating. Same with friendships, that they're healthy and, and sublating. Um, and staying within Dunbar's number and all these cognitive limits that we now know about. Uh, intimacy, um, that's another level of course, sex is important and you know uh, the five love languages in terms of time, uh, touch, uh, acts of service, uh, gifts, and uh, words of affirmation. That's where this category goes for people that want partners or this is what that category means. And then we have the political being engaged from you know, sublating the subjective spirit into objective spirit, where the individual and the family participates in civil society and, and state life, constitutions being a part of the legal structure and having the education system so that people come out of high school knowing how their society structures. They're not just trying to become workers, which is important uh, as that is also a spiritual scientific process of self-actualization, whether you want to look at it theistically or atheistically. I, uh, and and making sure they're feeling like they're recognized by the state. That process of recognition and that, that process of dignity is, is critical. And of course, we have the financial life area, which will be framed in terms of uh, caprice. This is where the freedom of making choice, gambling, playing in the stock markets, making a bet on the technologies in society will be restructured in this more fair way where everybody gets a chance to make this betting because the 90,000 already takes care of all these other life areas. This financial life area is just for like what you want to spend the money on randomly. You can make a bet, you can start building a business, you can start doing whatever. It's this moment that Hegel says must be protected in the true ideal rational state where you have the true notion of it as the, a universal, a particular, and the individual. And you know, the universal is the civil servants, our political staffers and all this. Who look after everybody if the state is rational it's not a corrupt state and then the particulars are the institutions that mediate the reasoning of the state and the resources to the individuals to help us pay that ninety thousand to get all these life areas met optimally in this higher rat reasoning and then the individual is of course what the particular is connecting to um, to channel the resources 
uh, into. So this is like the financial is the new kind of stock market. And then uh, we have the hygiene, so basic needs. Of course, a lot of people don't realize that a lot of modern society came from just having latrines and bathrooms and, and the, these plagues and infections were, were, were starting to be addressed through sanitation. And of course, style is another part of like who we are. It's like, what kind of clothing do we like? What's in, in style? What's in fashion? And, and um, being countercultural if we want. Uh, hippies, you know, avant-garde kind of, this is the artistic kind of moment of self-expression and it needs to be preserved and people need to have enough resources to express themselves in their uniqueness and smell good and all these types of things as well. Um, and then the dream goals are incredibly important in terms of the, the sense of growing towards a higher meaning, participating in, in discovering uh, their hero's journey. And so what we do at the end is we add up all the scores and we create averages because these, these bars are not just like, they're the adding up of all the days. So as more days go by, it gets harder and harder to change this average. But that's what makes it so important is just because you make a, a change for a week or two weeks is not going to make a dent in this column usually. And so that's what gives a, a sense of realisticness about the, the patterns we're setting and calibrating the rest of the, their life with them. It's a self-determining process. They're actually doing this themselves. The, the, they're just seeing that there's momentum behind each life area. And if you've been traumatized or ne neglecting a life area, it's going to take maybe more than, you know, two months to change something. You might need a year. So the, this is the inertia sort of in each life area based on how much damage they've suffered or how low the scores are when they first get into the system. So we sort of have the graphs showing the instantaneous versions of the progress and then we have the, mo the momentums. And so these momentums we want to get as a, at least above a six or seven uh, so that we can start improving and getting a picture of the true investment that people need, um, which is usually a lot higher than we think when we're taking it in this comprehensive mode. So people can see all their life years comparing to themselves, each other. Um, so you can see and make comparisons very quickly. But then there's uh, this, this version here. So there's individual profiles, but this version here is technically the entire stream of spirit. So this is the average of, of all the members in the New World Spirit. So in terms of the physicality of all the people, there could be tens of thousands, hundreds, maybe billions. Um, if we win all the Nobel Prizes, it will be billions. This is how we're doing as a whole. And so we can see as a world economy, we can see not just in terms of money, but in terms of actual comprehensive healthcare um, and well-being, not just healthcare, well-being, where we're lacking, where we need to start putting that 90,000 or encouraging people to, to take up the services or at least providing those services in a way that meets their needs. So... We also want to make sure people are not separated from what's called the idea. There's like this concrete metaphysical idea of how things are, this sort of entelechy. If you're, if you're a secularist, you don't have to believe in that. You can just say this is our, this is our ubermensch. This is our existential moment of self-actualization where we have the power within to, to become what we want. We have a destiny that we create. And so you can look at it either way as providential or as existential. It's, it's technically dialectically two moments of the same thing. Uh, where the caprice and abstract free will are lining up with necessity. But how far people are uh, from the idea really dictates the value that they're getting from society. So we're going to try and make sure that uh, they're connected to knowledge, to true knowledge in this upgrading process as part of the Nobel Economics Prize. So they have to be kind of cited in journals, not just reading National Geographic from an external point of view. We're trying to reestablish the internal connection to the research and development process, which we're calling the idea. Every new idea revamps and commercializes itself into new goods and services that increase the quality of life, especially as um, that universal trust score goes up. So we want people to not just be reading, we want them to be cited, parta partaking, even if they have lower IQs or lower education, because we're getting this sort of uh, ephemeralization of the healthcare system where it's it's kind of getting simpler but preserving the essential distinctions and getting rid of the the confusion uh, there's going to be a, a compounding effect in terms of efficacy and elegance and so this will allow people of all levels of ability to start memorizing the fractal patterns of the logic and applying the shapes in in new and novel ways where Maybe the sheer processing power will be done by maybe computers, AI, high IQ people that are in the sort of bad infinite mode of computation, the sensuous kind, 
but the the genuinely infinite kind is shared by everybody and that's where we once we find the principles behind these sheer brute experimentations with empiricism we get to the simple kind of principles that tie back into the universal structure of the infinite science the hegel's encyclopedia of the philosophical sciences where we're not just arranging in in some kind of arbitrary order um, the domains of knowledge we are there's a necessary connection the inner dialectic of them in the speculative movement so we also want them to be a part of papers and journals um, not just reading them being a part of those teams how close are they to sublation in their craft so this is where technological unemployment is is this is what's creating basically a lot of the the pain in terms of the employment system because the way the business cycle works as we're upgrading society certain industries become obsolete and then we leave it to the individual to trans transition and that transition is not well managed we have if we have any social supports at all social security or anything that are usually subsistence living and it starts to break the spirit once we break the flow state it's very hard to get it back sometimes and so as we know the Nobel economics prize is about creating flow states and that means really measuring how much time people have before their industry forces them to upgrade their skill sets and so we we want to stop the panic and the surprise of of that happening and teaching how this growing nature of the universe occurs so having people understand this growing nature will have the ideological um, stability that once we once they know that industries work this way it's future generations will be like oh yes we're always growing and and it's not like a, an upending and it's an accepted part of life as the ratio based becoming way of thinking in in our universe uh, so this is where um, they learn to sublate their craft into the next version as a, a process of self-actualization right now this is approximated horribly through striking and if you're in a socialist country you know you have unions fighting the entrepreneurs and there's this like wage spiral you know bill clinton had to try and solve this in the 1990s and all these, you know, when somebody goes on strike, they're staking their livelihoods on that. You know, even if there are unions, when, before, if there's no unions, people like literally, they risk their lives just to start unions. And it's very nasty. So it, it's it's brutal. It's not the most optimal way. Uh, flow states will, will make it much more uh, efficient. And that's what we're going to try and solve uh, as well. Without slowing, it's a Pareto change. We don't want to slow down the, the gifted though. It's a coordination problem that we're going to solve. So the next one is, uh, connecting to the idea, the absolute idea, based on cutting-edge research projects, which are what these papers are part of, but not just in terms of lower levels, but the, the Ivy Leagues as well. Making sure that the disparity even between universities is being fixed. Um, traveling is also a, a process of culturedness. It, it exposes the, the universal shapes behind things. And Hegel uses a great example. Many philosophers in history have used the great examples of language being one of the ways of seeing the bias in your own way of perception. And there's that wharf process, uh, wharf, wharf, I think, uh, hypothesis that the way you structure your language structures your perception, which is really hearkening back to grammar being just logic. And that's the Nobel Literature Prize we were talking about before. So we're making sure that if people that people get a chance to travel and see the world and see not just random spots either, but like the seven wonders of the world, the most beautiful spots, not just, you know, a, a week or two of vacation pay that you're stressed because by the time you get back to your work, you know, you're, it's not enough time to reset and get into flow. So we're really going to restructure what vacation pay is in terms of allowing this traveling to happen and even working abroad if possible. And uh, getting that kind of exposure. And then, of course, uh, there's other privileges too, like the idea in sensuous form is beauty. So being exposed to high art, being exposed to fashion, being exposed to um, physically attractive things, whether they're golden ratios, uh, well, architecture, um, models, anything. Uh, we want to make sure that people are being uh, exposed to that, whether you're gifted or not gifted, talented or not talented, or blessed or not blessed, or whatever the reality is of anybody's life, usually there's some, some strength that they have. And we want to coordinate those strengths so that the maximum amount of beauty in the moment can be expressed yeah, from their potential beauty. The maximum potential and actual beauty of the moment is expressed for, for everybody participating in these 11 life areas. Then there's the, the individual graph. So because we're, this is the New World Spirit as a whole, we can have um, sort of individuals updating 
and putting their names here. So this is like Spirit Man's numbers across the, their life areas, their total numbers. And so if people are looking over this uh, as a peer support group, they can just see if anybody has really low numbers and they can just go to their, their profile and start interacting and leaving the messages and, or encouragement or, or whatever. It's a, if we have millions of people on here, then it could be a way to get therapists or um, occupational therapists or anybody in the traditional abstract mode, the external modes of these industries, looking over these sheets and finding people who are, who are needing the help. And it could be very efficient just having one global list and we just track the numbers and the lowest ones start getting the attention and we start sublating with them. And uh, it should provide a pretty, clear, a, a pretty clear way of making sure that all these life errors are being handled comprehensively and getting these graph numbers and these inertias up um, so that nobody gets left behind. So not very controversial. Because it's anonymous, there's not a whole lot of risk, and we encourage people to stay anonymous during this. If they participate in services, we'll have to find a way to sign them up without um, exposing them. But some people will eventually start trusting the system. So if the trust level, the universal trust level gets high enough, then eventually we can start um, becoming more radically honest and transparent in our real identi identities. But right now, there's a, a whole lot of selling going on with data, and there's the culture we're in is it feels a little bit off. So in the beginning, we want to protect people that way, and uh, and that's kind of how we're going to do it until the trust level gets high enough. Once this gets high enough, we can we can start doing more radical and, and interesting things together. That's basically it. We want to make sure that people are stable because the next slide is going to be a lot more abrasive, and uh, basically we're burning almost the rest of these triggers on the next slide. So. Stay tuned. Uh, we are going to continue the practical path of actualizing the world spirit, and we are using the theory from the six Nobel Prizes as we go. So as we're talking, we are re referencing other slides, so if you haven't gone through them, it might sound a little confusing. But uh, basically, this is how we're going to solve the second problem of the stream of spirit, which is that yeah, once we pass the smashing room, um, we're going to get people performing um, at their best, uh, self-determining with these principles of wisdom that they can adopt and um, taking care of the lower Maslow, Maslow hierarchy um, section so that they can start self-actualizing in this higher inner spirit and individual spirit in the collective spirit by fixing the traumas and all the life areas, the desperation and the sensuousness um, so that people have the resources at any level to, to participate meaningfully in this process so the next stage is where we get into solving the next problem and stay tuned because it uh, it's a bit of a roller coaster we are in stage three now of the spirit stream and it's called the reality check so we went through the first stage where the absolute negation happened and then that was supposed to lead to Inanto Midramiya, uh, the dialectical process to bring people to uh, curiosity again in terms of the wisdom quiz. And then the wisdom quiz introduces sublation as people want to uh, take the next step. And the next step is, of course, step two, uh, the 11 life areas for a comprehensive intervention to start increasing the flow states and the stability of, our, of the basic needs of individuals so that they can start liberating uh, their pure thought and become more in the spirit of philosophical thinking. And so once we ensure that somebody's not feeling suicidal, this slide is where they come next. And uh, you can see we lost four triggers. We had six in the previous slide in stage two. Now we're down to two. And to be honest, we probably burn the rest of them. But I think most people who make it to this point in the presentation will have a little bit more emotional resilience. But I think even the most emotionally resilient will have probably four four triggers uh, during this reality check process. So the problem we're trying to solve is even if we have people listening and learning, the sensuous privileges will redistribute value and undermine the system in virtuous and vicious economic cycles. The system will become fragile and stratified from its own internal dialectic of differences in society and sensuous preferences, jealousy, envy, an abstract equality will stratify new world spirit anyway. This is a very tricky problem that has been under investigation for 
many years, many decades, because what we're really trying to solve here is the business cycle. And a business cycle is this up and down of um, wealth valuation, where as society changes, it goes through these 10 year and 25 uh, year cycles. And usually the poor and disadvantaged lose everything or are stuck in the old ways. And then the, the new technology is usually brought up by the more uh, privileged class. So it starts stratifying um, society. And so this presentation is not about uh, pre being prejudiced against anybody. There's a truth to this world and it's dialectical. And we have to get to the rational thinking to protect the guardians, to protect our um, privileged class, the gifted, the blessed, whatever you want to call the, the most, uh, I guess, um, powerful, and then the middle class, and then the, I guess you would say the, the less, um, the less I would say, the more vulnerable class. And so we're trying to get into a flow state where everybody's in the right moment. We're not trying to negate anybody or oppress anybody because that starts to hurt the flow state, which we talked about in the Nobel Economics Prize. And that is the priceless good and service. That is the ultimate purpose of spirit in the modern uh, terminology of it. So let's get into these triggers then on what causes these business cycles in more, more depth that hasn't been talked about in the past in, in the same way. So if you go here, there's two actual uh, graphics. One is the reality check graphic and the other one is the Pareto rotations. So let's get into the reality check first. Now, when we get in touch with reality, it can often be jarring. And there's many stereotypes in, in, uh, in popular culture about this. One of the biggest ones in modern times is, of course, uh, the Matrix and you know, any kind of movie that has a plot of going into the beyond and seeing, you know, the simulation theory of what's going on presently and getting behind hegemonic structures to the truth of things. But sometimes the truth isn't always as pretty as we think. The grass sometimes isn't greener on the other side. And this is kind of where it gets kind of intense in terms of our own culture and the way human nature works on an external superficial level without this deeper inner spiritually scientific logic this kind of infinite science that hegel is talking about in terms of speculative pure thought moving in itself uh, universally in an absolute way that we are a part of naturally or an extension of this process so this externality can be quite brutal and that's why we want to make sure that before people participate in this they know the risks uh, Beyond the, the risks, though, there's great benefits that this could get to the root of these economic problems that all the other solutions seem to be too superficial to get to the root. And so, of course, every slide begins with uh, the universal trust categories. So the overall, the uh, gender, the political economic, and then the art, religion, uh, science, or philosophy dialectics. Um, because these presentations are to start building this trust because without trust, Trust is one of the metrics of this inward kind of dynamic. And you can see a graph here and it's charting something and it's charting it in, in bundles. And you can kind of read them here, um, but they're listed in these uh, columns. So before we really get into the categories, we're gonna preface with a couple of warnings. So the point of this uh, if you get triggered, the point and the good intention is listed here. These are the 10 things we want to stop. This is our intention, whether it happens or not. We think there's a great chance that we can actually do this when when other states, countries, constitutions can't seem to get to the bottom of it. So the first thing that we're hoping this reality check does is it stops the deaths of despair and the suicides that are happening. Suicides actually went down surprisingly during the pandemic. And it could be because people were separated from the alienation of their work or there was some social assistance that caused people to increase their standard of livings. Um, but on the whole, there is a lot of despair, anxiety and um, things of this nature are going up. Uh, but we want to stop dehumanizing as well. So 
it's going to look like we're dehumanizing in some senses, but in some ways we're, we're creating a clarity of definition so that we know when it's happening and how we can get beyond it. Third one is to stop consumer manipulation. We have this hyper-consumerist culture that's um, con uh, it's consuming people. We're in this hyper-competition, which we're not against competition, but we're, we're in this race to the bottom kind of thing. And uh, it's because people are being marketed to to create these bubbles. And we don't we want to sort of pop these bubbles, but replace it with something more powerful and fulfilling, more universally satisfying before we do that, which is why we do the 11 life areas first, because there's a deeper inner fulfillment rather than this external kind. But the external kind itself can be beautiful. It's just it's unbalanced right now. We also want to stop burnout culture. Anxiety and depression are on the rise. Um, the American dream is work hard, uh, but of course there's limits to that. And we see that even in the elite institutions of banking and finance where there's there's laws now being put in place to prevent texting and emails uh, work related after certain periods of time because we're so connected now at least externally that we can work 24 7 if we wanted to uh, we want to stop insult inequalities school shootings we want to stop sexism in both directions men male and female we want to stop ageism we want to stop discrimination to the privileged and to the non-privileged so we're trying to protect both classes because it happens both ways. Perhaps not in equal amounts, but it is happening. We want to stop exploitation of the invisibly vulnerable. And we want to stop placation, empty aphorism, and, and gaslighting. That these reality checks um, are actually useful. Okay, and the good thing that we're trying to do is um, we're going to uh, get reality checks to see how current culture really sees you. And this way you can create informed decisions. Um, you can get real support if you do feel like you're disadvantaged or the reality check exposes things that you didn't think about before. You're not left alone. Uh, this is actually a, a new kind of support system where there's no, no abandonment. We're trying to take the valve on abandonment for anybody in this new world spirit. And then, you know, we can get to the real life, the deeper inner life beyond the superficial material side, which is still beautiful. There's still a, a role that nature plays in all this. But if you are feeling suicidal, please seek help first. Always remain anonymous in this process. So we're using Google Docs because you can sign on um, without a sign on actually. You can just come anonymously, just open up the links, they're all public. Um, if you're really uh, paranoid, use um, Tor so that Google can't check your IP when you're accessing the documents. Um, we're intentionally not taking data um, in terms of authentication because uh, corporations will eventually come to these sheets and start uh, scraping the data. But as long as they can't peg it to real identities, like a phone number or something, which is an identity number now, basically, uh, glo globally, uh, then the, the, that is not useful. So we're trying to make the data useless in terms of an uh, explo exploitive uh, way, but we're retaining the trends that we think are going to happen in terms of an academic sort of study and an actual sort of therapy for people that are interested in the way that might reduce quality of data because if you can't verify the people, how can you tell if they're telling the truth? But we think that with enough people um, coming to this process, they will, they will want to find the truth and it'll start to self-correct. Of course, there's going to be um, biases. There might be some racism and sexism that get through and stuff that are ha that's happening subconsciously in terms of system one thinking. But the smashing room should have already been passed by now. So a lot of the pain and suffering that comes in terms of wanting to knock people down should have started to sublate by now. So these should be residual um, types of negations. Um, so one of the things we recommend is, yep, stay anonymous. Um, only show the lower half of your face if you try and do the aesthetic stuff, the beauty stuff. Um, showing the lower half of your face can't really identify you unless you have some kind of mark which we encourage you to hide uh, if you don't want to be identified if you want to show your full face and you want to take the risk well that's up to you but uh, at this point global culture and the trust is so low that we want to protect everybody as much as possible so uh, if we need to get an impression of how um, what your attributes are uh, in terms of the face you can just show half then B is you have any uh, tattoos, cover them because they can be used to identify you. C is don't use your real name, use screen names. Uh, same with emails, create anonymous emails. Um, 
D um, use Tor if possible. That's right, because your IP can still be used to identify you. Uh, lots of residential, indus industrial type of targeting can happen by knowing what district you live in or what province or territory. It says a lot about you socio uh, socioeconomically, just having your IP from a certain place. Um, we're very cautious about children partaking in this. We don't really want to uh, address that at this moment. The system has to get to a higher level of trust and more maturity. So we're going to circumvent that risk for now because these categories really aren't appropriate for children. So it's mostly for people that are of age. Well, in fact, it is totally for people above age right now. Um, uh, and then overall, even though we're trying to protect you, the risk is yours. But we hope you see the value in this and you participate in as safe a way as you can. But basically, trying to know that these processes eventually um, result in authentic systems. These are the beginnings where we try and figure out what's safe. And then as it becomes more safe, people, the trust goes up. So we are aiming to have a higher level of trust. So keep that in mind. Um, and also keep in mind that these accounts and things always seem to get hacked, especially when there's real value. So we're predicting that that's going to happen. And that's another reason why we don't want any real data. Or we want the data, but we don't want to peg it to anybody. Um, so this way, if we get hacked, it's still not sellable. Um, so just letting you know um, we're prepared for that. And that's why we're really being careful with this warning. Now, slide number two is we're saying we're doing the best we can to try and get the abstract negations into the inner world, meaning that we never stop abstract negation or the moment of difference. We want to keep that, but the, the violence and the, the external nature of it hopefully will be taken care of with the smashing room and the life areas. Uh, people who like to send shock videos. So if we are going to do some video um, ratings, reality checks, we can't guarantee exactly what's going to happen because everybody's anonymous. So if you do get some shock, we are trying to fil filter for that, but um, just be careful when you're playing the, the spirit games and the Nobel Literature Prize games and this reality check game. Be very careful with your contact information. As we become our authentic selves, um, a sort of love process starts to happen of self-recognition, equanimity. Um, we start having high levels of empathy as people be authentic with the real struggles you're going through. So if people are starting to gravitate um, and it's starting to become intimate, Try not to give your contact information out right away, especially on voice cam. One of the things that we have is, you know, do not date if no sublate, because sublation is the living logic, right? Uh, and then if you're with somebody that, that doesn't know how to sublate and they don't have a very high UQ, universal quotient, um, they might have a high IQ, but that doesn't always translate into UQ. So you're, you're going to experience potentially some abstract negations or some kind of oppression that puts you in a double bind. Um, another thing is, although we do not check for real-time identities, you can use uh, a webcam to check real people rather than just using images. So we don't really want to use just pictures because then people can pretend to be other people. So if we ask you to turn your cam on or if you ask somebody to turn their cam on to, to make sure that we're not being targeted by bots or you know being used in these A-B studies of corporations that start to manipulate the process, um, then you can just check to see if it's the same person who has like five different you know Tor accounts open. Right, and we want to make sure that people aren't being targeted that way. Um, so people can turn their camera on for a second, face down, whatever, and just see, oh, they're a real person, great. Um, it's to prevent the copycatting. The other last thing is, although we are uh, body positive, try to be respectful and wise in your expressions. So nudity, stuff like this, um, we support expressions of all types, but People have different levels of preference or different levels of cultural exposure and the body is a very powerful thing. So uh, in the beginning, if people aren't asking for that kind of exposure, then we're going to try and stick a little bit to the norms. And if you get into a group that's a little bit more free, then of course you guys can express yourselves in the way you feel safe and you think is wise. Of course, we're operating within the, the laws of the land that we're in, so no crime. Um, now in the, in the green box here, um, if you want to, so the paradox here or the trick here is that if you want to be a part of the Nobel Prizes and everybody's anonymous, how do we prove what meanings or which contributions are each person? So you can start two accounts. One is the anonymous one to do this reality check Pareto stuff. And the other one can be uh, a real email for 
the more tame sort of um, literature prize games. And we might end up sort of merging them in a certain sense, but we are encouraging you to keep those two accounts separate. And if you want to stay totally anonymous, you totally can. And maybe in the future, we can validate your emails to see if you want to be a part of the Nobel Prizes. Uh, we can try and work work that out and see see how we can make it work. Um, the smash room, all the early stages, we want to be very anonymous. Once you feel it's safe, you can link them and you know, sophisticated tracking and artificial intelligence will likely be used to act um, in such a way that they can probably track trends. They can probably track voice trends, they can track theater trends, word trends, and they'll eventually probably be able to compile everything once we have this really powerful, you know, computational model. So try and, and act in a way that you would, you would uh, find respectful if somebody did find out about it. But for the most part, we're, we're thinking that most people know how to protect themselves in this day and age with information. So, so those are the warnings at this point. Now let's get into where the triggers happen uh, very quickly. So you'll see there's these five main universal categories of privilege generally, generally or power. So we have aesthetic, number two, social, number three, money and wealth, number four, body and sex appeal, number five, culturedness or sublativeness. Maybe not so much sublativeness, that's UQ, and we might end up uh, at a new column here for um, UQ. So this is the big thing that we're, we're trying to get started. Uh, so anyway, then we have traditional IQ, um, and then we have the non-universal categories. So these ones are more particular, and if you decide to answer these ones, the, your identity starts to get narrowed down. So... Um, you know, gender, segregated privilege, race privilege, heritage privilege, uh, stereotyping privilege. And there's a few more that we added in terms of place where you live geographically can have advantages or disadvantages. Um, age too. So, but for these ones, they're the more sort of universal kinds. And um, what we're going to do is we're going to have a reality check on how society sees you in these power categories. And as much as we don't want to believe that these have power and they can shape us, According to the science, they do. We're going to be very superficial in a certain way, but we're going to try and aim to be very honest. The goal here is to be kind, but honest. And this is to give a, a clarity, an accurate picture of how people will be treated in this culture so that we can help them navigate what is their, their true flow state beyond the delusions of the culture that we're in. And then we're going to provide a real support system to help that person grow in a way that's meaningful to them and is not unrealistic or, or, or gaslighting or too, too underestimating, right? Um, oppressive. So to show you a little bit about the science first before we do this, um, because it is quite superficial, we're going to rate on scales of 1 to 10 and we'll describe that scale. And you're, most people realize that, no, you can't simplify people to single numbers or anything like this. But we're going to try and get to clarity. That's where we're trying to quantize it. So the first category, aesthetics, we were surprised to find out that physical attractiveness in your face and um, yeah, usually around your face is, is a, has a great effect on your life, including in places of uh, indifference or high levels of calculation to offset those kinds of biases such as the legal system this legal system is supposed to be just and supposed to give everybody the same treatment in all cases uh, but it gets the the full consideration of the law but then we have many articles this is just one um, where we find out that the effect is quite a lot larger that even in judge in the cases of the judges who are supposed to be the most impartial we have physical attractiveness um, resulting in up to 304% uh, less or um, we're finding that unattractive individuals aesthetically are 304% uh, more greatly punished in terms of their their sentencing. So I think the real number is somewhere he says between uh, 70, 73% and 304%. And they said, oh, I think it's, no, it's 119% and 304. So it's, it's substantial. And it's not just in specialized cases. It seems to be everywhere, in every courthouse, um, more or less. 
So we have to take into account how this power leads to senses of freedom because all these categories are in some ways desired because they're leading to some kind of approximation of the genuine liberation of spirit or some version of freedom. But Hegel states it's because there's perhaps the, some version of the divine idea. This is the artistic moment that our minds are picking up on. And so there's, a, there's definitely a bias here. But it doesn't mean we need to pull people down. It means we need to cha channel this, this beauty in, in a direction where it creates the most amount of flow, the maximizing of the potential beauty and actual beauty of the moment for the most amount of people, including in the legal and justice system. So this has a real effect on, in terms of real, the real value in society. Uh, this is a part of the idea-based economics. We start measuring these things. Um, and the people ha that have it um, will have a certain outcome. And then people that don't have as much will also be taken care of. And right now we want to deny that this isn't real, but it is. And um, there's a great many people being subject to that kind of bias when they shouldn't be. Now, the next category is um, social. So the social category, number two, ha also has power because it also can provide degrees of freedom um, to some individuals and not others. So people that are very socially adept, very good at networking or born into influential families, um, maybe celebrities even, they have a pronounced influence on people. And these uh, medical studies show that it's, it's substantial as well. So your networks also give you an advantage and we want to measure that uh, you can call this social clout you can, you can give it quite a few different names so this one needs to be measured as well the next one is money and wealth money and wealth also comes with power and privilege um, and that one just goes <laughs> without saying everybody knows that in this culture that we're in this monetary culture the fourth one is body and sex so there are studies in sexual over perception where we our measuring abilities seem to be a little bit off and so we're trying to get these reality checks done so that people have a good idea of what, where they sit in things. And we can maybe stop these accidental harassments or anything that seems to be creating unfairness in terms of the sex dialectic. I think there's some studies to show that I think 20% of the people get 80% of the sex. That means 20% of the people share 80 uh, uh, or eighty percent of the people share twenty percent of the sex. So there's a sort of unaligned distribution of this kind of beauty in society as well, and it needs to be made a little bit more inward, a little more intimate in terms of making real connections with people. And porn and a bunch of other industries are built on this sort of desperation that's building, and we want to get to the bottom of this in a new way. So this needs to be measured too. And the difference between the body. Uh, appeal and the aesthetic appeal is the aesthetic is most of your face and body is your more like your neck down area your height your you know sex uh, body parts um, length of limbs golden ratio in the, the limbs the legs arms things like this and it, it doesn't sound like it but it actually has an effect so a height is already measured quite well especially in the in the financial economy that for every centimeter of height uh, usually correlates to something like two thousand dollars in in earnings and so in some cases for individuals that are past six feet or especially for men it can result in i think something like tens of thousands of dollars more so we we want to account for the body privileges as well in addition to the aesthetic now the Next category is culturedness and sublativeness. This is the most socially appropriate one. This is the one that makes everybody feel good. This is usually um, how much you've traveled, how funny you are, how enjoyable you are to be around, how to read um, situations in terms of diversity. So having lots of hobbies, having lots of life experience, being able to get along with almost anybody and make a conversation interesting and entertaining. Uh, it's kind of like um, the opposite of negative or neurotic personalities that are always uh, pushing people away or calling down limits or things like that. So this is the one that makes us feel good. So yeah, you can be anything if you're just a good person. Um, so uh, it's not very controversial. Now number six is what this study is about. IQ is also a very controversial thing to measure. 
but the overall research seems to confirm that more often than not, it does have a correlation with long-term success, except in one case, when the individual has an unsublated negation in them, when there's some kind of trauma inside, it, uh, it can derail the IQ and it becomes less universal. And that's the only time that IQ doesn't translate into long-term success because people sit in that negative moment of reason and don't actualize. They stop um, sublating into higher concrete forms of themselves. And of themselves. So this study is another one showing that, yes, there does seem to be a correlation between IQ despite having different types of intelligences. Things of this nature. So you can look into it if you want, but it does have a pronounced effect. And we want to take it into account because even militaries make it illegal to hire or to bring individuals into the military with IQs under um, somewhere around 75, 85, somewhere around there. And it's such a pronounced effect that um, the SATs in the United States, which is a, a scoring, uh, a universal scoring system, they started realizing problems with all these um, academic scandals and these pay schemes. So they created the SAT adversity score but now the score has been dismantled. It initially measured 15. Um, it initially measured 15 variables mm. to balance the playing field in terms of poverty, um, crime in your neighborhood, growing up, um, quality of institutions, stuff like this, and it tried to make a more even playing field. Uh, so it was initially implemented, but it got watered down in a certain way because people were criticizing it for being uh, too gameable. And also you couldn't sum up the nuances with a single number. And so they tried to create a new one, but it's, um, it's called Landmark or something of that effect. And it's, it's supposed to allow more movement. But in some senses, you can sometimes lose clarity. Um, so people are realizing that these privileges have life-altering consequences and we're going to take that into account in terms of IQ uh, and socioeconomic background. Now the sort of catch-all is, is these individuals like Malcolm Gladwell who many people have tried to debunk and here's one of the uh, websites uh, with hockey and Malcolm Gladwell has a book called Outliers to show how the most successful people in society were really products of their environment and a lot of the right stuff coming into play. And it's not necessarily about only hard work. Um, and so it's about being in the right place at the right time. So with hockey, uh, he, uses, he uses it as an example where really it seems to be more about birthdays than uh, working hard. And there are, there are examples, especially in this article, that try to debunk him and give examples. No, there's people born um, at closer to this cutoff line and they're more successful and it's a show of t real talent. But there is an overriding trend in every sport, not just hockey, where the cutoff date for the recruitment drives really dictates the, the likelihood of becoming successful. And so individuals born, so in Canada anyway, the cutoff or the... Um, I think the cutoff is January 1st. So when children are recruited to hockey from January to March, by the time that the season is done that cycle, the people born in December, October, December are playing with the guys who might be, you know, eight months older than them. And when you're young, that makes a big difference biologically. So they're a lot stronger. And of course they can hit the puck harder and skate faster. Maybe not necessarily because they're more talented, but just their bodies are more developed. And so when they, they look better, they get more, they get pushed into the higher uh, elite leagues and they get better training and they get all the, the favoritism and then also they do become the best. And there are a couple of examples, um, exceptions, but the overriding trend seems to be it's a, it's a real thing. And it's not just in this, it's happening everywhere. Uh, I think he even uses Bill Gates as an example where he had access to a mainframe when most people wouldn't have and all this kind of stuff. And that's not to say Bill Gates isn't intelligent, um, but it's, or he didn't work hard. It's just that he, had, he was in the right place at the right time um, with parents that had access to those types of resources. And so this sort of outlier effect is something that we're going to try and take into account where we continue, um, we're going to have to take it into account because 
we to create flow states we need to know what the real realities are behind people's potentials and where they were born and what advantages and disadvantages to not bring anybody down but just find the clarity of where they really would strive and thrive and grow so the the, the big point here as we know in the nobel peace prize is to get people to learn what sublation is this universal shape of the essence or the movement of essence <laughs> the movement the movement of essence but also the essence of wisdom and so this is one source. There's very large, uh, big data studies that are mimicking this. Malcolm Gladwell was, was a little bit ahead of the curve in 2012. And some of his studies might not be as rigorous as the ones we have now, but these types of things are pretty shocking in the big data. Um, I think Facebook can tell um, shocking things about individuals with just 63 of their likes. And then we have the whole Cambridge Analytica and micro-targeting and stuff like that, because this is really powerful. Um, so in terms of, um, well, there are some studies in terms of culturedness. So if you get to travel more, uh, you perform better in school, you you have higher cultural competence on average. And so if you get to travel more, uh, we want to make sure, we want to make sure everybody gets this travel experience as much as possible. And there's some studies to show that it seems to increase independence and self-performance and all these things that correlate with longer term success or higher levels of success. Of course, this isn't all, in all cases, but in and uh, it's, it's statistically relevant. So um, traveling is sort of like the idea you get to you get to experience diversity and it purifies sort of these universal shapes behind the particularities of the cultures. And um, that's the science behind why we decided these reality checks were important because measuring value is one of the greatest problems in an economy not even just the objective economy that we covered in the Nobel Economics Prize, but in terms of the subjective economy. So the subjective economy is the thing that's going off the rails right now with Wall Street speculation, um, insider trading laws, all these types of things are creating incredible wealth concentration. And it's happening because these, these types of privileges uh, are really where the power is in terms of the idea of real beauty, real power. And so it's not wrong, it's just that the way we think about our culture is external. So we're being very superficial about these and it's causing a lot of like literally deaths of despair as people are cut off from this absolute idea, this metaphysical shape that is really behind all the value and the things that we're, we recognize as valuable, as meaningful. And so we get this distortion in, in the reality of our perceptions and marketing is designed to do that to, to make us want to consume, want to compete and that's part of the spice of life. It's just that we're, we're, we might have crossed a line that's making people sick. It's not flow state. So um, it's burning people out uh, and we're going to put it back in. It's a coordination problem. So we're going to put it back sort of into sync. And one way to do that is we have to have clear measurements, not just for us. We're not telling people how to live their lives. This is for the individuals to self-determine and gain data that they can use to determine their lives once they get out of the system, because we don't know who they are. This is just for them. And so um, it's really about just informing people. And if you don't want to do it, you don't have to. But if you're curious, it might explain some of the treatments in your life, why maybe you didn't get invited to this party or why you didn't get this job or why you know people treat you this way, why people don't laugh at your jokes, why all these like questions that I think everybody has as they're growing up what might make more sense when we have an idea of where we sit in terms of the current culture. Uh, even, though, even though our culture might be fairly toxic, you get an idea of why that, how that toxicity is treating you. Um, or even if you are a privileged individual, how it's objectifying you. And there's this experience even with modeling and all these other agencies where it starts to feel wrong and people try and make a stand and um, they, they experience the sort of power dynamics there and uh, you get some some abuses and some Harvey Weinsteins I guess uh, you could say and people that are very carnal and love goes out to these individuals too because we're all fighting battles we don't know anything about so in the end it really is the vow of abandonment for everybody that doesn't mean we accept all the behaviors we create boundaries but we don't want to abandon anybody because we we believe in the inner spirit of people you talk to them like they're rational and figure out the truth their reality check and once you know their reality check, people's lives make a lot more sense. So let's get into the actual game now. So 
when we're playing a, a Pareto game, you get into a group of eight, more than more than a couple people, because you might be able to narrow down who the people are. So it's better to try and do these in like um, kind of bigger groups. And ideally, not with people you know. If you want to try and do it with people you know, maybe you can, but we're going to try and rotate them. So basically how the games work is you you take turns and you do a self-analysis. So the first one is what do you think your scores are from 0 to 10? Um, so it's a self a self rating. And to think of these 0 to 10 scales, 0 means that in terms of not what you, uh, it's what you think of yourself, but it's in relation to the highest objective standards of the culture. So how would the world rate you? Right? So if you if you think about aesthetic beauty, um, we're talking about the supermodels, the, the traditional uh, beauty standards of the beauty industry or whatever sells products. And that's usually having to do with symmetry or golden ratio or whatever modeling agencies look for. And so that's the, the highest standard. Um, that's what we're comparing to. And you can give yourself a rating um, how close you align to that. If you are a sort of model of some kind and you reach those standards then you would be nine or ten and if you're maybe disfigured in some way or had an accident or something that is objectively um, uh, not aligning with what is ordinary human standards then um, you can give yourself a rating based on that maybe there was uh, we know individuals in gangs that get slashed um, on their face and there's large scars which which can be portrayed as beautiful in terms of life struggle, but in terms of other uh, more marketing aspects, they're pretty ruthless about it. And um, so that's how you think of the zero to tens is these are the worldwide scales. So you can give yourself a zero to 10 as a self rating for social. We're talking about celebrities. So tens are celebrities are, are movie stars and all these types of people in each country. Um, then for money, we're talking about the most wealthy people in the world. So we're talking about, you know, millionaires, billionaires are uh, eights, nines, tens. And then body sex, these are our porn stars. Everybody knows about Pornhub and all this type of, you know, culture, uh, which is, is resulting in addictions because people's, people's inner world are, are, is not strong enough to handle these exposures, this constant having at at people's luxuries these these instant gratifications so it's becoming a problem that's how you would rate yourself and there are objective measurements of the sex organs that are generally attractive more attractive such as penis size or breast size or height size or whatever you want to go by eyes colors well actually eyes would be aesthetic but whatever the metrics are that you think would be a 10 um, in terms of the global scale that's what you rate yourself culturedness is uh, basically how likable you are and how diverse uh, you are in a crowd and what if you're in a diverse setting can you get along with everybody basically uh, and it's a little bit different than social because you could be just born into a social and have a big network or you're born into the monarchy or something you have a lot of power but this one you you actually are sublating your you're doing something cultural and then with iq of course we now know that uh, we now know that, like, uh, for number five, by the way, 10 would be sort of like a comedian like Dave Chappelle or somebody who's really sort of likable, even though they might be saying very risky things that most people would get sort of um, berated for or marginalized for. These individuals can get away with it because they're so good at making people feel safe and knowing where the boundaries are, the cultural boundaries are, and um, respecting them. And then intelligence is, of course, uh, it's quite well measured now that um, a 10 out of 10 in IQ would be about 150, 160 IQ, probably 160 IQ plus, and that's mostly hereditary. So these types of intelligences are, these are general intelligences. So they're usually good at multiple things, verbal, intellectual, mathematical, verbal, cultural, these types of things. So this is where you would rate yourself in terms of that standard. Um, if you want to do yourself with gender and race privileges, those are more um, depending on geography, but and also uh, what kind of society you're in. But for the most part, there's general trends to show that racism or segregation or gender privilege is, is pretty pretty widespread. Uh, but in terms of the universal categories, these are the ones that are the sort of, I guess, more standardized. Then after you do a self-rating, you'll get a you'll get a score. 
So you'll get a score without your IQ and it's just the first five and then it kind of tallies up what your, your total percents are in terms of privilege or privilege power. So 56% in terms of the world population, um, that's where you would stand. And then the flow scores would, that's your reality check score. Uh, if, if it's lower than you think or lower than you want and it's like a bursting of a bubble and it's painful, it's lower than you thought you were, then we're putting here crisis helplines and um, we're, we're giving people the resources to say it's okay to feel um, this way because whether we like it or not, society in this superficial culture is treating us this way. That's why we have a meaning crisis. That's why we have anxiety and depression already going up anyway. So we might as well confront the problem head on and start giving people the supports and redesigning society around this truth. This is pervasive everywhere in every country. These things have power in every country. So we're just being wise about it and saying, okay, let's not ignore it and let's not fall into it either. But if your score is higher than you thought it was and you're too self-deprecating, then this might be a, a little bit of a wake-up call that maybe you're, you're having uh, issues of worth or whatever. It could be a... It could be it goes, could go the opposite way if you came from a oppressive kind of family dynamic or friend dynamic or cultural dynamic it can give you a better picture of who you really are um, once you get other people rating you so you can compare your self score to now other people rating you so they take turns or uh, they don't take turns for each of these categories we get everybody to select the column anonymously and then the person describes a couple of traits about them. They can show half their face for the aesthetic. And they give about 10 seconds for people to think about it. And they say, okay, vote. And then we try and get people to vote at the same time um, so that people aren't influencing each other's scores too, too much. Or they get in that thin slice, subconscious bias. And then um, the person gives their, their social status without really revealing who they are. You don't want to give too personal, oh, I'm the cousin of this person and that thing. You can just say, I'm a cousin of a celebrity. I have these kind of accesses and privileges and people can decide. And then they can give you a rating as well. Three, two, one, uh, they count down to 10 and then everybody rates at the same time. And then that person just keeps saying their, their attributes and then people just keep voting. Uh, zero to 10, zero to 10. And then eventually it adds up all their numbers and you get a comparison. And um, this is just one round. Uh, as the game goes on and you're in the system, you get your own profile where all these numbers are located. And then it, it, it's, it's a moving average. So in one group, you might have some racist activity or some sexist activity or somebody is biased against you in some way. And the scores might be lower than you thought. But then over time, there should be an average that um, accumulates as we rotate the groups and get more and more diversity. And we usually warn people to say the lowest, usually two votes and the two highest votes are usually the most inaccurate in some sense. Somebody has a proclivity towards you or against you. The... The middle, like the clusters, are usually where the truth is. So keep that in mind. And um, we like to keep it updated too, so it kind of shows that your scores can evolve. And hopefully, we start seeing trends on, you know, what your life experience is like. Why, if you go into a certain place, uh, you get treated in a certain way different from other people. And it might be a, a great human rights tool to show um, what your experience might be like before you travel to a certain place or explain the current place that you're in, why you got, uh, why your set of choices resulted to, to the place you are now. So this is the reality check and it can be kind of jarring because we're really, we're really encouraging people to give high numbers if they're really high and to give low numbers if they're really low or middle numbers if they're really in the middle. We're really trying to get a clear picture, but that doesn't mean we need to call anybody down or be mean about it. It's, it just means that clarity is the way to these universal shapes and getting to an economy of flow state, matching up the, the, the four flow criterion. So this is the first part of the reality check. And then people can walk away and, and, um, or look at the scores and, and decide if they want to make a life change or what have you. I think that's all that, that there is to... This one and other people, if they see that the scores are low, they they'll keep an eye on you and your screen name and, and make sure that you're doing OK, or at least that's the intended goal. We're going to try to do that. And the more volunteers we get, the, the better it will go. Um, so you can see these uh, reality check folders up here. And um, 
I think we have these profiles that you can check out if you want. So every individual has their own personal profile that's created as soon as you get out of the smashing room and you pass the wisdom quiz, you get your own profile where um, these types of categories are, are tracked for your individual self. So here's the individual version where your personal scores are and they kind of just keep going down as the games repeat and you can look over them. But this is all anonymous by the way, so it's just your screen name and your life areas. So you can very quickly see with your life areas and then the sentence game comes later, which you don't know about at this point. That's the reality check. Now the second thing to, to check in terms of solving this redistribution problem of virtuous and vicious cycles is that now that we know that these categories, the aesthetic, the social, the, the money, the, the body attraction, all these things, um, is really where a lot of value is carried in terms of the universal shape of what Hegel calls the idea. We can re-coordinate the system based off of those ideas in what's called idea-based economics. So now that we have a clear picture of where the value is, the privilege really is, instead of holding people back that have that privilege, it's a coordination problem that is actually more fulfilling to them and to the people who are maybe less um, advantaged that way. And we sort of have a more kind of meaningful interpretation that people are playing a, a deeper and, and more difficult uh, game when they're in those non-privileged modes. So there's a little bit more respect and dignity that kind of can go in that direction. But it still means that people can, still have to sort of work to get into flow state. So instead of bringing people down, we want to do something called Pareto changes. And Pareto is, is a sort of, I think he was an economist. And it's about making adjustments where instead of bringing the top down, you bring the bottom up. And so that's kind of what we're going for here with these Pareto rotations is we're going to use these sheets. So if you click on this, we're going to use these fun literatures, these fun bundles of literature in the Nobel Literature Prize to play these spirit games to write the sentences of the story of being. But one of the criterions for the, to win the Nobel Prize is that the way the game is played, the meeting structure, we're going to add a Pareto um, requirement. And the Pareto requirement is that we rotate the categories of the idea, these categories of privilege, or sensuous privilege anyway. We're going to track them amongst the players in each game type, and then rotate them so that we get every number or every degree of every category experienced by every player. So players will play one game, two game, three games, like these are different dates of games to make sentences together. And the people that they play with can have different configurations of those privileges and you can set these in different ways so when this game these games are played the participants can give a group rating a flow rating for the whole group so a seven is about moderate right and then uh, the lowest individual score is a five the highest score is a nine because people have different experiences um, and then if it's an individual player they can give individual sort of rates and then um, these averages overall but we can create these numbers here and we're called um, Pareto grids. These are um, sort of grids that, that make it very visual where, what the configurations are. And this one has a 550 rating overall. And we can just see that it's a one, two, three, four, like it's going up to 10 this way, and then it's going up to 10 this way. So every cell is just rotating through, or every column is ro rotating through, and every row is rotating through each level of these privileges. So that each game is experiencing a different configuration during the two weeks that we might play this kind of configuration. But then below this, we have individual players. So this is the overall games and how the games themselves are configured, right? So in this game, game 10, um, there's gonna be one person that has a 10 in the aesthetic category. And then for the social, there's uh, a person who has a one and then a two and then it's just making sure that in this one game, these numbers are in that game. And then of course, this, this game is different from a different game. So the 10 uh, out of 10 uh, in terms of the reality check for game six happens in the culture category instead of the aesthetic category. And then we're going to measure these flow ratings and see if there's optimal combinations of different types of privilege to start narrowing in on a new economy of flow that is actually working for people. And it's self-determining. People can choose what kind of games they wanna play. 
as their identities are changing and sublating and you know these, these scores will change over time even for individuals but that's the game ratings and we can create patterns amongst games but then we can create patterns within games so here's one game and this is um, grid number one so this is a Pareto grid where where every player has a 10 out of 10 in every category so this is extremely unlikely but there may be people in the world that have this and this is called we're giving this the 100 tens because there's 100 tens here so player one has a 10 in aesthetic social wealth body culture intelligence and then gender race place all these types of things and if we there's other configurations to say well if you only want to do the universal ones you can and you don't want to be identified by your gender or race then you can not rate these ones um, but these ones will probably be rated at least for the Nobel Prize games and people can play all sorts of games they don't have to do this but if they want to get in the Nobel Prize and win the Nobel Economics Prize with the Nobel Literature Prize we have to do this version otherwise we're not doing anything new for the Economics Prize that's worth the prize nobody has really done this before to focus on where does value really come from and we think Hegel was right it comes from these universal shapes that we are self-recognizing in usually immediate modes and we're searching for self-actualization that's why art appeals to us because we're seeing a universal meaning in it that reflects our own life experience and we can see beauty in the simplicity and you know all that artistic stuff so this is just one configuration so in this uh, grid one we can have a grid 1.1 so now we have the hundred nines so now everybody has nines and we can measure the flow states from these and we can see the score is 900 instead of a thousand over here and then we can do the next rotation. So grid 1.2 is all eights, the 100 eights. And then grid 1.3 is the 100 sevens. And it just goes through all the numbers, right? All the way down five, four, three, two, one. And you can see that the number, the privilege score is going down. And we can measure what would happen. And if we can start recognizing trends and protecting people from certain configurations. And because it's all anonymous, we can't peg anybody. This is really just for people to know and to see what kind of games they want to play. This is to help them determine uh, how to schedule their games. So this is just the, the first grid. So the second grid um, is called the diagonal downward, where the numbers are only rotated. So player one, two, three, four. Only player 10 has a 10 in the aesthetic, but player nine has a 10 in the social. So really what we're showing is that there's a diagonal of 10s here, and we want to see how this game plays out when all the other categories are just being rotated. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, nine, 10, two, three, four, five, six, and then the ones over here. So all the rows are rotating. And then you can see that the, the score here is 550. So it's like sort of equivalent in terms of the first grid. It's, it's equivalent to somewhere between grid 1.5 and 1.4. And we can compare the flow states to see what the numbers really mean in terms of the value and the experience of flow. Because we're trying to create the flow economy. And so initially these might be really low scores. That's okay. We can start adjusting and say certain types of people might not like this and uh, it's an education campaign so the diagonal is all tens but then we can do a grid 2.1 where it's all nines and then we can do it again it's all eights and it's you know we can just keep going all the way down then we can do it again for the next type which is three grid three is the diagonal downward tens rotated so basically we have another diagonal 10 but now instead of just rotating the numbers in here um, what we're going to do is we're going to rotate the whole row uh, columns. So now you can see that um, the 10 that was in aesthetic is now rotated to the age. So we're moving the columns this way. We're, we're rotating this way. So you can see it rotating this way. And these will create hyper nuanced experiment data sets where we can pinpoint exactly what each number means over many, many, many combinations. I think so far we have like 26 grids, I think. This one is where you combine the first two grids. Grid four is a combining of two and three. So now we have the, the numbers are rotating and we have the columns rotating, right? So we have grid 4.4 is um, sixes and then it's halfway rotated between gender and intelligence. And we're keeping track of the scores too. So even though the scores are staying the same, the configurations can actually change the, the flow score. So the absolute numbers might not be enough. The, the directions also can contribute to the flow. 
Um, so I hope this provides a novel way to, to do a new type of economics that's hyper nuanced and is rooted on something that's often ignored in economics or, or it's, tried to push, it's tried to be pushed under the table. But the subjective economy is really relying on these things. And so we're using philosophy and uh, these reality checks to, to get this kind of data and restructure the kind of games we play because society is one big flow game. It's just that the four criteria aren't very well met. The, there's not really clear goals. There's a lot of existential crises going on, and we're filling that with materialism and possessions, which are ultimately not satisfying in the long term, according to end-of-life studies. Number two is it has to have immediate feedback. But we have a lot of uh, bureaucracies or, or dead weight preventing people from getting goods and services or feeling heard in their political institutions. In fact, current data uh, studies show, at least in, in the United States, that voting has zero effect on policy legislation. So it might be able to get certain people into power, but it doesn't seem to change any policies at all. So people don't feel like their feedback is immediate and it's affecting change. They're not feeling recognized in their systems. Um, so we're trying to fix these problems. Uh, the third criterion after immediate feedback is the, the challenge level of the jobs have to match the skill level of the citizens. And so there's, that can get into the culturedness, subladedness kind of thing, but there's a whole another part of uh, the economic prize called WIWA, the Worldwide Essential Workers App, where we start measuring particular skills. Um, but um, we want to make sure that, that that measuring process is happening fairly because right now it's not. There's like a sloughing off where this, the, the kind of privileged get all the long-term success and everybody else gets these sort of minimum wage jobs, which are subsistence living, and then you get the life rates going down and depression and suicide and, de and despair basically starts to occur because society is upgrading faster than they, than the, than they can get out of it. Um, and the last one is clear rules. So a lot of the rules don't factor in these power dynamics like the law, for instance, judge give, judges give less rest, uh, strict sentences to aesthetically beautiful people. So those types of rules are are within our culture and they're having big effects, but they're not directly acknowledged. They're sort of a hegemonic structure that's unquestioned. And if you try to question it, you're seen as superficial when really you're already in a superficial structure, you're just not allowed to question it. Um, so there's a whole bunch of these combinations here. Um, another interesting one is grid number five is where we're not just changing the numbers, we're rotating them. So we get the one, two, three, four, not just a bunch of tens, but then we rotate these numbers, so then you get a 10 here, and then it rotates again, 9, 8, or 9, 10, 1, 2, and then 8, 9, 10, so you can see it's rotating. And because we're keeping all the other columns the same, we're able to pinpoint and, and treat as a controlled variable if this change is actually affecting the flow states and how much does it affect it. So that when we start combining these grids in more and more complex categories for the types of personalities or the, the ideal configurations, we have a really uh, great way for people to, to do that, even for themselves. Uh, and, and the government's, the, the New World Spirit, uh, will provide this as a, as a universal service for everybody. It's not really even a universal basic income, it's like a universal basic flow, I guess you could say. And the new thing is, we don't want people to work their buns off, because if you overwork past flow, you get into arousal and anxiety and performance actually goes down and burnout increases and then health problems occur and then you got compounding uh, losses in the medical system and it's just not great. But you don't want people to underwork because then you get lethargy, apathy, boredom, and then people feel like they're not actualizing or growing. Um, so there's a sweet spot that we now aim for. People will, will get rewarded the most by aiming for their sweet spot and taking time off, sort of like what Switzerland and these Scandinavian countries figured out that when people are in flow state and they take time off, take time off and you know they do more human things, their productivity goes up 700%. They actually make more. And this is a very well-known fact by now. So you can see there's many configurations here. Now the diagonal is going down and we're repeating the same kind of studies. And, and then we're going column by column. So you can see it changing. And you can see the numbers rotating in the columns now. And um, now we're going row by row. But you can see the last ones are colored purple for a reason. And it's because all of these numbers are just staying the same. They're rotating in the same kind of way. But here, now we're making, we're making no stipulations on who, what the numbers are of the players. This is organic data. These could be random numbers, but we're figuring out, well, if we keep this row the same, in terms of organic game playing, where we don't fix any other rules, does this still have a substantial effect? 
and then seeing in random data sets if these changes still hold. So that's what the purple represents is that we're not setting any patterns except for the row. And then we're letting these turn into any other random combinations and seeing if there's trends that way. This is kind of how society really operates are in these organic spontaneous combinations. So we can check these types of data sets as well. And I think these would be incredibly helpful. So these are just the, the, the different types. And there's many, many more than this. This is just to give an impression of how incredibly powerful this type of economics, this idea based economics really is. And that nobody has seemed to do that. We're all doing this in approximate ways, but this is the first time it's being done explicitly and in an, anom an, an anonymous way to protect people so that they're not exploited because that's what the current culture is doing. This is what the dating apps are trying to measure. And this is why basically all the apps are free because we are the product they are extracting this data in some way. And we're using it for profit in a way that's stratifying society and putting people in these sort of invisible digital, uh, according to the CBC Massey lectures or uh, uh, other peer reviewed um, academic uh, platforms, they, they are calling these like di digital pens in a certain way, uh, a visible form of control through our instincts. So we're providing a self-determining version of that that's probably more healthy and more in line with the, the spirit, the new world spirit that Hegel was talking about. Um, so hopefully this is intriguing to you. If you want to create some combinations, you definitely can. Uh, we, can cre we can mix now the player grids with the game grids, and then we can have even more nuanced combinations and measure the flow scores. So... This is where we're heading with uh, the Nobel Economics Prize. And that's why we lost four triggers is that before this stuff is all understood, it really feels like it's too superficial and can't have any positive benefits. But when people are disconnected from these categories and they're not allowed to travel and their two, two weeks of vacation pay is not enough to, to get over the stress that they conjured or, or endured over the, the year, you know, 52 weeks, or they're separated from physical beauty or art, or they don't get touched by people they respect because aesthetic or the five love languages require. Some people have a love language of touch. And we know that if you don't touch a baby within a certain period of time, hug a baby or give them tactile security, they, have, they physically die. That's how important it is for human beings, uh, most human beings anyway. And it creates oxytocin and a bunch of stuff like this. Same with wealth, we, right, we already know that subsistence living has a drastic effect. Um, so hopefully now uh, people can see, especially if you're in sociology or you're in economics or psychology or therapy, or you can see the positive of what we're aiming for. And it's very, it's, it has a lot of scientific uh, rigor. We can actually measure these things in ways that maybe were never thought of before. And then we can start creating flow games where we rotate in Pareto rotations um, to achieve higher levels where we solve the virtuous and vicious economic cycles and we don't reduce it to like a flat version of, you know, maybe historical communism where everybody's treated the same. The, the sameness is the inner equality of spirit, but in terms of the diversity, we're being realistic about it and allowing people to shine in their greatness. You know, we're not trying to make this all the same. We're trying to create combinations. It's a coordination problem that will solve the business cycle. And uh, because we're going to be redistributing it through the WeWa app, um, we think that with the universal shapes in terms of a new culture of thinking together um, within the diversity and the skepticism of science, making sure that that part is, we don't end up in some kind of group think, right? You're allowed to be scientific. You're supposed to question and abstract and negate why you sublate. But this is how we think the business cycle uh, can be solved without being oppressive or naive. And this has never really been tried before, at least in this way, not that we know of. The other thing to mention here is we want people to, the reason why this solves a bit of the, the envy problem is because if you are a 10 in any category, usually there's jealousy, but if people gain the trust that every week they will have a game that experiences every number. So every week you meet somebody who's a 10 in each of these categories or a one in each of these categories or whatever, you get all the numbers every week. You stop pining for or getting desperate to, to try and cling to people because you know it's coming. So then it, it reduces the, this desperate sort of scarcity type mentality of hoarding and you get into a more abundance economy where things start flowing and people who are tense can, cannot shy away. They can shine brightly because they're, they're giving their beauty or their privilege or their, their IQ or their funniness or whatever they were gifted. They're giving it to other people every week that they know will appreciate it. So the people who are vulnerable 
in certain categories. We'll appreciate the people who who have gifts gifts in those categories, and um, the people who are gifted will appreciate sharing that gift with other people who they know might appreciate it. That even goes like even for people who are tens, they still get to have all the other categories too. Some people who might might have high aesthetic beauty are lacking intelligence. Maybe they're in a superficial culture and they need some kind of deeper meaningful stimu stimulus. And so they're going to be craving to meet this person who has a 10 in the intelligence or the, the cultured, right? Because they, they get enough of the other three, right? And people who have high levels of, of intelligence might be stereotyped as nerds. And so they're not getting enough social or wealth or, or aesthetic or body privilege, right? Um, so there's ways to balance these where all these other industries are trying to approximate it, but it's really turning into exploitation. And there's a much more beautiful way where you get to know the people in each of these modes and you get to know their limits too. And it starts creating a, a nice profound sense of empathy while you're playing the games because you're allowed to talk and do video chats while you're making the sentences. And we're going to encourage these in the highest versions of the games called ever living uh, games. Eventually, one last thing to cover here is that each fun mature can have um, can be played in each one of these types. But um, there is a there's a a thing that we're tracking even amongst all these grids. We're tracking for which one has the highest score overall, and that's called the spirit grid. And so that's the one universally the best for everybody, no matter what your number is. And if we end up finding that grid, that grid will be sort of the default that we start using. And it should start building the higher and higher levels, start sublating. Um, that's kind of where these numbers are. So if you're asked, like, what kind of a uh, sentence game are you playing? Or what kind of, like, Nobel Literature Prize game are you playing? You can say, well, we're doing grid version 7. And people will know sort of what that is. And then people can see, you know, if there's a spot open for uh, on a 7 grid with wealth uh, 8, and you're an 8 from your reality check, then you can fill that spot in that game. So that's how you would start choosing your games. And, Hopefully it starts doing something new. Um, and this also does something for the games that's really interesting in terms of external and internal games, which we'll get to now that we're solving the vicious and virtuous economic cycle problem. Uh, and we're not gonna get this repeated uh, fragility. And the reason why, last point here I suppose, is the reason why this was initially thought up is that you can sort of reset the system and you know give from the haves to the have-nots and you know tax the, the wealthy and you know bring up social assistance a little bit and you can do all these types of adjustments and they might work in the short run but then over time they always just turn back into the stratification and it's happening because the real value is not being accounted for it's always a banded solution so that's why this is going to stop we're going to re, re, re kind of set it but it's going to stay this way uh, we believe because we're not doing it and we're, we're taking the subjective and the objective economies um, fully into account and we're figuring out what the highest good and service is which is really flow state based on the idea the um, the research and development that Thomas Solo and others have pinpointed as the the generator of value and the qualitative upgradings of society so this is the full answer to a very tricky problem and hopefully you still have two triggers to endure, uh, endure the, the rest of the, the presentation. And the, the biggest and most complicated slide is still coming, but hopefully you can see now that we're just as practical as we are uh, deeply theoretical. We're trying to be sound and grounded in both modes. And hopefully by this point, uh, stage number three of the stream of spirit, it's starting to make. One more thing uh, to add in terms of these grids is that we might find stable and unstable grids. So maybe what we'll find is that all grids that actually have at least one person that has a 10 or even an average score. So across all the players, as long as the cultured score of all their cultured categories added up together, as long as this adds up to a 55 or above, any other combination of these could be stable and they'll have a good game of a flow state above a seven. Uh, but we might find out too that if you don't have at least one person that's a seven or above, then this, no matter what the other people's scores are, it, it still falls apart or is unstable. Or we can actually start finding combinations of these where we find people that have high wealthy average scores in a game. If they have it coupled with a, an intelligence score, then the games are stable. But if they're, if you have somebody who has a 10 or something in the aesthetic with a wealthy, it, it's an unstable game. 
So we can start figuring out which games are stable and which ones aren't stable. And all these incredible patterns between the shapes themselves, these categories themselves, can start to be determined uh, through these um, combinations, these sort of experiments to figure out how human phenomenology is really perceiving these things in a sort of universal way that gets to that shape space we were talking about before, even though these are sensuous categories. Um, so this is incredibly powerful stuff. There's a lot of potential here. and We, we can't wait till a few uh, teams of academics get on board and, and start helping out do the, to do the science and this new type of economics that we really truly believe has the ability to win a Nobel economics prize. And now it should also make more sense why we included it in point number two of the uh, Nobel uh, or of the spirit license. We can now see on slide uh, four here that we included Pareto rotations with a star and we put a little link down here saying that it's based on idea-based economics. And now the viewers of this presentation should understand why we did that and why it's necessary to, to get to the root of of how the spirit license is supposed to solve these um, Nobel economic problems or these Nobel prize worthy economic uh, solutions. And if you look over the presentation again, you'll see that we're threading all the different areas into each other because we're doing this in a new infinite kind of science where all of the, the areas uh, and domains of knowledge are in this universal kind of logic that we're showing in the different forms. Welcome to the fourth stage of the stream of spirit. We're losing one trigger from the previous slide, at least it's not four this time. Uh, the slide's a little less intense and uh, we're losing a trigger because some people will look at this and realize immediately that we are still in spreadsheet land, more and more spreadsheets. And we can't really get away from it because unless we make an app of our own, which we don't have the current funds to do, we'll have to raise that money and hopefully the Nobel Prizes uh, create some of the seed money or the, or the gifting that it'll inspire worldwide once we get that influencing ability and that trust uh, to share that those funds. Um, for now, we are going to have to use um, Google systems. They're the only ones that are uh, fast enough, universal enough, all this kind of stuff. And if we keep the systems anonymous, then we should be able to protect people from being exploited by Google or any corporation that tries to take advantage of this, uh, take advantage of the new world spirit. But uh, if you're not a big uh, spreadsheet person, you don't have to necessarily use these. We want it to be self-directing. Uh, because the people who are trained that will want to kind of realize the value and make this a success, they will um, they will make sure that these sheets are, are updated. Um, but eventually we do think that once people realize that this can be fun and they, they sort of pick up the new kind of logic, that it won't be a big deal. The, the sheets are actually pretty simple once people are familiar. Um, so the, the problem that this fourth stage is solving with these spreadsheets is you know, whatever we do, uh, it has to be familiar and fun and have real inner and outer rewards. Otherwise, people won't want to do it, even if their life areas are satisfied, even if they got all their anger out in a smashing room, even if we're rotating or we measure their privileges. Uh, to play this game and actually start making the, the story of being, the universal story of being, you know, we're writing a story, it sounds boring. Uh, it's kind of based a little bit on on, um, on those games where you can play them uh, and like draw a picture together. Somebody draws the top, you somebody else draws the middle and you build the picture together. It's the togetherness that is the fun part. If you feel validated in the process and whatever your life figure is, whatever your Pareto changes are or your reality check is and where your life areas are. But we put here another uh, indicator of how we're going to solve this problem and it's going to do with these four flow state criteria and, and these ever living meetings which we haven't fully explained yet but there's different levels that you can play what's called the sentence game so this fourth stage is called the sentence game because um, we showed in previous slides that we're going to be playing a, a really simple three-step um, process basically and 
we had one little practical slide snuck in at the beginning here of the presentation slide number five where we said select the story schedule a game and play the sentence game with one of the templates and we snuck this in here because most people might not be able to make it through all the theory that we put in the in the presentation to show people that there really is a chance to win six Nobel Prizes. If, if uh, we have anybody that has the, the state of mind to recognize what's really going on here, then um, now you're going to figure out how we're going to unpack these three simple steps into how we're literally doing six Nobel Prizes all at once with this simple little game. But of course it requires a few more spreadsheets. Um, so the first Sheets that need to be understood are the Universal Story folder sheet, which we just showed you. We'll kind of go over these again to show step by step how to play the game. So if you click on each one, you can um, open it up in the presentation and it'll take you to the open folders. So in this one, uh, we have the stories listed that the topmost stories and you can select your story. So right now, there's a bunch of examples, and there's one here, and um, I think one about the homeless. Um, but this one here, the story number one, is one we're actually kind of using as an example. It's kind of filled out, at least to the first competency level. And you can see a combined story. So you can actually combine these, which we'll get into in a second. But let's pick a peer story. And you can see the different levels of the polished papers that we talked before, the different levels of complexity. And then you'll see a, a, a draft constructor, uh, constructor and then a bibliography. And the bibliography is where anybody who helped contribute to the story, their name is referenced here. It's sort of like a, a tribute to you, anybody that wants to partic participate. And then you can actually go to the individual sort of games. But that's the, that's the structure of how you go through the stories. And... Um, if you want to, you can kind of go back and if you do click a combined story, you're going to find a different template here where we're actually, you can, you can combine the different levels, so story one and 1.1. 1 .1. Uh, if you think that they're sentences, that these two stories can be merged or sublated together to create a better story, then those combined stories of meaning can be in this folder using that template. And it's not just for, for like this is one type of story of the story B beginning. So you can kind of see in the titles, the story of being is story number one's title. And it has um, a noun, like a person, a person, place, or thing. So the person is about be, be, inning, which is a play on words of Hegel's category of pure being and Einsoff and Brahman and the Lord and Christianity and uh, the Tao, the ineffable. Uh, so this is the name of the character and then the place where it's all starting is the super sensuous realm the metaphysical realm And then if you open it up, you can see the rest of the sentence uh, the rest of the, the details Person place and thing and the thing is about spirit So this story is about achieving the spirit in the place of super sensuousness as be beginning and it just starts here It could start somewhere else, but these are the universals that sort of define the the story and of course they can change the one with Gandhi starts in India and it's, you know, um, but you can take these level of stories now. So story one has two versions right here, and these two can be combined in story one, but you could actually combine story one and the entirety of story two. So for instance, you want to translate one into a different language, you can do that. So if the first one's written in English and you want to trans and you want to combine it with story number three, or if you just want to create a, a new version of this, you can combine them and put them into the combined stories. Actually, the translations of story one would occur as a version, so it would be probably like 2.0 here, um, translations where you can go through. And then people can look at your translations and then make a version off of theirs to say, oh, this can, translation's different, or you're missing a nuance, or it provides a pretty hyper-nuanced uh, translation mechanism. But in terms of actually combining the narratives of the stories, um, you can put them in this folder, and these are called sublated folders. And then you can sublate those sublated stories. You can have different versions here, which we don't have yet. But you might have like combined story one, combined story two, combined story three. And then you can combine combined stories. And then eventually you get to this sort of final story, the story of spirit, which is the highest story where all the other stories are sublated into one story, no matter how diverse they are. So that's sort of how eventually we get to a mega meaning where we have all these different stories in one truly universal story 
of spirit of everybody of everything so that's the story folder in its full depth and you can explore that more if you'd like to but let's move on to oh let's move on to the fun literatures so the fun bundles of literature so now that we sort of have a narrative that we're going to pursue together we have to make it fun right that's the part of the problem fun literature stand for fun bundles of literature and it has a lot to do with form so the form also has a lot to do with how people perceive and experience reality. And the way we perceive reality is what helps determine what is fun for us and what is innerly rewarding. And this gets into flow state more. So this is the flow state psychology graph uh, that was initially, it was a field pioneer sort of by Mihaly Zizek Mihai. I think that's how you say his name. And of course it's known as many names in the zone, rapture, it's these states of mind where we have timelessness, we have complete immersion, and it's intrinsically enjoyable. People will, will pay you to make these states. If you can put somebody into flow state at work, they'll want to come to work, you know? And he tried to turn it into a science, and it's growing now in popularity. It has a little bit of a, a reputation for being a little bit of a pseudoscience, but that's changing now. As anxiety and depression and mental health actually becomes the main issue of, of the species across the planet. So he tried to make questionnaires to tease out you know, what we're doing with the Pareto grids, right? He had a, a version of his own in terms of not necessarily measuring the idea or any of the hardcore stuff we're doing, but he just thought, well, we're going to ask people how, how they feel at different parts of the day. And that's where we sort of got the ratings, the flow ratings of the Pareto rotation games. But this is really what we're, we have in mind in terms of emotions and the perception of fun. So there's the sweet spot, which is flow. If we play these games right and we calibrate the, the life areas and we calibrate the, the Pareto rotations, but we also calibrate these things called fun literatures in the right way, then it should match what people, how they perceive reality and it aligns their thinking and their being in a self-determining way. It can't be a course from without. It actually has to be just a set of conditions and then people are self-actualized in those conditions. Um, if you go to, if the challenge level is too low, then you start getting control and uh, like you can see the skill level versus the challenge level so if the challenge level goes down but the skill level is high it's it kind of goes down into control it's not as good as fall it's not bad but then if you have lots of skill and not enough challenge then you get relaxation which is not horrible uh, but if you get too low of skill and low challenge you get apathy and boredom and and if you have too too much challenge and not enough skill you get worry and anxiety and this is where we sort of are in our culture with the the information explosion we're all trying to keep up with our wetware and we're just being bombarded and struggling to keep up and feeling like we're being left behind so if you have a little bit more skill and high challenge well you get into arousal but that's still not quite flow and these can stimulate growth but when you get too far it actually creates damage so really it is all about calibration it's a coordination problem and that's why these games are really important and why we're, we're fine-tuning them but there's something else. So this is the outward way to sort of create games. And we're calling them flow games because games are artificial mechanisms that human beings use to create flow states. We've been doing it for, who knows, maybe millions of years, ever since pure thoughts uh, evolved into the scene. Um, but there's also an internal way. That's the external kind of way. The internal way is that our minds can do this within themselves. We can create games without even playing with anybody else. Um, and Mihaly calls these... Uh, autotelic personalities or Mihai, I'm not quite sure how to say his name um, but into autotelic personalities were discovered by him uh, when he was looking at World War II soldiers and some of them were put in concentration camps and some died and some survived and he wondered what made the difference why did some survive and why did some die and he studied one guy who was put into a concentration camp and survived, but he was a very high performance athlete and he had signs that he had an autotelic personality, which means self, auto, self, and then telos, goal. And of course, Hegel has both these concepts. Telos is teleology, teleology and a science of logic after uh, mechanism and chemism. And then he also has a set of, uh, or a concept of self that is heavily based on Aristotle and replays itself over and over again, sort of as the negation, sort of as this being within self, being for self, being in and for self. And these words constantly continue as this self-relating. 
So when you set a, a goal, this is sort of like setting an end, setting a limit. And then we overcome that limit through sublation. So in another sense, this is like the Nobel Peace Prize we talked about. Another way of saying the autotelic personalities are people that are good at this universal logic and are good at sublating limits into higher concrete unities, even in terms of shapes of phenomenology and perception, because all the logic is repeating in different forms. So he says that an autotelic personality is a self that has self-contained goals, one that easily translates potential threats into enjoyable challenges and therefore maintains its inner harmony. Notice that inner harmony in the world of pure thought that we then align our being with in terms of our thinking. So it's a nice way of things flow, and that's the logic of it. But you can make these flow states fun in terms of this inner dynamic and in terms of the outer dynamic of the games. And so this is what the fun literatures are, are trying to approximate um, with the other stages of the stream of spirit. So if you open up the actual fun literature document, you'll see that they're all listed. And you can see, of course, the trust scores are at the top because without trust, all this stuff seems to be pointless in some sense or much more difficult to sublate. So all of this stuff is really just to increase trust so we can start sublating and gaining the trust of all these particular categories in tension that are unsublated in our current culture. But you can see there's instructions here. And if you want to find a certain type of lit uh, fun literature, like somebody says, hey, we played this sentence game and it was like, you know, it was fun literature number 6,592. Well, you can't really go through, you can try and scroll for a long time. But if you, another benefit of spreadsheets is if you do control F and you just type in the number, you know, um, fun literature number 6,000, whatever I said, 287, it'll, it'll go and check first of all to see if it even exists. And if it does, you just press enter and it brings you straight there in the grid or um, people can tell you, you know, go to J7 and you'll find it. So that's the benefit. It's a coordinate system. If there's people that get excited by this, we could even make it a requirement to be on the Nobel Prize or whatever to invent, yes, five meanings, but also make one fun literature that's from you. And uh, we might get millions of these fun literatures, all different permutations and combinations. Um, so um, we want people to do these searches first. We don't want them to duplicate. So if this main root column, this main root column is a way to sort of simplify and, and get people to check, you know, does their fund literature already exist? So if they want to make an acrostic, acrostic um, fund literature or it has an acrostic poem in it, then you just type in acrostic. And if you find uh, a row that has acrostics in it, then usually it starts with the most simple one. And then you just go over and then you see all the derivations of that acrostic form. So you can very kind of quickly see if your fun literature that you have in mind already exists. And if, um, if you really want to, you can search for like entire fun literature. So you can just copy an entire cell and paste it in the, in the search column. And then it'll show you if all of them, if groups of these uh, styles of art exist together in a group already in the fun literature, it'll show you the whole group. So. Um, that's how to sort of search for this sheet and how to how to make sense of it. And the ones that have links, so if you click on this, it actually has a, a link. So that means that this fun literature is actually in a sentence somewhere. Some some group played a game and they used this form. And so if you click on it, this is the tracking sheet of that form. So maybe you invented this form and you said, okay, I want to have fun literature number 27. It was invented by Spirit Man. That's the screen name, the anonymous screen name. Um, and then you can actually give your fun literature, uh, not just a number, but a, actually the, the, the numbers go in order. So you'll have to get a, what's called a global identifier number, but you can also give it your own name. So this could be a, called the story of being Nobel Prize worthy. So it's a play off of story number one, the story of being, but the form is in the Nobel Prize worthy one, indicating that this is one of the forms that can, can be in the literature prize. So the meeting version, so you can step, stipulate the kind of meeting. So version 1.9 is in terms of the ever living meeting style, which we haven't talked about yet, which will come next, but we did cover the Pareto. So number two, hopefully you can read this if it's not too small. It says Pareto version 3.1. So that means grid 3.1, which we covered in the, in the third stage of the stream of spirit. So 3.1, I think was the downward diagonal and um, they're just saying we need to have that kind of grid. So the players need to have that matching. And then the flow rating. So they're stipulating that um, 
in order for this to be considered, uh, you have to aim for uh, a level eight in terms of ratings or above. Um, and then by the point of, by the time we know the, the Pareto stuff, we might be able to predict which ones will create eights and um, start selecting ahead of time proactively and not just experimentally. Um, the goal is also to have everyone leaving with at least one synchro density, which is a, which is another name for meaning. So everybody, you can't just have, you know, if there's eight people, you can't just have like, you know, one person get all the meetings and everybody else sits by idly. This is saying though it needs to be shared. There needs to be assisting going on to make the game more fun. And it has to have Nobel laureate meetings, meaning that those Nobel lectures, the 600 that we talked about with the Nobel literature prize that were using algorithms to sort the words. Uh, we have to include those Nobel laureates in this game style. There has to be three meanings per synchro density. There has to be uh, a chemistry reference, uh, or a physics reference, a chemistry reference, a biology reference, an economics reference, a literature reference, and a peace reference in the, in the sentence that we construct with this fun literature. So this is just what the words in the sentence have to be under. There has to be at least one word that does all of these things and have that kind of flow dynamic. So in terms of the form of the language, they're saying it's universal, the lingo is universal. So you don't have to use a, a type of jargon. So you don't have to use just, just physics, ter physics terms, for instance, or just chemistry terms. Each one of these has their own special language. Um, universal means you can use any kind of words that you want from any domain. And then the rule. So this is where like we satisfy that fun mature. And so you can see rule one is the number of players has to be 10. Rule two is um, these sort of Pareto rules and the privilege rules. So you can actually stipulate that you want people to have a certain IQ score, a certain uh, culturedness score and those categories of those Pareto scores that we talked about before. So it tracks how many times this fun literature has been used, it can be used 10 times. This is just an example. Um, who liked these the most or who gave them the highest ratings in terms of the stories? Is there a story written entirely in this fun literature? So not only are the sentences, individual sentences, like a couple of them are written in this fun literature, but the entire, every sentence of story 1.0 is written in this form and every story has uh, a synchronicity score so the higher the synchronicity score the more it'll be considered for the nobel prize if it matches this fun literature so not only does it have to meet these and it gets audited to see if all these are met it actually also checks to see how many meanings per sentence the story has overall when you add up all the sentences for each competency level. So it starts to get a little bit complicated here, which is why we need moderators to sort of guide people. So in the beginning, every story can be written in five different levels of complexity in terms of those universal shapes, those Hegel shapes we talked about in the Nobel Physics Prize and in Hegel Science of Logic, which is really 133 philosophers of history. So when we say Hegel, he's actually the culmination of the greatest thinkers of 2,500 years. And we could use each individual thinker but for, for shortness, we can just reference to Hegel for now. But if people are just starting, story one, uh, the story of B beginning and you know the super sensuous beginning and the thing is spirit, can be written as the lullaby, competency one, very simple. But there's only three sentences really, at least in the, the, the lullaby, the first version. Um, so each one of those three sentences can be in this fun literature style, in this form. So if all three sentences are in that form, then you can say yes. Story 1.0 is finished for competency level one, but there's so far uh, none for, comp for the other competency level. So it gives people an idea that if they like that story or like story one, they can expand and write entire competencies in one fun literature style. In other cases, the, the story will be written with multiple fun literatures. Each sentence could be a different fun literature. But if you want a pure, a pure fun literature, then you can write an entire story in just one form. So if you choose a sonnet or something, then it could be, uh, you can write the entire, you can rewrite the story of, of one, uh, 1.0 as you know, sonnets at different levels of comp complexity. Uh, then it, it tracks the story level, but it can also track the sentence level. So how many sentences were individually used and you can track across stories. So, you know, this could be the sentences from stories one, six, nine, 72, 5,000. And it just gives an idea of how many times this was used uh, in terms of the sentences, not just the stories overall. And then of course, words, how many words are in this fun literature style, which might be 
an extension of the the sentences, but it gives you an idea of the frequency which which one which furnitures are the most popular, and uh, we can start figuring out why they're popular and what is the universality of it that that's contributing to that, and then maybe adding that to the science of logic or expanding the encyclopedia of the philosophical sciences, which as we know, genuine philosophy is the universal. It's not a particular amongst other knowledge domains like it is today. That's not real philosophy. That's a abstract philosophy. So that's the point of these tracking sheets. And you can actually see the Pareto rotations used with this. Um, and then you can see the actual games played with those rotations. So these could be real numbers of, of an actual game completed. And here's the real flow scores with this fun literature and so you can see if the fun literature also contributes to the fun of the game and not just the privilege scores, the Pareto rotations. So we're measuring a lot of things and it's all anonymous. So um, hopefully people are, are more honest and uh, know that this is really just benefiting everybody because we're all, whether we're rich or poor or anything, we're all suffering in some sense. Anxiety is going up in poor and rich countries alike. So this is really what the fun literature slide is all about. And this is just one fun literature slide. This, if, if this tracking document doesn't get made until at least one story or at least one sentence are, are written in this form. And for this one we do, this fun literature does have uh, three sentences that use this form, but all of these don't so far. And so we don't want people making a whole bunch of these. We want them to start writing. These are just examples that we wrote down to get people started. But to keep things sort of fair, we want to make sure that people are not just creating a whole bunch of them and you know they actually have to write, write them out so that other people can you don't have a chance to make make them um, so that's kind of like the point of this slide and you can see so far that there's uh, 16 or 14 versions and there can be more and more derivatives but this one's called the story of being universal prize worthy so we have the Nobel Prize but we also have the Nobel Economics Prize which are these universal prizes so to play this game you have to meet these criteria which are uh, even more strict. So instead of a, a flow rating of eight, like we had for the Nobel Prize, this one's even higher, flow state nine. And is it possible to create flow states where everybody, all the players are at like a level nine flow state, which is like incredible. I think in the future we can get to this point. We finally have a, a, a scientific mechanism to, to figure it out. Um, there's other ones too where People don't have to write about abstract things. They can write about their own experience. They can write their life experience into the story. So if they're a mother and they had a miscarriage and it was traumatizing and there's things that we never would have thought would have happened to them, then they can teach other people that experience through the stories and they can do it through a fun literature. It's uh, the, the being authentic. So whatever you write in this fun literature, it has to have something to do with the people who wrote it. And because we're playing the game in an uh, anonymous way too, you can actually play these games anonymously and, and be honest and not worry about necessarily being exposed for your truth because uh, there's a lot of shame and, and stuff like that in our current culture or shaming and so that's where we can start getting some really profound stories coming out that otherwise would not have ever been told or even read um, but hopefully people will take advantage of that and, and it's very cathartic to write in that kind of fun literature style there's a really funny combinations of things so like uh, the story of being the mega acrostic so this acrostic is not just an acrostic with the first letters of um, of each sentence but every letter or, or every word has an acrostic with all the other words going down the story so it's it's really intense and then there's like another version of the acrostic which is called the supreme acrostic where it's it might be hard to read this but it's an acrostic with every word and every sentence being an acrostic and then it says it's an acrostic with words inside each sentence for all sentences as well so it's an additional and then of course there's the highest level here which is the supreme speculative acrostic where you have those first two condi conditions but the third condition is, is the palindrome um, of each acrostic so that means that it's an acrostic but the acrostic is the same read both ways <laughs> And uh, not only that, but another one is that um, all the words have to be Janus words, which are also um, reflexive, so they're, they can be read forwards and back. So it's like a lot of stuff going on in this. This is an extremely sophisticated and difficult fun literature, but some of our literature prize winners of the past or Pulitzer prize winners or people who have a natural gift for this kind of stuff might find it really, it'll put them maybe into flow because the challenge level is high enough for the skill level. 
and that's where we start getting these flow states at all levels, high levels, low levels, everything. Everything is, it's meant to be universal. That's what spirit is. So there's many more to come. I'm sure people will think of much more clever combinations, but it's, it's to get the mind um, thinking about the true potential of these funlatures and that maybe once we get away from the spreadsheets, we start creating apps and it's, it's well designed, it'll become even more fun and that our life experiences will start to become like this and we can start having autotelic types of games, autotelic personalities. Um, even when we're not working on these universal prizes and we're going to parties or hanging out with people or, you know, conversations or just people using different fun literatures. Cultures are like basically fun literatures. There's certain types of norms and, and stuff that, uh, not norms or practices that entire groups of people uh, agree upon. Language games, basically Wittgenstein's sort of language games that seem arbitrary, but we're thinking there might be something more universal going on here. Um, but okay, I hope that makes some degree of sense. And we're, we're, if you want to know how, how many derivations there are, this is like 11. So there's 11 derivations of this one type. And we can track how many fun literatures there are um, to give people an idea, idea of the incredible amount of diversity that we're embracing, despite doing all the sort of philosophical essencing and bringing people together in oneness and, and all this sort of totality, finding the, the beauty in the in the diversity we're doing both at once the unifying and the diversifying through things like this oh and here's another thing too i'll just mention this in terms of the novel economics prize so so if we don't so in terms of the pareto games uh, of course people who have higher iqs and, and education and all that stuff will win basically every every fun that you're game they'll be able to think up the combinations faster they're permutating things faster so it it starts to become boring. It starts to become a separation in society again. But we can create fun literatures that specifically state what the Pareto level is. So for instance, this one's called the story of being hard. So it has to be intimate, meaning that the people who are in it write about their life experience. And it, they don't have to give real details, like where they lived or whatever. It's, it's, it can still be a, a, true, a true sort of fiction. Uh, but then they can step, stipulate the Pareto level. So here it says Pareto all uh, must be under five. So that means all those categories, uh, where there's the first five, the aesthetic, the social, the wealth, the body, and the culturedness, or the IQ, um, all of them have to be uh, out, of, out of a 10 score. It has to be five or below. So it means it's low. That means they're choosing a hard, a sort of hard game to play in terms of life. And it means they have like, less than half of privilege in all their areas and that's a certain type of life experience so the people who write, write under this fun literature have to be those types of people and they can use a universal language and then we can do this again and, and specify Pareto wealth only the wealth categories under five the other categories can be whatever so you sort of get the poor at least in the financial life area writing this type of story and it's called the story of being poor and then you can do uh, another derivation which is called the story of being rich so the Pareto is all areas are above eights, um, including wealth, beauty, all that kind of stuff. And then there's like really extreme combinations, like the story of being ideal gods, which is writing about their real life experience. And it's human beings that have Pareto scores of all tens. So this is basically people that have it all. You, could, you would think funniness, they're, they're beautiful, they're sexy, they're smart, um, they're kind. They're socially likable, popular, um, they're wealthy, uh, they have high, you know, high IQs and all this type of stuff, and they're just lovable. So people want to be jealous of them, but they're so amazing to be around. They're charismatic, their charisma and their gravitas, and you know, they like to make everybody around them feel amazing. So you want to be around these people, and this kind of feeling, these people are amazing at creating flow states. And so this is as close as you can kind of get to ideal versions of, of being gods on earth, um, if you want to put it that way. Demigods are just really powerful people that are sort of lovable. So you can create any versions uh, of this that you want. There's many, many versions. In fact, you could probably just do permutations across them, but you can start mixing it with different types. You can mix it with this one and this one and create, you know, many types. But it's what it does is it makes it so that, you know, you can have an entire story written by the poor. And then you can see how the poor would write a story or, you know, you can start contrasting different ways of living based on the way people are writing their stories. And it could be in a, 
an incredibly powerful ethnographic and auto ethnographic tool for any of our social scientists out there. But it basically just says there's a place for everybody. Everybody is an essential moment of spirit and the meaning of their experience is invited in. And that's what these fun literatures have the power to do. Okay, so um, you can also see these graphs of, of comparing which ones are the most popular, how often they're used. So their tracking scores can be here quickly and then we can start seeing trends um, for each type. Maybe, maybe people will naturally gravitate to a couple of these and we'll have to figure out why and it'll be very interesting and intriguing. Um, so this is the fun literature. This is a very big piece of the Nobel Literature Prize. This is what uh, we think is new. So you're supposed to select one. So you pick a story and you select the fun literature that you want to play under and then you go to the scheduling. And once you go to the scheduling, uh, maybe you want maybe you couldn't pick a fun literature. Maybe none of them are fun. So you can actually go here and you can build one. It's sort of like build your own pizza or build your own Build-A-Bear or something. And uh, I'm not invested in any of those companies, so that's not a plug for anybody, but it's a combinatory thing. So you can see that we listed from, there's a website that we, we sort of, there's a couple of websites that we pulled these from, so um, we would love to put their links here. But uh, there's the basic literary devices, poetry devices, prose devices, repetition, and there's all these uh, literary forms. And so there's metaphors, you can click on them and actually go and read about them. So if you don't know what they are and you want to build your own fun literature, or you have one in mind, you can click here. Oh, here's the website we took it from, writers.com, thank you. And uh, you can learn about what each form is and then start building your special kind. And you can make it as big as you want, small as you want. But if it's too big, people might not want to play it. And so not only can you pick individual like literature, literature forms, you can, you can do these macro macro forms too, like combining a sonnet with a with a um, golden shovel or a, a bop or a blues or there's many different forms. These are just um, some listed here, and uh, of course we have all the fun lectures listed. So you can go back to that main page if you want. And here's like some of the the early ones. We can list them all here. Some of the most popular ones here that people can pick. And then what we're going to do is, um, of course, we have the trust score up here because the trust score is really important. And we actually repeat the uh, spirit agreement here, the spirit license at the top so people know what they're contributing to, if they contribute their talents. The gold is the current story or competency level that has the highest uh, synchro density score, the highest number of meanings per sentence or per word. And um, we also give the scores, uh, you can read it too. This one so far, we have the lullaby as an example but I'm sure there'll be combinations that can beat this. But uh, we rank it in terms of also how many people play each type of fun literature. So you can get the highest synchro density for the story, sentence, and word versions. At competency level one, there's 79 meanings um, for a group of one. So one person basically wrote uh, or played this fun literature. So they, they got 79 meanings by themselves, which is pretty good in terms of a story. So the story has 79 meanings or a synchro density. And then in terms of a sentence, their, their most meaningful sentence in that story is 47 or even maybe a different story, but one sentence has 47 ways of interpreting it. It's pretty good, but I'm sure it'll get higher. And then you have uh, words to this word art stuff that we're gonna get into. So we're tracking, uh, we're trying to give people a lot of feedback, immediate feedback as part of the flow criteria in that we're competing in a cooperative way so you have this nice cooperative, we're building stories together for the Nobel Literature Prize, but you're also, we have this fun little competition. So it's about, it's about winning, but it's also about how we play the games, the flow state. And so we're doing it for groups of one, but we're also doing it for groups of two. So they can play the exact same fun literature, exact same gaming, and, uh, or exact same sort of sentence and rewrite it with two players. And then they, they would also get tracked because it might be harder or different than a one player game and each one has its own special dialectics and then groups of three can have their highest levels and groups of four and groups of five and groups of six and maybe groups of hundreds and uh, it'll be very interesting to track that and then here's the actual scheduling part and we went through this in the previous slide but now it should be a little bit more clear how to schedule these games with more of the details so you can join a game that already exists. Maybe your fun literature is already scheduled and you want to join a game and your Pareto scores match up. But then um, if you want to create your own, then all you do is you, you put, okay, this is open so far. 
and you're going to schedule it for January, who knows, the Nobel, the Nobel deadline, let's say, Nobel nomination deadline, January 31st. And uh, you want it to play for, who knows, you know, it's, you, have, you want to play after work. So you're going to play from 7 to, for an hour, uh, p.m. Um, UTC, let's say. And so you went to the story. If you, if you don't know what the story is, right, there, the link is here too. So you can click this and go back to the stories, right? There they are, pick one. So um, we're going to pick story, uh, story number one. And if you want to create a new story, it's a pretty big, you have to, you have to duplicate the, the folders. So you have to download these, um, the, the template that you want to copy, or even the, the blank one, and you copy it, or you download it, and then you upload it again, and then you just do all the renaming, and you have to go through it and, you know, fill out, fill out the polished papers or clear them, or fill out the drafts constructor and all this kind of stuff. So it's a little bit of a process to start up a whole new story. It's like starting up a whole new universe, a whole new uh, narrative, narrative universe. Um, it, it might be easier just to start up a, 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 a subversion of an already existing story or even an existing sentence. But you have a lot of freedom depending on how confident you are, or how much time you have. So we're going to pick story 1.0. Or maybe for fun, let's do 1.1. That's a derivation of story 1.0. Um, maybe it's in German or something, or uh, Sudanese. So let's say um, we want to play now. And so we have to pick a game template. So you're going to have to, there's going to be like a, an ID numbers, uh, an ID number here. So I think so far the games are at four. And we're figuring this out sort of as we go and you can help pitch in. But this is where, you know, if you add a new game, the number should increase. And this is where everybody goes to know what kind of number. So if, if we make, uh, so this is game number four, let's make this game number five. So then we would change the number to five. Okay, this five, good. And then we would say, okay, well, what kind of furniture is this game gonna play under? Well, let's do this one, furniture number six. Actually, let's do, let's do the super hard one. Um, actually, yeah, let's do the super hard one. Let's say furniture number 18. And then all you do is you come here and you just paste it in the cell like so. And uh, I think that's how it works. And okay, so that's done. And then you say what kind of language you want to play in because people all around the world could maybe see this. And if there are hundreds of like thousands of people or hundreds of people playing this, we'll have to have maybe multiples of these, but uh, a better coordination system. But while we're still starting it up in the hardcore, the early adopters come in. This will be good enough. So let's say we'll play it in English. And now you get to choose what kind of competency level. Now the competency level will be sort of covered more. And well, it was already covered in the Nobel Literature Prize. So let's go back there quickly to the presentation and, and check what we mean again by the competency score, um, which is right here. And it's these ontologies, right? So. So this is the competency one, it's simple. It only has the top level, the absolute syllogism in terms of the shape space. So this is logic, nature, spirit, and you write a sentence. Uh, or you can choose competency two, which is unpacking into the next level of complexity, or number three, number four, number five. So these are the first three. And as you can see, it gets complicated pretty fast. The higher the competency, the more work you have to do. But the more, more meanings you get per story. Uh, and I think the Nobel Prize one has to have, uh, I think, competency three and higher, um, at least in the beginning. So let's say we're going to take competency three, competency three. And uh, the next one is the Pareto stuff, so or the, the meaning version. So there's three different ways, three different levels to play to play the games. And uh, we can cover that in a bit here. I'll show you. But basically, there's level 1.7, 1.8, 1.9. And 1.9 1 is the most hardcore. It's the ever-living meeting style. And it's we're going to go through it here. We didn't go through it in the simple version. Uh, but here, we're going to show it. Because this is the Nobel Prize-worthy stuff. So ever-living. Actually, you don't even need to put ever-living meetings. But we're doing this for examples. So people can get used to it. And then there's a rule set that has to be... Uh, copied so if you're if you want to set a certain kind of Pareto limit it'll either come from the furniture or you can select it out of the um, 
part of the, the tracking pages for that thumbnature. So this would be the, the Pareto grids. And um, you can copy the rule set from the tracking sheet of your Pareto. This one doesn't really have one yet, but if you wanted to choose grid, grid number, who knows, 1.1 or 1.0, which is like the hundred, the hundred tens, right? Uh, that means all the players have to be tens. So then this category here, once you set the Pareto, um, this category here, the executor column, this is the person that actually is the moderator of the meeting. But in ever living meetings, you don't just have an executor, you actually have four different types of positions. And these positions help mo make sure the group flow is really high across all the life areas. And remember those 11 life areas. So we have an executor, in this case, it's this guy named Spirit Man. Then the influencer is not chosen, the strategist isn't chosen, and the relationship builder is not yet chosen. That's why this column is gray, uh, red. It's because until this is green and we get enough, this ever living meeting can't be scheduled. So if, it, if these criteria aren't met by the date, then the, the game doesn't happen because it doesn't meet the criterion or the person who defined the game. Um, but these, uh, the executor, influencer, strategist, and relationship builder are traditional roles um, of high performance teams. And so you have people looking after the, the strategy, uh, you know, all parts of how to have a great meeting as you're playing the game. And then the last column is the actual players. So this is where people come in. And so if you put, put grid 1.0, let's just say, let's just say that's going to be the executor. And um, um, we have to pick players in terms of the rules. So once the rules are set, you can kind of paste them here and then players can come in and say, okay, well, I want to take position. I, I'm a, let's say one of the rules, I guess we don't have them for this, but let's say somebody was rule number, I don't know, one is the Pareto rule where somebody has to have like a, a, a seven in their um, um, culturedness column. So then maybe somebody would come in and they'd be like cultured, cultured um, hero or some culture hero. Yeah, culture hero, we'll call this person's screen name. Okay, so that person is meeting one of the rules. And once all the people are, are in the right positions and it satisfies the Pareto and the, the meeting style, then it becomes green. Or if you want to join a game, you can just put your name up here and join a game. But uh, once it becomes green, then you can play your game down here. So you want to make sure that on the day of everything is kosher. And um, that's basically how you, you, you schedule a game right now before we turn this into an app and, and garner some attention. Uh, here's the actual reali reality check scores to kind of prove that these players are, are meeting the criterion. So A means aesthetic, it's a two. Uh, social means a four. W means um, wealth, five. B means body, seven. C means culturedness, it's a one, and then um, IQ score is a six, and then their total Pareto reality check for those universal categories is a 25. So that's their total, and that's what this column means. Um, you can also, the logic nature of spirit um, is just to track which universals like are, are being covered in the story, and if the story is, is becoming complete. So that's basically how you, at a base minimum, schedule a game in the more complex way where we're doing the Pareto stuff and we're doing the ever living meeting styles. And um, once people get used to it, it should start getting easier, especially as the trust levels go up. The Each template is also being changed. We're sublating the system as a whole as part of the economics prize. So we have a, a ticket number system, a universal ticket number system. So as things upgrade and change, everybody is given time to catch up to the upgrade. It's part of the, the new uh, encyclopedia of the philosophical sciences that when we upgrade, we're not just like letting people, you know, try to keep up. We're actually taking care of the people who have maybe lower IQs or are more vulnerable or whatever. We're, we're measuring these things to make sure that the societies don't leave anybody behind. If they want to be left behind, well, then that's a part of self-determination. But once people experience flow and that they are doing it through their autotelic personalities and that they have control over how to design these games, then I think people will feel a lot more fulfilled in a way that the current society, or at least the global current culture, the current global spirit is not satisfying. Um, so that's how you schedule a game once you're ready to play. So now we'll, we'll go into actually playing the game. So you can play the game at three different levels, at the word level, the sentence level, and the story level. 
So the scent, the word level is the sort of, um, I guess you could say in a way, the simplest level. But we're playing it at a, a higher meaning level. So this is the full kit and caboodle of the true sophistication behind these games. This is what the executor and the moderator will do. Uh, people who are just starting out might just have like the sentence on the screen or the, the, the picture on the screen uh, stream somewhere. But if people feel overwhelmed, this is what the executors are trained to, to fill out and people just like say what sentences and they follow the rules, right? So this is basically how to start playing the game full blast. So this is an ever-living meeting style. This is the highest level. So ELM stands for ever-living meeting. Of course, we have the trust scores that are updating across all the documents because um, we want to feel like a team. This is New World Spirit gaining trust from everybody as they're playing these games and feeling like we're we're embracing their truth as a moment as an essential moment. Uh, but there's more um, things to track in this version, whereas in the first version, it's very simple. You don't have all this extra stuff. You have two rules a couple of turns and then you track some of the meanings that's it but now we have these fun literatures we have these universal hegel stuff and we have all these flow state meaning rules which provide a high level of, of self-determining the rules stay the same though there's really only uh well there's four rules but there's two player rules and two sentence rules so like we said before in each turn that each person gets they can add a word modify a word or remove a word in the in the sentence or the picture and then they have to, number, rule number two is justify that change. So in the word level, we're doing this on one word. We're not doing this as a sentence. So whatever change, they, they add something to the, the picture, they modify something in the picture, or they remove something in the picture, do it after a while. And then uh, sen sentence rule number one is that the universal must have a, or the sentence must, or yeah, the sentence itself must have a universal. Maybe we'll make that true for words too. But if there is a universal in the word or as the word, it'll, it'll be more eligible for the Nobel Prizes or the Universal Prizes afterwards. Then we have sentence rule number two, and that means that you have to meet all the rules of your fun literature and that the checklist of the rules has to be met. So this is kind of where the checklist is. So this is the fun literature, um, number 11 in this, term, in this game. Uh, and then we have all 11 of the rules um, Kind of listed how we met them in terms of this graphic this is not really aligning yet uh, it's just an example template template but um, in terms of an acrostic we can say well this picture has an a in it so it forms the acrostic art with three other sentences in other games so if you change if you change this all to a different word then you could be ruining three other sentences so you have to be really careful as we're building stories together and it makes it a little bit more fun because we're working together with other teams simultaneously but then an auditor, somebody will have to come along and double check that they actually met these criterion and kind of sign off to say, yep, this meets the criterion. And then they could be eligible for that 90,000 with the spirit license and getting their life figures all good to go. Uh, it, it also has the date played. Um, so we can keep track of those particularities. And uh, in terms of the flow rules, so each game is timed has a time limit because it could go on for a long time people will get tired so the long flow timer is how long the game will go entirely and then the turn time so how long each turn is but there's a t here one t means one turn but in terms of the ever living meeting rules you can change these by voting every cycle or like once every player gets a turn that's a cycle they can renegotiate the rules of the flow of the game Whereas the previous lower levels aren't this complicated. It's just like, nope, we set 60 minutes and everybody gets five minute turns and it doesn't change during the game. Um, but here you can change not only the length of the turn, but you can also change the manner of the turns from a turn base to a free flow. And we're still tracking the times of each individual. Uh, each turn, yeah, whatever it is, one minute here. Here it's a one minute turn. So that means as each player gets their turn, they only have one minute to add, modify, or remove, and then uh, within that minute also justify the change and the meaning that they're adding with it and that meaning gets written down here with the, the words but here's the there's six rules to the ever living meetings overall so this is about the style of the meeting and then this is about qu the qualifying the actual um, content of the what we're building together these um, player rules and sentence rules but these flow rules there's six of them 
So the first rule is that everybody gets the same what's called block time, which means that by the end of the meeting, 60 minutes, let's say there's um, you know, three players, each player has a block time of 20 minutes. And by the end of the meeting, everybody has their 20 minutes complete. Uh, no matter what the timing, no matter what the terms are, um, that's what that number one means, same block time. And if more people join the meeting, uh, these could get so flexible that people can take team, come in and out. So as we get more players, the block times will have to adjust and that makes it a little bit more complicated, but maybe more fun for the really advanced players. And then number two is gifting. You can actually give some of your time to other players that you think haven't had enough exposure, but it will reduce your block time, meaning that you'll get less time to speak and they'll get more because you're giving real time. Um, if you don't get what you want, so every cycle we take a vote. If you vote uh, as a one T, then you you and you wanted a free flow, then it's written down that if you get three three turns that don't um, resonate with what you want, then you get to veto at some point. And then number three is that so that those rules are nested as part of gifting. Then you get uh, the same flow turn. So if you decide in a cycle that everybody gets one minute per turn for one cycle, then everybody gets that one minute. You have to do the whole cycle like that, at least in terms of these initial versions of the ever living meetings. Um, and then you can actually change the length of the turns. So it could be five minute turns. If people vote, oh, they want you know six minute turns, uh, we we sort of take the majority. And uh, then you can change the nature. So turn as you go person by person by person, one minute, one minute by one minute. And they don't have to take their full one minute. They, if they do it in 10 seconds, it just moves to the next person and they get more block time um, at the end of the, the game. But you can also change it to free flow. So if you change this T to an F, free flow means that you don't take turns. People are just randomly saying, oh, I wanna change this word. I wanna add this word in. And it'll be hard for the, the executor, the moderator to keep up, but um, as long as it's civil and people aren't talking over each other, then it should still kind of go in turns, but the turns aren't structured in this order. It doesn't go player one to player two, player three, player four, you know, it could get pedantic. So a free flow is like player seven might make a change and player three might, and then eight likes that. And then it, it allows more freedom that people who get bored of the cycle uh, might want. But after enough free flow, people might get tired of the free flow so they can, they can set a time for their free flow. So they can say, well, we want to do free flow for only 10 minutes. So another free flow timer is set up and after 10 minutes they can do another vote and they can say, oh, we're tired of free flow, it's too crazy, let's go back to a, a, a turn base, but one minute's too short, let's do a three minute turn. And if they all vote on that, then everybody gets three minutes instead of one. So it provides an incredible amount of flexibility and self-determination that makes the games continue to feel alive. And uh, this is sort of the, the point of, of it. So the the last three rules, the flow rules, are these um, bills of wisdom rules where, number one, um, there's these four rules that make these meetings even better. So there's the executor who keeps track of the timings and, and you know, if people go over time, they, they make sure that the meetings go over and or don't go over and that they meet the, the long flow timer of times, they aim for the 60 minutes. And then the influencer is to summarize and to provide inf inspiration and and sort of provide a design element that makes things more fun. Um, or they're just better communicators in some sense, maybe funnier or um, if the, the conversation is stagnated, then maybe they can galvanize it or um, build some kind of cohesion. And then the, the strategist is the person that sort of tracks all the scores and does all the analytics and, and kind of makes sure the fun literatures are met and. They're the ones that are writing down the meanings and making sure that all the meanings that are being said and added are actually documented correctly and accurately in terms of what what is being added and what the explanation is. And then uh, number three is that um, because these meetings are very humanistic and we're doing a holistic, comprehensive approach, uh, people don't just have to have conversations about you know adding a word. It can be very you know personal. They can start talking about their life areas, like how's your your family doing in the in the pandemic? How uh, how's your physical life? How's your diet? How's your weight gain or weight loss? How's your physical routines? How's your political engagement? How, you know, we have the 11 life here. So people can kind of go through one round getting to know each other at the beginning of the game. And then they can actually start playing um, depending on however they want to play it. And so those are the three other rules. Um, and there can be like a, a video chat up here. Somebody can be on 
some kind of video platform and uh, the, the executor could be up here and they can be whatever. If, if, if this, the Pareto meeting says that they have to be a, a you know, a six uh, in terms of uh, aesthetics or something, then they can show half their face up here. If people feel comfortable and the, the trust scores are high enough, they can regulate how much they want to show themselves. It's, you know, there's no real children uh, yet. There will be versions of this for children, but um, they can't really be this open because it could be it could be crossing boundaries. So we're just going to play it safe in the beginning and do these first trial runs with uh, mature, and uh, they can give consent or they don't need guardians. Okay, I hope that makes some degree of sense. Um, people can decide what their comfort level is, and we're going to try and rotate these so that people get an experience uh, across all types of human human life, um, I guess, experience. So. Now, to get to the next point here, the actual statistics are tracked here in these uh, in these columns. So you have number of words here, how many words are here, uh, what is the uh, the flow checks, how many vetoes there's taken, when was this template designed, because the templates also upgrade. This might become a phone app eventually, and then when that happens, we give time for people to upgrade. And uh, then we have like how many densities are in this uh, this story or this sentence or this this word. And then we have, you know, how much fullness. So fullness is one whole row is taken up here across all these literary meanings, color meanings, shape meanings, uh, other kinds of meanings. So literary meanings is sort of copying the, the sentence um, where this word is occurring. So there might be an acrostic. Uh, there might be some kind of lingo here, religious lingos, all in all. And then um, art, uh, lyrical poetry, and has to do with uh, Shakespeare or whatever the explanation is. So um, this is where we track all of this. And the more of these we have, the higher the synchronistic density is, the simultaneity of the sentence, which means it's more meaningful. It could be more meaningful. Um, so that's what we're, we're giving. Uh, we're giving all these numbers to measure. And th there will be more things to measure as the games get more advanced. But at a minimum, we want to get the synchro densities because that's how we determine which sentence makes it into the story and the Nobel Prizes. And it's a more objective criterion. And uh, not just playing favorites or something that ruins, you know, the credibility and gets into this nepotism that current society has. Uh, then we have the actual player columns here. So this is where the cycles occur, and this is the Pareto score. So this is the aesthetic, this is the social, this is the W with the wealth, uh, body, all these types of um, privilege, privileges that might be stated in the furniture. So, you know, with the first person, it says they have their numbers here, one, five, seven, whatever. And then the points are tracked in this column here, where you track how many ads the person did in the game so far, how many modifies, how many removes, how many assists. So it's not just about you getting the final words, you can actually line somebody else up. And if somebody else calls you out on that assist, then um, you all, all three of you get points. The person who, who made the edit, the person who lined up for the edit, and the person who, who kind of exposed the assist. And the person who exposes the assist can't be the person who did the assist. So it makes the, everybody work as a team. And then how many dissonances and how many uh, remaining meanings that are still in the sentence that people, like people can remove your word. So if your word goes away, then it's like all those meanings go away. So it's a, it can be a team bonding thing, but it's, it's also competitive because each person is trying to get the most amount of meanings. And so this is where the numbers are tracked. This person added six meanings during the game, um, or six words. They had seven modifies. They had five, five removes, and they had you know two assists. So this is their overall in the game so far after all the cycles have been played. And so here's the actual cycles. So cycle one, cycle two, cycle three, cycle four. And what's being checked for each cycle is something called a flow check. So remember with the Pareto rotations, where we um, where we were tracking all these furnitures, right? So if we go here and we track, uh, and we're tracking the. Oh, I hope I'm not freezing here. We're tracking the Pareto rotations, right? Remember, the point of these Pareto grids is to get people to rate how they feel during the meeting and then do an average. So these scores here are being created from these cycles here across all the players. So this person, uh, when they uh, did their cycle, 
uh, or cycle one, when they were going through cycle one, they rated cycle one as an eight out of 10. So they're feeling pretty good about how this cycle went. They liked it, um, they were content. And the, the type of cycle, it was a one, one turn base, so one minute turn base, and they felt this way. And then for cycle two, like let's say they, they, they get through all, every, every player should have this rating done by the time this column fills out here. But the, this person is like a one player game, so they're the only person playing maybe. Um, so that's why their cycles continue. But uh, in cycle two, uh, they are also uh, eight out of ten and one T. So they basically did one one minute turn base for the entire thing, which seems redundant redundant for one person. But uh, in teams, this will become much more significant. And here, for some reason, they're at a seven point nine. So this cycle didn't go as good for them. Something happened, and their flow wasn't quite as high. But overall, the average is that they're roughly at eight out of ten. And we're going to average the the flow scores for all the participants, and then the, the game as a whole gets a score. And uh, depending on the Pareto and the fun literature, we can start narrowing down what's contributing to what. And then whatever your meanings were, you are placed beside you. So these are the ones that this person contributed to this graphic. So this is like word art. So there's a, a NASA image in the back, and it's explained why they chose this image with this word all. So the color is that, you know, it's, it's black in a galaxy. The explanation is, you know, it's added because the meaning, it's adding the meaning of pure being, the universal, is immediate indeterminacy, and it is a void and a brightness of which nothing can be distinguished. The black represents the pure nothing, or the vastness of the brightness of uh, galaxies in this space, or in space. So it's a sensuous approximation for basically um, this universal here in the, in the side. And this is basically how you begin the game. You play it and you create meanings for the colors and the shapes. So, you know, the font here is uh, in the great vibes and there's a meaning for the great vibes and meaning of the space and we're tracking the totals here. So the more of these universals, uh, if you want it to be Nobel Prize worthy, it has to have at least one of these in the proper order of the ontology. So where you're choosing to write this um, has to match. And then, of course, the, the fun lectures have to be matched, and the strategist will hopefully help, or the executor will help with that. But then you just eventually create this little canvas around the word, and it has a lot more meanings. And it can be embedded in the next level of the game. So basically, the template stays the same. It's just the level that starts to change. And people will start to feel overwhelmed at this point, but it's pretty simple um, once people get used to it. This is just a totally new way of doing this, and now I hope... Uh, individuals can see, or at least we hope the individuals can see that there are literally six Nobel Prizes worthy of development here. So now let's open up the next template, which is the sentence level. So we played it on the word level. And let's say we selected another, uh, another template here. So this is the sentence. So this is the ever living meeting style. So this is happening like a 1.9 level. We have the trust scores as usual. This is across the entire New World Spirit. So everybody in the world who's playing this, this is the trust scores with them. It's not just like your individual trust scores, but basically everything is the same. We still have two player rules, two sentence rules, and uh, we have the flow state rules and the executor strategist and the date played and the long flow timer, the, the uh, basically the turn timers or free flow timer and then the number of words and all the, the statistics and then the player column and uh, then the cycles. And then you can see that the meanings, there's more meanings that this player contributed to this, this game. And you can see that now we have more colors. So the fun literature is actually in uh, magenta, I think, or pink, purple. And uh, you can see that the word art is in its own sentence along with just the liter literature version of the sentence. So you can interchange them depending, but to have the words readable, it's just listed here in plain font. But this sentence has its own ID, just like every word has its own ID. So this one's sentence zero one. And um, this is happening, I think, at competency level. It was scheduled at competency level one, so it's a lullaby sentence. And so, of course, we have all be beginning with logically being in the beginning and grew up becoming nature thinking home, uh, thinking, leaving home, disagreeing. And so logically is the universal word, it has a word art version of it. 
And you can see here that we have the logic is the first universal of uh, the lullaby, of the ontology of it. And then we have um, two more references to the science of logic in the story, but they're in a darker gold or orange because they're not the primary. This has to, this universal has to be in the sentence in, in order for it to make logical sense with the other sentences that this belongs to. So this is like the first sentence, but the other two sentences will follow um, the other ontologies, or it'll follow this ontology in this order, but with a different universal. It's a lot to take in, I know, but hopefully somebody will, will grasp this and Really, people who are playing the games will really only have to track a couple of rules. But we still have the acrostic, and you can see that now in terms of the entire sentence, like this word might have had, I think it had, what, eight meanings? But now in terms of the entire sentence, we have quite a few, 14, and the colors represent, you know, this, this um, blue means that if you change this word, this end rhyme, for instance, then you could be messing up the end rhyme of the other sentences. So be very careful when you change the, the ones that have blue colors in them. Um, be careful about changing anything that has yellow. If you change the yellow, it won't be part of the, the story, really. Um, that's what gives a kind of co cohesion to the hero's journey uh, across all types of cultures because it's, a, it's that shape dynamic. Uh, of course, uh, with alliteration, it can occur with multiple words. You can have repeating uh, meanings. And then you're making sure you're providing an, ex an explanation and then the person who made the change. So with this template, uh, at the time, it didn't, it didn't have the names. Uh, we didn't upgrade this template, but now they're upgraded. So now you put your name down here, and this way we can keep track more easily where to put the meanings. And you just go through and get as many as you possibly can. And the synchro density just means how many layers of meaning you can get per symbol, basically. And those that are have the most meanings will will win. But there's a, a kind of a caveat here that you can you can get a lot of meanings packed into a sentence, but they could be ugly sentences. They could be very choppy still. So in the rating system, there's actually a, one more rating that once the game is played, people can vote on what's called the elegance of the sentence or the eloquence too. So you can see here, once the game finishes, uh, it has a synchro density of 16, but it has an elegant score of 4 out of 10. So it's not very elegant. They could have just mashed a bunch of things together. So um, this score, these two scores together, are really what will determine which sentences get chosen. And it had a pretty high group flow, which is great. So groups that have low flows, we want to figure out why they were uh, low and then start creating better grids, better games. So now we're creating a whole sentence. And you can see how we're threading the word art with the sentences and that these sentences are linked together in the stories. And people can be writing these simultaneously in different games. And the executor's job is to move between uh, other executors who are communicating on the story and they're coordinating the groups to make sure that they're in flow and not writing over each other and, and deleting meanings that are good ones. Um, so anytime you, you, unless you're removing a word, um, you should always be building on other people's meanings so that we get this kind of building structure. And that's sort of the, uh, that's sort of the goal. So this is the next level of complexity, the sentence level. Now, if we go up one more level to the story level, uh, we're going to try and, um, we're going to try and write the sentences in a coordinated manner, which will start mapping out the entire ontology. So for this video, because um, we're a little bit time crunched, and this is the first one we're making, I guess the, the link to the, the story is not quite uh, up. So let's log back into the story folder, and let's go and find it. So. Uh, games are here. Oh no, let's go to the draft constructor. So the draft constructor is where we're putting all the sentences together. So here's the ontology here on the left hand side. Well, basically starting from the top, this, this uh, template's a little bit different than the other two because we're coordinating entire games now. And so we have the executors of the entire story. They're watching over all the sentences. They're sort of like a bird's eye view. 
and they put their names down and how long they're going to be in a shift that they want and you can see their personal profile so you can see their if they're doing okay or whatever it's, all, it's up to everybody everybody can play this game at whatever level they feel comfortable because it's all anonymous if you want it to be um, then there's these like two red squares and these are called um, well we can call them whatever we want um, I was working with a, another individual and uh, we can change these these names but we're really big on synchronicity and like resonating together creating a, a group collaboration and so what happens is this resonance chamber is linked to the, the higher level which is like the pure combining story levels and so the executors of that level are communicating with the executors in this level and they're leaving messages here it's like a little chat to say hey somebody wants to make this change can we make this change and if it messes up too many meetings this person can make the judgment said no that's not a good change if it is a good change then they can uh, communicate to the individual executors in the actual games who are designing the sentences in real time. And they can leave a message for them here saying, hey, this person wants to make this kind of change. And um, the executor who's playing in the sentences will have this sheet open and they can kind of see it. And they can tell their group members, hey, somebody wants to change this word to this. And um, if it's on somebody's turn, they can decide to do that. And then the people who suggest the change will get points. The person who makes the change and then the person who suggests the change, uh, whether it's an add, a modify, or a remove. And then their explanation has to make sense. So these point systems are going to be flushed out more as we play the game and work it out. But for now, this should be enough to get the initial sentences going and the initial scoring system going. For this story, every story has a version. So every time the sentences change, the version changes because the story is literally changing. And um, you can see that the, the story is being written at different levels of competency. So in terms of competency, one, it's completed. So there's a sentence uh, at each part of that competency level. So in the first one is the simplest, it's the lullaby. It's just logic, this universal nature, this universal and spirit. All these other universals in here are not being written. So that's why only the competency one is completed because there's one, one written sentence for each one. And to, in total, the density, is, the synchro density is 79. 79 simultaneous meetings happening in one sentence. And it's uh, under front furniture number 11. So in terms of competency one of this story, um, each one of these is written in fun literature number 11. So that fun literature is completed so far. But nothing else is really happening. Like it's 4% complete. People are trying to write these other higher levels, but they're, they're not done yet. And you can kind of get an idea of how complete the entire story is uh, if you add up all these percentages. So what we're tracking here now is the sentence ID, the fun literature that is being used, and uh, the game history. So really in the other versions, the, the fun literature was listed here and you can click on it. Fun literature number uh, 11. And then you can click on the link and immediately go to the tracking sheet and see how much it's used and what, what is the actual um, style. But the furniture is only of the game that is the current highest synchro density. So this one is at uh, synchro density 19. So if somebody writes a sentence and the synchro density is a 20, then this whole sentence gets replaced. Right, so then the, the game number gets replaced. So if you want to see how the game was played, if you want to figure out how they got to 19, you can actually click on the template and see how the game went down and how it finished. And this is what it looks like. Right, so it's a very quick way to check um, basically an amazing amount of meaning coordination and life should be meaningful. We have a meaning crisis right now in the world. It's leading to existential crises. But you can also click the history so not only can you see the, the current winning sentence, but you can see all the other sentences before it that were previous winners and uh, the words as well. So you can get a history of each sentence of this story. And so you can really see in real time human beings making meaning together and getting points and having game and getting their life areas and getting satisfied in all these different ways um, that are pretty Nobel Prize worthy. So to help to help keep the coordination uh, heuristic and quick, the colors are are underneath each word to represent how it's connected to the other words. So, of course, uh, blue means that this, this first word is connected to all the other first words of the other three sentences at this competency level. 
So there's three other sentences that are relying. That's what the three means. So if you change this, you could be ruining the meaning of three other sentences. So of course we're spelling art. All has an A. Restless is an R. And then through or though is a T. So A-R-T spells the acrostic. Um, then purple means that this is a, a fun literature word. If you change this word, you might actually ruin the fun literature. So you want to be careful. It's not necessarily linking to the, any, any of the other sentences, but it gives you an idea of the synchro densities just with colors in a one glance. And you can see that there's another linking word to other sentences, and it's this end rhyme, you know, disagreeing, uh, fleeing, and freeing. So you want to be careful changing those. And there's another internal rhyme, well-being, unseeing, and I think being again is it, or I think it's thinking. And then of course the, the yellow is the universal. You change this and you might ruin the qualification for the Nobel Prize entirely. So you got to be really careful with these uh, yellow ones. And they're different, right? Spirit, nature, logic, it lines up with the ontology. The universal Hegel stuff, logic, nature, spirit, right in the hero's journey. And you can see they're different games because they're all different sentences. Each sentence is itself a game. So this is number two. And you can see that number three is where the, the highest meaningful sentence is, was constructed. So this is the most meaningful sentence currently, all of all the sentences constructed with a meaning of 48 sent synchro densities for one sentence is pretty amazing. It's, it's got 2.6 meanings per word, and there's 18 words in this um, sentence. So the sentence itself goes, though be inning knew better, matured into spirit wisdom forever, and returned home in well-being so free. That's a lullaby sentence, but this one sentence has 48 ways of interpreting it, and they're all listed here on the side. There's a lot of philosophical interpretations, religious interpretations, hero journey, art. You can see them all listed here. And if you want to read what they are, um, you can. They're all like, like this word here, better, has one, two, three, four, five, six, seven meanings. And they don't all happen linearly. You can see they all have different numbers. It goes from 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, and then jumps to 29 and then 46. So as it started getting harder to find more meanings, it took longer turns to, to get to them. And that's what these numbers show. And you can see which numbers have the most amount of uh, synchro densities. So uh, you can get a really quick snapshot of, of what's happening. And there's a physics reference in here. Uh, with a comma so even commas and punctuations can have meanings you just have to explain it quite well and uh, this, the explanations are quite in depth and uh, you can read them if you open these templates but um, this is the most meaningful sentence so far and it should meet uh, at least most of these criteria actually it doesn't it, there's two that were missing and so that's how you can very quickly check the history of the sentences and do your own auditing or if you're amazed how can they get to 48 wow then you can you can see what kind of art went into it what kind of process and you can also see uh, what games are coming to challenge the current winners so um, the current games being played back in january 10th this should be updated but as an example uh, when we get more volunteers this will be easier to keep up to date but basically um, games 1.1 uh, games 1.2 and games 1.3 are being played simultaneously all in sentence one. They're all vying for how to write this sentence uh, of story number one um, to get a higher synchro density than 19. So they're all competing and they're, these are their, their, their numbers in terms of the, the game. So, so 1.1 is building off of this game. So they're making a copy of this game. And they're, they're not going to rewrite an entire sentence. They're going to duplicate this sentence and then just try and do modifications or removals um, to build off the sentence and not start from scratch. So all three of these are doing the same. Um, but their actual numbers are, this is game number four. Out of all the stories being played at the same time, story two, story three, uh, this is the fourth game, the sixth game, and the twelfth game. So every game has its unique identifier, even though it's being linked to the other games that they're building off of because we're, we're creating a chain of histories on each sentence. So it's it starts to add up and it, it feels pretty <laughs> complicated at first, but human beings are doing this all the time. This is why language, we're sloppy with our language, especially with the universal logic inside of it. It's amazing that human beings can communicate at all. And so this is why we're providing a new way to train um, students how to create meanings and be very aware and precise in their 
and their communication when they want to be clear. And if they want to be uh, sloppy or, or choose a different form that's antithetical to form, then they can choose different funlatures or it, it allows that kind of freedom. And so you can see that the, the games are scheduled. So these guys are going to get an attempt and this game comes right after and then these two games come after. And the people who are the executors managing this can contact the executors of these games ahead of time and kind of let them know what's going on in terms of the upper part of the story or ideas that the executors can have. If they start seeing trends between the sentences, they can actually write their ideas down here and um, start making suggestions. And if the suggestions are taken up by the executors in the games, or maybe they are in the game, uh, they're in both at once, then they can make their own changes and then gain more points for their profile, but also gain more points for everybody working on the story as a whole in the bibliography. So you get this beautiful sort of back and forth between the universal, the particular, and the individual, uh, which to Hegel is the, the notion. That's when you know you're organizing things in the truth, in the spirit, or at least in a higher community spirit, a higher culture. And so it starts to get a little bit complicated, but that's basically how we're going to try and um, keep this immense meaning-making process in flow state. And as people get good at it, they'll they'll start to find really unique combinations and start communicating across each other and say, hey, did you see this? What do you think of this? Is this possible? Hey, what if we switch out this fun literature? And, and it's a really great process of recognition. And that process of recognition is really the beauty that we're trying to create here in mutual meaning-making. That's where peace starts to happen, even amongst diversities of ex human experience. Now, the only thing we really have to cover next or last, um, and whatever final synchro density is the highest, they, they are the ones that are occupying the polished paper. So the polished paper doesn't have any spreadsheet. It's really just the final product. It's just the sentences. Or if we decide to include the word art, that's fine. And if you want to track down the games that created them, then you can go and find them. This is what the Nobel Literature Prize Committee will probably see. And if they want to see the constructions, then they can actually click on the individual games. But really, this is the actual document, like a book or a poem or a whatever story, uh, whatever style we choose. Okay, so there's one level more of complexity. And um, it's about combining words and stories. So these are the what are called sub sublative templates. And so you can do it for the word, you can do it for the sentence, and you can do it for the story. But you can actually start combining and playing games about taking other people's work, which might be an honor to them, and uh, creating something new. So in this, at the word level, of course, we had our original word, and we're combining it with a different word in the same sentence, or potentially making novel combinations. Um, but basically you can see that we took elements from both of these and we made a third. And we're saying it's all with two little smiley faces because this smiley face is a yellow representing a universal and that they're somehow identifying a pattern that these L's might be universals in some sense and then they have to explain their meaning here. Um, but as an example, we haven't done that. We're just showing how to, how to combine the meanings. You can look at them too and say, well, this one's an acrostic and this one, has a universal in it so we're blending a universal and it gives you a nice way to combine the meanings in a hyper discrete way um, while creating a continuous work it's a nice dialectic and all artists are doing some version of this in their own sagacity so this is the word version of sublating two different prior arts and giving credit to the people and validating them everybody's getting ninety thousand anyway so it's not really a comp competition you don't want to hoard your ideas um, because every, the recognition should be rotated with the Pareto games and everything should be ma managed in a much better way. Here's the sentence version of combining two sentences together or sublating them. So here's one version of the sentence. And then if we scroll over, here's the middle combined version. And then if you go over, this is the, the second version of the sentence. And I pretty much just copied the sentences, but these will actually be different. And then they can quickly go back and forth and say, hey, this sentence has this uh, word here. Hey, what if we change that to this word's uh, second sentence? And, and then you can create a third one um, that hopefully is bigger than both of them together. It's just a way to, to bring them together in one template. And then the, the big kahuna is uh, when you're combining entire stories together. 
like we showed in the um, so using this template this is where we we go to the universal story folder and you can see that whatever we create with this template where we're taking the entire stories is what we point we put at the highest level the combined stories goes here so whatever we create goes here and uh, might be a little confusing at this point but hopefully people will see the true power of this so here's the sentences right a uh, comp competency level one one two three just a lullaby games uh games one two and three point one um, so 3.1 means that this is the second so there was a previous sentence here that was a 3.0 that was winning and this game somebody came with 3.1 and like modified the sentence to 47 and now their sentence is in here so the game number immediately kind of tells you the history a little bit um, so this one is done at this level and then there's the middle story where we're combining them and then here's the other story so these could be totally different sentences in maybe game one point uh, or story 2.0, right? 2.1. So we're combining maybe the Gandhi story. So these are sentences about Gandhi and we're combining the ontologies. So we might say, well, maybe this character actually meets Gandhi in this story. So this sentence will be about um, BB inning meeting Gandhi from this story using fun literature number 27 or something, which is a sonnet. Maybe they're falling in love or something. A metaphysical being with a you know a historical being that's an interesting combination so there's a, amazing amounts of combinations here where we can combine people's ideas together and actually show how we're combining them and then tracking the the scores and the version numbers so when you're combining stories the versions change fast because you're you can change lots of things you can even change the fun literatures the games everything is sort of flowing and the executors are going to get good at tracking that and um yeah, this is a this is a very advanced process where most people will probably not start and they'll constantly be improving. These templates will be upgrading as we're working the bugs out. But um, hopefully these meanings get tracked and, and result in something quite beautiful. So here's the meanings for the center one on, on why the executors made the changes they did. And these top layer guys um, might, be might be speaking with other combined stories, but they'll definitely be communicating downwards. This is the people that are in the individual templates and um, maybe if we have a script or something when we type here it'll copy it to the the normal story uh, somebody who's in like one of these templates up here one of the sentence templates so somebody in the sublating story will copy and and it'll show up to the executor here or or the executor in the actual story template here uh, my recording software is slowing down my computer, so I hope you don't mind. Um, oh, this is the scheduling one. Oops. I meant to click on this one. Oh, well, <laughs> I need to put this link in here. Uh, but anyway, this is how we're going to play this game with pretty much just six templates. I It might be a while before people start combining things together, but at least these six are fairly simple, and it's channeling an incredible amount of process. That might have been previously unimaginable before, but with just six templates, we can do uh, a lot. And I hope other people are. We hope other people can can uh, eventually master this and start making improvements and developing a a more fluid system before massive amounts of people play the game. But hopefully enough to get um, the Nobel Prize committees to start paying attention that we're doing something incredibly new here and. And it can be fun. <laughs> I think this is, if we do this right, uh, it will be fun. It, it won't get old because these ontologies that the science of logic is based on the idea of based economics, which is continually growing into the unknown in a qualitative way, which is changing the nature. It's constantly fresh. It's vital. It's new. It's not mechanical in the bad infinite. This is the genuinely infinite process of creating meaning and a story that never technically ends. It's sort of complete in terms of the universal shapes but it's always moving in itself. So uh, with the flow state criterion, with the universal shapes, with the fun literatures, and with this organized system of, of competition and cooperation, we're hoping to sort of sublate the adversarial competition and the, and the lack of sort of fun games and the meaninglessness in society in a very practical way that embodies all that theory we covered in the previous slides. 
So we lost one trigger, but hopefully uh, you're realizing that this is getting closer to the idea that, you know, this is pretty, pretty intense, but it just might work. Only one more stage to go. And if that was pretty complicated, this last stage is pretty much the, the last one where we add in a little bit more complication, but um, it should make sense and should tie everything together. So thank you for watching to this point and uh, we will see you in the next slide. Hopefully you're, if you have an autotelic personality, hopefully you're flowing with all this. Last but not least, we have arrived at the fifth and last stage of the stream of spirit and the overall guardian spirit video to create the Nobel surprise. Compared to the last slide, we are losing one more and our last trigger if you've made it this far. We burnt all 27 uh, that we began with in the first slide. And the reason why we're burning a trigger is that there are individuals who might look at this and get triggered because this spreadsheet here, this last one, was originally how we began presenting this to people. And everybody was overwhelmed. And so we decided it's not a great way to start. We should build our way up to it, but it is still one more spreadsheet. And it's a bit of a database, so it's hard to find other forms to do this without getting lost. At least the spreadsheet provides a coordinate pair to help guide people through the immensity of this. But of course, as we upgrade to the Worldwide Essential Workers app and these new uh, technologies, we should be able to make this a little bit more manageable uh, and to solve this uh, final problem of getting people to not just learn the theory, but also embody it in practice. And, uh, it's uh, it goes like this it says even highly educated and intelligent people whether in science or religion cannot agree and cooperate due to the finitude of sensuousness or sensuous symbols multiple holy texts and siloed academics a new world spirit is impossible and we are essentially scientifically and spiritually disabled uh, it sounds a little bit strange to say disabled, but if you look up the word or the, the term universal design, it already exists and it's based on um, accessibility for uh, those who may be disabled in terms of architectural design and designing uh, elevators where people can come in and out freely or stairs that have um, wheel, wheelchair accessible entrances, things like this braille for, for the blind might be incorporated into some designs. It's just make it universally accessible. And so we're saying though, that this doesn't just apply to physical disability or even maybe mental disability, but also a sort of spiritual disability, where even if your body and your mind seem to work right, there's an abstract logic that we're using that is sort of disabling us from this internal connection to the real science of the world we're in that incorporates our phenomenology, our anthropology and our psychology and our epistemology and our metaphysics and our ontologies and our, our meaning making and and our state making our civil society and families and art and religion itself along with philosophy itself in the process of trying to live by a higher wisdom a wisdom we desperately need right now because it seems like there is a lack of universal design across the planet that is leading to these abstract negations these oppositions that are leading to wars, wealth concentration we've never seen before. People are being left behind in depths of despair. We have this delusional sense of culture and valuation. And we're even destroying the planet to the point that we're hurriedly building space stations just in case things go horribly wrong here, um, which is very concerning. So this might be a a way to solve that, a new type of uh, universal design that is truly universal, even in that sense, where we can get even the highly educated and the intelligent to work with those in religion or what are con considered uh, impenetrable gridlocks, oppositional pairs, where science and uh, religion are one of the, are one of the uh, favors we asked in the beginning uh, when we made the, uh, the spirit agreement it's one of the, I think it's uh, in terms of the 27 dialectical epoch conflicts, the apocalypses, we call them for short. It's number um, uh, 15 is science and art. Okay, 14 is spirituality and science. So 
Um, we need to start getting people working and bridging these gaps and having a clear understanding of why they're different, but also why they, they're the same. And this hopefully final spreadsheet, as overwhelming as it might seem, hopefully bridges that gap because what we're showing is everything that we've covered so far in terms of the theory of the Nobel Prizes and trying to actualize it in this game process, whether it's the universal physics shapes um, that we show with Julian Barber's work in terms of fiber bundles and the super sensuous dynamic of it or sublation space where we have ratios that govern the absolute motion of things and positions and and hopefully connecting quantum gravity and or hopefully connecting gravity with uh, between general relativity and, and quantum field theory and time as well. Um, so we're calling this UPS1 and then the universal, whether it's the universal chemistry shapes, uh, the UCS, or whether it's the universal medical shapes we're considering, the UMS, or the universal prize shapes, which is the economics prize uh, as UPS number two, and then the universal meaning shapes for the literature prize, UPS, or U, UMS, oh, should be number two. <laughs> And then uh, universal piece shapes, uh, UPS number three. All of these look different in the different slides that we're winning the prizes on because they're treated as, as different and solid domains in contemporary uh, science. Uh, art is not seen as a science and science is not seen really as an art. Some people who are really in tune can make that sublation, but it's not really universal and it's mostly not, uh, an antithesis. And so what we're showing is actually they're all the same shapes. They're all just the science of logic. And we're just talking about them with specialized languages. They're called sensuous languages. And that sensuousness is the finitude that prevents us from realizing the universal essence or the shapes underneath these particularities or what look like particularities. They're sort of the fundlatures of science, you could say, if you watch the previous slide. So what this universal design document is going to do, if we click on it, is it's showing how we can coordinate this meaning making in a, in a way that's trackable despite the immensity. So here it is. This is the universal design document. And of course, like all the other documents, we have the trust categories at the top. These three big dialectics must be sublated or brought into real ratios of harmony because they're currently ripping things apart, as we talked about in previous slides. And then as the universal trust ratio goes up, then we can actually start accessing higher qualities of being in flow state together, which is in this living kind of spirit, rather than this abstract warring, this oppositional, painful version of refutation that is not this sort of plant-like unity where we're growing uh, in a truthful way. The true nature of the universe and the laws of the universe work in this growing kind of way. Um, so including the beginning of the universe itself with this Janus point concept or this opposition to the absolute idea, which then sublates itself into spirit, which is what we're trying to achieve. But first we have to galvanize this process of a deeper recognition, a universal meaning process that's underneath all of this infinite diversity that we can use as a methodology, but also a, an ontology and epistemology and a philosophy and an art and a religion to get to, to a, a kind of co cohesion while still having difference in preserving the beauty of that difference. So we have the first row as a guardian spirit row. So this is quite unwieldy. So we're gonna try and get people to, who are specialized in each area to, to sort of supervise a column or be the contact person for the column. And we have a couple of people here with their anonymous screen names. And um, we want it to be anonymous because at first the way abstract negation works, like we talked about in the smashing room, people in the beginning don't, un what they don't understand they negate until we develop real philosophical, genuinely philosophical consciousness. That's not this abstract egoic small self version of what philosophy has been pigeonholed into and why we're lacking a lot of wisdom in the world, despite it looking like we're making progress. There's very concerning inflection points coming if we don't upgrade our wisdom soon to keep pace. So the guardian spirits is what we sign first, and uh, then we start getting into the sections. So to, to make this document manageable, there's three main sections. There's these columns, which are called the simultaneity columns. 
and then there's this L column, which is this black transformation column. And then there's the f content and form, the universal content and universal form columns. So we'll tackle the first section first. So we have each column here represents a level of simultaneity uh, occurring. So simultaneity is sort of the secret sauce that galvanized a lot of this that brought together a lot of these uh, what you saw on the slides and it was because in this groundbreaking discovery or new reading of this philosopher Hegel the thing he's doing that's really hard to grasp is is the sameness in the difference the simultaneousness while things are changing and when the reader grasps that one of those final moments it starts to embody this what he calls speculative thinking this mysterious sort of mystical kind of thought that is not superstition but is a a new kind of science that doesn't normally grasp the universe in the simultaneity it usually grasps it in chunks or abstract pieces or like chopping up space and time and saying that space and time are separate things but then einstein comes and says no actually if you think about it they're they're, they're different, but they're the same. That's happening at the same time. There's a simultaneity going on there, and that led him to develop curved space-time models. So, and that's actually how the universe really seems to be, is in this like wonky sort of, you know, speculative back and forth between sameness and difference. And the empirical world actually seems to be this way. And Hegel, uh, well, Hegel was before Einstein, but Einstein showed in, in uh, more modern mathematics. But Hegel did that for everything, every domain. And so that's what we're trying to show here is the incredible level of simultaneity, simultaneity in all these diverse forms of knowledge that are in abstraction or, or treated as usually separate, except in the rare cases of interdisciplinarity and transdisciplinarity. So to start simply, the first column is showing the simplest form of simultaneity. It has a synchro density. So there's synchronicity in the world which is a uh, not only simultaneousness happening but it's a it's a meaningful simultaneity it's a reasoning behind the reasoning and you can treat that as a religious view you can think it's a god doing it. you can do it as yourself you can say it as your subconscious you can say it's nature just being a lot more clever than we are you can call it gaia you can you can make it ubermensch you can this meaning making process can happen in all those moments but the most simple one uh, we think is just this metaphysical grounding the true the only real scientific beginning that doesn't have an assumption that's unjustified or just faith-based only is this absolute negation moment that leads to pure being sheer immediate indeterminacy so the first uh, real sort of category that's repeating itself simultaneously over and over and over again is the pure category of sp spontaneity it's just pure being all the way down in terms of this story so this is the science of logic that we're moving down through. And there's over 200 universal pure thought categories in it. But really, it's just pure being in different determinate forms is what it's called. So it's just different forms of the same thing. It's all simultaneously happening in the timeless, spaceless realm. So that's the simplest one. Then the second one is called symmetry. Symmetry is another form of simultaneity. Um, there's two things kind of happening at once. And what it is is it's just... A mirror in a way it's like a peace poem here to sort of summarize very quickly what the progress is across the science of logic but we have the pure spontaneity and one of the most universal words that embodies this is this huh you know apparently in anthropology every language on earth has this word huh that represents you know we don't understand something it's it's engaging with the unknown it's the first uh, abstract negation into the pure nothing that then distinguishes itself from indeterminacy but then after that pure spontaneity we have a division sort of happening a distinction that is no distinction which is represented by this white and this these black lines this is pure nothing this is pure pure being so this is representing this category of nothing pure nothing metaphysically and then this splits into two versions of this so then we have a, a non-being with a being and the uh, a non-being with a being in the opposite direction. So this is what pure becoming is, is recognizing these moments belonging together. And then we sort of have a, a little bit more development until we get to determinate being, which is like this interpenetrating, this perfect co-extension of each other on top of each other. And we have being for self as such, and then it starts to develop itself into an opposition between um, 
itself in quality, its own quality, and then that turns into something, and this little dot is like a something. It's an inward being within self. And these are all like shape language that I'm using now. It's it's very unusual. But then this sort of divides itself into something other, and then this kind of goes within itself and becomes a a, uh, a sort of determination, constitution, and limit. So this is the it's just two things happening over and over and over again in different combinations. So it's a different level of things happening as mirrors of each other. Then we get the third level of simultaneity, which is synonymity. And this is where we start getting the deeper meaning making in the story mode. And this one uh, level of simultaneity has five different columns within it. And this is where the competencies come in. So we have competency one, competency two, competency three, competency four, and competency five. And you can see that um, we give a, it gives the grounding for the universal story of being or the story of being for short. We have an inner rhyme that's gonna be running through all of them because inwardness is sort of how these universals move. And there's a rhyme generator that we're using to sort of find what, what is the most rhymed word. And the word B is one of the most rhymed words, it has 3000 rhymes. So it was a great word to choose to try and create rhymes with. And of course, all of it is in terms of the first simultaneity, all of it is just being uh, with a non being, right? There's like this back and forth, but uh, then we have each competency described as a lullaby, and then we have the universal categories, you know, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, to really give a quick template of the ontology that are being explored. And it was this was kind of inspired by these learning models uh, based on teaching, you know, quantum mechanics in five different levels from kindergarten to PhD, and we're just using that for the this universal kind of knowledge, these shape spaces, and so. We're just creating synonymous meanings across different competencies using these fun literatures. Um, and you can see this red column means what the synchro density number is because what we're pasting here is the, the current winning stories at each level. The highest synchro densities get pasted here and they're the most likely candidate for the Nobel prizes. And uh, this will eventually be upgraded to the universal prize as well. So these are the three ontologies we saw from the Nobel Literature Prize. But these would be the, the stories underneath them would be the ones that have the highest synchro densities per in their sentences for each universal. So we would just copy them here as they go down. And we kind of tried to put a few in here, but this has to be filled out as more and more people start making meetings. And um, this stuff has kind of all been happening um, in previous slides to a certain degree. And the goal is just to get the synchro density number higher and higher. But in the next column, the synchro, the synchrony four, this is where we're kind of combining famous other works in history. So, you know, Jane Austen, Shakespeare, um, you know, Tolstoy, we're going to be taking some of their works and trying to work them in as well. So we have, you know, the 200 and, you know, one major masterwork from history representing each of these universals and then blending that into the story as well. And then what we're going to do is we're going to do the same thing for synchronicity five, which is we're going to take all the Nobel lectures, all over 600 of them, and we're going to do the word search and see if any of them are talking about these universals and then also provide and work in a Nobel laureate into the story as well, or at least their sentence or their form of writing. And then when somebody reads a sentence, they'll be reading the greatest writers of history with the greatest uh, Nobel laureates in the last hundred years. And if these are truly universal categories, they truly universal content is what we're calling, then it should be able to synchronize. And then once we get really good at this, then we start um, going beyond and making higher and higher levels of speculative meaning using Janus words as well and all these other types of things that become deeper fun literatures. So this is the simultaneous column. It really is about showing what is happening rationally at the same time that it's different. Then the transformation column is just showing how many uh, forms are in these sentences. And the higher we get this number, the more it's like the fun literature number. Um, but it has a little bit of an extra, an extra piece of meaning to it that we think is truly novel. And it gets into this last combination, this last uh, 
this last slide, which is the content and form slide. So content and form are opposites usually they're well they are they're in the dialectic and so this is not just any content this yellow column here this is the universal this is happening everywhere it's happening in the biggest galaxy it's happening in the smallest point it's happening beyond space time it's happening in space time it's super sensuous it's imminent within the sensuous it's inner phenomenology it's within the mind it's pure thought it governs the laws of the universe it's biology it's it's everything everything every symbol if it's rational, has some version of this universal content in it at some level of complexity. The order is the incredible thing that Hegel provides, but it's actually a sum total of all the greatest thinkers in history. He's just summarizing their principles. So you're actually looking at the greatest work, works of the most prof profound minds in the last 2,500, 3,000 years. And this is called determinate universals, whereas normally these are left as ineffabilities or ineffables, language games that can't resolve themselves in some kind of objective meaning. But when the inner order of these is grasped, it is absolutely immense that somebody had the ability to see this in the chaos. And now we have a way to think it, not just intuit it. Artists have an intuitive understanding of this. And those in, in religion have an experiential version of this in the mode of, of symbology, but they are actually tapping into something that seems to be eternal truth. And now we can scientifically think it in a logical way. And logic is about systematic order of these universal shapes of meaning. And so that's the universal content. That's why we want it to be in the story of being. We've covered it in the theory slides with all the Nobel Prizes. They're ju it's just the same shapes in different forms. And so what we realized that was the next level of mind-bending realization is that if these are truly universal, truly in a sense absolute, that means their form, the form can't be outside of them. So the form is literally the content transposed. So all that we're doing is we're putting the content in, in itself, technically. That's what the form is. So we just took all these 200 um, universal contents and we're just putting them horizontally now. So the first category, of course, is a repeat of logic. So this is like the identity category. So determinate being just is, or doctrine of being is just doctrine of being repeating. Then, to make it a little bit more manageable, because we're really just focusing on the uh, the physics, chemistry, the Nobel forms. Um, so most people don't think about putting them in this order, but we are hiding 44 logical metaphysical categories to get to numbers. And then numbers uh, develop eventually into physics, but there's about 203 dialectical developments that have to happen in the truly logical form to get to physics but we're gonna hide those. They're in the content, that's why it's a lot longer vertically, but we're gonna hide them to make the horizontal more manageable. And then as we get more people on board, we can start expanding these and starting to find their forms. Um, so you can just see that we're just taking the content and making the form. The form is the content, the content is the form. And so you can see we have the art side and then the religious side we have it broken into all the historical religions in chronological order, more or less, or trying to. And then at the end of this, in the most concrete form, is genuine philosophy. Not abstract philosophy only, but genuine philosophy, this concrete totality of universal logic. And you can see at the top, we have the guardian spirits that are supervising each column. So this person here, uh, this Jane, a person this is a screen name it's not their necessarily real name and they are taking on emotion in the biology medicine category um, so this is what the guardian spirit category is for is making sure that this is somewhat coordinated and then we have this historian's paradise across every category because really this is a database of history and it's an amazing compilation of the sum total of everything that may have ever happened so far. And so we want historians maybe to help us fill out these two particular subdivisions of each section. And so we have contingent history, and then we have conceptual history. So these are like the terms of the art. 
that are representing these universal shapes, but in their own kind of way, their own pidgin language, I guess you could say, or professional language. And then the contingent history are the agents of history that serve the role of finding or discovering or making explicit through realization, through discovery, these concepts. So that's the contingent part that's based on space-time. And what we're finding is that as, as these domains of knowledge are progressing, their complexity levels are also increasing. So they're all following the same logical order as they go downwards whether they're in religious mode, uh, biology, chemistry, they're all the same content in different sensuous representations or symbologies or signings, I guess you could say. And we just need people who are studied in these domains to actually say who were the people at the early beginnings of art. You know, we have cave art, we have proto-art, Neanderthal art 65,000 years ago in Spain and so we, we can start putting like the the numbers here 2630 BC is when art might have started in this formal kind of sense as a as a sort of doctrine of being version at the very beginning of a formalizing of the art process and then of course we have the more modern periods and then we have the 1600s and the 1800s and then we have Van Gogh more more recently and these historical agents were inventing forms of art that might have been actually approximating this universal logic because Hegel states that history, contingent human history, is spirit actualizing itself as the idea coming to its own realization and actualization through the, the struggling of contingent human beings as we actualize our thoughts to ourselves. And so what we're going to do is as we start identifying these periods of history in each form, we're going to be lining them up with their concepts. And right now these are examples, these can change. And we're not saying Lipo even existed back in the Neanderthal times, but one word poems, very simple art is really the point that we're getting at here. And uh, the art might become more and more objective, Hegel calls it, or more complete as we go down. And we see that, you know, phonemes evolve as elementary units of meaning and, and speaking. And then we get into stresses and then syllables, and it's becoming more and more concrete. And, some of this came from Leonard Bernstein's lecture on the last question, as he tried to do this incredible lecture at Harvard, doing, trying to approximate. They, they, he noticed this kind of evolution, this universal kind of evolution was happening somehow, and they were trying to pinpoint it. Talking about children going na, 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 and those are the first early tones of music. And na is sort of like, maybe like negation. Negation is the first sort of pure nothing coming to know itself. And uh, we kind of get the, the, the higher forms of concrete art moving into these um, forms of poetry. Hegel states is the highest form, dramatic poetry, and then it turns into comedy, and then that sublates into religion. And so it starts turning into higher levels of form. And so that should have a conceptual history in n not this logical language. This is something only Hegel was able to see in its purity. But there will be sensuous versions of these words as terms of the art that artists will be very well acquainted with who are masters of that art. And so we have the same thing maybe for dance and for religions we have this as well, contingent human uh, agents in Egyptian um, mysticism or mythology, uh, religion, Hinduism, Buddhism has its sex, uh, sects. Then we have, of course, Christianity and whoever's the experts in these fields will maybe greatly enjoy this universal process of meaning making and pattern recognizing and of course we have uh, genuine philosophies, its version, and luckily for us, Hegel at least gave us this version. He, you can see which people in history, in the history of philosophy, found these universals to him. And he said Thales, as we used in the chemistry slides in the previous Nobel slides, was the first to discover the abstract universal, which if we go over is sort of like uh, determinate, well not necessarily determinate being, it's, it's before uh, determinate being, it would more likely be actually up here. But we haven't had a chance to adjust the columns, we're, we're figuring it out. But um, you can see that Thales and then Anaximander, and then we have Parmenides here. And I think Parmenides, uh, of course, discovered pure being, so he should be aligned with pure being. So once we get more time to align these categories properly, the reason why Hegel's 
history of philosophy is so incredibly different from any other more particular sort of regurgitations is that he's not just regurgitating, he's seeing with a sort of new absolute clarity this shape space that was the principle that endured from their philosophy through the last few thousand years of time. What is truly universal endures in the chaos of contingent human development where we have wars that are sort of the violent working out of these universal principles of people trying to beat each other's ideologies. And that's why Hegel says all war is, is ideologically based because it's really just these universals fighting over each other in the non-living way of refutation. It's in this violent abstract way. And that's why we're teaching peace as really understanding sublation because these philosophers didn't understand that necessarily. That's why Parmenides with his pure being was sort of conflicting with Zeno who is this dialectical trickster showing that there's a contradiction to every other universal or category. And then Heraclitus comes on his own and wars with both of them and sort of says, no, the truth isn't pure being and it's not pure nothing, it's this becoming. And really the real way of sublating is showing that they're all moments of concrete totalities or these trinities with inner unities, these dialectical inner syntheses, not just external combinings. And each person in history, you know, it might have taken them decades to uncover their philosophies. Uh, and it took hundreds and thousands of years to start building the logical progress where they were progressing on each other, even though they thought they were negating each other. But the spirit was working through them through what's called the cunning of reason. And so the, the universes that actually are lined up, we you know for sure here is this one here. We made sure it was lined up as an example. So the ship Lucipius is one of these agents that were showing in the simultaneity column um, played a role in terms of the sentence that we wrote here. And this is just an example, but this sentence has 10 synchro densities, 10 forms within it, 10 meanings. So the first one is that it's Lucipius uncovering this universal, this being for self. And uh, in pure logic, it's just being for self. In math, it's called degree. In physics, it's represented as matter and gravity. And then in chemistry, it's elementality. In, in biology, it's soul. In economics, it's rational agent. In art, it's morphine. Like it's, this universal is reoccurring in all its forms. This is the true power. And so what, what ends up happening is we end up developing something like a periodic table of universe, of absolute shapes. And this is the up to as that we talked about in the Nobel Medical Prize and in the Nobel Peace Prize. And really what we're showing here is as we traverse the forms, we'll notice forms that are missing at each level, that don't exist in con current contemporary culture. So we have it for logic. We have this being for self in terms of math. Uh, we don't have it for these 244 categories yet, we don't think. Uh, we know that Kepler uh, played a big role in the speculative way of de developing physics and the real conception of orbits uh, in terms of periodic ratios and stuff like this. And in chemistry, we know about elements now. We know about, well, the subconscious in older language and religious language is the soul in biology. This category being for self represents uh, at that at that level of complexity and at that shape complexity, it's it's being for self is represented as the soul, this coming together and returning immediately with oneself. But then for the other categories here, which represents um, I think the space between biology and economics, we have an echa here, and this is what Mendeleev used to predict elements in the periodic table that hadn't been discovered in the 1800s yet, but he was recognizing the patterns, these universal logics behind the, the, the elements he was studying. And so he was able to predict based on the patterns that there were missing elements and he was calling them echa kind of elements. And so we're doing the same thing here, but now with universal shapes and forms that there's missing words that don't yet exist. And we're predicting that they do exist for, for uh, objective spirit or, the Nobel Economics Prize that we, we know it has something to do with rational agents. And then we're missing one. And then with art, where we think it's aligning with the morpheme in some sense, this might be false, but as we work more on this, we'll find the real one. Uh, and then we have all these echoes that are missing in terms of the religious uh, dialectic, except until the last one, we know that it stands for, in terms of conceptual history, 
it stands for uh, maybe God's nascent subjectivity. And if we expand this, uh, this out, you'll be able to see it. But if you scroll up, it's just the religious um, conceptual category. Let's see, religion, this is the contingent agents in history mostly, and then this is the conceptual. And so that's what we would call being for self in the religious mode is, is this sort of subjectivity that's nascent. It's not really a thinking thing yet. It's not concrete enough, livingly. That will develop further down. Um, but we already know that in terms of the contingent history of genuine philosophy, Lucipius is the person that goes here. And we know that in terms of genuine philosophy, it's just the universal logic and it's dialectical development. So we just get being for self again as the genuinely philosophical understanding of the universal truth, the universal wisdom in all these particular representations. And as we do the religious history, historian studies, we will get these amazing religious historians who take their faith very seriously and will, with great diligence, make sure we get the right interpretations here. And uh, this might result in whole new levels of Bible study that doesn't just negate the holy text, but actually, you know, and it doesn't extend it with this Babylon, Tower of Babylon type of external logic, but gets to the internal essence of the super sensuous messages of these divine ones. And then we can, if we do try and expand the holy text, it won't be from this, you know, carnal, sinful, external kind of maybe knowledge that they're talking about, warning us about, but we will have grasped the essence and any extensions will will not taint the text. It'll just reorganize the, the logic and these other studies of it that are so fulfillments, they're sublations, they're not abstract negations or cancelings. And that's the living kind of spirit that we want to embrace when we go about these paying tribute and respect to the histories of the past that might have put the universals in different forms. When this clicks, it's it's pretty mind-blowing and incredible. Uh, we have another example here, number four. It's a little bit more concrete with the one. And so in this one, it's Democritus who, who you know, in the physics form called this the, the atom. And in, in math, we call it specific degree. And these are more familiar categories, but we have a lot of work to do to start filling this out and studying the encyclopedia of the philosophical sciences that Hegel had written across all these domains. This is what he was doing over and over again. And we're just putting it in this database form so that when people play the sentence game, they can reference this table and sort of see what the true depth of these words we're using every day that we don't understand at all. What do we mean when we say one? What do we mean when we say atom? Every time we zoom into the atom, we get more particles, quasi-particles, quarks. And at the end of it, what really is there? Is it an infinite regression? Well, probably is. That's maybe why we'll stop giving Nobel Prizes to new particles and start focusing on these universals which are ever before us, but we never think to question them because we're not real scientists. We're not skeptical enough to even question the apparatus that we're using to measure reality, which is our own thoughts. And that's why when we try and measure a wave function at these very small levels, we seem to play a role in collapsing them and actually spontaneously creating real particular states out of superpositions. So Hegel was ahead of the game and, and sort of predicted all this just from the pure logical side of things, which is absolutely astounding. And we are gonna improve, but this is an incredible backbone that's been missing for thousands of years. And now the, this breakthrough understanding is getting to what the true depth of it represents. And we would love to see uh, if anybody else wants to join us in this experiment to see if this periodic table, this universal periodic table of absolute shapes um, can be used to make differential diagnoses that if somebody needs these if somebody needs to learn uh, this to sublate the schism in their logic um, and they're they were raised in a culturally religious uh, maybe jewish community then we can go to this column and we can say okay for this for this kind of therapy uh, we recommend this judaic kabbalistic teacher and go and find these passages and the contingent agents of history that they may identify with, and then they'll be able to understand the essence of the lesson and the, and the universal logic through a sensuous form that doesn't cause an immense amount of cognitive dissonance or abstract negation to them, such as, you know, maybe prescribing a, a Hinduistic or a, a Christian version of it would be an antithesis because the sensuous symbols war. 
right? Because they're finite. They, they can't be necessarily in superposition once they're collapsed. It's only the universals within that are super sensuous. And that's where the peace comes in is when we start to embody this recognition process. It's recognition is incredibly powerful. That's really what it's about. The spirit in us recognizing itself in the other and coming to a harmony in a way that's what love is that's what virtue all virtues are based upon and it sounds so superficial just recognizing but within that is an incredible significance a meaning that belongs to us and our sensuous symbols are getting in the way so we're not negating uh, abstractly negating we're showing the super sensuous that may be behind these and when we think them it's really quite insightful it's a uh, it makes sense of all these contradictions and these koans that Buddhists even use to drive ordinary thinking out of their out of these oppositions that reduce sense making in the world the world starts making a lot more sense we start having epiphanies again and this playfulness within the speculative nature of the mystery of life and metaphysics it starts to happen naturally and we start reconnecting with our soul and this vitality and this our subconscious the cognitive dissonance and the double binds in our subconscious start to sublate and resolve in these fluid moments of reason that we can share with others and understand their experience and start to experience perhaps a sort of equanimity with the different sensuous versions of uh, how we embody this logic as we live it our being in our thinking and our thinking in our being and then maybe we will start to expand this and we will start becoming these contingent agents of history and building our own universal uh, sort of destinies by uncovering the next version of the synchronicity behind these universals, deepening the experience and building upon these holy divine insights rather than making fun of them or understanding them in a superficial carnal way, which is actually embodying them in the opposite meaning. But through this, this is the differential diagnosis, at least in the Nobel Medical Prize, that could greatly help doctors who don't have diplomas or PhDs in each one of these forms, which would take maybe a lifetime to do. And, uh, but they can still very quickly figure out where to start addressing this meaning crisis or these, these sort of schisms. There's one more tricky case before moving on that is worth covering. So in terms of the Nobel Medical Prize, and for even those who are incredibly uh, sensuous, there's something called the Synchronicity Document of Philosophies. And it's the help of this differential diagnosis process in the extreme case that the fixity of the understanding is based on people and not just abstract symbols. So this is the synchronicity document of philosophies organized in a similar way to the universal design document. And you can see here in the first column, in the frozen column here, these are the universals, the, the content in a simplified form. In fact, the, the 40 categories, uh, the, I think it's around competency three. Um, but you can see at the top here, we're going chronologically from the oldest times of recorded history to more and more recent heading towards the right side. And so some of the most ancient records we have of is Egypt and then Mayans. And we kind of put the dates here that we're approximating 2500 BCE, 2000 BCE, and then the Hindu Vedas, Zoroaster, Judaism, Greek, it's, it's Buddhism, it kind of gets newer and newer and newer as we go. And then we're putting the conceptual art, you could say, the terms for the universals of each major ideology or representation uh, beside the universals, just like in the universal design document. But this one is a little bit different in that it goes by the figures. Uh, so in terms of Buddhism, of course, Buddha, then the pre-Socratics were going in by individual philosophers, sort of like that contingent history column. But this is a much more expanded version for really intense philosophers or people who study individual individuals quite in depth and know their individual philosophies. So we put their 
the way that they describe the words that they use. And if somebody is sensuously pegged, pegged to an individual, they could find the individual here in these expanded versions. Here's the Hegel column, of course. Um, and what you can see here that's interesting is we've already begun sublating continental philosophy, all of continental philosophy with all of analytic philosophy. And most people place Hegel within the continental tradition only, but he was actually more analytical than analytical philosophers and more continental than continental philosophers. He was already the sublation of both of these worlds. The abstract negation that started what we consider modern analytic philosophy came because nobody understood Hegel to transcend or sublate his real limit in that, that his limit in that, that li living logic. But here's how we started sublating them is we took modern forms of logic and we put it in the Hegelian order. And we said the symbols themselves are never derived. That was Hegel's criticism of Boole, well, not necessarily Boole, but um, of logic logicians in general. And so anybody that came after him, because he didn't understand that meta-reflexive, absolutely reflexive, skeptical element of true science, they started using these symbols abstractly, just unjustifiably. They said they were self-evident, but they never derived that self-evidence. And you can say, well, that's a contradiction. Uh, you know, you don't have to drive self-evidence, but Hegel does. He does that with the absolute negation, like we talked about in the, the smashing room of absolute negation. Frege uh, and Peirce come later, and they try and they try and reinvent this universal logic. And Begriff Schrift was an attempt to revamp the whole enterprise, but uh, Frege never justified his symbols. And then Bertrand Russell come, came along and showed that there was an inner contradiction, the Russell's paradox, which is actually catching onto the true nature of pure thought, but they treated it as a defect, just like Kant did with the, the, the self-judgment of the apperception of the eye, the pure eye. So all we did was we started deriving the symbols they used from scratch with the absolute negation, which would which of course leads to pure being, and then the universal symbols of logic is what starts is what starts it all, and then it derives itself and negates itself, and this is our first attempts of showing what these in tremendous individuals were doing in their logical notations. So they're all saying the same thing, in it, but it's only because we found the universal content behind them, the essence of the logic, the true logic behind them. And so we're sublating all of continental philosophy of analytical philosophy to return genuine philosophy to its true concrete whole. We're healing the, the schisms of abstract thought, which has resulted in the lessening of philosophy's place in society as another particular amongst other particular domains. Whereas it's truly the universal as we're showing by bridging these logic together in one. So this is the power of using this document. If somebody wants to go in a hyper kind of egoistic way. You can pick any individual and you can just show that it's their philosophy is in this order. There's those that will say, no, you can't do that to my philosophy. You don't understand them. And this happened with um, Heidegger recently. So we are, for those that are really intense, we can divide each category into two. Um, the person's order. So this is Heidegger's order of his, the way he orders his philosophy. And of course, there was no system. Uh, Heidegger didn't have a systematic totality, but he had some concepts here, and some other individuals ordered them the way they thought Heidegger would have ordered them. And then we still provide the Hegelian order the way we think Hegel would have ordered the concepts. So you can compare and contrast the way that the contingent history developed these concepts, and then how they would have looked if they would have read Hegel and understood him. So it's an incredibly powerful comparative analysis between the greatest minds in history that some people will be fixated upon. And it'll take a lot of effort to do these differential diagnoses with uh, either through the self or through the Nobel Medical, Medical Prize and medical professions. Um, but it's this is in the extreme case that not only are people fixated on the symbols, but they're fixated on the individuals who created those symbols. So that's how they could be saying the exact same thing, but then the, the hero that they have is what they use to do the warring. And of course, individual agents of history are finite creatures that can't be merged necessarily. You can do it conceptually, but you can't do it in history. And most people don't want to do that. So this is where a lot of the, the conflict is coming from. 
And of course, you get some of the most modern philosophers to date. And um, we can start including individual citizens who are learning or they're upgrading their UQ, their universal quotient, through this process, through learning with their favorite, not only just ideology, but their favorite philosophers in that ideology. So this is sort of a specialized expansion of what's in the universal design document in terms of the contingent history column and the conceptual column. Um, but you can see it's just going by time and and uh, this is to help get into the more nuanced cases that if you don't have a PhD or you don't have like diplomas in each one of these individual philosophers, never mind in their general, the general ideologies, then this is another ephemeralization that can save tens of thousands of hours and still have the rigor and have the expertise and the professionals who have studied these and do have PhDs making sure that they're filled out correctly. And of course, you can leave comments. If you don't like what's happening, you can leave a comment and say, well, why did you do this? Why this? This should be um, not pure being, but, you know, uh, dialectical materialism or something, if they think that's true. In this case, it would because this is the metaphysical realm. And of course, Marx didn't really believe in that. So somebody can look at this, the, the person who's the guardian spirit of this column uh, can look at that and decide to see if it's right and they can have a dialogue here. And uh, th these kinds of dialogues will be cit citable and this will be the new idea-based economics happening right here. So if there are any PhDs that want to help start doing just uh, justification to these, our Hegelian scholars will work with you and see if we can get this sort of hyper-nuanced level of genuine philosophy started at the particular individual levels, not just on the uh, universal levels in the universal design document. It should help them address this meaning crisis and these schisms that are causing immense pain in people. And of course, it moves up from the individual to their work, to their families, to, to our friends and civil society. All the life areas are linked that way in a growing kind of complexity. This complexity is growing through us. These shape spaces, phenomenologically, subjectively, and in the objective economy and the objective uh, physicality of the world, chemistry of the world. So if you know any f historians that would find this a paradise, there is a lot of novel things that can be uncovered here. I think a lot of in, 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 a lot of meaningful, deep seated truth in the absolute kind of sense, even though we're using the correspondence model of truth and doing this Aristotelian moment, can lead us down a path which um, could even maybe resolve wars. So please join us if you're interested and help us write the story of being within this new kind of paradigm. And uh, within the immensity of all that has been shown in the last 18 slides of the Guardian Spirit presentation, um, it may be possible to surprise the Nobel Prize committees and surprise the entire world by having emerge a, a new world spirit. It might seem like at first that this incredible complexity can't be learned by anybody but the most gifted or the most intelligent or the, the highest on the Pareto tables and the grids. But if it's really thought through carefully, this is an incredible ephemeralization of the education system where it's it's becoming more applicable by actually becoming more elegant it's actually simplifying and we're reducing the confusion in the orders and so what will happen is this invites in more people no matter what the iqs are no matter what the educational backgrounds are it's it's kind of doing the adversity score that the SATs are trying to approximate. It's leveling, leveling the field, the playing field. With this kind of simplicity and this ephemeralization where we're doing more with less, we're memorizing 200 categories, and then the rest of it is recognized by the new generations as just being re repetitions in different beautiful forms. And then we can discover new ones, and we're going to be doing that through the the WIWA app and the, uh, the idea-based economics, research and development is expanding this universal content and recognizing it in all these forms. 
And this is why at first it seems incredibly complicated because the current culture we're in is actually really confusing and we're getting this abstractions of abstractions of abstractions and the transdisciplinarity and the interdisciplinarity are working. We're getting closer, but in the interim, we're, there's an infinitude of combinations of permutations that we can get lost in, which is this information explosion, neologisms upon neologisms upon neologisms to try and get to the essence of things. So this gives us uh, a, a backbone to kind of pull it all in a little bit and can and kind of rein in the information explosion so that we can swim within it without getting lost and that's kind of what this is it's a, a little bit of a a life raft in this infinite exponential sort of increase in in the information age so this is meant for everybody not just academics and phds and gifted high iqs this will actually help everybody learn including maybe those who have such traumatized psychologies it'll help correct those so that the learning process can, can continue in this living way and we can answer the 400 why questions that children can ask by the time they're four years old and this uh, this is a uh, this doing more with less is really what all aspects sort of of our society need and it just needs to be taught that way and we're, we're starting now so once we figure out and we get the real teachers on board and how to to bring this to each level at each level of competency one two three four five then we can then we're going to start seeing the the amazing potential of this to change lives at every level everybody no one's left behind and it can be as simple as starting with being nothing and becoming because we're becoming something more by doing less. It's that typical guru teaching is it's not that you have to learn so much more. It's that you have to forget some of the things you think you know that aren't true. And uh, it, this very much rings of that sort of mystery, that sort of irony. So. Hopefully you're not triggered. Uh, that was a lot to take in, but this last problem should at least have the beginning steps of solving it. That no matter how highly educated or technical, we can get the UQ, the universal quotient, much higher through this um, universal table, universal periodic table of absolute shapes, and have and show it in the sensuous symbols. Show it in the multiple holy texts show in the silent academics one by one that there is a magnificent and almost majestic kind of ability being born an ability that can resolve the disability we have both scientifically and spiritually of which we can gain a universal kind of accessibility towards our highest potentials and then really actually truly actualize our highest destiny and finally cooperate and save ourselves and our planet congratulations you've made it to the end you've experienced a little dose of what is called infinite science and perhaps now, even if it doesn't make sense, maybe you've come to the idea that yes, it comes off as insane and completely different, but it's crazy enough that it just might work and might work fast enough to help us offset this doomsday clock and the 10 Nobel laureates behind it from sending out warning signs of what is to come. And this new world spirit can move incredibly quickly if we can grasp this deeper wisdom if the presentation seemed a little bit too abstract or didn't seem like it was really rigorous enough we do have these abstracts we're going to be working on and filling out and using the universal periodic table of absolute shapes to link and cite to contemporary sources and scholars that we feel like are aligning much like the shape dynamic crew 
and other great minds to track down this, this wisdom and put it into a form that is publishable. But for now, in terms of generating public awareness, this is a seismic intervention in terms of human culture and human wisdom. And the goal is to have the traditional place of philosophy return to its truth and start liberating spirit in an actual and genuine freedom that is the point of spirit mission. And it goes a little bit like this. The mission is to liberate spirit in an abundance of genuine freedom, to sublate and thereby transcend the bad infinite in all finite processes, distortions, and untrue thinking, which trap consciousness in neuroticism, despair, and double binds. Through our actions, thoughts, and beliefs, we will generate a new total culture of genuine reason, love, and wisdom for all those in, of, and from this spirit of mutual self-recognition and respect. Actual freedom sublates the dichotomy of necessity and caprice and will be made manifest to the greatest extent possible to maximize the actual and potential beauty of the moment for all. Ultimately, the result will be a culture of flow both within and without as we begin to embody this absolute logic, science, spirituality, and philosophy in its essential and complete realization. Thank you for enduring any triggers that may have been experienced. You have a tremendous amount of emotional resilience and may have the capacity to be a guardian spirit for millions of people. If you are interested or inspired, please share this with people that you think would benefit as we work towards these Nobel Prizes to gain the influence that these, these ideas deserve. And if anything, hopefully, if you're a Hegelian scholar, you've had a deeper reading of this tremendous thinker and the 133 philosophers of history and the greatest minds that developed these universals that he drew from. It's a tremendous and Herculean act of respect where a giant was standing on the shoulders of giants. And hopefully we can glean a little bit of that wisdom and have done so in this presentation. So love to you, beautiful and free soul.